Argonauts of the Western Pacific by Bronislaw Malinowski An Account of Native Enterprise and Adventure in the Archipelagos of Melanesian New Guinea Forward by the Author Ethnology is in the sadly ludicrous, not to say tragic, position. That at the very moment when it begins to put its workshop in order, to forge its proper tools, to start ready for work on its appointed task, the material of its study melts away with hopeless rapidity. Just now, when the methods and aims of scientific field ethnology have taken shape, when men fully trained for the work have begun to travel into savage countries and study their inhabitants, these die away under our very eyes. The research which has been done on native races by men of academic training has proved beyond doubt and cavil that scientific, methodic inquiry can give us results far more abundant and of better quality than those of even the best amateur's work. Most, though not all, of the modern scientific accounts have opened up quite new and unexpected aspects of tribal life. They have given us, in clear outline, the picture of social institutions often surprisingly vast and complex. They have brought before us the vision of the native as he is, in his religious and magical beliefs and practices. They have allowed us to penetrate into his mind far more deeply than we have ever done before. From this new material, scientifically hallmarked, Students of comparative ethnology have already drawn some very important conclusions on the origin of human customs, beliefs, and institutions. On the history of cultures, and their spread and contact, on the laws of human behavior in society, and of the human mind. The hope of gaining a new vision of savage humanity through the labors of scientific specialists opens out like a mirage, vanishing almost as soon as perceived. For though at present, there is still a large number of native communities available for scientific study, within a generation or two, they or their cultures will have practically disappeared. The need for energetic work is urgent, and the time is short. Nor, alas, up to the present, has any adequate interest been taken by the public in these studies. The number of workers is small, the encouragement they receive scanty. I feel therefore no need to justify an ethnological contribution which is the result of specialized research in the field. In this volume I give an account of one phase of savage life only, in describing certain forms of intertribal, trading relations among the natives of New Guinea. This account has been culled, as a preliminary monograph, from ethnographic material, covering the whole extent of the tribal culture of one district. One of the first conditions of acceptable ethnographic work certainly is that it should deal with the totality of all social, cultural and psychological aspects of the community. For they are so interwoven that not one can be understood without taking into consideration all the others. The reader of this monograph will clearly see that, though its main theme is economic, for it deals with commercial enterprise, exchange and trade, constant reference has to be made to social organization, the power of magic to mythology and folklore, and indeed to all other aspects as well as the main one. The geographical area of which the book treats is limited to the archipelagos lying off the eastern end of New Guinea. Even within this, the main field of research was in one district, that of the Trobriand Islands. This, however, has been studied minutely. I have lived in that one archipelago for about two years, in the course of three expeditions to New Guinea, during which time I naturally acquired a thorough knowledge of the language. I did my work entirely alone, living for the greater part of the time right in the villages. I therefore had constantly the daily life of the natives before my eyes, while accidental, dramatic occurrences, deaths, quarrels, village brawls, public and ceremonial events, could not escape my notice. In the present state of ethnography, when so much has still to be done in paving the way for forthcoming research and in fixing its scope, each new contribution ought to justify its appearance in several points. It ought to show some advance in method, it ought to push research beyond its previous limits in depth, in width, or in both, finally, it ought to endeavor to present its results in a manner exact, but not dry. The specialist interested in method, in reading this work, will find set out in the introduction, divisions, and in, the exposition of my points of view and efforts in this direction. The reader who is concerned with results, rather than with the way of obtaining them, will find in chapters to a consecutive narrative of the Kula expeditions, 
and the various associated customs and beliefs. The student who is interested, not only in the narrative, but in the ethnographic background for it, and a clear definition of the institution, will find the first in chapters and, and the latter in chapter. To Mr. Robert Mond I tender my sincerest thanks. It is to his generous endowment that I owe the possibility of carrying on for several years the research of which the present volume is a partial result. To Mr. Atley Hunt, CMG. Secretary of the Home and Territories Department of the Commonwealth of Australia, I am indebted for the financial assistance of the department, and also for much help given on the spot. In the Trobriens, I was immensely helped in my work by Mr. B. Hancock, Pearl Trader, to whom I am grateful not only for assistance and services, but for many acts of friendship. Much of the argument in this book has been greatly improved by the criticism given me by my friend, Mr. Paul Kunner, of Vienna, an expert in the practical affairs of modern industry and a highly competent thinker on economic matters. Professor L. T. Hobhouse has kindly read the proofs and given me valuable advice on several points. Sir James Fraser, by writing his preface, has enhanced the value of this volume beyond its merit and it is not only a great honor and advantage for me to be introduced by him, but also a special pleasure. For my first love for ethnology is associated with the reading of the Golden Bough, then in its second edition. Last, not least, I wish to mention Professor C. G. Seligman, to whom this book is dedicated. The initiative of my expedition was given by him and I owe him more than I can express for the encouragement and scientific counsel which he has so generously given me during the progress of my work in New Guinea. B. M. L. Boken. Ica de los Vinos. Tenerife. April, 1921. Acknowledgements. It is in the nature of the research, that an ethnographer has to rely upon the assistance of others to an extent much greater than is the case with other scientific workers. I have therefore to express in this special place my obligations to the many who have helped me. As said in the preface, financially I owe most to Mr. Robert Mond, who made my work possible by bestowing on me the Robert Mond Travelling Scholarship, University of London, of £250 per annum for five years, for 1914 and for 1917 to 1920. I was substantially helped by a grant of £250 from the Home and Territories Department of Australia, obtained by the good offices of Mr. Atley Hunt, CMG. The London School of Economics awarded me the Constance Hutchinson Scholarship of £100 yearly for two years, 1915 to 1916. Professor Seligman, to whom in this, as in other matters I owe so much, besides helping me in obtaining all the other grants, gave himself £100 towards the cost of the expedition and equipped me with a camera, a phonograph, anthropometric instruments and other paraphernalia of ethnographic work. I went out to Australia with the British Association for the Advancement of Science in 1914, as a guest, and at the expense, of the Commonwealth Government of Australia. It may be interesting for intending field workers to observe that I carried out my ethnographic research for six years, 1914 to 1920, making three expeditions to the field of my work. And devoting the intervals between expeditions to the working out of my material and to the study of special literature, on little more than £250 a year. I defrayed out of this, not only all the expenses of travel and research, such as fares, wages to native servants, payments of interpreters, but I was also able to collect a fair amount of ethnographic specimens. Of which part has been presented to the Melbourne Museum as the Robert Mond Collection. This would not have been possible for me, had I not received much help from residents in New Guinea. My friend, Mr. B. Hancock, of Gusaweta, Trobriand Islands, allowed me to use his house and store as base for my gear and provisions. He lent me his cutter on various occasions and provided me with a home, where I could always repair in need or sickness. He helped me in my photographic work, and gave me a good number of his own photographic plates, of which several are reproduced in this book, Plates, N. Other pearl traders and buyers of the Trobriens were also very kind to me, especially M. and Madame Raphael Brudeau, of Paris, Messer C., and G. Auerbach, and the late Mr. 
Mick George, all of whom helped me in various ways and extended to me their kind hospitality. In my interim studies in Melbourne, I received much help from the staff of the excellent Public Library of Victoria, for which I have to thank the librarian, Mr. E. La Touche Armstrong, my friend Mr. E. Pitt, Mr. Cook and others. Two maps and two plates are reproduced by kind permission of Professor Seligman from his Melanesians of British New Guinea. I have to thank the editor of Man, Captain T. A. Joyce, for his permission to use here again the plates which were previously published in that paper. Mr. William Swan Stollybrass, Senior Managing Director of Messrs. G. O. Routledge and Sons, Ltd has spared no trouble in meeting all my wishes as to scientific details in the publication of this book, for which I wish to express my sincere thanks. Phonetic Note The native names and words in this book are written according to the simple rules, recommended by the Royal Geographical Society and the Royal Anthropological Institute. That is, the vowels are to be pronounced as in Italian and the consonants as in English. This spelling suits the sounds of the Melanesian languages of New Guinea sufficiently well. The apostrophe placed between two vowels indicates that they should be pronounced separately and not merged into a diphthong. The accent is almost always on the penultimate, rarely on the antipenultimate. All the syllables must be pronounced clearly and distinctly. Table of Contents 7. 15. I. Sailing and trading in the South Seas, the Kula. 2. Method in ethnography. 3. Starting field work. Some perplexing difficulties. 3. Conditions of success. 4. Life in a tent among the natives. Mechanism of getting in touch with them. V. Active methods of research. Order and consistency in savage cultures. Methodological Consequences of This Truth 6. Formulating the Principles of Tribal Constitution and of the Anatomy of Culture Method of Inference from Statistic Accumulation of Concrete Data Uses of Synoptic Charts 7. Presentation of the Intimate Touches of Native Life Of Types of Behavior Method of Systematic Fixing of Impressions, of Detailed, Consecutive Records Importance of personal participation in native life. 8. Recording of stereotyped manners of thinking and feeling. Corpus inscriptionum Kirawaniensium. 9. Summary of argument. The native's vision of his world 1. I. I. Racial divisions in eastern New Guinea. Seligman's classification. The Kula natives. 2. Subdivisions of the Kula district. 3. Scenery at the eastern end of New Guinea. Villages of the S. Ma Sim, their customs and social institutions. 4. The D'Entrecastos Archipelago. The tribes of Dobu. The mythological associations of their country. Some of their customs and institutions. Sorcery. A vision on Sarabwina Beach. V. Sailing North. The Amphlet Group. Savage Monopolists 27. 2. I. Arrival in the Coral Islands. First Impression of the Native. Some Significant Appearances and Their Deeper Meaning. 2. Position of Women, Their Life and Conduct Before and After Marriage. 3. Further Exploration in the Villages. A Cross Country Walk. Gardens and Gardening. 4. The Native's Working Power. Their motives and incentives to work. Magic and work. A digression on primitive economics. V. Chieftainship, power through wealth, a plutocratic community. List of the various provinces and political divisions in the Trobriands. 6. Totemism, the solidarity of clans and the bonds of kinship. 7. Spirits of the dead. The overweening importance of magic. Black Magic The Prowling Sorcerers and the Flying Witches The Malevolent Visitors from the South and Epidemics 8. The Eastern Neighbors of the Trobrianders The Remaining Districts of the Kula 49 3. I. A Concise Definition of the Kula 2. Its Economic Character 
3. The Articles Exchanged, The Conception of Vegue. 4. The Main Rules and Aspects of the Kula, The Sociological Aspect, Partnership, Direction of Movement, Nature of Kula Ownership, The Differential and Integral Effect of These Rules. V. The Act of Exchange, Its Regulations. The light it throws on the acquisitive and communistic tendencies of the natives, its concrete outlines, the solicitory gifts. 6. The associated activities and the secondary aspects of the Kula, construction of canoes. Subsidiary trade, their true relation to the Kula, the ceremonial, mythology and magic associated with the Kula, the mortuary taboos and distributions, in their relation to the Kula 81. 4. I. The value and importance of a canoe to a native. Its appearance, the impressions and emotions it arouses in those who use or own it. The atmosphere of romance which surrounds it for the native. 2. Analysis of its construction, in relation to its function. The three types of canoes in the Trobriand Islands. 3. V. Sociology of a large canoe, Misawa. 3. A. Social organization of labor in constructing a canoe, the division of functions, the magical regulation of work. 4. B. Sociology of canoe ownership, the Toli relationship, the Talawaga, master, or owner, of a canoe, the four privileges and functions of a Talawaga. V. C. The social division of functions in manning and sailing a canoe. Statistical data about the Trobriand shipping 105. V. I. Construction of canoes as part of the Kula proceedings. Magic and mythology. The preparatory and the ceremonial stage of construction. 2. The first stage, expelling the wood sprite Takwe. Transport of the log, the hollowing out of the log and the associated magic. 3. The second stage, the inaugural rite of Kula magic, the native at grips with problems of construction, the Wayugo creeper the magical spell uttered over it, caulking. The three magical exorcisms. 4. Some general remarks about the two stages of canoe building and the concomitant magic. Bulabwalata, evil magic, of canoes. The ornamental prow boards. The Dabuan and the Murawan types of overseas canoe 124. 6. I. The procedure and magic at launching. The trial run, Tassasoria. Account of the launching in Tassasoria seen on the beach of Kuala Kuba. Reflections on the decay of customs under European influence. 2. Digression on the sociology of work, organization of labor, forms of communal labor, payment for work. 3. The custom of ceremonial visiting, Kabajadoya. Local trade, done on such expeditions. 4-7. Digression on gifts, payments, and exchange. 4. Attitude of the native towards wealth. Desire of display. Enhancement of social prestige through wealth. The motives of accumulating foodstuffs. The villamalia, magic of plenty. The handling of yams. Psychology of eating. Value of manufactured goods, psychologically analyzed. V. Motives for exchange. Giving, as satisfaction of vanity and as display of power. Fallacy of the economically isolated individual or household. Absence of gain in exchange. 6. Exchange of gifts and barter. List of gifts, payments and commercial transactions. 1. Pure gifts. 2. Customary payments, repaid irregularly and without strict equivalence. 3. Payments for services rendered, 4. Gifts returned in strictly equivalent form, 5. Exchange of material goods against privileges, titles and non-material possessions, 6. Ceremonial barter with deferred payment, 7. Trade pure and simple. 7. Economic duties corresponding to various social ties. Table of eight classes of social relationship, Characterized by definite economic obligations 146. 7. Scene laid in Sinekita. The local chiefs. Stir in the village. 
The Social Differentiation of the Sailing Party Magical Rites, Associated with the Preparing and Loading of a Canoe The Solomoya Rite The Magical Bundle, Lileva The Compartments of a Canoe and the Jabobo Spell Farewells on the Beach 195 8. I. The Definition of an Avalaku, Ceremonial, Competitive Expedition 2. The Sagali, Ceremonial Distribution, on Moa 3. The Magic of Sailing 207 9. I. The Landscape Mythological Geography of the Regions Beyond 2. Sailing, the Winds, Navigation, Technique of Sailing a Canoe and Its Dangers 3. The Customs and Taboos of Sailing Privileged Position of Certain Subclans 4. The Beliefs in Dreadful Monsters Lurking in the C219 X. I. The Flying Witches, Molokwazi or Yoyova, Essentials of the Belief, Initiation and Education of a Yoyova, Witch, Secrecy Surrounding This Condition Manner of Practicing This Witchcraft, Actual Cases 2. The Flying Witches at Sea and in Shipwreck Other Dangerous Agents The Kagyu Magic, Its Modes of Operation 3. Account of the Preparatory Rites of Kagyu Some Incantations Quoted 4. The Story of Shipwreck and Rescue V. The Spell of the Rescuing Giant Fish The Myth and the Magical Formula of Tokolabwedoga 237 11. I. Arrival in Gumasila Example of a Kula Conversation Trobrianders on Long Visits in the Amphlets 2. Sociology of the Kula 1. Sociological Limitations to Participation in the Kula 2. Relation of Partnership 3. Entering the Kula Relationship for Participation of Women in the Kula 3. The Natives of the Amphlets, Their Industries and Trade Pottery Importing the clay, technology of pot making, commercial relations with the surrounding districts. 4. Drift of migrations and cultural influences in this province 267. 12. I. Sailing under the lee of Koitabu. The cannibals of the unexplored jungle. Trobrian traditions and legends about them. The history and song of Gamagabu. 2. Myths and reality. Significance imparted to landscape by myth. Line of distinction between the mythical and the actual occurrences, magical power and mythical atmosphere, the three strata of Trobriand myths. 3. V. The myths of the Kula. 3. Survey of Kula mythology and its geographical distribution. The story of Giryu of Muyua, Woodlark Island. The two stories of Tokosakuna of Digumanu and Gumasila. 4. The Kadayuri Myth of the Flying Canoe Commentary and Analysis of this Myth Association between the Canoe and the Flying Witches Mythology and the Lakuba Clan V. The Myth of Kasabwebwerida and the Necklace Gumakarakadekta Comparison of these stories 6. Sociological Analysis of the Myths Influence of the Kula Myths upon Native Outlook, Myth and Custom 7. The relation between myth and actuality restated. 8. The story, the natural monuments and the religious ceremonial of the mythical personalities Atuaine, Achiramoe, and their sister Sinatamubadai. Other rocks of similar traditional nature 290. 13. I. The halt on the beach. The beauty magic. Some incantations quoted. The spell of the Tawaya. Conch shell. 2. The magical onset on the Koya. Psychological analysis of this magic. 3. The Gwara, Taboo, and the Kayubana I spell 334. 14. I. Reception in Dobu. 2. The main transactions of the Kula and the subsidiary gifts and exchanges, some general reflections on the driving force of the Kula. Regulations of the main transaction Vaga, opening gift, and Yodel, return gift, the solicitory gifts, Pokala, Kwepulu, Karabudu, Koratanna, intermediary gifts, Basi, 
and final clinching gift, kudu. The other articles sometimes exchanged in the main transaction of the kula, doga, samakupa, bhikkhu, commercial honor and ethics of the kula. 3. The kula proceedings in dobu, wooing the partner, koigapani magic, the subsidiary trade. Roamings of the Boyans in the Dobu District 350. 15. I. Visits made on the return trip. Some articles acquired. 2. The Spondylus shell fishing in Sanaroa Lagoon and in home waters, its general character and magic, the Coloma myth. Consecutive account of the technicalities, ceremonial and magic of the diving for the shell. 3. Technology, economics and sociology of the production of the discs and necklaces from the shell. 4. Tanerare, display of the hull. Arrival of the party home to Sinekita 366. 16. I. The Uvalaku, ceremonial expedition, from Dobu to southern Boyawa, the preparations in Dobu and Sanaroa, preparations in Gumasila, the excitement, the spreading and convergence of news. Arrival of the Dabuan fleet in Nabwajeta. 2. Preparations in Sinekita for the reception of the visiting party. The Dabuans arrive. The scene at Kikuyawa Point. The ceremonial reception. Speeches and gifts. The three days sojourn of the Dabuans in Sinekita. Manner of living. Exchange of gifts and barter. 3. Return home. Results shown at the Tanerair 376. 17. I. The subject matter of Boyawan magic. Its association with all the vital activities and with the unaccountable aspects of reality. 2. V. The native conception of magic. 2. The methods of arriving at its knowledge. 3. Native views about the original sources of magic. Its primeval character. Inadmissibility to the native of spontaneous generation in magic. Magic a power of man and not a force of nature. Magic and myth and their supernormal atmosphere. 4. The magical acts, spell and rite. Relation between these two factors, spells uttered directly without a concomitant rite, spells accompanied by simple rite of impregnation, spells accompanied by a rite of transference, spells accompanied by offerings and invocations. Summary of this survey. V. Place where magic is stored in the human anatomy. 6. Condition of the performer. Taboos and observances. Sociological position. Actual descent and magical filiation. 7. Definition of systematic magic. The systems of canoe magic and kula magic. 8. Supernormal or supernatural character of magic emotional reaction of the natives to certain forms of magic, the kariyala, magical portent, role of ancestral spirits, native terminology. 9. Ceremonial setting of magic. X. Institution of taboo, supported by magic. Ketubutabu and Ketapaku. 11. Purchase of certain forms of magic. Payments for magical services. 12. Brief summary 392. 18. I. Study of linguistic data in magic to throw light on native ideas about the power of words. 2. The text of the Wayogo spell with literal translation. 3. Linguistic analysis of its Yula, exordium. 4. Vocal technique of reciting a spell. Analysis of the Tapwana, main part, and Dogaina, final part. V. The text of the Solomoya spell and its analysis. 6 to 12. Linguistic data referring to the other spells mentioned in this volume and some general inferences. 6. The Takwe spell and the opening phrases of the canoe spells. 7. The Tapwana, main parts, of the canoe spells. 8. The end parts, Dogaina, of these spells. 9. The Yula of the Mwazala spells. X, the Tapwana and the Dogaina of these spells. 11, the Kegiyu spells. 12, summary of the results of this linguistic survey. 13, substances used in these magical rites. 14 to 18, 
analysis of some non-magical linguistic texts, to illustrate ethnographic method and native way of thinking. 14. General remarks about certain aspects of method. 15. Text number 1, its literal and free translation. 16. Commentary. 17. Texts number 2 and 3 translated and commented upon 428. 19. I, Tuolua, the chief of Kiriwina, on a visit in Sinekita. The decay of his power. Some melancholy reflections about the folly of destroying the native order of things and of undermining native authority as now prevailing. 2. The division into Kula communities, the three types of Kula, with respect to this division. The overseas Kula. 3. The inland Kula between two Kula communities, and within such a unit. 4. The Kula communities, in Boyawa, Trobriand Islands, 464. XX. 1, 2, account of an expedition from Kiriwina to Kideva. I, fixing dates and preparing districts. 2, preliminaries of the journey. Departure from Kalakuba Beach. Sailing. Analogies and differences between these expeditions and those of the Sinekitans to Dobu. Entering the village. The Yulawada custom. Sojourn in Kideva and return. 3. The Soai, Mortuary Feast, in the Eastern District, Kideva to Muyawa, and its association with the Kula 478. XXI. I. Rapid survey of the routes between Woodlark Island, Muroa or Muyawa, and the Engineer Group and between this latter and Dobu. 2. The ordinary trade carried on between these communities. 3. An offshoot of the Kula, trading expeditions between the Western Trobriand, Cavateria and Kelola, and the Western D'Entrecastos. 4. Production of Mwali, Arms Hells. V. Some other offshoots and leakages of the Kula Ring. Entry of the Kula Vegue into the Ring. 494. 22509. Table of Contents. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 6. 7. 8. 9. I. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 2. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 6. 7. 8. 3. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 6. 4. I. 2. 3. 4. V. V. I. 2. 3. 4. 6. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 6. 7. 7. 8. I. 2. 3. 9. I. 2. 3. 4. X. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 11. I. 2. 3. 4. 12. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 6. 7. 8. 13. I. 2. 3. 14. I. 2. 3. 15. I. 2. 3. 4. 16. I. 2. 3. 17. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 6. 7. 8. 9. X. 
11. 12. 18. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 6. 7. 8. 9. X. 11. 12. 13. 14. 15. 16. 17. 19. I. 2. 3. 4. XX. I. 2. 3. 21. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 22. List of illustrations. Frontispiece. Plate. Facing page. I. 2. 3. 4. V. 6. 7. 8. 9. X. 11. 12. 13. 14. 15. 16. 17. 18. 19. XX. XXI. XXI. XEI. Ziv. XXV. XXVI. XXVI. 18EI. Zix. Triple X. XXXI. XXXI. 33. Ziv. XXXV. XXXVI. XVI. XXXVI. X6. XL. XLI. 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 Sliv. XLV. XLVI. 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 49. L. A. L. B. L. I. A. I. I. L. I. I. L. I. V. L. V. L. V. I. L. V. I. L. V. I. L. A. X. L. X. L. X. I. L. X. I. L. X. I. Lexiv. L. X. V. Maps. I. 33. 2. 3. 4. V. Tables. I. 2. 3. 415 to 418. Figures in text. I. 2. Map I, the native names and their spelling on this end. The following map conform to the traditional nomenclature to be found on charts and old maps. Maps 3 V show, the native names as ascertained by myself and phonetically spelled. Introduction, the subject, method and scope of this inquiry. I. The coastal populations of the South Sea Islands, with very few exceptions, are, or were before their extinction, expert navigators and traders. Several of them had evolved excellent types of large seagoing canoes, and used to embark in them on distant trade expeditions or raids of war and conquest. The Papio-Melanesians, who inhabit the coast and the outlying islands of New Guinea, are no exception to this rule. In general they are daring sailors, industrious manufacturers, and keen traders. The manufacturing centers of important articles, such as pottery, stone implements, canoes, fine baskets, valued ornaments, are localized in several places, according to the skill of the inhabitants, their inherited tribal tradition, and special facilities offered by the district. Thence they are traded over wide areas, sometimes traveling more than hundreds of miles. Definite forms of exchange along definite trade routes are to be found established between the various tribes. A most remarkable form of intertribal trade is that obtaining between the Motu of Port Moresby and the tribes of the Papuan Gulf. The Motu sail for hundreds of miles in heavy, unwieldy canoes, called Lakatoi, which are provided with the characteristic crab claw sails. 
They bring pottery and shell ornaments, in olden days, stone blades, to Gulf Papuans, from whom they obtain in exchange sago and the heavy dugouts, which are used afterwards by the Motu for the construction of their Lakatoi canoes. Further east, on the south coast, there lives the industrious, seafaring population of the Mailu, who link the east end of New Guinea with the central coast tribes by means of annual trading expeditions. Finally, the natives of the islands and archipelagos, scattered around the east end, are in constant trading relations with one another. We possess in Professor Seligman's book an excellent description of the subject, especially of the nearer trades routes between the various islands inhabited by the southern Masim. There exists, however, another, a very extensive and highly complex trading system, embracing with its ramifications, not only the islands near the east end, but also the Louisiades, Woodlark Island, the Trobriand Archipelago, and the D'Entrecastos Group. It penetrates into the mainland of New Guinea, and exerts an indirect influence over several outlying districts, such as Rossell Island, and some parts of the northern and southern coast of New Guinea. This trading system, the Kula, is the subject I am setting out to describe in this volume, and it will be seen that it is an economic phenomenon of considerable theoretical importance. It looms paramount in the tribal life of those natives who live within its circuit, and its importance is fully realized by the tribesmen themselves, whose ideas, ambitions, desires and vanities are very much bound up with the Kula. 2. Before proceeding to the account of the Kula, it will be well to give a description of the methods used in the collecting of the ethnographic material. The results of scientific research in any branch of learning ought to be presented in a manner absolutely candid and above board. No one would dream of making an experimental contribution to physical or chemical science, without giving a detailed account of all the arrangements of the experiments, an exact description of the apparatus used. Of the manner in which the observations were conducted, of their number, of the length of time devoted to them, and of the degree of approximation with which each measurement was made. In less exact sciences, as in biology or geology, this cannot be done as rigorously, but every student will do his best to bring home to the reader all the conditions in which the experiment or the observations were made. In ethnography, where a candid account of such data is perhaps even more necessary, it has unfortunately in the past not always been supplied with sufficient generosity, and many writers do not ply the full searchlight of methodic sincerity. As they move among their facts and produce them before us out of complete obscurity. It would be easy to quote works of high repute, and with a scientific hallmark on them, in which wholesale generalizations are laid down before us, and we are not informed at all by what actual experiences the writers have reached their conclusion. No special chapter or paragraph is devoted to describing to us the conditions under which observations were made and information collected. I consider that only such ethnographic sources are of unquestionable scientific value, in which we can clearly draw the line between, on the one hand, the results of direct observation and of native statements and interpretations, and on the other. The inferences of the author, based on his common sense and psychological insight. Indeed, some such survey, as that contained in the table, given below, ought to be forthcoming, so that at a glance the reader could estimate with precision the degree of the writer's personal acquaintance with the facts which he describes, and form an idea under what conditions information had been obtained from the natives. Again, in historical science, no one could expect to be seriously treated if he made any mystery of his sources and spoke of the past as if he knew it by divination. In ethnography, the writer is his own chronicler and the historian at the same time, while his sources are no doubt easily accessible, but also supremely elusive and complex. They are not embodied in fixed, material documents, but in the behavior and in the memory of living men. In ethnography, the distance is often enormous between the brute material of information, as it is presented to the student in his own observations, in native statement. In the kaleidoscope of tribal life, and the final authoritative presentation of the results. The ethnographer has to traverse this distance in the laborious years between the moment when he sets foot upon a native beach, and makes his first attempts to get into touch with the natives. And the time when he writes down the final version of his results. A brief outline of an ethnographer's tribulations, as lived through by myself, 
may throw more light on the question than any long abstract discussion could do. 3. Imagine yourself suddenly set down surrounded by all your gear, alone on a tropical beach close to a native village, while the launch or dinghy which has brought you sails away out of sight. Since you take up your abode in the compound of some neighboring white man, trader or missionary, you have nothing to do, but to start at once on your ethnographic work. Imagine further that you are a beginner, without previous experience, with nothing to guide you and no one to help you. For the white man is temporarily absent, or else unable or unwilling to waste any of his time on you. This exactly describes my first initiation into field work on the south coast of New Guinea. I well remember the long visits I paid to the villages during the first weeks. The feeling of hopelessness and despair after many obstinate but futile attempts had entirely failed to bring me into real touch with the natives or supply me with any material. I had periods of despondency when I buried myself in the reading of novels, as a man might take to drink in a fit of tropical depression and boredom. Imagine yourself then, making your first entry into the village, alone or in company with your white Ciceroni. Some natives flock round you, especially if they smell tobacco. Others, the more dignified and elderly, remain seated where they are. Your white companion has his routine way of treating the natives, and he neither understands, nor is very much concerned with the manner in which you, as an ethnographer, will have to approach them. The first visit leaves you with a hopeful feeling that when you return alone, things will be easier. Such was my hope at least. I came back duly, and soon gathered an audience around me. A few compliments in pidgin English on both sides, some tobacco changing hands, induced an atmosphere of mutual amiability. I tried then to proceed to business. First, to begin with subjects which might arouse no suspicion, I started to do technology. A few natives were engaged in manufacturing some object or other. It was easy to look at it and obtain the names of the tools, and even some technical expressions about the proceedings, but there the matter ended. It must be borne in mind that pidgin English is a very imperfect instrument for expressing one's ideas. And that before one gets a good training in framing questions and understanding answers one has the uncomfortable feeling that free communication in it with the natives will never be attained. And I was quite unable to enter into any more detailed or explicit conversation with them at first. I knew well that the best remedy for this was to collect concrete data, and accordingly I took a village census, wrote down genealogies, drew up plans and collected the terms of kinship. But all this remained dead material, which led no further into the understanding of real native mentality or behavior, since I could neither procure a good native interpretation of any of these items. Nor get what could be called the hang of tribal life. As to obtaining their ideas about religion, and magic, their beliefs in sorcery and spirits, nothing was forthcoming except a few superficial items of folklore, mangled by being forced into pidgin English. Information which I received from some white residents in the district, valuable as it was in itself, was more discouraging than anything else with regard to my own work. Here were men who had lived for years in the place with constant opportunities of observing the natives and communicating with them, and who yet hardly knew one thing about them really well. How could I therefore in a few months or a year, hope to overtake and go beyond them? Moreover, the manner in which my white informants spoke about the natives and put their views was, naturally, that of untrained minds, unaccustomed to formulate their thoughts with any degree of consistency and precision. And they were for the most part, naturally enough, full of the biased and prejudged opinions inevitable in the average practical man, whether administrator, missionary, or trader yet so strongly repulsive to a mind striving after the objective, scientific view of things. The habit of treating with a self-satisfied frivolity what is really serious to the ethnographer. The cheap rating of what to him is a scientific treasure, that is to say, the native's cultural and mental peculiarities and independence, these features, so well known in the inferior amateur's writing. I found in the tone of the majority of white residents. Plate. I. The ethnographer's tent on the beach of New Agassi. This is illustrates the manner of life among the natives, described in. Note, with reference to and, the dugout log of a large canoe beside the tent, 
and the Misawa canoe, beached under palm leaves to the left. Plate. 2. The Chief's Lisiga, Personal Hut, in Omurakana. Tuolua, the present chief, is standing in front, cf, to the left, among the palms, is the ethnographer's tent, c, with a group of natives squatting in front of it. Plate. 3. Street of Kasanai, in Kiriwina, Trobriand Islands. An everyday scene, showing groups of people at their ordinary occupations. C. Plate. 4. Scene in Urawodu, Trobriands. A complex, but well-defined, act of a sagali, ceremonial distribution, is going on. There is a definite system of sociological, economic and ceremonial principles at the bottom of the apparently confused proceedings. C. Indeed, in my first piece of ethnographic research on the south coast, it was not until I was alone in the district that I began to make some headway, and, at any rate, I found out where lay the secret of effective fieldwork. What is then this ethnographer's magic, by which he is able to evoke the real spirit of the natives, the true picture of tribal life? As usual, success can only be obtained by a patient and systematic application of a number of rules of common sense and well-known scientific principles. And not by the discovery of any marvelous shortcut leading to the desired results without effort or trouble. The principles of method can be grouped under three main headings, first of all, naturally, the student must possess real scientific aims, and know the values and criteria of modern ethnography. Secondly, he ought to put himself in good conditions of work, that is, in the main, to live without other white men, right among the natives. Finally, he has to apply a number of special methods of collecting, manipulating and fixing his evidence. A few words must be said about these three foundation stones of fieldwork, beginning with the second as the most elementary. 4. Proper Conditions for Ethnographic Work These, as said, consist mainly in cutting oneself off from the company of other white men, and remaining in as close contact with the natives as possible, which really can only be achieved by camping right in their villages, see plates end. It is very nice to have a base in a white man's compound for the stores, and to know there is a refuge there in times of sickness and surfeit of native. But it must be far enough away not to become a permanent milieu in which you live and from which you emerge at fixed hours only to do the village. It should not even be near enough to fly to at any moment for recreation. For the native is not the natural companion for a white man, and after you have been working with him for several hours, seeing how he does his gardens, or letting him tell you items of folklore, or discussing his customs. You will naturally hanker after the company of your own kind. But if you are alone in a village beyond reach of this, you go for a solitary walk for an hour or so, return again and then quite naturally seek out the native society, this time as a relief from loneliness. Just as you would any other companionship. And by means of this natural intercourse, you learn to know him, and you become familiar with his customs and beliefs far better than when he is a paid, and often bored, informant. There is all the difference between a sporadic plunging into the company of natives, and being really in contact with them. What does this latter mean? On the ethnographer's side, it means that his life in the village, which at first is a strange, sometimes unpleasant, sometimes intensely interesting adventure, soon adopts quite a natural course very much in harmony with his surroundings. Soon after I had established myself in Omarkana, Trobriand Islands, I began to take part, in a way, in the village life, to look forward to the important or festive events. To take personal interest in the gossip and the developments of the small village occurrences. To wake up every morning to a day, presenting itself to me more or less as it does to the native. I would get out from under my mosquito net, to find around me the village life beginning to stir, or the people well advanced in their working day according to the hour and also to the season, for they get up and begin their labors early or late. As work presses. As I went on my morning walk through the village, I could see intimate details of family life, of toilet, cooking, taking of meals. I could see the arrangements for the day's work, people starting on their errands, or groups of men and women busy at some manufacturing tasks, see. Quarrels, jokes, 
family scenes, events usually trivial, sometimes dramatic but always significant, formed the atmosphere of my daily life, as well as of theirs. It must be remembered that as the natives saw me constantly every day, they ceased to be interested or alarmed, or made self-conscious by my presence, and I ceased to be a disturbing element in the tribal life which I was to study. Altering it by my very approach, as always happens with a newcomer to every savage community. In fact, as they knew that I would thrust my nose into everything, even where a well-mannered native would not dream of intruding, they finished by regarding me as part and parcel of their life, a necessary evil or nuisance. Mitigated by donations of tobacco. Later on in the day, whatever happened was within easy reach, and there was no possibility of its escaping my notice. Alarms about the sorcerer's approach in the evening, one or two big, really important quarrels and rifts within the community, cases of illness, attempted cures and deaths, magical rites which had to be performed, all these I had not to pursue. Fearful of missing them, but they took place under my very eyes, at my own doorstep, so to speak, see. And it must be emphasized whenever anything dramatic or important occurs it is essential to investigate it at the very moment of happening, because the natives cannot but talk about it, are too excited to be reticent. And too interested to be mentally lazy in supplying details. Also, over and over again, I committed breaches of etiquette, which the natives, familiar enough with me, were not slow in pointing out. I had to learn how to behave, and to a certain extent, I acquired, the feeling, for native good and bad manners. With this, and with the capacity of enjoying their company and sharing some of their games and amusements, I began to feel that I was indeed in touch with the natives. And this is certainly the preliminary condition of being able to carry on successful field work. V. But the ethnographer has not only to spread his nets in the right place, and wait for what will fall into them. He must be an active huntsman, and drive his quarry into them and follow it up to its most inaccessible lairs. And that leads us to the more active methods of pursuing ethnographic evidence. It has been mentioned at the end of that the ethnographer has to be inspired by the knowledge of the most modern results of scientific study, by its principles and aims. I shall not enlarge upon this subject, except by way of one remark, to avoid the possibility of misunderstanding. Good training in theory, and acquaintance with its latest results, is not identical with being burdened with preconceived ideas. If a man sets out on an expedition, determined to prove certain hypotheses, if he is incapable of changing his views constantly and casting them off ungrudgingly under the pressure of evidence, needless to say his work will be worthless. But the more problems he brings with him into the field, the more he is in the habit of molding his theories according to facts, and of seeing facts in their bearing upon theory, the better he is equipped for the work. Preconceived ideas are pernicious in any scientific work, but foreshadowed problems are the main endowment of a scientific thinker, and these problems are first revealed to the observer by his theoretical studies. In ethnology the early efforts of Bastian, Tyler, Morgan, the German Volker psychologian have remolded the older crude information of travelers, missionaries, etc. and have shown us the importance of applying deeper conceptions and discarding crude and misleading ones. The concept of animism superseded that of fetishism or devil worship, both meaningless terms. The understanding of the classificatory systems of relationship paved the way for the brilliant, modern researches on native sociology in the fieldwork of the Cambridge School. The psychological analysis of the German thinkers has brought forth an abundant crop of most valuable information in the results obtained by the recent German expeditions to Africa, South America, and the Pacific. While the theoretical works of Fraser, Durkheim and others have already, and will no doubt still for a long time inspire field workers and lead them to new results. The field worker relies entirely upon inspiration from theory. Of course he may be also a theoretical thinker and worker, and there he can draw on himself for stimulus. But the two functions are separate, and in actual research they have to be separated both in time and conditions of work. As always happens when scientific interest turns towards and begins to labor on a field so far only prospected by the curiosity of amateurs, ethnology has introduced law and order into what seemed chaotic and freakish. It has transformed for us the sensational, 
wild and unaccountable world of savages into a number of well-ordered communities, governed by law, behaving and thinking according to consistent principles. The word savage, whatever association it might have had originally, connotes ideas of boundless liberty, of irregularity, of something extremely and extraordinarily quaint. In popular thinking, we imagine that the natives live on the bosom of nature, more or less as they can and like, the prey of irregular, phantasmagoric beliefs and apprehensions. Modern science, on the contrary, shows that their social institutions have a very definite organization, that they are governed by authority, law and order in their public and personal relations, while the latter are, besides, under the control of extremely complex ties of kinship and clanship. Indeed, we see them entangled in a mesh of duties, functions and privileges which correspond to an elaborate tribal, communal and kinship organization, c. Their beliefs and practices do not by any means lack consistency of a certain type, and their knowledge of the outer world is sufficient to guide them in many of their strenuous enterprises and activities. Their artistic productions again lack neither meaning nor beauty. It is a very far cry from the famous answer given long ago by a representative authority who, asked, what are the manners and customs of the natives, answered, customs none, manners beastly, to the position of the modern ethnographer. This latter, with his tables of kinship terms, genealogies, maps, plans and diagrams, proves an extensive and big organization, shows the constitution of the tribe, of the clan, of the family. And he gives us a picture of the native subjected to a strict code of behavior and good manners, to which in comparison the life at the court of Versailles or Escurial was free and easy. Thus the first and basic ideal of ethnographic fieldwork is to give a clear and firm outline of the social constitution, and disentangle the laws and regularities of all cultural phenomena from the irrelevances. The firm skeleton of the tribal life has to be first ascertained. This ideal imposes in the first place the fundamental obligation of giving a complete survey of the phenomena, and not of picking out the sensational, the singular, still less the funny and quaint. The time when we could tolerate accounts presenting us the native as a distorted, childish caricature of a human being are gone. This picture is false, and like many other falsehoods, it has been killed by science. The field ethnographer has seriously and soberly to cover the full extent of the phenomena in each aspect of tribal culture studied, making no difference between what is commonplace, or drab, or ordinary. And what strikes him as astonishing and out of the way. At the same time, the whole area of tribal culture in all its aspects has to be gone over in research. The consistency, the law and order which obtain within each aspect make also for joining them into one coherent whole. An ethnographer who sets out to study only religion, or only technology, or only social organization cuts out an artificial field for inquiry, and he will be seriously handicapped in his work. 6. Having settled this very general rule, let us descend to more detailed consideration of method. The ethnographer has in the field, according to what has just been said, the duty before him of drawing up all the rules and regularities of tribal life, all that is permanent and fixed. Of giving an anatomy of their culture, of depicting the constitution of their society. But these things, though crystallized and set, are nowhere formulated. There is no written or explicitly expressed code of laws, and their whole tribal tradition, the whole structure of their society, are embodied in the most elusive of all materials, the human being. But not even in human mind or memory are these laws to be found definitely formulated. The natives obey the forces and commands of the tribal code, but they do not comprehend them. Exactly as they obey their instincts and their impulses, but could not lay down a single law of psychology. The regularities in native institutions are an automatic result of the interaction of the mental forces of tradition, and of the material conditions of environment. Exactly as a humble member of any modern institution, whether it be the state, or the church, or the army, is of it and in it, but has no vision of the resulting integral action of the whole, still less could furnish any account of its organization. So it would be futile to attempt questioning a native in abstract, sociological terms. The difference is that, in our society, every institution has its intelligent members, its historians, and its archives and documents, whereas in a native society there are none of these. 
After this is realized an expedient has to be found to overcome this difficulty. This expedient for an ethnographer consists in collecting concrete data of evidence and drawing the general inferences for himself. This seems obvious on the face of it, but was not found out or at least practiced in ethnography till field work was taken up by men of science. Moreover, in giving it practical effect, it is neither easy to devise the concrete applications of this method, nor to carry them out systematically and consistently. Though we cannot ask a native about abstract, general rules, we can always inquire how a given case would be treated. Thus for instance, in asking how they would treat crime, or punish it, it would be vain to put to a native a sweeping question such as, how do you treat and punish a criminal? For even words could not be found to express it in native, or in pigeon. But an imaginary case, or still better, a real occurrence, will stimulate a native to express his opinion and to supply plentiful information. A real case indeed will start the natives on a wave of discussion, evoke expressions of indignation, show them taking sides, all of which talk will probably contain a wealth of definite views, of moral censures. As well as reveal the social mechanism set in motion by the crime committed. From there, it will be easy to lead them on to speak of other similar cases, to remember other actual occurrences or to discuss them in all their implications and aspects. From this material, which ought to cover the widest possible range of facts, the inference is obtained by simple induction. The scientific treatment differs from that of good common sense, first in that a student will extend the completeness and minuteness of survey much further and in a pedantically systematic and methodical manner. And secondly, in that the scientifically trained mind will push the inquiry along really relevant lines and towards aims possessing real importance. Indeed, the object of scientific training is to provide the empirical investigator with a mental chart, in accordance with which he can take his bearings and lay his course. To return to our example, a number of definite cases discussed will reveal to the ethnographer the social machinery for punishment. This is one part, one aspect of tribal authority. Imagine further that by a similar method of inference from definite data, he arrives at understanding leadership in war, in economic enterprise. In tribal festivities, there he has at once all the data necessary to answer the questions about tribal government and social authority. In actual field work, the comparison of such data, the attempt to piece them together, will often reveal rifts and gaps in the information which lead on to further investigations. From my own experience, I can say that, very often, a problem seemed settled, everything fixed and clear, till I began to write down a short preliminary sketch of my results. And only then, did I see the enormous deficiencies, which would show me where lay new problems, and lead me on to new work. In fact, I spent a few months between my first and second expeditions, and over a year between that and the subsequent one, in going over all my material, and making parts of it almost ready for publication each time. Though each time I knew I would have to rewrite it. Such cross-fertilization of constructive work and observation, I found most valuable, and I do not think I could have made real headway without it. I give this bit of my own history merely to show that what has been said so far is not only an empty program, but the result of personal experience. In this volume, the description is given of a big institution connected with ever so many associated activities, and presenting many aspects. To anyone who reflects on the subject, it will be clear that the information about a phenomenon of such high complexity and of so many ramifications, could not be obtained with any degree of exactitude and completeness. Without a constant interplay of constructive attempts and empirical checking. In fact, I have written up an outline of the Kula Institution at least half a dozen times while in the field and in the intervals between my expeditions. Each time, new problems and difficulties presented themselves. The collecting of concrete data over a wide range of facts is thus one of the main points of field method. The obligation is not to enumerate a few examples only, but to exhaust as far as possible all the cases within reach. And, on this search for cases, the investigator will score most whose mental chart is clearest. But, whenever the material of the search allows it, this mental chart ought to be transformed into a real one. It ought to materialize into a diagram, a plan, an exhaustive, synoptic table of cases. 
Long since, in all tolerably good modern books on natives, we expect to find a full list or table of kinship terms, which includes all the data relative to it, and does not just pick out a few strange and anomalous relationships or expressions. In the investigation of kinship, the following up of one relation after another in concrete cases leads naturally to the construction of genealogical tables. Practiced already by the best early writers, such as Munzinger, and, if I remember rightly, Kubery, this method has been developed to its fullest extent in the works of Dr. Rivers. Again, studying the concrete data of economic transactions, in order to trace the history of a valuable object, and to gauge the nature of its circulation. The principle of completeness and thoroughness would lead to construct tables of transactions, such as we find in the work of Professor Seligman. It is in following Professor Seligman's example in this matter that I was able to settle certain of the more difficult and detailed rules of the Kula. The method of reducing information, if possible, into charts or synoptic tables ought to be extended to the study of practically all aspects of native life. All types of economic transactions may be studied by following up connected, actual cases, and putting them into a synoptic chart. Again, a table ought to be drawn up of all the gifts and presents customary in a given society, a table including the sociological, ceremonial, and economic definition of every item. Also, systems of magic, connected series of ceremonies, types of legal acts, all could be charted, allowing each entry to be synoptically defined under a number of headings. Besides this, of course, the genealogical census of every community, studied more in detail, extensive maps, plans and diagrams, illustrating ownership in garden land, hunting and fishing privileges, etc. Serve as the more fundamental documents of ethnographic research. A genealogy is nothing else but a synoptic chart of a number of connected relations of kinship. Its value as an instrument of research consists in that it allows the investigator to put questions which he formulates to himself in abstracto, but can put concretely to the native informant. As a document, its value consists in that it gives a number of authenticated data, presented in their natural grouping. A synoptic chart of magic fulfills the same function. As an instrument of research, I have used it in order to ascertain, for instance, the ideas about the nature of magical power. With a chart before me, I could easily and conveniently go over one item after the other, and note down the relevant practices and beliefs contained in each of them. The answer to my abstract problem could then be obtained by drawing a general inference from all the cases, and the procedure is illustrated in chapters and. I cannot enter further into the discussion of this question, which would need further distinctions, such as between a chart of concrete, actual data, such as is a genealogy, and a chart summarizing the outlines of a custom or belief. As a chart of a magical system would be. Returning once more to the question of methodological candor, discussed previously and I wish to point out here, that the procedure of concrete and tabularized presentation of data ought to be applied first to the ethnographer's own credentials. That is, an ethnographer, who wishes to be trusted, must show clearly and concisely, in a tabularized form, which are his own direct observations, and which the indirect information that form the basis of his account. The table on the next page will serve as an example of this procedure and help the reader of this book to form an idea of the trustworthiness of any statement he is specially anxious to check. With the help of this table and the many references scattered throughout the text, as to how, under what circumstances, and with what degree of accuracy I arrived at a given item of knowledge, there will. I hope remain no obscurity whatever as to the sources of the book. Chronological list of Kula events witnessed by the writer. First Expedition, August, 1914, March. 1915. March, 1915. In the village of Dicoyas, Woodlark Island, A. Few ceremonial offerings seen. Preliminary information obtained. Second Expedition, May, 1915, May. 1916. June, 1915. A Kabajidoya visit arrives from Bakutatu. Kiriwina. It's anchoring at Kavateria witnessed and the men seen at. Omurakana, where information collected. July, 1915. 
several parties from Kideva land on the beach of Kalakuba. The men examined in Omurakana. Much information collected in that period. September, 1915. Unsuccessful attempt to sail to Kideva with Tuolua, the chief of Omurakana. October, November, 1915. Departure noticed of three. Expeditions from Kirawina to Kideva. Each time Tuolua brings. Home a hall of Mwali, arms hells. November, 1915, March, 1916. Preparations for a. Big overseas expedition from Kirawina to the Marshall Bennett Islands. Construction of a canoe, renovating of another, sail making in. Omurakana, launching, Tassasoria on the beach of. Kalakuba. At the same time, information is being obtained about these. And the associated subjects. Some magical texts of canoe building and. Kula magic obtained. Third Expedition, October. 1917 October, 1918. November, 1917 December, 1917. Inland Kula. Some data obtained in Tequaqua. December, February, 1918. Parties from Kideva arrive in. Wawela. Collection of information about the Yoyova. Magic and spells of Kega obtained. March, 1918. Preparations in Sanaroa, preparations in the. Amphlets. The Dabuan fleet arrives in the Amphlets. The Uvaliku expedition from Dobu followed to Boyawa. April, 1918. Their arrival, their reception in Sinekita, the Kula transactions, the big intertribal gathering. Some magical formulae obtained. May, 1918. Party from Kideva seen in Vakuta. June, July, 1918. Information about Kula magic and customs. Checked and amplified in Omurakana, especially with regard to its Eastern branches. August, September, 1918. Magical texts obtained in Sinekita. October, 1918. Information obtained from a number of natives. In Dobu and southern Ma Sim district, examined in Samurai. To summarize the first, cardinal point of method, I may say each phenomenon ought to be studied through the broadest range possible of its concrete manifestations, each studied by an exhaustive survey of detailed examples. If possible, the results ought to be embodied into some sort of synoptic chart, both to be used as an instrument of study, and to be presented as an ethnological document. With the help of such documents and such study of actualities the clear outline of the framework of the natives' culture in the widest sense of the word, and the constitution of their society, can be presented. This method could be called the method of statistic documentation by concrete evidence. 7. Needless to add, in this respect, the scientific fieldwork is far above even the best amateur productions. There is, however, one point in which the latter often excel. This is, in the presentation of intimate touches of native life, in bringing home to us these aspects of it with which one is made familiar only through being in close contact with the natives, one way or the other, for a long period of time. In certain results of scientific work, especially that which has been called survey work, we are given an excellent skeleton, so to speak, of the tribal constitution, but it lacks flesh and blood. We learn much about the framework of their society, but within it, we cannot perceive or imagine the realities of human life, the even flow of everyday events, the occasional ripples of excitement over a feast, or ceremony, or some singular occurrence. In working out the rules and regularities of native custom, and in obtaining a precise formula for them from the collection of data and native statements, we find that this very precision is foreign to real life, which never adheres rigidly to any rules. It must be supplemented by the observation of the manner in which a given custom is carried out, of the behavior of the natives in obeying the rules so exactly formulated by the ethnographer. 
of the very exceptions which in sociological phenomena almost always occur. If all the conclusions are solely based on the statements of informants, or deduced from objective documents, it is of course impossible to supplement them in actually observed data of real behavior. And that is the reason why certain works of amateur residents of long standing, such as educated traders and planters, medical men and officials, and last, not least, of the few intelligent and unbiased missionaries to whom ethnography owes so much, this is the reason why these works surpass in plasticity and in vividness most of the purely scientific accounts. But if the specialized field worker can adopt the conditions of living described above, he is in a far better position to be really in touch with the natives than any other white resident. For none of them lives right in a native village, except for very short periods, and everyone has his own business, which takes up a considerable part of his time. Moreover, if, like a trader or a missionary or an official he enters into active relations with the native, if he has to transform or influence or make use of him, this makes a real, unbiased, impartial observation impossible. And precludes all-round sincerity, at least in the case of the missionaries and officials. Living in the village with no other business but to follow native life, one sees the customs, ceremonies and transactions over and over again, one has examples of their beliefs as they are actually lived through. And the full body and blood of actual native life fills out soon the skeleton of abstract constructions. That is the reason why, working under such conditions as previously described, the ethnographer is enabled to add something essential to the bare outline of tribal constitution, and to supplement it by all the details of behavior. Setting and Small Incident He is able in each case to state whether an act is public or private, how a public assembly behaves, and what it looks like, he can judge whether an event is ordinary or an exciting and singular one. Whether natives bring to it a great deal of sincere and earnest spirit, or perform it in fun, whether they do it in a perfunctory manner, or with zeal and deliberation. In other words, there is a series of phenomena of great importance which cannot possibly be recorded by questioning or computing documents, but have to be observed in their full actuality. Let us call them the imponderabilia of actual life. Here belong such things as the routine of a man's working day, the details of his care of the body, of the manner of taking food and preparing it. The tone of conversational and social life around the village fires, the existence of strong friendships or hostilities, and of passing sympathies and dislikes between people. The subtle yet unmistakable manner in which personal vanities and ambitions are reflected in the behavior of the individual and in the emotional reactions of those who surround him. All these facts can and ought to be scientifically formulated and recorded, but it is necessary that this be done, not by a superficial registration of details, as is usually done by untrained observers but with an effort at penetrating the mental attitude expressed in them. And that is the reason why the work of scientifically trained observers, once seriously applied to the study of this aspect, will, I believe, yield results of surpassing value. So far, it has been done only by amateurs, and therefore done, on the whole, indifferently. Indeed, if we remember that these imponderable yet all-important facts of actual life are part of the real substance of the social fabric, that in them are spun the innumerable threads which keep together the family, the clan, the village community. The tribe, their significance becomes clear. The more crystallized bonds of social grouping, such as the definite ritual, the economic and legal duties, the obligations, the ceremonial gifts and formal marks of regard, though equally important for the student, are certainly felt less strongly by the individual who has to fulfill them. Applying this to ourselves, we all know that, family life, means for us, first and foremost, the atmosphere of home, all the innumerable small acts and attentions in which are expressed the affection, the mutual interest, the little preferences, and the little antipathies which constitute intimacy. That we may inherit from this person, that we shall have to walk after the hearse of the other, though sociologically these facts belong to the definition of, family, and, family life, in personal perspective of what family truly is to us. They normally stand very much in the background. Exactly the same applies to a native community, and if the ethnographer wants to bring their real life home to his readers, he must on no account neglect this. 
neither aspect, the intimate, as little as the legal, ought to be glossed over. Yet as a rule in ethnographic accounts we have not both but either the one or the other, and, so far, the intimate one has hardly ever been properly treated. In all social relations besides the family ties, even those between mere tribesmen and, beyond that, between hostile or friendly members of different tribes, meeting on any sort of social business, there is this intimate side. Expressed by the typical details of intercourse, the tone of their behavior in the presence of one another. This side is different from the definite, crystallized legal frame of the relationship, and it has to be studied and stated in its own right. In the same way, in studying the conspicuous acts of tribal life, such as ceremonies, rites, festivities, etc., the details and tone of behavior ought to be given, besides the bare outline of events. The importance of this may be exemplified by one instance. Much has been said and written about survival. Yet the survival character of an act is expressed in nothing as well as in the concomitant behavior, in the way in which it is carried out. Take any example from our own culture, whether it be the pomp and pageantry of a state ceremony, or a picturesque custom kept up by street urchins. Its outline will not tell you whether the rite flourishes still with full vigor in the hearts of those who perform it or assist at the performance or whether they regard it as almost a dead thing, kept alive for tradition's sake. But observe and fix the data of their behavior, and at once the degree of vitality of the act will become clear. There is no doubt, from all points of sociological or psychological analysis, and in any question of theory, the manner and type of behavior observed in the performance of an act is of the highest importance. Indeed behavior is a fact, a relevant fact, and one that can be recorded. And foolish indeed and short-sighted would be the man of science who would pass by a whole class of phenomena, ready to be garnered, and leave them to waste, even though he did not see at the moment to what theoretical use they might be put. As to the actual method of observing and recording in fieldwork these imponderabilia of actual life and of typical behavior, there is no doubt that the personal equation of the observer comes in here more prominently. Then in the collection of crystallized, ethnographic data. But here also the main endeavor must be to let facts speak for themselves. If in making a daily round of the village, certain small incidents, characteristic forms of taking food, of conversing, of doing work, see for instance, are found occurring over and over again, they should be noted down at once. It is also important that this work of collecting and fixing impressions should begin early in the course of working out a district. Because certain subtle peculiarities, which make an impression as long as they are novel, cease to be noticed as soon as they become familiar. Others again can only be perceived with a better knowledge of the local conditions. An ethnographic diary, carried on systematically throughout the course of one's work in a district would be the ideal instrument for this sort of study. And if, side by side with the normal and typical, the ethnographer carefully notes the slight, or the more pronounced deviations from it, he will be able to indicate the two extremes within which the normal moves. In observing ceremonies or other tribal events, such, for instance as the scene depicted in, it is necessary, not only to note down those occurrences and details which are prescribed by tradition and custom to be the essential course of the act. But also the ethnographer ought to record carefully and precisely, one after the other, the actions of the actors and of the spectators. Forgetting for a moment that he knows and understands the structure of this ceremony, the main dogmatic ideas underlying it, he might try to find himself only in the midst of an assembly of human beings, who behave seriously or jocularly. With earnest concentration or with bored frivolity, who are either in the same mood as he finds them every day, or else are screwed up to a high pitch of excitement, and so on and so on. With his attention constantly directed to this aspect of tribal life, with the constant endeavor to fix it, to express it in terms of actual fact, a good deal of reliable and expressive material finds its way into his notes. He will be able to set the act into its proper place in tribal life that is to show whether it is exceptional or commonplace, one in which the natives behave ordinarily, or one in which their whole behavior is transformed. And he will also be able to bring all this home to his readers in a clear, convincing manner. Again, in this type of work, it is good for the ethnographer sometimes to put aside camera, notebook and pencil, 
and to join in himself in what is going on. He can take part in the natives' games, he can follow them on their visits and walks, sit down and listen and share in their conversations. I am not certain if this is equally easy for everyone, perhaps the Slavonic nature is more plastic and more naturally savage than that of Western Europeans, but though the degree of success varies, the attempt is possible for everyone. Out of such plunges into the life of the natives, and I made them frequently not only for study's sake but because everyone needs human company, I have carried away a distinct feeling that their behavior, their manner of being, in all sorts of tribal transactions, became more transparent and easily understandable than it had been before. All these methodological remarks, the reader will find again illustrated in the following chapters. 8. Finally, let us pass to the third and last aim of scientific fieldwork, to the last type of phenomenon which ought to be recorded in order to give a full and adequate picture of native culture. Besides the firm outline of tribal constitution and crystallized cultural items which form the skeleton, besides the data of daily life and ordinary behavior, which are, so to speak, its flesh and blood, there is still to be recorded the spirit, the natives' views and opinions and utterances. For, in every act of tribal life, there is, first, the routine prescribed by custom and tradition, then there is the manner in which it is carried out, and lastly there is the commentary to it, contained in the native's mind. A man who submits to various customary obligations, who follows a traditional course of action, does it impelled by certain motives, to the accompaniment of certain feelings, guided by certain ideas. These ideas, feelings, and impulses are molded and conditioned by the culture in which we find them, and are therefore an ethnic peculiarity of the given society. An attempt must be made therefore, to study and record them. But is this possible? Are these subjective states not too elusive and shapeless? And, even granted that people usually do feel or think or experience certain psychological states in association with the performance of customary acts, the majority of them surely are not able to formulate these states, to put them into words. This latter point must certainly be granted, and it is perhaps the real Gordian knot in the study of the facts of social psychology. Without trying to cut or untie this knot, that is to solve the problem theoretically, or to enter further into the field of general methodology, I shall make directly for the question of practical means to overcome some of the difficulties involved. First of all, it has to be laid down that we have to study here stereotyped manners of thinking and feeling. As sociologists, we are not interested in what A or B may feel qua individuals, in the accidental course of their own personal experiences, we are interested only in what they feel and think qua members of a given community. Now in this capacity, their mental states receive a certain stamp, become stereotyped by the institutions in which they live, by the influence of tradition and folklore, by the very vehicle of thought, that is by language. The social and cultural environment in which they move forces them to think and feel in a definite manner. Thus, a man who lives in a polyandrous community cannot experience the same feelings of jealousy, as a strict monogenist, though he might have the elements of them. A man who lives within the sphere of the Kula cannot become permanently and sentimentally attached to certain of his possessions, in spite of the fact that he values them most of all. These examples are crude, but better ones will be found in the text of this book. So, the third commandment of fieldwork runs, find out the typical ways of thinking and feeling, corresponding to the institutions and culture of a given community, and formulate the results in the most convincing manner. What will be the method of procedure? The best ethnographical writers, here again the Cambridge School with Haddon, Rivers, and Seligman rank first among English ethnographers, have always tried to quote verbatim statements of crucial importance. They also adduce terms of native classification, sociological, psychological and industrial termini technici, and have rendered the verbal contour of native thought as precisely as possible. One step further in this line can be made by the ethnographer, who acquires a knowledge of the native language and can use it as an instrument of inquiry. In working in the Kirawinian language, I found still some difficulty in writing down the statement directly in translation which at first I used to do in the act of taking notes. The translation often robbed the text of all its significant characteristics, rubbed off all its points, 
so that gradually I was led to note down certain important phrases just as they were spoken, in the native tongue. As my knowledge of the language progressed, I put down more and more in Kirawinian, till at last I found myself writing exclusively in that language, rapidly taking notes, word for word, of each statement. No sooner had I arrived at this point, than I recognized that I was thus acquiring at the same time an abundant linguistic material, and a series of ethnographic documents which ought to be reproduced as I had fixed them. Besides being utilized in the writing up of my account. This corpus inscriptionum Kirawiniensium can be utilized, not only by myself, but by all those who, through their better penetration and ability of interpreting them, may find points which escape my attention. Very much as the other corpora form the basis for the various interpretations of ancient and prehistoric cultures. Only, these ethnographic inscriptions are all decipherable and clear, have been almost all translated fully and unambiguously, and have been provided with native cross-commentaries or scolia obtained from living sources. No more need be said on this subject here, as later on a whole chapter, is devoted to it, and to its exemplification by several native texts. The corpus will of course be published separately at a later date. 9. Our considerations thus indicate that the goal of ethnographic fieldwork must be approached through three avenues. 1. The organization of the tribe, and the anatomy of its culture must be recorded in firm, clear outline. The method of concrete, statistical documentation is the means through which such an outline has to be given. 2. Within this frame, the imponderabilia of actual life, and the type of behavior have to be filled in. They have to be collected through minute, detailed observations, in the form of some sort of ethnographic diary, made possible by close contact with native life. 3. A collection of ethnographic statements, characteristic narratives, typical utterances, items of folklore and magical formulae has to be given as a corpus inscriptionum, as documents of native mentality. These three lines of approach lead to the final goal, of which an ethnographer should never lose sight. This goal is, briefly, to grasp the native's point of view, his relation to life, to realize his vision of his world. We have to study man, and we must study what concerns him most intimately, that is, the hold which life has on him. In each culture, the values are slightly different. People aspire after different aims, follow different impulses, yearn after a different form of happiness. In each culture, we find different institutions in which man pursues his life interest, different customs by which he satisfies his aspirations, different codes of law and morality which reward his virtues or punish his defections. To study the institutions, customs, and codes or to study the behavior and mentality without the subjective desire of feeling by what these people live, of realizing the substance of their happiness, is, in my opinion, to miss the greatest reward which we can hope to obtain from the study of man. These generalities the reader will find illustrated in the following chapters. We shall see there the savage striving to satisfy certain aspirations, to attain his type of value, to follow his line of social ambition. We shall see him led on to perilous and difficult enterprises by a tradition of magical and heroical exploits, shall see him following the lure of his own romance. Perhaps as we read the account of these remote customs there may emerge a feeling of solidarity with the endeavors and ambitions of these natives. Perhaps man's mentality will be revealed to us, and brought near, along some lines which we never have followed before. Perhaps through realizing human nature in a shape very distant and foreign to us, we shall have some light shed on our own. In this, and in this case only, we shall be justified in feeling that it has been worth our while to understand these natives, their institutions and customs, and that we have gathered some profit from the Kula. Map 2, diagram showing the geographical area of the Ma Sim and its relation to the districts inhabited by W. Papuo Melanesians and by Papuans. Reproduced from the Melanesians of British New Guinea, by kind permission of Professor C. G. Seligman. The Hiri, as these expeditions are called in Matuan, have been described with a great wealth of detail and clearness of outline by Captain F. Barton, in C. G. Seligman's The Melanesians of British New Guinea, Cambridge, 1910, Chapter 8. C. F. 
The Milu, by B. Malinowski, in Transactions of the R. Society of S. Australia, 1915, Chapter 4. 4, pages 612 to 629. Opposite Chapter 40. On this point of method again, we are indebted to the Cambridge School of Anthropology for having introduced the really scientific way of dealing with the question. More especially in the writings of Haddon, Rivers and Seligman, the distinction between inference and observation is always clearly drawn, and we can visualize with perfect precision the conditions under which the work was done. I may note at once that there were a few delightful exceptions to that, to mention only my friends Billy Hancock in the Trobriands, M. Raffle Bruto, another pearl trader, and the missionary, Mr. M. K. Gilmore. According to a useful habit of the terminology of science, I use the word ethnography for the empirical and descriptive results of the science of man, and the word ethnology for speculative and comparative theories. The legendary, early authority, who found the natives only beastly and without customs is left behind by a modern writer, speaking about the southern Masim with whom he lived and worked, in close contact, for many years. Says. We teach lawless men to become obedient, inhuman men to love, and savage men to change. And again, guided in his conduct by nothing but his instincts and propensities, and governed by his unchecked passions. Lawless, inhuman and savage. A grosser misstatement of the real state of things could not be invented by anyone wishing to parody the missionary point of view. Quoted from the Rev. C. W. Abel, of the London Missionary Society, Savage Life in New Guinea, No Date. For instance, the tables of circulation of the valuable axe blades, op sit, pages 531, 532. In this book, besides the adjoining table, which does not strictly belong to the class of document of which I speak here, the reader will find only a few samples of synoptic tables, such as the list of Kula partners mentioned and analyzed in. The list of gifts and presents in, not tabularized, only described. The synoptic data of a Kula expedition in, and the table of Kula magic given in. Here, I have not wanted to overload the account with charts, etc., preferring to reserve them till the full publication of my material. It was soon after I had adopted this course that I received a letter from Dr. A. H. Gardiner, the well-known Egyptologist, urging me to do this very thing. From his point of view as archaeologist, he naturally saw the enormous possibilities for an ethnographer of obtaining a similar body of written sources as have been preserved to us from ancient cultures plus the possibility of illuminating them by personal knowledge of the full life of that culture. Chapter 1. The Country and Inhabitants of the Kula District. I. The tribes who live within the sphere of the Kula system of trading belong, one and all, with the exception perhaps, of the Rossel Island natives. Of whom we know next to nothing, to the same racial group. These tribes inhabit the easternmost end of the mainland of New Guinea and those islands, scattered in the form of the long-drawn archipelago, which continue in the same southeasternly trend as the mainland. As if to bridge over the gap between New Guinea and the Solomons. New Guinea is a mountainous island continent, very difficult of access in its interior, and also at certain portions of the coast, where barrier reefs, swamps and rocks practically prevent landing or even approach for native craft. Such a country would obviously not offer the same opportunities in all its parts to the drifting migrations which in all probability are responsible for the composition of the present population of the South Seas. The easily accessible portions of the coast and the outlying islands would certainly offer a hospitable reception to immigrants of a higher stock. But, on the other hand, the high hills, the impregnable fastnesses in swampy flats and shores where landing was difficult and dangerous, would give easy protection to the aborigines, and discourage the influx of migrators. The actual distribution of races in New Guinea completely justifies these hypotheses. Shows the eastern part of the main island and archipelagos of New Guinea and the racial distribution of the natives. The interior of the continent, the low Sago swamps and deltas of the Gulf of Papua, probably the greater part of the north coast and of the southwest coast of New Guinea, are inhabited by a relatively tall, dark-skinned, frizzly-haired race. Called by Dyar. 
Seligman Papuan, and in the hills more especially by pygmy tribes. We know little about these people, swamp tribes and hill tribes alike, who probably are the autochthons in this part of the world. As we shall also not meet them in the following account, it will be better to pass to the tribes who inhabit the accessible parts of New Guinea. The eastern Papuasians, that is, the generally smaller, lighter colored, frizzly haired races of the eastern peninsula of New Guinea and its archipelagos now require a name, and since the true Melanesian element is dominant in them, they may be called Papuo Melanesians. With regard to these eastern Papuasians, Dr. C. Haddon first recognized that they came into the country as the result of a Melanesian migration into New Guinea, and further, that a single wandering would not account for certain puzzling facts. The Papuo Melanesians again can be divided into two groups, a western and an eastern one, which, following Dr. Seligman's terminology, we shall call the western Papuo Melanesians and the Maasim respectively. It is with these latter we shall become acquainted in the following pages. If we glance at a map and follow the orographical features of eastern New Guinea and its coastline, we see at once that the high main range of mountains drops off between the 149th and 150th meridians. And again that the fringing reef disappears at the same point, that is, at the west end of Orangery Bay. This means that the extreme east end of New Guinea, with its archipelagos, in other words, the Maasim country, is the most easily accessible area, and might be expected to be inhabited by a homogeneous stock of people consisting of immigrants almost unmixed with the autochthons, cf. Indeed, while the condition actually existing in the Maasim area suggests that there was no slow mingling of the invaders with a previous stock, the geographical features of the territory of the western Papuo Melanesians with its hills, mountains and swamps, are such that invaders could not have speedily overrun the country, nor failed to have been influenced by the original inhabitants. I shall assume that the reader is acquainted with the quoted work of Dr. Seligman, where a thorough account is given of all the main types of Papuo-Melanesian sociology and culture one after the other. But the tribes of the eastern Papuo-Melanesian or Maasim area, must be described here somewhat more in detail, as it is within this fairly homogeneous area that the Kula takes place. Indeed, the Kula sphere of influence and the ethnographic area of the Maasim tribes almost completely overlap, and we can speak about the Kula type of culture and the Maasim culture almost synonymously. 2. The adjacent shows the Kula district, that is, the easternmost end of the main island and the archipelagos lying to its east and northeast. As Professor C. G. Seligman says, this area can be divided into two parts, a small northern portion comprising the Trobrians, the Marshall Bennets, the Woodlarks, Muroa, as well as a number of smaller islands such as the Loglands, Nada, and a far larger southern portion comprising the remainder of the Maasim domain, Op. Sit, page 7. This division is represented on by the thick line isolating to the north the Amphlets, the Trobrians, the small Marshall Bennet group, Woodlark Island, and the Loglin Group. The southern portion, I found convenient to divide further into two divisions by a vertical line, leaving to the East Masima, Sudest Island, and Rossell Island. As our information about this district is extremely scanty, I have preferred to exclude it from the area of the southern Masim. In this excluded area, only the natives of Masima enter into the Kula, but their participation will play a very small part only in the following account. The western segment, and this is the part of which we shall speak as the district of the southern Maasim, comprises first the east end of the mainland, the few adjacent islands, Sariba, Roje, Saide, and Basilaki. To the south, the island of Wari, to the east the important, though small archipelago of Tube Tube, Engineer Group, and to the north, the big archipelago of the D'Entrecastos Islands. From this latter, only one district, that of Dobu, interests us more specially. The culturally homogeneous tribes of the southern Maasim have been marked off on our map as District V, the Dubans as District 4. Map 3, the Kula District. Sketch map, showing the subdivisions of the Maasim and the principal places of importance in the Kula. Returning to the two main divisions into the southern and northern portion, this latter is occupied by a very homogeneous population, 
homogeneous both in language and culture, and in the clear recognition of their own ethnic unity. To quote further Professor Seligman, it is characterized by the absence of cannibalism, which, until put down by the government, existed throughout the remaining portion of the district. Another peculiarity of the northern Ma Sim is their recognition, in certain districts, though not in all, of chieftains who wield extensive powers, opposite page 7. The natives of that northern area used to practice, I say used because wars are a thing of the past, a type of warfare open and chivalrous, very different from the raids of the southern Ma Sim. Their villages are built in big compact blocks, and they have storehouses on piles for storing food, distinct from their rather miserable dwellings, which stand directly on the ground and are not raised on piles. As can be seen on the map, it has been necessary to subdivide this northern Ma Sim further into three groups, first, that of the Trobriand Islanders, or the Boyans, the western branch. Secondly that of the natives of Woodlark Island and the Marshall Bennets, the eastern branch, and, thirdly, the small group of the Amphlet natives. The other big subdivision of the Kula tribes is composed of the southern Ma Sim, of which, as just said, the western branch mainly concerns us. These last natives are smaller in stature, and with, broadly speaking, a much less attractive appearance than those of the north. They live in widely scattered communities, each house or group of houses standing in its own little grove of palm and fruit trees, apart from the others. Formerly they were cannibals and headhunters, and used to make unexpected raids on their adversaries. There is no chieftainship, authority being exercised by the elders in each community. They build very elaborately constructed and beautifully decorated houses on piles. I have found it necessary for the purpose of this study to cut out of the western branch of the southern portion of the Ma Sim the two areas, marked 4 and V on there, as they are of special importance to the Kula. It must, however, be borne in mind that our present knowledge does not allow of any final classification of the southern Ma Sim. Such are the general characteristics of the northern and southern Ma Sim respectively, given in a few words. But before proceeding with our subject, it will be good to give a short but more detailed sketch of each of these tribes. I shall begin with the southernmost section, following the order in which a visitor, traveling from Port Moresby with the mail boat, would come in contact with these districts, the way indeed in which I received my first impressions of them. My personal knowledge of the various tribes is, however, very uneven, based on a long residence among the Trobriand Islanders, District I, on a month's study of the Amphlets, District Three. On a few weeks spent in Woodlark Island or Murua, District 2, the neighborhood of Samurai, District V, and the south coast of New Guinea, also V, and on three short visits to Dobu, District 4. My knowledge of some of the remaining localities which enter into the Kula is derived only from a few conversations I had with natives of this district, and on second-hand information derived from white residents. The work of Professor C. G. Seligman, however, supplements my personal acquaintance in so far as the districts of Tube Tube, Woodlark Island, the Marshall Bennets, and several others are concerned. The whole account of the Kula will therefore naturally be given from the perspective, so to speak, of the Trobriand district. This district is often called in this book by its native name, Boyawa, and the language is spoken of as Kirawinian, Kirawina being the main province of the district and its language considered by the natives as a standard speech. But I may add at once that in studying the Kula in that part, I ipso facto studied its adjacent branches between the Trobriands and the Amphlets, between the Trobriands and Kitava, and between the Trobriands and Dobu. Seeing not only the preparations and departures in Boyawa, but also the arrival of the natives from other districts, in fact, following one or two of such expeditions in person. Moreover, the Kula being an international affair, the natives of one tribe know more about Kula customs abroad than they would about any other subject. And in all its essentials, the customs and tribal rules of the exchange are identical throughout the whole Kula area. 3. Let us imagine that we are sailing along the south coast of New Guinea towards its eastern end. At about the middle of Orangery Bay we arrive at the boundary of the Ma Sim, which runs from this point northwestwards till it strikes the northern coast near Cape Nelson, c. As mentioned before, 
the boundary of the district inhabited by this tribe corresponds to definite geographical conditions, that is, to the absence of natural, inland fastnesses, or of any obstacles to landing. Indeed, it is here that the Great Barrier Reef becomes finally submerged, while again the main range of mountains, which follows up to this point, always separated from the foreshore by minor ranges, comes to an end. Orangery Bay is closed, on its eastern side, by a headland, the first of a series of hills, rising directly out of the sea. As we approach the land, we can see distinctly the steep, folded slopes, covered with dense, rank jungle, brightened here and there by bold patches of lawlong grass. The coast is broken first by a series of small, landlocked bays or lagoons. Then, after Fife Bay, come one or two larger bays, with a flat, alluvial foreshore, and then from South Cape the coast stretches in an almost unbroken line, for several miles, to the end of the mainland. The east end of New Guinea is a tropical region, where the distinction between the dry and wet season is not felt very sharply. In fact, there is no pronounced dry season there, and so the land is always clad in intense, shining green, which forms a crude contrast with the blue sea. The summits of the hills are often shrouded in trailing mist, whilst white clouds brood or race over the sea, breaking up the monotony of saturated, stiff blue and green. To someone not acquainted with the South Sea landscape it is difficult to convey the permanent impression of smiling festiveness, the alluring clearness of the beach, fringed by jungle trees and palms, skirted by white foam and blue sea. Above it the slopes ascending in rich, stiff folds of dark and light green, piebald and shaded over towards the summit by steamy, tropical mists. When I first sailed along this coast, it was after a few months' residence and field work in the neighboring district of the Mailu. From Toulon Island, the main center and most important settlement of the Mailu, I used to look towards the east end of Orangery Bay, and on clear days I could see the pyramidal hills of Bonabona, of Gadagadoe, as blue silhouettes in the distance. Under the influence of my work, I came to regard this country within the somewhat narrow native horizon, as the distant land to which perilous, seasonal voyages are made, from whence come certain objects, baskets, decorated carvings, weapons. Ornaments, particularly well formed, and superior to the local ones. The land to which the natives point with awe and distrust, when speaking of specially evil and virulent forms of sorcery, the home of a folk mentioned with horror as cannibals. Any really fine touch of artistic taste, in Mailu carvings, would always be directly imported or imitated from the East, and I also found that the softest and most melodious songs and the finest dances came from the Masim. Many of their customs and institutions would be quoted to me as quaint and unusual, and thus, I, the ethnographer working on the borderland of two cultures, naturally had my interest and curiosity aroused. It seemed as if the Eastern people must be much more complex, in one direction towards the cruel, man-eating savage, in the other towards the finely gifted, poetical lord of primitive forest and seas. When I compared them with the relatively coarse and dull native of Mailu. No wonder, therefore, that on approaching their coast, traveling on that occasion in a small launch, I scanned the landscape with keen interest, anxious to catch my first glimpse of natives, or of their traces. The first distinctly visible signs of human existence in this neighborhood are the patches of garden land. These big clearings, triangular in shape, with the apex pointing uphill, look as if they were plastered on to the steep slopes. From August to November, the season when the natives cut and burn the bush, they can be seen, at night, alight with slowly blazing logs, and in daytime, their smoke clings over the clearings, and slowly drifts along the hillside. Later on in the year, when the plantation sprouts, they form a bright spot, with the light green of their fresh leaves. The villages in this district are to be found only on the foreshore, at the foot of the hills, hidden in groves of trees, with here and there a golden or purplish bit of thatch showing through the dark green of the leaves. In calm weather a few canoes are probably not far off, fishing. If the visitor is lucky enough to pass at the time of feasts, trading expeditions, or any other big tribal gathering, many a fine seagoing canoe may be seen approaching the village with the sound of conch shells blowing melodiously. In order to visit one of the typical, large settlements of these natives, let us say near Fife Bay, 
on the south coast, or on the island of Sariba, or Roje, it would be best to go ashore in some big, sheltered bay. Or on one of the extensive beaches at the foot of a hilly island. We enter a clear, lofty grove, composed of palms, breadfruit, mangoes, and other fruit trees, often with a sandy subsoil, well weeded out and clean, where grow clumps of ornamental bushes, such as the red flowering hibiscus. Croton or aromatic shrub. Here we find the village. Fascinating as may be the Motwan habitation standing on high piles in the middle of a lagoon, or the neat streets of an Aroma or Mailu settlement, or the irregular warren of small huts on the Trobriand coast. All these cannot compete in picturesqueness or charm with the villages of the southern Masim. When, on a hot day, we enter the deep shadow of fruit trees and palms, and find ourselves in the midst of the wonderfully designed and ornamented houses hiding here and there in irregular groups among the green. Surrounded by little decorative gardens of shells and flowers, with pebble-bordered paths and stone-paved sitting circles, it seems as if the visions of a primeval, happy, savage life were suddenly realized, even if only in a fleeting impression. Big bodies of canoes are drawn high up the beach and covered with palm leaves. Here and their nets are drying, spread out on special stands, and on the platforms in front of the houses sit groups of men and women, busy at some domestic work, smoking and chatting. Plate V. Scenes on the beach of Silo Silo, Southern Moss Sim District. These represent phases of a big annual feast, the Soai. See, and compare also, note the prominent part taken by women in the proceedings. The use of the ceremonial axe handles, the manner of carrying pigs, and the canoes beached on the shore. Plate 6. Village scenes during a Soai feast. These show types of southern Masim and their decorations again note the prominent part taken by women in the ceremonial actions. C. Walking along the paths which lead on for miles, we come every few hundred yards on another hamlet of a few houses. Some of these are evidently new and freshly decorated, while others are abandoned, and a heap of broken household objects is lying on the ground, showing that the death of one of the village elders has caused it to be deserted. As the evening approaches, the life becomes more active, fires are kindled, and the natives busy themselves cooking and eating food. In the dancing season, towards dusk, groups of men and women foregather, singing, dancing, and beating drums. When we approach the natives closer and scan their personal appearance, we are struck, if we compare them with their western neighbors, by the extreme lightness of their skin, their sturdy, even lumpy stature, and a sort of soft, almost a feat general impression which their physique produces. Their fat, broad faces, their squashed noses, and frequently oblique eyes, make them appear quaint and grotesque rather than impressively savage. Their hair, not so woolly as that of the pure Papuans, nor growing into the enormous halo of the Machuans, is worn in big mops, which they often cut at the side so as to give the head an oblong, almost cylindrical shape. Their manner is shy and diffident, but not unfriendly, rather smiling and almost servile, in very great contrast to the morose Papuan, or the unfriendly, reserved south coast Mailu or Aroma. On the whole, they give at first approach not so much the impression of wild savages as of smug and self-satisfied bourgeois. Their ornaments are much less elaborate and more toned down than those of their western neighbors. Belts and armlets plated of a dark brown fern vine, small red shell discs and turtle shell rings as ear ornaments are the only permanent, everyday decorations worn. Like all Melanesians of eastern New Guinea, they are quite cleanly in their persons, and a personal approach to them does not offend any of our senses. They are very fond of red hibiscus flowers stuck in their hair, of scented flower wreaths on their head, of aromatic leaves thrust into their belts and armlets. Their grand, festive headdress is extremely modest compared with the enormous erections of feathers used by the western tribes, and consists mainly of a round halo of white cockatoo feathers stuck into their hair, c and. In olden days, before the advent of white men, these pleasant, apparently effete people were inveterate cannibals and headhunters, and in their large war canoes they carried on treacherous, cruel raids, falling upon sleeping villages, killing man, woman and child, 
and feasting on their bodies. The attractive stone circles in their villages were associated with their cannibal feasts. The traveler, who could settle down in one of their villages and remain there sufficiently long to study their habits and enter into their tribal life, would soon be struck by the absence of a well-recognized general authority. In this, however, the natives resembled not only the other western Melanesians of New Guinea, but also the natives of the Melanesian archipelago. The authority in the southern Masim tribe, as in many others, is vested in the village elders. In each hamlet the eldest man has a position of personal influence and power, and these collectively would in all cases represent the tribe and carry out and enforce their decisions, always arrived at in strict accord with tribal tradition. Deeper sociological study would reveal the characteristic totemism of these natives, and also the matrilineal construction of their society. Descent, inheritance, and social position follow the female line, a man always belongs to his mother's totemic division and local group, and inherits from his mother's brother. Women also enjoy a very independent position, and are exceedingly well treated, and in tribal and festive affairs they play a prominent part, see plates end. Some women, even, owing to their magical powers, wield a considerable influence. The sexual life of these natives is extremely lax. Even when we remember the very free standard of sex morals in the Melanesian tribes of New Guinea, such as the Motu or the Mailu, we still find these natives exceedingly loose in such matters. Certain reserves and appearances which are usually kept up in other tribes, are here completely abandoned. As is probably the case in many communities where sex morals are lax, there is a complete absence of unnatural practices and sex perversions. Marriage is concluded as the natural end of a long and lasting liaison. These natives are efficient and industrious manufacturers, and great traders. They own large seagoing canoes, which, however, they do not manufacture themselves, but which they import from the northern Ma Sim district, or from Panayati. Another feature of their culture, which we shall meet again, consists of their big feasts, called soa, sea plates and, associated with mortuary celebrations and with a special mortuary taboo called gora. In the big intertribal trading of the kula, these feasts play a considerable role. This general, and necessarily somewhat superficial description, is meant to give the reader a definite impression of these tribes, provide them, so to speak, with a physiognomy, rather than to give a full account of their tribal constitution. For this the reader is referred to Professor C. G. Seligman's treatise, Our Main Source of Knowledge on the Melanesians of New Guinea. The above sketch refers to what Professor Seligman calls the Southern Ma Sim, or more exactly to the portion marked off in the ethnographic sketch as V, the Southern Ma Sim, the inhabitants of the easternmost mainland and the adjacent archipelago. 4. Let us now move north, towards the district marked, for, the Dobu, in our map, which forms one of the most important links in the chain of Kula and a very influential center of cultural influence. As we sail north, passing East Cape, the easternmost point of the main island, a long, flat promontory covered with palms and fruit belts, and harboring a very dense population, a new world, new both geographically and ethnographically, opens up before us. At first it is only a faint, bluish silhouette, like a shadow of a distant mountain range, hovering far north over the horizon. As we approach, the hills of Normanby, the nearest of three big islands of the D'Entrecastos archipelago, become clearer and take more definite shape and substance. A few high summits stand out more distinctly through the usual tropical haze, among them the characteristic double-peaked top of Buebueso, the mountain where, according to native legend, the spirits of the dead in these parts lead their latter existence. The south coast of Normanby, and the interior are inhabited by a tribe or tribes of which we know nothing ethnographically, except that they differ culturally from the rest of their neighbors. These tribes also take no direct part in the Kula. The northern end of Normanby, both sides of the Dawson Straits which separate the two islands of Normanby and Ferguson, and the southeastern tip of Ferguson, are inhabited by a very important tribe, the Dobu. The heart of their district is the small extinct volcano forming an island at the eastern entrance to Dawson Straits, Dobu, after which island they are named. To reach it, we have to sail through this extremely picturesque channel. 
On either side of the winding, narrow strait, green hills descend, and close it in, till it is more like a mountain lake. Here and there they recede, and a lagoon opens out. Or again they rise in fairly steep slopes, on which there can be plainly seen triangular gardens, native houses on piles, large tracts of unbroken jungle and patches of grassland. As we proceed, the narrow straits broaden, and we see on our right a wide flank of Emp Solomonai on Normanby Island. On our left, there is a shallow bay, and behind it a large, flat plain, stretching far into the interior of Ferguson Island, and over it, we look into wide valleys, and on to several distant mountain ranges. After another turn, we enter a big bay, on both sides bordered by a flat foreshore, and in the middle of it rises out of a girdle of tropical vegetation, the creased cone of an extinct volcano, the island of Dobu. We are now in the center of a densely populated and ethnographically important district. From this island, in olden days, fierce and daring cannibal and head-hunting expeditions were periodically launched, to the dread of the neighboring tribes. The natives of the immediately surrounding districts, of the flat foreshore on both sides of the straits, and of the big neighboring islands were allies. But the more distant districts, often over a hundred miles away by sail, never felt safe from the Dobuans. Again, this was, and still is, one of the main links in the Kula, a center of trade, industries and general cultural influence. It is characteristic of the international position of the Dobuans that their language is spoken as a lingua franca all over the D'Entrecastos archipelago, in the Amphlets, and as far north as the Trobrians. In the southern part of these latter islands, almost everyone speaks Dobuan, although in Dobu the language of the Trobrians or Kirawinian is hardly spoken by anyone. This is a remarkable fact, which cannot be easily explained in terms of the present conditions, as the Trobrianders, if anything, are on a higher level of cultural development than Dobuans, are more numerous, and enjoy the same general prestige. Another remarkable fact about Dobu and its district is that it is studded with spots of special, mythological interest. Its charming scenery, of volcanic cones, of wide, calm bays, and lagoons overhung by lofty, green mountains, with the reef-riddled, island-strewn ocean on the north, has deep, legendary meaning for the native. Here is the land and sea where the magically inspired sailors and heroes of the dim past performed feats of daring and power. As we sail from the entrance into Dawson Straits, through Dobu and the Amphlets to Boyawa, almost every new configuration of the land which we pass is the scene of some legendary exploit. Here the narrow gorge has been broken through by a magic canoe flying in the air. There the two rocks standing in the sea are the petrified bodies of two mythological heroes who were stranded at this spot after a quarrel. Here again, a landlocked lagoon has been a port of refuge to a mythical crew. Apart from its legends, the scenery before us, fine as it is, derives still more charm from the knowledge that it is, and has been a distant Eldorado. A land of promise and hope to generation after generation of really daring native sailors from the northern islands. And in the past these lands and seas must have been the scene of migrations and fights, of tribal invasions, and of gradual infiltrations of peoples and cultures. In personal appearance, the Dobuans have a very distinct physique, which differentiates them sharply from the southern Masim and from the Trobrianders. Very dark-skinned, small of stature, with big heads and rounded shoulders, they give a strange, almost gnome-like impression on a first encounter. In their manner, and their tribal character, there is something definitely pleasant, honest and open, an impression which long acquaintance with them confirms and strengthens. They are the general favorites of the whites, form the best and most reliable servants, and traders who have resided long among them compare them favorably with other natives. Their villages, like those of the previously described Ma-Sim, are scattered over wide areas. The fertile and flat foreshores which they inhabit are studded with small, compact hamlets of a dozen or so houses, hidden in the midst of one continuous plantation of fruit trees, palms, bananas and yams. The houses are built on piles, but are cruder architecturally than those of the S. Ma Sim, and almost without any decorations, though in the olden days of head-hunting some of them were ornamented with skulls. In their social constitution, the people are totemic, 
being divided into a number of exogamous clans with linked totems. There is no institution of regular chieftainship, nor have they any system of rank or caste such as we shall meet in the Trobrians. Authority is vested in the elders of the tribe. In each hamlet there is a man who wields the greatest influence locally, and acts as its representative on such tribal councils as may arise in connection with ceremonies and expeditions. Their system of kinship is matrilineal, and women hold a very good position, and wield great influence. They also seem to take a much more permanent and prominent part in tribal life than is the case among the neighboring populations. There is notably one of the features of Dabuan society, which seems to strike the Trobrianders as peculiar, and to which they will direct attention while giving information. Even although in the Trobrians also women have a good enough social position. In Dobu, women take an important part in gardening, and have a share in performing garden magic, and this in itself gives them a high status. Again, the main instrument for wielding power and inflicting penalties in these lands, sorcery, is to a great extent in the hands of women. The flying witches, so characteristic of the eastern New Guinea type of culture, here have one of their strongholds. We shall have to go into this subject more in detail when speaking about shipwreck and the dangers of sailing. Besides this, women practice ordinary sorcery, which in other tribes is only man's prerogative. As a rule, amongst natives, a high position of women is associated with sex laxity. In this, Dobu is an exception. Not only are married women expected to remain faithful, and adultery considered a great crime, but, in sharp contrast to all surrounding tribes, the unmarried girls of Dobu remain strictly chaste. There are no ceremonial or customary forms of license, and an intrigue would be certainly regarded as an offense. A few more words must be said here about sorcery, as this is a matter of great importance in all intertribal relations. The dread of sorcery is enormous, and when the natives visit distant parts, this dread is enhanced by the additional awe of the unknown and foreign. Besides the flying witches, there are, in Dobu, men and women who, by their knowledge of magical spells and rites, can inflict disease and cause death. The methods of these sorcerers, and all the beliefs clustering round this subject are very much the same as those in the Trobrians which we shall meet later on. These methods are characterized by being very rational and direct, and implying hardly any supernatural element. The sorcerer has to utter a spell over some substance, and this must be administered by mouth, or else burnt over the fire in the victim's hut. The pointing stick is also used by the sorcerers in certain rites. If his methods are compared with those used by flying witches, who eat the heart and lungs, drink the blood, snap the bones of their enemies, and moreover possess the powers of invisibility and of flying. The Dabuan sorcerer seems to have but simple and clumsy means at his disposal. He is also very much behind his Mailu or Motu namesakes, I say namesakes, because sorcerers throughout the Ma Sim are called Barayu, and the same word is used in Mailu, while the Motu use the reduplicated Babrayu. The magicians in these parts use such powerful methods as those of killing the victim first, opening up the body, removing, lacerating or charming the inside, then bringing the victim to life again, only that he may soon sicken and eventually die. According to Dabuan belief, the spirits of the dead go to the top of Mtibwebweso on Normanby Island. This confined space harbors the shades of practically all the natives of the D'Entrecastos archipelago, except those of northern Good Enough Island who, as I was told by some local informants, go after death to the spirit land of the Trobrianders. The Dabuans have also the belief in a double soul, one, shadowy and impersonal, surviving the bodily death for a few days only, and remaining in the vicinity of the grave, the other the real spirit, who goes to Buebueso. It is interesting to note how natives, living on the boundary between two cultures and between two types of belief, regard the ensuing differences. A native of, say, southern Boyawa, confronted with the question, how it is that the Dabuans place spirit land on Buebueso, whereas they, the Trobrianders, place it in Tuma, does not see any difficulty in solving the problem. He does not regard the difference as due to a dogmatic conflict in doctrine. Quite simply he answers, their dead go to Buebueso and ours to Tuma. 
The metaphysical laws of existence are not yet considered subject to one invariable truth. As human destinies in life change, according to varieties in tribal custom, so also the doings of the spirit. An interesting theory is evolved to harmonize the two beliefs in a mixed case. There is a belief that if a Trobriander were to die in Dobu, when on a Kula expedition, he would go for a time to Bwebweso. In due season, the spirits of the Trobrianders would sail from Tuma, the spirit land, to Bwebweso, on a spirit Kula, and the newly departed one would join their party in sail with them back to Tuma. On leaving Dobu, we sail the open sea, a sea studded with coral patches and sandbanks, and seamed with long barrier reefs, where treacherous tides, running sometimes as much as five knots, make sailing really dangerous. Especially for helpless native craft. This is the Kula Sea, the scene of the intertribal expeditions and adventures which will be the theme of our future descriptions. The eastern shore of Ferguson Island, near Dobu, along which we are sailing, consists first of a series of volcanic cones and capes, giving the landscape the aspect of something unfinished and crudely put together. At the foot of the hills there stretches for several miles beyond Dobu a broad alluvial flat covered with villages, Dai Dai, Tuyutana, Bweawa, all important centers of trade, and the homes of the direct Kula partners of the Trobrianders. Heavy fumes can be seen floating above the jungle, coming from the hot geysers of Dai Dai, which spurt up in high jets every few minutes. Soon we come abreast of two characteristically shaped, dark rocks, one half hidden in the vegetation of the shore, the other standing in the sea at the end of a narrow sandspit dividing the two. These are Atuaine and Achiramoe, two men turned into stone, as mythical tradition has it. Here the big sailing expeditions, those starting northwards from Dobu, as well as those arriving from the north, still make a halt, just as they have done for centuries, and, under observation of many taboos, give sacrificial offerings to the stones. With ritual invocations for propitious trade. In the lee of these two rocks, runs a small bay with a clean, sandy beach, called Sarabuena. Here a visitor, lucky enough to pass at the right moment of the right season would see a picturesque and interesting scene. There before him would lie a huge fleet of some fifty to a hundred canoes, anchored in the shallow water, with swarms of natives upon them, all engaged in some strange and mysterious task. Some of these, bent over heaps of herbs, would be mumbling incantations, others would be painting and adorning their bodies. An onlooker of two generations ago coming upon the same scene would no doubt have been led to suspect that he was watching the preparations for some dramatic tribal contest. For one of those big onslaughts in which the existence of whole villages and tribes were wiped out. It would even have been difficult for him to discern from the behavior of the natives whether they were moved more by fear or by the spirit of aggression. As both these passions might have been read, and correctly so, into their attitudes and movements. That the scene contained no element of warfare, that this fleet had come here from about a hundred miles sailing distance on a well-regulated tribal visit. That it had drawn up here for the final and most important preparations, this would not have been an easy guess to make. Nowadays, for this is carried out to this day with undiminished pomp, it would be an equally picturesque, but of course, tamer affair, since the romance of danger has gone from native life. As we learn in the course of this study to know more about these natives, their general ways and customs, and more especially about their Kula cycle of beliefs, ideas and sentiments, we shall be able to look with understanding eyes upon this scene. And comprehend this mixture of awe with intense, almost aggressive eagerness and this behavior, which appears cowed and fierce at the same time. V. Immediately after leaving Sarabuena and rounding the promontory of the two rocks, we come in sight of the island of Sanaroa, a big, sprawling, coral flat, with a range of volcanic hills on its western side. On the wide lagoon to the east of this island are the fishing grounds, where year after year the Trobrianders, returning from Dobu, look for the valuable spondylus shell, which, after their arrival home, is worked into the red discs, which form one of the main objects of native wealth. In the north of Sanaroa there is a stone in one of the tidal creeks called Sinidamubadai, once a woman, the sister of Atuaine and Achiramoe, who, with her brothers came in here and was petrified before the last stage of the journey. 
she also receives offerings from canoes, coming either way on Kula expeditions. Sailing further, some fine scenery unfolds itself on our left, where the high mountain range comes nearer to the sea shore, and where small bays, deep valleys and wooded slopes succeed one another. By carefully scanning the slopes, we can see small batches of some three to six miserable huts. These are the dwellings of the inhabitants, who are of a distinctly lower culture than the Dabuans, take no part in the Kula, and in olden days were the cowed and unhappy victims of their neighbors. On our right there emerge behind Sanaroa the islands of Uwama and Tawara, the latter inhabited by Dabuan natives. Tawara is of interest to us, because one of the myths which we shall get to know later on makes it the cradle of the Kula. As we sail on, rounding one after the other the eastern promontories of Ferguson Island, a group of strongly marked monumental profiles appears far on the horizon from behind the receding headlands. These are the Amphlet Islands, the link, both geographically and culturally, between the coastal tribes of the volcanic region of Dobu and the inhabitants of the flat coral archipelago of the Trobrians. This portion of the sea is very picturesque, and has a charm of its own even in this land of fine and varied scenery. On the main island of Ferguson, overlooking the amphlets from the south, and ascending straight out of the sea in a slim and graceful pyramid, lies the tall mountain of Koyatabu, the highest peak on the island. Its big, green surface is cut in half by the white ribbon of a watercourse, starting almost halfway up and running down to the sea. Scattered under the lea of Koyatabu are the numerous smaller and bigger islands of the Amphlet Archipelago, steep, rocky hills, shaped into pyramids, sphinxes and cupolas, the whole a strange and picturesque assemblage of characteristic forms. Plate 7. In the Amphlets The seafront of the main village on Gumasila, or Gumawana. C. With a strong southeasterly wind, which blows here for three quarters of the year, we approach the islands very fast, and the two most important ones, Gumawana and Omei, almost seem to leap out of the mist. As we anchor in front of Gumawana village at the se end of the island, we cannot but feel impressed. Built on a narrow strip of foreshore, open to the breakers, and squeezed down to the water's edge by an almost precipitously rising jungle at its back. The village has been made sea-proof by walls of stone surrounding the houses with several bulwarks, and by stone dikes forming small artificial harbors along the sea front. The shabby and unornamented huts, built on piles, look very picturesque in these surroundings, sea plates end. The inhabitants of this village, and of the four remaining ones in the archipelago, are a queer people. They are a numerically weak tribe, easily assailable from the sea, getting hardly enough to eat from their rocky islands. And yet, through their unique skill in pottery, their great daring and efficiency as sailors, and their central position halfway between Dobu and the Trobrians. They have succeeded in becoming in several respects the monopolists of this part of the world. They have also the main characteristics of monopolists, grasping and mean, inhospitable and greedy, keen on keeping the trade and exchange in their own hands, yet unprepared to make any sacrifice towards improving it. Shy, yet arrogant to anyone who has any dealings with them, they contrast unfavorably with their southern and northern neighbors. And this is not only the white man's impression. The Trobrianders, as well as the Dabuans, give the Amphlet natives a very bad name, as being stingy and unfair in all Kula transactions, and as having no real sense of generosity and hospitality. When our boat anchors there, the natives approach it in their canoes, offering clay pots for sale. But if we want to go ashore and have a look at their village, there is a great commotion, and all the women disappear from the open places. The younger ones run and hide in the jungle behind the village, and even the old hags conceal themselves in the houses. So that if we want to see the making of pottery, which is almost exclusively women's work, we must first lure some old woman out of her retreat with generous promises of tobacco and assurances of honorable intentions. This has been mentioned here, because it is of ethnographic interest, as it is not only white men who inspire this shyness. If native strangers, coming from a distance for trade, put in for a short time in the amphlets, the women also disappear in this fashion. This very ostentatious coyness is, however, not a sham, 
because in the amphlets, even more than in Dobu, married and unmarried life is characterized by strict chastity and fidelity. Women here have also a good deal of influence, and take a great part in gardening and the performance of garden magic. In social institutions and customs, the natives present a mixture of northern and southern Ma Sim elements. There are no chiefs, but influential elders wield authority, and in each village there is a head man who takes the lead in ceremonies and other big tribal affairs. Their totemic clans are identical with those of Murua, District 2. Their somewhat precarious food supply comes partly from the poor gardens, partly from fishing with kite and fish trap, which, however, can only seldom be carried out, and does not yield very much. They are not self-supporting, and receive, in form of presents and by trade, a good deal of vegetable food as well as pigs from the mainland, from Dobu and the Trobriands. In personal appearance they are very much like the Trobrianders, that is, taller than the Dobuans, lighter skinned, and with finer features. We must now leave the amphlets and proceed to the Trobriand Islands, the scene of most of the occurrences described in this book, and the country concerning which I possess by far the largest amount of ethnographic information. Plate 8 Group of natives in the village of Tukwaqua. This shows the type of coastal village, with the natives squatting round, to illustrate DIVI. Plate 9 Men of rank from Kiriwina. Tokalubakiki, a chief's son. Tauizai and Yabukwayu, of the highest and somewhat inferior rank respectively. All three show fine features and intelligent expressions, they were among my best informants. C and Plate X Fishermen from Tayava Types of commoners from a lagoon village C The best accounts we possess of the inland tribes are those of W. H. Williamson, the Mafulu, 1912, and of C. Kieser, A.U.S. Dem Lebender Kalut, in R. Neuhaus, Deutsch New Guinea, Volume 3. Berlin, 1911 the preliminary publications of G. Lantman on the Keyway, Papuan Magic in the Building of Houses, Acta Arboenses, Humanora. I. ABO, 1920, and The Folk Tales of the Keyway Papuans, Helsingfors, 1917, promise that the full account will dispel some of the mysteries surrounding the Gulf of Papua. Meanwhile a good semi-popular account of these natives is to be found in W. N. Beavers, Unexplored New Guinea, 1920. Personally I doubt very much whether the hill tribes and the swamp tribes belong to the same stock or have the same culture. Compare also the most recent contribution to this problem, Migrations of Cultures in British New Guinea, by A. C. Haddon, Huxley Memorial Lecture for 1921, published by the R. Anthrop Institute. C. C. G. Seligman, The Melanesians of British New Guinea, Cambridge, 1910. C.F.C. G. Seligman, Op. Sit, page 5. A number of good portraits of the S. Ma Sim type are to be found in the valuable book of the Rev. H. Newton, in Far New Guinea, 1914, and in the amusingly written though superficial and often unreliable booklet of the Rev. C. W. Abel, London Missionary Society, Savage Life in New Guinea, no date. See table in the introduction, and also chapters end. C.F. Professor C. G. Seligman, Op. Sit, Chapters 40 in XLII. Professor C. G. Seligman, Op. Sit, Chapters 35, XXXVA, XVI. C.F. Professor C. G. Seligman, Chapters 37 and XXXVI. My knowledge of the Dobuans is fragmentary, derived from three short visits in their district, from conversation with several Dobu natives whom I had in my service, and from frequent parallels and allusions about Dobuan customs, which are met when doing fieldwork among the southern Trobrianders. There is a short, sketchy account of certain of their customs and beliefs by the Rev. W. E. Bromolo, first missionary in Dobu, which I have also consulted, in the records of the Australasian Association for the Advancement of Science. Professor C. G. Seligman, Opsit, pages 170 and 171, 
187 and 188 about the Koida and Motu, and B. Malinowski, the Milu, pages 647 to 652. Comp D. Jeunesse and A. Ballantyne, The Northern D'Entrecastos, Oxford, 1920, Chapter 12. I spent about a month in these islands, and found the natives surprisingly intractable and difficult to work with ethnographically. The Amphlet, boys, are renowned as good boat hands, but in general they are not such capable and willing workers as the Dobulans. Chapter 2 The Natives of the Trobriand Islands I. Leaving the bronzed rocks and the dark jungle of the Amphlets for the present, for we shall have to revisit them in the course of our study. And then shall learn more about their inhabitants, we sail north into an entirely different world of flat coral islands. Into an ethnographic district, which stands out by ever so many peculiar manners and customs from the rest of Papua Melanesia. So far, we have sailed over intensely blue, clear seas, where in shallow places the coral bottom, with its variety of color and form, with its wonderful plant and fish life, is a fascinating spectacle in itself, a sea framed in all the splendors of tropical jungle, of volcanic and mountainous scenery with lively watercourses and falls, with steamy clouds trailing in the high valleys. From all this we take a final farewell as we sail north. The outlines of the amphlets soon fade away in tropical haze, till only Koyatabu's slender pyramid, lifted over them, remains on the horizon, the graceful form, which follows us even as far as the lagoon of Kiriwina. We now enter an opaque, greenish sea, whose monotony is broken only by a few sandbanks, some bare and awash, others with a few pandanus trees squatting on their air roots, high in the sand. To these banks, the amphlet natives come and there they spend weeks on end, fishing for turtle and dugong. Here is also laid the scene of several of the mythical incidents of primeval Kula. Further ahead, through the misty spray, the line of horizon thickens here and there, as if faint pencil marks had been drawn upon it. These become more substantial, one of them lengthens and broadens, the others spring into the distinct shapes of small islands, and we find ourselves in the big lagoon of the Trobriands, with Boyawa, the largest island, on our right. And with many others, inhabited and uninhabited, to the north and northwest. Map 4, the Trobriand Archipelago, also called Boyawa or Kiriwina. As we sail in the lagoon, following the intricate passages between the shallows, and as we approach the main island, the thick, tangled matting of the low jungle breaks here and there over a beach, and we can see into a palm grove. Like an interior, supported by pillars. This indicates the site of a village. We step ashore onto the sea front, as a rule covered with mud and refuse, with canoes drawn up high and dry, and passing through the grove, we enter the village itself, sea. Soon we are seated on one of the platforms built in front of a yam house, shaded by its overhanging roof. The round, gray logs, worn smooth by contact with naked feet and bodies, the trodden ground of the village street. The brown skins of the natives, who immediately surround the visitor in large groups, all these form a color scheme of bronze and gray, unforgettable to anyone, who, like myself, has lived among these people. It is difficult to convey the feelings of intense interest and suspense with which an ethnographer enters for the first time the district that is to be the future scene of his fieldwork. Certain salient features, characteristic of the place, at once rivet his attention, and fill him with hopes or apprehensions. The appearance of the natives, their manners, their types of behavior, may augur well or ill for the possibilities of rapid and easy research. One is on the lookout for symptoms of deeper, sociological facts, one suspects many hidden and mysterious ethnographic phenomena behind the commonplace aspect of things. Perhaps that queer-looking, intelligent native is a renowned sorcerer. Perhaps between those two groups of men there exists some important rivalry or vendetta which may throw much light on the customs and character of the people if one can only lay hands upon it. Such at least were my thoughts and feelings as on the day of my arrival in Boyawa I sat scanning a chatting group of Trobriand natives. The great variety in their physical appearance is what strikes one first in Boyawa. There are men and women of tall stature, fine bearing, 
and delicate features, with clear-cut aquiline profile and high foreheads, well-formed nose and chin, and an open, intelligent expression, see plates. And besides these, there are others with prognathic, negroid faces, broad, thick-lipped mouths, narrow foreheads, and a coarse expression, see plates. The better featured have also a markedly lighter skin. Even their hair differs, varying from quite straight locks to the frizzly mop of the typical Melanesian. They wear the same classes of ornaments as the other Ma Sim, consisting mainly of fiber armlets and belts, earrings of turtle shell and spondylus discs, and they are very fond of using, for personal decoration, flowers and aromatic herbs. In manner they are much freer, more familiar and confident, than any of the natives we have so far met. As soon as an interesting stranger arrives, half the village assembles around him, talking loudly and making remarks about him, frequently uncomplimentary, and altogether assuming a tone of jocular familiarity. Plate 11. A typical Nakabakwabia, unmarried woman. This shows the coarse, though fine-looking, type of a commoner woman. C. Plate 12. Boyawan girls. Such facial painting and decorations are used when they go on a Katayasi expedition. C. One of the main sociological features at once strikes an observant newcomer, the existence of rank and social differentiation. Some of the natives, very frequently those of the finer looking type, are treated with most marked deference by others, and in return, these chiefs and persons of rank behave in quite a different way towards the strangers. In fact, they show excellent manners in the full meaning of this word. When a chief is present, no commoner dares to remain in a physically higher position, he has to bend his body or squat. Similarly, when the chief sits down, no one would dare to stand. The institution of definite chieftainship, to which are shown such extreme marks of deference, with a sort of rudimentary court ceremonial, with insignia of rank and authority, is so entirely foreign to the whole spirit of Melanesian tribal life. That at first sight it transports the ethnographer into a different world. In the course of our inquiry, we shall constantly meet with manifestation of the Kirawinian chief's authority, we shall notice the difference in this respect between the Trobrianders and the other tribes. And the resulting adjustments of tribal usage. 2. Another sociological feature, which forcibly obtrudes itself on the visitor's notice, is the social position of the women. Their behavior, after the cool aloofness of the Dabuan women, and the very uninviting treatment which strangers receive from those of the Amphlets, comes almost as a shock in its friendly familiarity. Naturally, here also, the manners of women of rank are quite different from those of low-class commoners. But, on the whole, high and low alike, though by no means reserved, have a genial, pleasant approach, and many of them are very fine-looking, see plates. Their dress is also different from any so far observed. All the Melanesian women in New Guinea wear a petticoat made of fiber. Among the southern Masim, this fiber skirt is long, reaching to the knees or below, whereas in the Trobrians it is much shorter and fuller, consisting of several layers standing out round the body like a ruff, compare the S. Masim women on plates and with the Trobrianders on. The highly ornamental effect of that dress is enhanced by the elaborate decorations made in three colors on the several layers forming the top skirt. On the whole, it is very becoming to fine young women, and gives to small slender girls a graceful, elfish appearance. Chastity is an unknown virtue among these natives. At an incredibly early age they become initiated into sexual life, and many of the innocent-looking plays of childhood are not as innocuous as they appear. As they grow up, they live in promiscuous free love, which gradually develops into more permanent attachments, one of which ends in marriage. But before this is reached, unmarried girls are openly supposed to be quite free to do what they like, and there are even ceremonial arrangements by which the girls of a village repair in a body to another place. There they publicly range themselves for inspection, and each is chosen by a local boy, with whom she spends a night. This is called katayasi, c. Again, when a visiting party arrives from another district, food is brought to them by the unmarried girls, who are also expected to satisfy their sexual wants. 
At the big mortuary vigils round the corpse of a newly deceased person, people from neighboring villages come in large bodies to take part in the wailing and singing. The girls of the visiting party are expected by usage to comfort the boys of the bereaved village, in a manner which gives much anguish to their official lovers. There is another remarkable form of ceremonial license, in which indeed women are openly the initiators. During the gardening season, at the time of weeding, the women do communal work, and any strange man who ventures to pass through the district runs a considerable risk, for the women will run after him, seize him, tear off his pubic leaf, and ill-treat him orgiastically in the most ignominious manner. Side by side with these ceremonial forms of license, there go, in the normal course of events, constant private intrigues, more intense during the festive seasons, becoming less prominent as garden work, trading expeditions, or harvesting take up the energies and attention of the tribe. Marriage is associated with hardly any public or private rite or ceremony. The woman simply joins her husband in his house, and later on, there is a series of exchanges of gifts, which in no way can be interpreted as purchase money for the wife. As a matter of fact, the most important feature of the Trobriand marriage is the fact that the wife's family have to contribute, and that in a very substantial manner, to the economics of her household. And also they have to perform all sorts of services for the husband. In her married life, the woman is supposed to remain faithful to her husband, but this rule is neither very strictly kept nor enforced. In all other ways, she retains a great measure of independence, and her husband has to treat her well and with consideration. If he does not, the woman simply leaves him and returns to her family, and as the husband is as a rule economically the loser by her action, he has to exert himself to get her back, which he does by means of presents and persuasions. If she chooses, she can leave him for good, and she can always find someone else to marry. In tribal life, the position of women is also very high. They do not as a rule join the councils of men, but in many matters they have their own way, and control several aspects of tribal life. Thus, some of the garden work is their business, and this is considered a privilege as well as a duty. They also look after certain stages in the big, ceremonial divisions of food, associated with the very complete and elaborate mortuary ritual of the Boyans, c. Certain forms of magic, that performed over a firstborn baby, beauty magic made at tribal ceremonies, some classes of sorcery, are also the monopoly of women. Women of rank share the privileges incidental to it, and men of low caste will bend before them and observe all the necessary formalities and taboos due to a chief. A woman of chief's rank, married to commoner, retains her status, even with regard to her husband, and has to be treated accordingly. The Trobrianders are matrilineal, that is, in tracing descent and settling inheritance, they follow the maternal line. A child belongs to the clan and village community of its mother, and wealth, as well as social position, are inherited, not from father to son, but from maternal uncle to nephew. This rule admits of certain important and interesting exceptions, which we shall come across in the course of this study. 3. Returning to our imaginary first visit ashore, the next interesting thing to do, after we have sufficiently taken in the appearance and manners of the natives, is to walk round the village. In doing this, again we would come across much, which to a trained eye, would reveal at once deeper sociological facts. In the Trobriens, however, it would be better to make our first observations in one of the large, inland villages, situated on even, flat ground with plenty of space, so that it has been possible to build it in the typical pattern. In the coastal villages, placed on marshy ground and coral outcrop, the irregularity of the soil and cramped space have obliterated the design, and they present quite a chaotic appearance. The big villages of the central districts, on the other hand, are built one and all with an almost geometrical regularity. In the middle, a big circular space is surrounded by a ring of yam houses. These latter are built on piles, and present a fine, decorative front, with walls of big, round logs, laid crosswise on one another, so as to leave wide interstices through which the stored yams can be seen, see plates. Some of the storehouses strike us at once as being better built, larger, and higher than the rest, and these have also big, ornamented boards, running round the gable and across it. 
these are the yam houses of the chief or of persons of rank. Each yam house also has, as a rule, a small platform in front of it, on which groups of men will sit and chat in the evening, and where visitors can rest. Concentrically with the circular row of yam houses, there runs a ring of dwelling huts, and thus a street going all round the village is formed between the two rows, sea plates. The dwellings are lower than the yam houses, and instead of being on piles, are built directly on the ground. The interior is dark and very stuffy, and the only opening into it is through the door, and that is usually closed. Each hut is occupied by one family, c, that is, husband, wife and small children, while adolescent and grown-up boys and girls live in separate small bachelor's houses, harboring some two to six inmates. Chiefs and people of rank have their special, personal houses, besides those of their wives. The chief's house often stands in the central ring of the storehouses facing the main place. Plate 13. Kadabu Dance The circular dance with the carved sherled on the Baku of Omar Khanna. See, note the plain, though picturesque, headdress of cockatoo feathers. Plate 14. Dancers in full decoration. A segment of the dancing circle, in a Kadabu dance, village of Yalaka. C. The broad inspection of the village would therefore reveal to us the role of decoration as insignia of rank, the existence of bachelors' and spinsters' houses, the great importance attached to the yam harvest, all these small symptoms which followed up, would lead us deep into the problems of native sociology. Moreover, such an inspection would have led us to inquire as to the part played by the different divisions of the village in tribal life. We should then learn that the Baku, the central circular space, is the scene of public ceremonies and festivities, such as dancing, sea plates, division of food, tribal feasts, mortuary vigils, in short, of all doings that represent the village as a whole. In the circular street between the stores and living houses, everyday life goes on, that is, the preparation of food, the eating of meals, and the usual exchange of gossip and ordinary social amenities. The interior of the houses is only used at night, or on wet days, and is more a sleeping than a living room. The backs of the houses and the contiguous groves are the scene of the children's play and the women's occupations. Further away, remote parts of the grove are reserved for sanitary purposes, each sex having its own retreat. The Baku, central place, is the most picturesque part, and there the somewhat monotonous color scheme of the brown and gray is broken by the overhanging foliage of the grove. Seen above the neat fronts and gaudy ornamentation of the yam houses and by the decorations worn by the crowd when a dance or ceremony is taking place, see plates. Dancing is done only at one time in the year, in connection with the harvest festivities, called Milamala, at which season also the spirits of the dead return from Tuma, the netherworld, to the villages from which they hail. Sometimes the dancing season lasts only for a few weeks or even days, sometimes it is extended into a special dancing period called Usigala. During such a time of festivities, the inhabitants of a village will dance day after day, for a month or longer, the period being inaugurated by a feast, punctuated by several more, and ending in a big culminating performance. At this many villages assist as spectators, and distributions of food take place. During an usigala, dancing is done in full dress, that is, with facial painting, floral decorations, valuable ornaments, and a headdress of white cockatoo feathers, sea plates. A performance consists always of a dance executed in a ring to the accompaniment of singing and drum beating, both of which are done by a group of people standing in the middle. Some dances are done with the carved dancing shield. Sociologically, the village is an important unit in the Trobriands. Even the mightiest chief in the Trobriands wields his authority primarily over his own village and only secondarily over the district. The village community exploit jointly their garden lands, perform ceremonies, wage warfare, undertake trading expeditions, and sail in the same canoe or fleet of canoes as one group. After the first inspection of the village, we would be naturally interested to know more of the surrounding country, and would take a walk through the bush. Here, however, if we hoped for a picturesque and varied landscape, we should receive a great disappointment. 
The extensive, flat island consists only of one fertile plain, with a low coral ridge running along portions of the coast. It is almost entirely under intermittent cultivation, and the bush, regularly cleared away every few years, has no time to grow high. A low, dense jungle grows in a matted tangle, and practically wherever we move on the island we walk along between two green walls, presenting no variety, allowing of no broader view. The monotony is broken only by an occasional clump of old trees left standing, usually a tabooed place, or by one of the numerous villages which we meet with every mile or two in this densely populated country. The main element, both of picturesqueness and ethnographic interest, is afforded by the native gardens. Each year about one quarter or one fifth of the total area is under actual cultivation as gardens, and these are well tended, and present a pleasant change from the monotony of the scrub. In its early stages, the garden site is simply a bare, cleared space, allowing of a wider outlook upon the distant coral ridge in the east, and upon the tall groves, scattered over the horizon, which indicate villages or tabooed tree clumps. Later on, when the yam vines, taro, and sugar cane begin to grow and bud, the bare brown soil is covered with the fresh green of the tender plants. After some more time still, tall, stout poles are planted over each yam plant. The vine climbs round them, grows into a full, shady garland of foliage, and the whole makes the impression of a large, exuberant hopyard. 4. Half of the native's working life is spent in the garden, and around it centers perhaps more than half of his interests and ambitions. And here we must pause and make an attempt to understand his attitude in this matter, as it is typical of the way in which he goes about all his work. If we remain under the delusion that the native is a happy-go-lucky, lazy child of nature, who shuns as far as possible all labor and effort, waiting till the ripe fruits, so bountifully supplied by generous tropical nature, fall into his mouth. We shall not be able to understand in the least his aims and motives in carrying out the kula or any other enterprise. On the contrary, the truth is that the native can and, under circumstances, does work hard, and work systematically, with endurance and purpose, nor does he wait till he is pressed to work by his immediate needs. In gardening, for instance, the natives produce much more than they actually require, and in any average year they harvest perhaps twice as much as they can eat. Nowadays, this surplus is exported by Europeans to feed plantation hands in other parts of New Guinea, in olden days it was simply allowed to rot. Again, they produce this surplus in a manner which entails much more work than is strictly necessary for obtaining the crops. Much time and labor is given up to aesthetic purposes, to making the gardens tidy, clean, cleared of all debris. To building fine, solid fences, to providing specially strong and big yam poles. All these things are to some extent required for the growth of the plant. But there can be no doubt that the natives push their conscientiousness far beyond the limit of the purely necessary. The non-utilitarian element in their garden work is still more clearly perceptible in the various tasks which they carry out entirely for the sake of ornamentation, in connection with magical ceremonies, and in obedience to tribal usage. Thus, after the ground has been scrupulously cleared and is ready for planting, the natives divide each garden plot into small squares, each a few yards in length and width, and this is done only in obedience to usage. In order to make the gardens look neat. No self-respecting man would dream of omitting to do this. Again, in especially well-trimmed gardens, long horizontal poles are tied to the yam supports in order to embellish them. Another, and perhaps the most interesting example of non-utilitarian work is afforded by the big, prismatic erections called campicola, which serve ornamental and magical purposes, but have nothing to do with the growth of plants, comp. Among the forces and beliefs which bear upon and regulate garden work, perhaps magic is the most important. It is a department of its own, and the garden magician, next to the chief and the sorcerer, is the most important personage of the village. The position is hereditary, and, in each village, a special system of magic is handed on in the female line from one generation to another. I have called it a system, because the magician has to perform a series of rites and spells over the garden, which run parallel with the labor, and which, in fact, initiate each stage of the work and each new development of the plant life. 
Even before any gardening is begun at all, the magician has to consecrate the site with a big ceremonial performance in which all the men of the village take part. This ceremony officially opens the season's gardening, and only after it is performed do the villagers begin to cut the scrub on their plots. Then, in a series of rites, the magician inaugurates successively all the various stages which follow one another, the burning of the scrub, the clearing, the planting, the weeding and the harvesting. Also, in another series of rites and spells, he magically assists the plant in sprouting, in budding, in bursting into leaf, in climbing, in forming the rich garlands of foliage, and in producing the edible tubers. The garden magician, according to native ideas, thus controls both the work of man and the forces of nature. He also acts directly as supervisor of gardening, sees to it that people do not skimp their work, or lag behind with it. Thus magic is a systematizing, regulating, and controlling influence in garden work. The magician, in carrying out the rites, sets the pace, compels people to apply themselves to certain tasks, and to accomplish them properly and in time. Incidentally, magic also imposes on the tribe a good deal of extra work, of apparently unnecessary, hampering taboos and regulations. In the long run, however, there is no doubt that by its influence in ordering, systematizing and regulating work, magic is economically invaluable for the natives. Another notion which must be exploded, once and forever, is that of the primitive economic man of some current economic textbooks. This fanciful, dummy creature, who has been very tenacious of existence in popular and semi-popular economic literature, and whose shadow haunts even the minds of competent anthropologists, blighting their outlook with a preconceived idea, is an imaginary, primitive man, or savage, prompted in all his actions by a rationalistic conception of self-interest, and achieving his aims directly and with the minimum of effort. Even one well-established instance should show how preposterous is this assumption that man, and especially man on a low level of culture, should be actuated by pure economic motives of enlightened self-interest. The primitive Trobriander furnishes us with such an instance, contradicting this fallacious theory. He works prompted by motives of a highly complex, social and traditional nature, and towards aims which are certainly not directed towards the satisfaction of present wants, or to the direct achievement of utilitarian purposes. Thus, in the first place, as we have seen, work is not carried out on the principle of the least effort. On the contrary, much time and energy is spent on wholly unnecessary effort, that is, from a utilitarian point of view. Again, work and effort, instead of being merely a means to an end, are, in a way an end in themselves. A good garden worker in the Trobriands derives a direct prestige from the amount of labor he can do, and the size of garden he can till. The title Tokwe Bagula, which means, good or, efficient gardener, is bestowed with discrimination, and born with pride. Several of my friends, renowned as Tokwe Bagula, would boast to me how long they worked, how much ground they tilled, and would compare their efforts with those of less efficient men. When the labor, some of which is done communally, is being actually carried out, a good deal of competition goes on. Men vie with one another in their speed, in their thoroughness, and in the weights they can lift, when bringing big poles to the garden, or in carrying away the harvested yams. The most important point about this is, however, that all, or almost all the fruits of his work, and certainly any surplus which he can achieve by extra effort, goes not to the man himself, but to his relatives-in-law. Without entering into details of the system of the apportionment of the harvest, of which the sociology is rather complex and would require a preliminary account of the Trobriand kinship system and kinship ideas. It may be said that about three-quarters of a man's crops go partly as tribute to the chief, partly as his due to his sisters, or mothers, husband and family. But although he thus derives practically no personal benefit in a utilitarian sense from his harvest, the gardener receives much praise and renown from its size and quality, and that in a direct and circumstantial manner. For all the crops, after being harvested, are displayed for some time afterwards in the gardens, piled up in neat, conical heaps under small shelters made of yam vine. Each man's harvest is thus exhibited for criticism in his own plot, and parties of natives walk about from garden to garden, admiring, comparing and praising the best results. 
The importance of the food display can be gauged by the fact that, in olden days, when the chief's power was much more considerable than now, it was dangerous for a man who was not either of high rank himself, or working for such a one, to show crops which might compare too favorably with those of the chief. In years when the harvest promises to be plentiful, the chief will proclaim a Kaesa harvest, that is to say, ceremonial, competitive display of food, and then the straining for good results and the interest taken in them are still higher. We shall meet later on with ceremonial enterprises of the Kaesa type, and find that they play a considerable part in the Kula. All this shows how entirely the real native of flesh and bone differs from the shadowy primitive economic man, on whose imaginary behavior many of the scholastic deductions of abstract economics are based. The Trobriander works in a roundabout way, to a large extent for the sake of the work itself, and puts a great deal of aesthetic polish on the arrangement and general appearance of his garden. He is not guided primarily by the desire to satisfy his wants, but by a very complex set of traditional forces, duties and obligations, beliefs in magic, social ambitions and vanities. He wants, if he is a man, to achieve social distinction as a good gardener and a good worker in general. I have dwelt at this length upon these points concerning the motives and aims of the Trobrianders in their garden work, because, in the chapters that follow, we shall be studying economic activities. And the reader will grasp the attitude of the natives best if he has it illustrated to him by various examples. All that has been said in this matter about the Trobriander applies also to the neighboring tribes. V. With the help of this new insight gained into the mind of the native, and into their social scheme of harvest distribution, it will be easier to describe the nature of the chief's authority. Chieftainship in the Trobrians is the combination of two institutions, first, that of headmanship, or village authority. Secondly, that of totemic clanship, that is the division of the community into classes or castes, each with a certain more or less definite rank. In every community in the Trobrians, there is one man who wields the greatest authority, though often this does not amount to very much. He is, in many cases, nothing more than the primus inter pairs in a group of village elders, who deliberate on all important matters together, and arrive at a decision by common consent. It must not be forgotten that there is hardly ever much room for doubt or deliberation, as natives communally, as well as individually, never act except on traditional and conventional lines. This village headman is, as a rule, therefore, not much more than a master of tribal ceremonies, and the main speaker within and without the tribe, whenever one is needed. But the position of headman becomes much more than this, when he is a person of high rank, which is by no means always the case. In the Trobrians there exist four totemic clans, and each of these is divided into a number of smaller subclans, which could also be called families or castes, for the members of each claim common descent from one ancestress. And each of them holds a certain, specified rank. These subclans have also a local character, because the original ancestress emerged from a hole in the ground, as a rule somewhere in the neighborhood of their village community. There is not one subclan in the Trobrians whose members cannot indicate its original locality, where their group, in the form of the ancestress, first saw the light of the sun. Coral outcrops, waterholes, small caves or grottoes, are generally pointed out as the original holes, or houses, as they are called. Often such a hole is surrounded by one of the tabooed clumps of trees alluded to before. Many of them are situated in the grove surrounding a village, and a few near the seashore. Not one is on the cultivable land. The highest subclan is that of the Tabalu, belonging to the Malasi Totem clan. To this subclan belongs the main chief of Kiriwina, Tuolua, who resides in the village of Omerkana, C. And. He is in the first place the headman of his own village, and in contrast to the headman of low rank, he has quite a considerable amount of power. His high rank inspires everyone about him with the greatest and most genuine respect and awe, and the remnants of his power are still surprisingly large, even now, when white authorities, very foolishly and with fatal results, do their utmost to undermine his prestige and influence. Not only does the chief, by which word I shall designate a headman of rank, possess a high degree of authority within his own village, but his sphere of influence extends far beyond it. 
A number of villages are tributary to him, and in several respects subject to his authority. In case of war, they are his allies, and have to foregather in his village. When he needs men to perform some task, he can send to his subject villages, and they will supply him with workers. In all big festivities the villages of his district will join, and the chief will act as master of ceremonies. Nevertheless, for all these services rendered to him he has to pay. He even has to pay for any tributes received out of his stores of wealth. Wealth, in the Trobriens, is the outward sign and the substance of power, and the means also of exercising it. But how does he acquire his wealth? And here we come to the main duty of the vassal villages to the chief. From each subject village, he takes a wife, whose family, according to the Trobriand law, has to supply him with large amounts of crops. This wife is always the sister or some relation of the headman of the subject village, and thus practically the whole community has to work for him. In olden days, the chief of Omer Khanna had up to as many as forty consorts, and received perhaps as much as thirty to fifty percent of all the garden produce of Kirawina. Even now, when his wives number only sixteen, he has enormous storehouses, and they are full to the roof with yams every harvest time. With this supply, he is able to pay for the many services he requires, to furnish with food the participants in big feasts, in tribal gatherings or distant expeditions. Part of the food he uses to acquire objects of native wealth, or to pay for the making of them. In brief, through his privilege of practicing polygamy, the chief is kept supplied with an abundance of wealth in foodstuffs and in valuables, which he uses to maintain his high position. To organize tribal festivities and enterprises, and to pay, according to custom, for the many personal services to which he is entitled. One point in connection with the chief's authority deserves special mention. Power implies not only the possibility of rewarding, but also the means of punishing. This in the Trobriens is as a rule done indirectly, by means of sorcery. The chief has the best sorcerers of the district always at his beck and call. Of course he also has to reward them when they do him a service. If anyone offends him, or trespasses upon his authority, the chief summons the sorcerer, and orders that the culprit shall die by black magic. And here the chief is powerfully helped in achieving his end by the fact that he can do this openly, so that everybody, and the victim himself knows that a sorcerer is after him. As the natives are very deeply and genuinely afraid of sorcery, the feeling of being hunted, of imagining themselves doomed, is in itself enough to doom them in reality. Only in extreme cases does a chief inflict direct punishment on a culprit. He has one or two hereditary henchmen, whose duty it is to kill the man who has so deeply offended him, that actual death is the only sufficient punishment. As a matter of fact, very few cases of this are on record, and it is now, of course, entirely in abeyance. Thus the chief's position can be grasped only through the realization of the high importance of wealth, of the necessity of paying for everything, even for services which are due to him, and which could not be withheld. Again, this wealth comes to the chief from his relations-in-law, and it is through his right to practice polygamy that he actually achieves his position, and exercises his power. Side by side with this rather complex mechanism of authority, the prestige of rank, the direct recognition of his personal superiority, give the chief an immense power, even outside his district. Except for the few of his own rank, no native in the Trobriens will remain erect and the great chief of Omer Khanna approaches, even in these days of tribal disintegration. Wherever he goes, he is considered as the most important person, is seated on a high platform, and treated with consideration. Of course the fact that he is accorded marks of great deference, and approached in the manner as if he were a supreme despot, does not mean that perfect good fellowship and sociability do not reign in his personal relations with his companions and vassals. There is no difference in interests or outlook between him and his subjects. They sit together and chat, they exchange village gossip, the only difference being that the chief is always on his guard, and much more reticent and diplomatic than the other, though he is no less interested. The chief, unless he is too old, joins in dances and even in games, and indeed he takes precedence as a matter of course. 
In trying to realize the social conditions among the Trobrianders and their neighbors, it must not be forgotten that their social organization is in certain respects complex and ill-defined. Besides very definite laws which are strictly obeyed, there exist a number of quaint usages, of vague graduations and rules, of others where the exceptions are so many, that they rather obliterate the rule than confirm it. The narrow social outlook of the native who does not see beyond his own district, the prevalence of singularities and exceptional cases is one of the leading characteristics of native sociology. One which for many reasons has not been sufficiently recognized. But the main outlines of chieftainship here presented, will be enough to give a clear idea of it and of some of the flavor of their institutions, as much, in fact, as is necessary, in order to understand the chief's role in the Kula. But it must to a certain extent be supplemented by the concrete data, bearing upon the political divisions of the Trobrians. The most important chief is, as said, the one who resides in Omerkana and rules Kiriwina, agriculturally the richest and most important district. His family, or sub-clan, the Tabulu, are acknowledged to have by far the highest rank in all the archipelago. Their fame is spread over the whole Kula district. The entire province of Kiriwina derives prestige from its chief, and its inhabitants also keep all his personal taboos, which is a duty but also a distinction. Next to the high chief, there resides in a village some two miles distant, a personage who, though in several respects his vassal, is also his main foe and rival, the headman of Kabwaku, and ruler of the province of Tilatala. The present holder of this title is an old rogue named Moliasi. From time to time, in the old days, war used to break out between the two provinces, each of which could muster some twelve villages for the fight. These wars were never very bloody or of long duration, and they were in many ways fought in a competitive, sporting manner, since, unlike with the Dabuans and southern Masim, there were neither head-hunting nor cannibalistic practices among the Boyans. Nevertheless, defeat was a serious matter. It meant a temporary destruction of the losers' villages, and exile for a year or two. After that, a ceremony of reconciliation took place, and friend and foe would help to rebuild the villages. The ruler of Tilatala has an intermediate rank, and outside his district he does not enjoy much prestige, but within it, he has a considerable amount of power, and a good deal of wealth, in the shape of stored food and ceremonial articles. All the villages under his rule, have, of course, their own independent headmen, who, being of low rank, have only a small degree of local authority. In the west of the big, northern half of Boyawa, that is of the main island of the Trobriand group, are again two districts, in past times often at war with one another. One of them, Kuboma, subject to the chief of Gumalababa, of high rank, though inferior to the chief of Kiriwina, consists of some ten inland villages, and is very important as a center of industry. Among these villages are included those of Yalaka, Budawelaka, Kutakwekala, where the quicklime is prepared for beetle chewing, and also the lime pots made. The highly artistic designs, burnt in on the lime pots, are the speciality of these villagers, but unfortunately the industry is fast decaying. The inhabitants of Luya are renowned for their basket work, of which the finest specimens are their production. But the most remarkable of all is the village of Boidalu, whose inhabitants are at the same time the most despised pariahs, the most dreaded sorcerers, and the most skillful and industrious craftsmen in the island. They belong to several sub-clans, all originating in the neighborhood of the village, near which also, according to tradition, the original sorcerer came out of the soil in the form of a crab. They eat the flesh of bush pigs, and they catch and eat the stingery, both objects of strict taboos and of genuine loathing to the other inhabitants of northern Boyawa. For this reason they are despised and regarded as unclean by the others. In olden days they would have to crouch lower and more abjectly than anyone else. No man or woman would mate with anyone from Boidalu, whether in marriage or in an intrigue. Yet in wood carving, and especially in the working out of the wonderful, round dishes, in the manufacture of plated fiber work, and in the production of combs, they are far more skillful than anyone else, and acknowledged to be such. They are the wholesale manufacturers of these objects for export, and they can produce work not to be rivaled by any other village. 
The five villages lying on the western coast of the northern half, on the shores of the lagoon, form the district of Kolomita. They are all fishing villages, but differ in their methods, and each has its own fishing grounds and its own methods of exploiting them. The district is much less homogeneous than any of those before mentioned. It possesses no paramount chief, and even in war the villagers used not to fight on the same side. But it is impossible to enter here into all these shades and singularities of political organization. In the southern part of Boyawa, there is first the province of Luba, occupying the waste of the island, the part where it narrows down to a long isthmus. This part is ruled by a chief of high rank, who resides in Alavalivi. He belongs to the same family as the chief of Omarakana, and this southern dominion is the result of a younger line's having branched off some three generations ago. This happened after an unsuccessful war, when the whole tribe of Kirawina fled south to Luba, and lived there for two years in a temporary village. The main body returned afterwards, but a number remained behind with the chief's brother, and thus the village of Olivalivi was founded. Wawela, which was formerly a very big village, now consists of hardly more than twenty huts. The only one on the eastern shore which lies right on the sea, it is very picturesquely situated, overlooking a wide bay with a clean beach. It is of importance as the traditional center of astronomical knowledge. From here, for generation after generation up to the present day, the calendar of the natives has been regulated. This means that some of the most important dates are fixed, especially that of the great annual festival, the Milamala, always held at full moon. Again, Wawela is one of the villages where the second form of sorcery, that of the flying witches, has its main trobriand home. In fact, according to native belief, this form of sorcery has its seat only in the southern half, and is unknown to the women in the north, though the southern witches extend their field of operations all over Boyawa. Wawela, which lies facing the east, and which is always in close touch with the villages of Kideva and the rest of the Marshall Bennets, shares with these islands the reputation of harboring many women who can fly, kill by magic. Who also feed on corpses, and are especially dangerous to seamen in peril. Further down to the south, on the western shore of the lagoon, we come to the big settlement of Sinekita, consisting of some six villages lying within a few hundred yards from one another but each having its own headmen and a certain amount of local characteristics. These villages form, however, one community for purposes of war and of the Kula. Some of the local headmen of Sinekita claim the highest rank, some are commoners. But on the whole, both the principle of rank and the power of the chief break down more and more as we move south. Beyond Sinekita, we meet a few more villages, who practice a local Kula, and with whom we shall have to deal later on. Sinekita itself will loom very largely in the descriptions that follow. The southern part of the island is sometimes called Kabewajina, but it does not constitute a definite political unit, like the northern districts. Finally, south of the main island, divided from it by a narrow channel, lies the half-moon-shaped island of Vakuta, to which belong four small villages and one big one. Within recent times, perhaps four to six generations ago, there came down and settled in this last mentioned one a branch of the real Tabalu, the chiefly family of highest rank. But their power here never assumed the proportions even of the small chiefs of Sinekita. In Vakuta, the typical Papio-Melanesian system of government by tribal elders, with one more prominent than the others, but not paramount, is in full vigor. The two big settlements of Sinekita and Vakuta play a great part in the Kula, and they also are the only two communities in the whole Trobriands where the red shell discs are made. This industry, as we shall see, is closely associated with the Kula. Politically, Sinekita and Vakuta are rivals, and in olden days were periodically at war with one another. Another district which forms a definite political and cultural unit is the large island of Kelula, in the west. The inhabitants are fishermen, canoe builders, and traders, and undertake big expeditions to the western D'Entrecastos Islands, trading for betel nut, sago, pottery and turtle shell in exchange for their own industrial produce. It has been necessary to give a somewhat detailed description of chieftainship and political divisions, as a firm grasp of the main, political institutions is essential to the understanding of the Kula. 
All departments of tribal life, religion, magic, economics are interwoven, but the social organization of the tribe lies at the foundation of everything else. Thus it is essential to bear in mind that the Trobrians form one cultural unit, speaking the same language, having the same institutions, obeying the same laws and regulations, swayed by the same beliefs and conventions. The districts just enumerated, into which the Trobrians are subdivided, are distinct politically and not culturally. That is, each of them comprises the same kind of natives, only obeying or at least acknowledging their own chief, having their own interests and pursuits, and in case of war each fighting their own fight. Again, within each district, the several village communities have each a great deal of independence. A village community is represented by a headman, its members make their gardens in one block and under the guidance of their own garden magician. They carry on their own feasts and ceremonial arrangements, mourn their dead in common, and perform, in remembrance of their departed ones, an endless series of food distributions. In all big affairs, whether of the district or of the tribe, members of a village community keep together, and act in one group. 6. Right across the political and local divisions cut the totemic clans, each having a series of linked totems, with a bird as principal one. The members of these four clans are scattered over the whole tribe of Boyawa, and in each village community, members of all four are to be found, and even in every house, there are at least two classes represented. Since a husband must be of a different clan from his wife and children. There is a certain amount of solidarity within the clan, based on the very vague feeling of communal affinity to the totem birds and animals, but much more on the many social duties, such as the performance of certain ceremonies especially the mortuary ones, which band the members of a clan together. But real solidarity obtains only between members of a subclan. A subclan is a local division of a clan, whose members claim common ancestry, and hence real identity of bodily substance, and also are attached to the locality where their ancestors emerged. It is to these subclans that the idea of a definite rank attaches. One of the totemic clans, the Malasi, includes the most aristocratic sub-clan, the Tabalu, as well as the lowest one, the local division of the Malasi in Boitalu. A chief of the Tabalu feels very insulted if it is ever hinted that he is akin to one of the stingery eaters of the unclean village, although they are Malasi like himself. The principle of rank attached to totemic divisions is to be met only in Trobrian sociology, it is entirely foreign to all the other Papio-Melanesian tribes. As regards kinship, the main thing to be remembered is that the natives are matrilineal, and that the succession of rank, membership in all the social groups, and the inheritance of possessions descend in the maternal line. The mother's brother is considered the real guardian of a boy, and there is a series of mutual duties and obligations, which establish a very close and important relation between the two. The real kinship, the real identity of substance is considered to exist only between a man and his mother's relations. In the first rank of these, his brothers and sisters are specially near to him. For his sister or sisters he has to work as soon as they are grown up and married. But, in spite of that, a most rigorous taboo exists between them, beginning quite early in life. No man would joke and talk freely in the presence of his sister, or even look at her. The slightest allusion to the sexual affairs, whether illicit or matrimonial, of a brother or sister in the presence of the other, is the deadliest insult and mortification. When a man approaches a group of people where his sister is talking, either she withdraws or he turns away. The father's relation to his children is remarkable. Physiological fatherhood is unknown, and no tie of kinship or relationship is supposed to exist between father and child, except that between a mother's husband and the wife's child. Nevertheless, the father is by far the nearest and most affectionate friend of his children. In ever so many cases, I could observe that when a child, a young boy or girl, was in trouble or sick. When there was a question of someone exposing himself to difficulties or danger for the child's sake, it was always the father who worried, who would undergo all the hardships needed, and never the maternal uncle. This state of things is quite clearly recognized, and explicitly put into words by the natives. In matters of inheritance and handing over of possessions, 
a man always shows the tendency to do as much for his children as he is able, considering his obligations to his sister's family. Plate. 15. A family group. Tokolubakiki of Omurakana, with his mother, wife and children. C. Note the storehouse, with yams showing through the interstices. It is difficult, in one phrase or two, to epitomize the distinction between the two relations, that between a boy and his maternal uncle, and that between a son and a father. The best way to put it shortly might be by saying that the maternal uncle's position of close relation is regarded as right by law and usage, whereas the father's interest and affection for his children are due to sentiment. And to the intimate personal relations existing between them. He has watched the children grow up, he has assisted the mother in many of the small and tender cares given to an infant, he has carried the child about, and given it such education as it gets from watching the elder ones at work. And gradually joining in. In matters of inheritance, the father gives the children all that he can, and gives it freely and with pleasure, the maternal uncle gives under the compulsion of custom what he cannot withhold and keep for his own children. 7. A few more words must be said about some of the magical religious ideas of the Trobrianders. The main thing that struck me in connection with their belief in the spirits of the dead, was that they are almost completely devoid of any fear of ghosts. Of any of these uncanny feelings with which we face the idea of a possible return of the dead. All the fears and dreads of the natives are reserved for black magic, flying witches, malevolent disease-bringing beings, but above all for sorcerers and witches. The spirits migrate immediately after death to the island of Tuma, lying in the northwest of Boyoa, and there they exist for another span of time, underground, say some, on the surface of the earth, though invisible, say others. They return to visit their own villages once a year, and take part in the big annual feast, Milamala, where they receive offerings. Sometimes, at this season, they show themselves to the living, who are, however, not alarmed by it, and in general the spirits do not influence human beings very much, for better or worse. In a number of magical formulae, there is an invocation of ancestral spirits, and they receive offerings in several rites. But there is nothing of the mutual interaction, of the intimate collaboration between man and spirit which are the essence of religious cult. On the other hand, magic, the attempt of man to govern the forces of nature directly, by means of a special lore, is all-pervading, and all-important in the Trobriands. Sorcery and garden magic have already been mentioned. Here it must suffice to add, that everything that vitally affects the native is accompanied by magic. All economic activities have their magic. Love, welfare of babies, talents and crafts, beauty and agility, all can be fostered or frustrated by magic. In dealing with the kula, a pursuit of immense importance to the natives, and playing on almost all their social passions and ambitions, we shall meet with another system of magic. And we shall have then to go more into detail about the subject in general. Disease, health, or death are also the result of magic or countermagic. The Trobrianders have a very complex and very definite set of theoretical views on these matters. Good health is primarily of course the natural, normal state. Minor ills may be contracted by exposure, overeating, overstrain, bad food, or other ordinary causes. Such ailments never last, and have never any really bad effects, nor are they of immediate danger. But, if a man sickens for any length of time, and his strength seems to be really sapped, then the evil forces are at work. By far the most prevalent form of black magic, is that of the Bwagayu, that is the black sorcerer, of whom there are a number in each district. Usually even in each village there are one or two men more or less dreaded as Bwagayu. To be one does not require any special initiation except the knowledge of the spells. To learn these, that is, to learn them in such a manner as to become an acknowledged Bwagayu, can only be done by means of high payment, or in exceptional circumstances. Thus, a father will often give his sorcery to his son, always, however, without payment, or a commoner will teach it to a man of rank, or a man to his sister's son. In these two latter cases a very high payment would have to be given. It is important as a characteristic of the kinship conditions of this people, 
that a man receive sorcery gratis from his father, who according to the traditional kinship system is no blood relation. Whereas he has to pay for it to his maternal uncle, whose natural heir he is. When a man has acquired the black art, he applies it to a first victim, and this has always to be someone of his own family. It is a firm and definite belief among all the natives that if a man's sorcery has to be any good, it must first be practiced on his mother or sister, or any of his maternal kindred. Such a matricidal act makes him a genuine Bwagayu. His art then can be practiced on others, and becomes an established source of income. The beliefs about sorcery are complex, they differ according as to whether taken from a real sorcerer, or from an outsider. And there are also evidently strata of belief, due perhaps to local variation, perhaps to superimposed versions. Here a short summary must suffice. When a sorcerer wants to attack someone, the first step is to cast a light spell over his habitual haunts, a spell which will affect him with a slight illness and compel him to keep to his bed in his house. Where he will try to cure himself by lying over a small fire and warming his body. His first ailment, called Kanagola, comprises pains in the body, such as, speaking from our point of view, would be brought about by rheumatism, general cold, influenza, or any incipient disease. When the victim is in bed, with a fire burning under him, and also, as a rule, one in the middle of the hut, the Boagayu stealthily approaches the house. He is accompanied by a few nightbirds, owls and nightjars, which keep guard over him, and he is surrounded by a halo of legendary terrors which make all natives shiver at the idea of meeting a sorcerer on such a nocturnal visit. He then tries to insert through the thatch wall a bunch of herbs impregnated with some deadly charm and tied to a long stick, and these he attempts to thrust into the fire over which the sick man is lying. If he succeeds, the fumes of the burnt leaves will be inhaled by the victim, whose name has been uttered in the charm, and he will be seized by one or other of the deadly diseases of which the natives have a long list. With a definite symptomatology, as well as a magical etiology. Thus the preliminary sorcery was necessary, in order to keep the victim to his house, in which spot only can the mortal magic be performed. Of course, the sick man is on the defensive as well. First of all, his friends and relatives, this is one of the main duties of the wife's brothers, will keep a close watch over him, sitting with spears round the hut, and at all approaches to it. Often have I come across such vigils, when walking late at night through some village. Then, the services of some rival Boagayu are invoked, for the art of killing and curing is always in the same hand, and he utters counterspells, so that at times the efforts of the first sorcerer. Even should he succeed in burning the herbs according to the dreaded Tajinave rite, are fruitless. Should this be so, he resorts to the final and most fatal rite, that of the pointing bone. Uttering powerful spells, the Boagayu and one or two accomplices, boil some coconut oil in a small pot, far away in a dense patch of jungle. Leaves of herbs are soaked in the oil, and then wrapped round a sharp stingery spine, or some similar pointed object, and the final incantation, most deadly of all, is chanted over it. Then the Boagayu steals towards the village, catches sight of his victim, and hiding himself behind a shrub or house, points the magical dagger at him. In fact, he violently and viciously turns it round in the air, as if to stab the victim, and to twist and wrench the point in the wound. This, if carried out properly, and not counteracted by a still more powerful magician, will never fail to kill a man. I have here summarized the bare outlines of the successive application of black magic as it is believed by sorcerer and outsider alike to be done, and to act in producing disease and death. There can be no doubt that the acts of sorcery are really carried out by those who believe themselves to possess the black powers. It is equally certain that the nervous strain of knowing one's life to be threatened by a Boagayu is very great, and probably it is much worse when a man knows that behind the sorcerer stands the might of the chief. And this apprehension certainly contributes powerfully towards the success of black magic. On the other hand, a chief, if attacked, would have a good guard to protect him, and the most powerful wizards to back him up, and also the authority to deal directly with anyone suspected of plotting against him. Thus sorcery, which is one of the means of carrying on the established order, is in its turn strengthened by it. 
If we remember that, as in all belief in the miraculous and supernatural, so also here, there is the loophole of counterforces, and of the sorcery being incorrectly or inefficiently applied, spoilt by broken taboos, mispronounced spells. Or what not? Again, that suggestion strongly influences the victim, and undermines his natural resistance. Further that all disease is invariably traced back to some sorcerer or other, who, whether it is true or not, often frankly admits his responsibility in order to enhance his reputation. There is then no difficulty in understanding why the belief in black magic flourishes, why no empirical evidence can ever dispel it, and why the sorcerer no less than the victim, has confidence in his own powers. At least, the difficulty is the same as in explaining many contemporary examples of results achieved by miracles and faith healing, such as Christian science or Lourdes, or in any cure by prayers and devotion. Although by far the most important of them all, the Boagayu is only one among the beings who can cause disease and death. The often mentioned flying witches, who come always from the southern half of the island, or from the east, from the islands of Kideva, Iwa, Gava, or Murua, are even more deadly. All very rapid and violent diseases, more especially such as show no direct, perceptible symptoms, are attributed to the Molokwazi, as they are called. Invisible, they fly through the air, and perch on trees, housetops, and other high places. From there, they pounce upon a man or woman and remove and hide the inside, that is, the lungs, heart and guts, or the brains and tongue. Such a victim will die within a day or two, unless another witch, called for the purpose and well paid, goes in search and restores the missing, inside. Of course, sometimes it is too late to do it, as the meal has been eaten in the meantime. Then the victim must die. Another powerful agency of death consists of the Tauviyu, non-human though anthropomorphic beings, who cause all epidemic disease. When, at the end of the rainy season the new and unripe yams have come in, and dysentery rages, decimating the villages. Or, when in hot and damp years an infectious disease passes over the district, taking heavy toll, this means that the Tauviyu have come from the south, and that, invisible, they march through the villages, rattling their lime gourds. And with their sword clubs or sticks hitting their victims, who immediately sicken and die. The Tauviyu can, at will, assume the shape of man or reptile. He appears then as a snake, or crab, or lizard, and you recognize him at once, for he will not run away from you, and he has as a rule a patch of some gaudy color on his skin. It would be a fatal thing to kill such a reptile. On the contrary, it has to be taken up cautiously and treated as a chief. That is to say, it is placed on a high platform, and some of the valuable tokens of wealth, a polished green stone blade, or a pair of arm shells, or a necklace of spondylus shell beads must be put before it as an offering. It is very interesting to note that the Tauviyu are believed to come from the northern coast of Normanby Island, from the district of Duayu, and more especially from a place called Sawatapa. This is the very place where, according to Dabuan belief and myth, their sorcery originated. Thus, what to the local tribes of the originating place is ordinary sorcery, practiced by men, becomes, when looked at from a great distance, and from an alien tribe, a non-human agency, endowed with such supernormal powers as changing of shape, invisibility, and a direct, infallible method of inflicting death. The Talviyu have sometimes sexual intercourse with women, several present cases are on record, and such women who have a familiar Tauviyu become dangerous witches, though how they practice their witchcraft is not quite clear to the natives. A much less dangerous being is the Takwe, a wood sprite, living in trees and rocks, stealing crops from the field and from the yam houses, and inflicting slight ailments. Some men in the past have acquired the knowledge of how to do this from the Takwe, and have handed it on to their descendants. So we see that, except for the very light ailments which pass quickly and easily, all disease is attributed to sorcery. Even accidents are not believed to happen without cause. That this is the case also with drowning, we shall learn more in detail, when we have to follow the Trobrianders in their dangerous sea trips. Natural death, caused by old age, is admittedly possible, 
but when I asked in several concrete cases, in which age was obviously the cause, why such and such a man died, I was always told that a Boisvilleux was at the back of it. Only suicide and death in battle have a different place in the mind of the natives, and this is also confirmed by the belief that people killed in war, those that commit suicide, and those who are bewitched to death have, each class, their own way to the other world. This sketch of Trobriand tribal life, belief and customs must suffice, and we shall still have opportunities of enlarging upon these subjects that most matter to us for the present study. 8. Two more districts remain to be mentioned, through which the Kula trade passes on its circuit, before it returns to the place from where we started. One of them is the eastern portion of the northern Mas Sim, comprising the Marshall Bennett Islands, Kideva, Iwa, Gawa, Kwayawada, and Woodlark Island, Murua, with the small group of Nada Islands. The other district is that of Asti. Agnan Island, called by the natives Masima, or Masima, with the smaller island Panayati. Looking from the rocky shores of Boyawa, at its narrowest point, we can see over the white breakers on the fringing reef and over the sea, here always blue and limpid, the silhouette of a flat-topped, low rock, almost due east. This is Kideva. To the Trobrianders of the eastern districts, this island and those behind it are the promised land of the Kula, just as Dobu is to the natives of southern Boyawa. But here, unlike in the south, they have to deal with tribesmen who speak their own language, with dialectic differences only, and who have very much the same institutions and customs. In fact, the nearest island, Kideva, differs only very little from the Trobrians. Although the more distant islands, especially Murua, have a slightly different form of totemism, with hardly any idea of rank attached to the subclans, and consequently no chieftainship in the Trobrian sense. Yet their social organization is also much the same as in the western province. I know the natives only from having seen them very frequently and in great numbers in the Trobrians, where they come on Kula expeditions. In Murua, however, I spent a short time doing fieldwork in the village of Dikoyas. In appearance, dress, ornaments and manners, the natives are indistinguishable from the Trobrianders. Their ideas and customs in matters of sex, marriage and kinship are, with variations in detail only, the same as in Boyawa. In beliefs and mythology, they also belong to the same culture. To the Trobrianders, the eastern islands are also the chief home and stronghold of the dreaded Molokwazi, flying witches. The land whence love magic came, originating in the island of Iwa, the distant shores towards which the mythical hero Tadava sailed, performing many feats, till he finally disappeared, no one knows where. The most recent version is that he most likely finished his career in the white man's country. To the eastern islands, says native belief, the spirits of the dead, killed by sorcery, go round on a short visit not stopping there, only floating through the air like clouds, before they turn round to the northwest to Tuma. From these islands, many important products come to Boyawa, the Trobrians, but none half as important as the tough, homogeneous greenstone, from which all their implements were made in the past. And of which the ceremonial axes are made up till now. Some of these places are renowned for their yam gardens, especially Kideva, and it is recognized that the best carving in black ebony comes from there. The most important point of difference between the natives of this district and the Trobrianders, lies in the method of mortuary distributions, to which subject we shall have to return in a later part of the book. As it is closely connected with Kula. From Murua, Woodlark Island, the Kula track curves over to the south in two different branches, one direct to Tube Tube, and the other to Masima, and thence to Tube Tube and Wari. The district of Masima is almost entirely unknown to me, I have only spoken once or twice with natives of this island, and there is not, to my knowledge, any reliable published information about that district. So we shall have to pass it over with a very few words. This is, however, not so alarming, because it is certain, even from the little I know about them, that the natives do not essentially differ from the other Masim. They are totemic and matrilineal. There is no chieftainship, and the form of authority is the same as in the southern Masim. Their sorcerers and witches resemble those of the southern Masim and Dabuans. In industries, they specialize in canoe building, 
and in the small island of Panayati produced the same type of craft as the natives of Gawa and Woodlark Island, slightly different only from the Trobrian canoe. In the island of Misima, a very big supply of Erica, beetle, nut is produced, as there is a custom of planting a number of these nuts after a man's death. The small islands of Tube Tube and Wari, which form the final link of the Kula, lie already within the district of the southern Masim. In fact, the island of Tube Tube is one of the places studied in detail by Professor Seligman, and its ethnographical description is one of three parallel monographs which form the division of the southern Masim in the treatise so often quoted. Finally, I want to point out again that the descriptions of the various Kula districts given in this and in the previous chapter, though accurate in every detail, are not meant to be an exhaustive ethnographic sketch of the tribes. They have been given with a few light touches in order to produce a vivid and so to speak personal impression of the various type of natives, and countries, and of cultures. If I have succeeded in giving a physiognomy to each of the various tribes, to the Trobrianders, to the Amphletans, the Dobuans, and the Southern Masim, and in arousing some interest in them, the main purpose has been achieved. And the necessary ethnographic background for the Kula has been supplied. Plate 16. Arms Hells This shows the several varieties, differing in size and finish. C. Plate 17. Two men wearing arms hells. This illustrates the manner in which the arms hells are usually adorned with beads, pendants and ribbons of dried pandanus. I do not remember having seen more than once or twice men wearing arms hells, and then they were in full dancing array. C. Already Dr. C. G. Seligman has noticed that there are people of an outstanding fine physical type among the northern Masim, of whom the Trobrianders form the western section. People who are, generally taller, often very notably so, than the individuals of the short-faced, broad-nosed type, in whom the bridge of the nose is very low. Op Sit, page 8. I have dealt with the subject of garden work in the Trobrians and with its economic importance more fully in an article entitled The Primitive Economics of the Trobriand Islanders, in the Economic Journal, March, 1921. This does not mean that the general economic conclusions are wrong. The economic nature of man is as a rule illustrated on imaginary savages for didactic purposes only, and the conclusions of the authors are in reality based on their study of the facts of developed economics. But, nevertheless, quite apart from the fact that pedagogically it is a wrong principle to make matters look more simple by introducing a falsehood. It is the ethnographer's duty and right to protest against the introduction from outside of false facts into his own field of study. Compare Professor C. G. Seligman, Op. Sit, pages 663-668, to also the author, article on, War and Weapons Among the Trobriand Islanders, in Man, January, 1918. Compare the author's article on, Fishing and Fishing Magic in the Trobriands, Man, June, 1918. The discovery of the existence of, linked totems, and the introduction of this term and conception are due to Professor C. G. Seligman. Opsit, pp. 9, 11, see also index. See the author's article, Beloma, Spirits of the Dead, Part 7, JRAI, 1917, where this statement has been substantiated with abundant evidence. Further information obtained during another expedition to the Trobriands, established by an additional wealth of detail the complete ignorance of physiological fatherhood. See the author's article, Beloma, Spirits of the Dead, quoted above. I am using the words religion and magic according to Sir James Fraser's distinction, see, Golden Bough, Volume 1. Fraser's definition suits the Kirawinian facts much better than any other one. In fact, although I started my field work convinced that the theories of religion and magic expounded in the Golden Bough are inadequate, I was forced by all my observations in New Guinea to come over to Fraser's position. Compare Professor C. G. Seligman, Op. Sit, The Parallel Description of the Social Institutions in the Trobriands, Marshall Bennett's, Woodlark Island, and the Lufflands, Chapters 49 LV. Chapter 3. The Essentials of the Kula. I. Having thus described the scene, and the actors, 
let us now proceed to the performance. The kula is a form of exchange, of extensive, intertribal character. It is carried on by communities inhabiting a wide ring of islands, which form a closed circuit. This circuit can be seen on, where it is represented by the lines joining a number of islands to the north and east of the east end of New Guinea. Along this route, articles of two kinds, and these two kinds only, are constantly traveling in opposite directions. In the direction of the hands of a clock, moves constantly one of these kinds, long necklaces of red shell, called soleva, plates end. In the opposite direction moves the other kind, bracelets of white shell called mwali, plates end. Each of these articles, as it travels in its own direction on the closed circuit, meets on its way articles of the other class, and is constantly being exchanged for them. Every movement of the Kula articles, every detail of the transactions is fixed and regulated by a set of traditional rules and conventions, and some acts of the Kula are accompanied by an elaborate magical ritual and public ceremonies. On every island and in every village, a more or less limited number of men take part in the Kula, that is to say, receive the goods, hold them for a short time, and then pass them on. Therefore every man who is in the Kula, periodically though not regularly, receives one or several mwali, arm shells, or a soleva, necklace of red shell discs, and then has to hand it on to one of his partners, from whom he receives the opposite commodity in exchange. Thus no man ever keeps any of the articles for any length of time in his possession. One transaction does not finish the kula relationship, the rule being, once in the kula, always in the kula, and a partnership between two men is a permanent and lifelong affair. Again, any given mwali or soleva may always be found traveling and changing hands, and there is no question of its ever settling down, so that the principle, once in the kula, always in the kula, applies also to the valuables themselves. Map V, the Kula Ring The ceremonial exchange of the two articles is the main, the fundamental aspect of the kula. But associated with it, and done under its cover, we find a great number of secondary activities and features. Thus, side by side with the ritual exchange of arm shells and necklaces, the natives carry on ordinary trade, bartering from one island to another a great number of utilities, often unprocurable in the district to which they are imported. And indispensable there. Further, there are other activities, preliminary to the kula, or associated with it, such as the building of seagoing canoes for the expeditions, certain big forms of mortuary ceremonies, and preparatory taboos. The kula is thus an extremely big and complex institution, both in its geographical extent, and in the manifoldness of its component pursuits. It welds together a considerable number of tribes, and it embraces a vast complex of activities, interconnected, and playing into one another, so as to form one organic whole. Yet it must be remembered that what appears to us an extensive, complicated, and yet well-ordered institution is the outcome of ever so many doings and pursuits, carried on by savages, who have no laws or aims or charters definitely laid down. They have no knowledge of the total outline of any of their social structure. They know their own motives, know the purpose of individual actions and the rules which apply to them, but how, out of these, the whole collective institution shapes, this is beyond their mental range. Not even the most intelligent native has any clear idea of the kula as a big, organized social construction, still less of its sociological function and implications. If you were to ask him what the kula is, he would answer by giving a few details, most likely by giving his personal experiences and subjective views on the kula, but nothing approaching the definition just given here. Not even a partial coherent account could be obtained. For the integral picture does not exist in his mind, he is in it, and cannot see the whole from the outside. The integration of all the details observed, the achievement of a sociological synthesis of all the various, relevant symptoms, is the task of the ethnographer. First of all, he has to find out that certain activities, which at first sight might appear incoherent and not correlated, have a meaning. He then has to find out what is constant and relevant in these activities, and what accidental and inessential, that is, to find out the laws and rules of all the transactions. Again, the ethnographer has to construct the picture of the big institution, 
very much as the physicist constructs his theory from the experimental data, which always have been within reach of everybody, but which needed a consistent interpretation. I have touched on this point of method in the introduction, divisions and, but I have repeated it here, as it is necessary to grasp it clearly in order not to lose the right perspective of conditions as they really exist among the natives. 2. In giving the above abstract and concise definition, I had to reverse the order of research, as this is done in ethnographic fieldwork. Where the most generalized inferences are obtained as the result of long inquiries and laborious inductions. The general definition of the Kula will serve as a sort of plan or diagram in our further concrete and detailed descriptions. And this is the more necessary as the Kula is concerned with the exchange of wealth and utilities, and therefore it is an economic institution. And there is no other aspect of primitive life where our knowledge is more scanty and our understanding more superficial than in economics. Hence misconception is rampant, and it is necessary to clear the ground when approaching any economic subject. Thus in the introduction we called the Kula a form of trade, and we ranged it alongside other systems of barter. This is quite correct, if we give the word trade a sufficiently wide interpretation, and mean by it any exchange of goods. But the word trade is used in current ethnography and economic literature with so many different implications that a whole lot of misleading, preconceived ideas have to be brushed aside in order to grasp the facts correctly. Thus the a priori current notion of primitive trade would be that of an exchange of indispensable or useful articles, done without much ceremony or regulation, under stress of dearth or need, in spasmodic. Irregular intervals, and this done either by direct barter, everyone looking out sharply not to be done out of his due, or, if the savages were too timid and distrustful to face one another, by some customary arrangement. Securing by means of heavy penalties compliance in the obligations incurred or imposed. Waiving for the present the question how far this conception is valid or not in general, in my opinion it is quite misleading, we have to realize clearly that the Kula contradicts in almost every point the above definition of savage trade. It shows to us primitive exchange in an entirely different light. The Kula is not a surreptitious and precarious form of exchange. It is, quite on the contrary, rooted in myth, backed by traditional law, and surrounded with magical rites. All its main transactions are public and ceremonial, and carried out according to definite rules. It is not done on the spur of the moment, but happens periodically, at dates settled in advance, and it is carried on along definite trade routes, which must lead to fixed trysting places. Sociologically, though transacted between tribes differing in language, culture, and probably even in race, it is based on a fixed and permanent status, on a partnership which binds into couples some thousands of individuals. This partnership is a lifelong relationship, it implies various mutual duties and privileges, and constitutes a type of intertribal relationship on an enormous scale. As to the economic mechanism of the transactions, this is based on a specific form of credit, which implies a high degree of mutual trust and commercial honor, and this refers also to the subsidiary, minor trade, which accompanies the Kula proper. Finally, the Kula is not done under stress of any need, since its main aim is to exchange articles which are of no practical use. From the concise definition of Kula given at the beginning of this chapter, we see that in its final essence, divested of all trappings and accessories, it is a very simple affair, which at first sight might even appear tame and unromantic. After all, it only consists of an exchange, interminably repeated, of two articles intended for ornamentation, but not even used for that to any extent. Yet this simple action, this passing from hand to hand of two meaningless and quite useless objects, has somehow succeeded in becoming the foundation of a big intertribal institution, in being associated with ever so many other activities. Myth, magic and tradition have built up around it definite ritual and ceremonial forms, have given it a halo of romance and value in the minds of the natives, have indeed created a passion in their hearts for this simple exchange. The definition of the Kula must now be amplified, and we must describe one after the other its fundamental characteristics and main rules. So that it may be clearly grasped by what mechanism the mere exchange of two articles results in an institution so vast, complex, and deeply rooted. 3. 
First of all, a few words must be said about the two principal objects of exchange, the arm shells, Mwali, and the necklaces, Soleva. The arm shells are obtained by breaking off the top and the narrow end of a big, cone-shaped shell, conus millipunctatus, and then polishing up the remaining ring. These bracelets are highly coveted by all the Papua Melanesians of New Guinea, and they spread even into the pure Papuan district of the Gulf. The manner of wearing the arm shells is illustrated by, where the men have put them on on purpose to be photographed. The use of the small discs of red spondylus shell, out of which the soleva are made, is also of a very wide diffusion. There is a manufacturing center of them in one of the villages in Port Moresby, and also in several places in eastern New Guinea, notably in Rossell Island, and in the Trobriands. I have said, use, on purpose here, because these small beads, each of them a flat, round disc with a hole in the center, colored anything from muddy brown to carmine red, are employed in various ways for ornamentation. They are most generally used as part of earrings, made of rings of turtle shell, which are attached to the ear lobe, and from which hang a cluster of the shell discs. These earrings are very much worn, and, especially among the moss sim, you see them on the ears of every second man or woman, while others are satisfied with turtle shell alone, unornamented with the shell discs. Another everyday ornament, frequently met with and worn, especially by young girls and boys, consists of a short necklace, just encircling the neck, made of the red spondylus discs, with one or more cowrie shell pendants. These shell discs can be, and often are, used in the makeup of the various classes of the more elaborate ornaments, worn on festive occasions only. Here, however, we are more especially concerned with the very long necklaces, measuring from 2 to 5 meters, made of spondylus discs, of which there are two main varieties, one, much the finer, with a big shell pendant. The other made of bigger discs, and with a few cowrie shells or black banana seeds in the center, see. The arm shells on the one hand, and the long spondylus shell strings on the other, the two main kula articles, are primarily ornaments. As such, they are used with the most elaborate dancing dress only, and on very festive occasions such as big ceremonial dances, great feasts, and big gatherings, where several villages are represented, as can be seen in. Never could they be used as everyday ornaments, nor on occasions of minor importance, such as a small dance in the village, a harvest gathering, a love-making expedition, when facial painting. Floral decoration and smaller though not quite everyday ornaments are worn, see plates end. But even though usable and sometimes used, this is not the main function of these articles. Thus, a chief may have several shell strings in his possession, and a few arm shells. Supposing that a big dance is held in his or in a neighboring village, he will not put on his ornaments himself if he goes to assist at it, unless he intends to dance and decorate himself, but any of his relatives. His children or his friends and even vassals, can have the use of them for the asking. If you go to a feast or a dance where there are a number of men wearing such ornaments, and ask any one of them at random to whom it belongs, the chances are that more than half of them will answer that they themselves are not the owners. But that they had the articles lent to them. These objects are not owned in order to be used, the privilege of decorating oneself with them is not the real aim of possession. Plate. 18. Two necklaces, made of red spondylus discs. On the left, the soleva, or baggy, the real kula article. On the right, the katutababal, or samakupa, as it is called among the southern Masim, made of bigger discs, manufactured in the villages of Sinakita and Vakuta, Trobriand Islands. This latter article does not play any important part in the kula. C. and. Plate. 19. Two women adorned with necklaces. This shows the manner in which a soleva is worn, when used as a decoration. C. Indeed, and this is more significant, by far the greater number of the arm shells, easily 90%, are of too small a size to be worn even by young boys and girls. A few are so big and valuable that they would not be worn at all, except once in a decade by a very important man on a very festive day. Though all the shell strings can be worn, some of them are again considered too valuable, and are cumbersome for frequent use, 
and would be worn on very exceptional occasions only. This negative description leaves us with the questions, why, then, are these objects valued, what purpose do they serve? The full answer to this question will emerge out of the whole story contained in the following chapters, but an approximate idea must be given at once. As it is always better to approach the unknown through the known, let us consider for a moment whether among ourselves we have not some type of objects which play a similar role and which are used and possessed in the same manner. When, after a six years' absence in the South Seas and Australia, I returned to Europe and did my first bit of sightseeing in Edinburgh Castle, I was shown the crown jewels. The keeper told many stories of how they were worn by this or that king or queen on such and such occasion, of how some of them had been taken over to London, to the great and just indignation of the whole Scottish nation, how they were restored. And how now everyone can be pleased, since they are safe under lock and key, and no one can touch them. As I was looking at them and thinking how ugly, useless, ungainly, even tawdry they were, I had the feeling that something similar had been told to me of late, and that I had seen many other objects of this sort. Which made a similar impression on me. And then arose before me the vision of a native village on coral soil, and a small, rickety platform temporarily erected under a pandanus thatch, surrounded by a number of brown, naked men, and one of them showing me long, thin red strings. And big, white, worn-out objects, clumsy to sight and greasy to touch. With reverence he also would name them, and tell their history, and by whom and when they were worn, and how they changed hands, and how their temporary possession was a great sign of the importance and glory of the village. The analogy between the European and the Trobriand Vegue, valuables, must be delimited with more precision. The crown jewels, in fact, any heirlooms too valuable and too cumbersome to be worn, represent the same type as Vegue in that they are merely possessed for the sake of possession itself. And the ownership of them with the ensuing renown is the main source of their value. Also both heirlooms and Vegue are cherished because of the historical sentiment which surrounds them. However ugly, useless, and, according to current standards, valueless an object may be, if it has figured in historical scenes and passed through the hands of historic persons. And is therefore an unfailing vehicle of important sentimental associations, it cannot but be precious to us. This historic sentimentalism, which indeed has a large share in our general interest in studies of past events, exists also in the South Seas. Every really good Kula article has its individual name, round each there is a sort of history and romance in the traditions of the natives. Crown jewels or heirlooms are insignia of rank and symbols of wealth respectively, and in olden days with us, and in New Guinea up till a few years ago, both rank and wealth went together. The main point of difference is that the Kula goods are only in possession for a time, whereas the European treasure must be permanently owned in order to have full value. Taking a broader, ethnological view of the question, we may class the Kula valuables among the many ceremonial objects of wealth. Enormous, carved and decorated weapons, stone implements, articles of domestic and industrial nature, too well decorated and too clumsy for use. Such things are usually called ceremonial, but this word seems to cover a great number of meanings and much that has no meaning at all. In fact, very often, especially on museum labels, an article is called ceremonial simply because nothing is known about its uses and general nature. Speaking only about museum exhibits from New Guinea, I can say that many so called ceremonial objects are nothing but simply overgrown objects of use which preciousness of material and amount of labor expended have transformed into reservoirs of condensed economic value. Again, others are used on festive occasions, but play no part whatever in rites and ceremonies, and serve for decoration only, and these might be called objects of parade, comp. Finally, a number of these articles function actually as instruments of a magical or religious rite, and belong to the intrinsic apparatus of a ceremony. Such and such only could be correctly called ceremonial. During the Soai feasts among the southern Masim, women carrying polished axe blades in fine carved handles, accompany with a rhythmic step to the beat of drums, the entry of the pigs and mango saplings into the village, see plates and
As this is part of the ceremony and the axes are an indispensable accessory, their use in this case can be legitimately called ceremonial. Again, in certain magical ceremonies in the Trobriens, the Tawosi, garden magician, has to carry a mounted axe blade on his shoulders, and with it he delivers a ritual blow at a Kamkakola structure, see plate, compare. The Vegue, the Kula valuables, in one of their aspects are overgrown objects of use. They are also, however, ceremonial objects in the narrow and correct sense of the word. This will become clear after perusal of the following pages, and to this point we shall return in the it must be kept in mind that here we are trying to obtain a clear and vivid idea of what the Kula valuables are to the natives, and not to give a detailed and circumstantial description of them, nor to define them with precision. The comparison with the European heirlooms or crown jewels was given in order to show that this type of ownership is not entirely a fantastic South Sea custom, untranslatable into our ideas. 4. And this is a point I want to stress. The comparison I have made is not based on purely external, superficial similarity. The psychological and sociological forces at work are the same, it is really the same mental attitude which makes us value our heirlooms, and makes the natives in New Guinea value their vegue. 4. The exchange of these two classes of vegue, of the arms hells and the necklaces, constitutes the main act of the kula. This exchange is not done freely, right and left, as opportunity offers, and where the whim leads. It is subject indeed to strict limitations and regulations. One of these refers to the sociology of the exchange, and entails that Kula transactions can be done only between partners. A man who is in the Kula, for not everyone within its district is entitled to carry it on, has only a limited number of people with whom he does it. This partnership is entered upon in a definite manner, under fulfillment of certain formalities, and it constitutes a lifelong relationship. The number of partners a man has varies with his rank and importance. A commoner in the Trobriens would have a few partners only, whereas a chief would number hundreds of them. There is no special social mechanism to limit the partnership of some people and extend that of the others, but a man would naturally know to what number of partners he was entitled by his rank and position. And there would be always the example of his immediate ancestors to guide him. In other tribes, where the distinction of rank is not so pronounced, an old man of standing, or a headman of a hamlet or village would also have hundreds of Kula associates, whereas a man of minor importance would have but few. Two Kula partners have to Kula with one another, and exchange other gifts incidentally, they behave as friends, and have a number of mutual duties and obligations, which vary with the distance between their villages and with their reciprocal status. An average man has a few partners nearby, as a rule his relations-in-law or his friends, and with these partners, he is generally on very friendly terms. The Kula partnership is one of the special bonds which unite two men into one of the standing relations of mutual exchange of gifts and services so characteristic of these natives. Again, the average man will have one or two chiefs in his or in the neighboring districts with whom he coolis. In such a case, he would be bound to assist and serve them in various ways, and to offer them the pick of his vague when he gets a fresh supply. On the other hand he would expect them to be specially liberal to him. The overseas partner is, on the other hand, a host, patron and ally in a land of danger and insecurity. Nowadays, though the feeling of danger still persists, and natives never feel safe and comfortable in a strange district, this danger is rather felt as a magical one, and it is more the fear of foreign sorcery that besets them. In olden days, more tangible dangers were apprehended, and the partner was the main guarantee of safety. He also provides with food, gives presents, and his house, though never used to sleep in, is the place in which to foregather while in the village. Thus the Kula partnership provides every man within its ring with a few friends near at hand, and with some friendly allies in the faraway, dangerous, foreign districts. These are the only people with whom he can Kula, but, of course, amongst all his partners, he is free to choose to which one he will offer which object. Let us now try to cast a broad glance at the cumulative effects of the rules of partnership. We see that all around the ring of Kula there is a network of relationships, and that naturally the whole forms one interwoven fabric. 
Men living at hundreds of miles sailing distance from one another are bound together by direct or intermediate partnership, exchange with each other, know of each other, and on certain occasions meet in a large intertribal gathering. Objects given by one, in time reach some very distant indirect partner or other, and not only Kula objects, but various articles of domestic use and minor gifts. It is easy to see that in the long run, not only objects of material culture, but also customs, songs, art motives and general cultural influences travel along the Kula route. It is a vast, intertribal net of relationships, a big institution, consisting of thousands of men, all bound together by one common passion for Kula exchange, and secondarily, by many minor ties and interests. Returning again to the personal aspect of the Kula, let us take a concrete example, that of an average man who lives, let us assume, in the village of Sinekita, an important Kula center in the southern Trobriands. He has a few partners, near and far, but they again fall into categories, those who give him arm shells, and those who give him necklaces. For it is naturally an invariable rule of the Kula that arm shells and necklaces are never received from the same man, since they must travel in different directions. If one partner gives the arms hells, and I return to him a necklace, all future operations have to be of the same type. More than that, the nature of the operation between me, the man of Sinekita, and my partner, is determined by our relative positions with regard to the points of the compass. Thus I, in Sinekita, would receive from the north and east only arm shells, from the south and west, necklaces are given to me. If I have a near partner next door to me, if his abode is north or east of mine, he will always be giving me arm shells and receiving necklaces from me. If at a later time he were to shift his residence within the village, the old relationship would obtain, but if he became a member of another village community on the other side of me the relationship would be reversed. The partners in villages to the north of Sinekita, in the district of Luba, Kolomita, or Kiriwina all supply me with arm shells. These I hand over to my partners in the south, and receive from them necklaces. The south in this case means the southern districts of Boyawa, as well as the Amphlets in Dobu. Thus every man has to obey definite rules as to the geographical direction of his transactions. At any point in the Kula ring, if we imagine him turn towards the center of the circle, he receives the arm shells with his left hand, and the necklaces with his right, and then hands them both on. In other words, he constantly passes the arm shells from left to right, and the necklaces from right to left. Applying this rule of personal conduct to the whole Kula ring, we can see at once what the aggregate result is. The sum total of exchanges will not result in an aimless shifting of the two classes of article, in a fortuitous come and go of the arms hells and necklaces. Two continuous streams will constantly flow on, the one of necklaces following the hands of a clock, and the other, composed of the arm shells, in the opposite direction. We see thus that it is quite correct to speak of the circular exchange of the Kula, of a ring or circuit of moving articles, comp. On this ring, all the villages are placed in a definitely fixed position with regard to one another, so that one is always on either the arm shell or on the necklace side of the other. Now we pass to another rule of the Kula, of the greatest importance. As just explained, the arms hells and shell strings always travel in their own respective directions on the ring, and they are never, under any circumstances, traded back in the wrong direction. Also, they never stop. It seems almost incredible at first, but it is the fact, nevertheless, that no one ever keeps any of the Kula, valuables for any length of time. Indeed, in the whole of the Trobriands there are perhaps only one or two specially fine arms hells and shell necklaces permanently owned as heirlooms, and these are set apart as a special class, and are once and for all out of the Kula. Ownership, therefore, in Kula, is quite a special economic relation. A man who is in the Kula never keeps any article for longer than, say, a year or two. Even this exposes him to the reproach of being niggardly, and certain districts have the bad reputation of being, slow, and hard, in the Kula. On the other hand, each man has an enormous number of articles passing through his hands during his lifetime, of which he enjoys a temporary possession, and which he keeps in trust for a time. This possession hardly ever makes him use the articles, 
and he remains under the obligation soon again to hand them on to one of his partners. But the temporary ownership allows him to draw a great deal of renown, to exhibit his article, to tell how he obtained it, and to plan to whom he is going to give it. And all this forms one of the favorite subjects of tribal conversation and gossip, in which the feats and the glory in Kula of chiefs or commoners are constantly discussed and rediscussed. Thus every article moves in one direction only, never comes back, never permanently stops, and takes as a rule some two to ten years to make the round. This feature of the Kula is perhaps its most remarkable one, since it creates a new type of ownership, and places the two Kula articles in a class of their own. Here we can return to the comparison drawn between the Vegue, Kirawinian valuables, and the European heirlooms. This comparison broke down on one point, in the European objects of this class, permanent ownership, lasting association with the hereditary dignity or rank or with a family, is one of its main features. In this the Kula articles differ from heirlooms, but resemble another type of valued object, that is, trophies, gauges of superiority, sporting cups, objects which are kept for a time only by the winning party, whether a group or an individual. Though held only in trust, only for a period, though never used in any utilitarian way, yet the holders get from them a special type of pleasure by the mere fact of owning them, of being entitled to them. Here again, it is not only a superficial, external resemblance, but very much the same mental attitude, favored by similar social arrangements. The resemblance goes so far that in the Kula there exists also the element of pride in merit, an element which forms the main ingredient in the pleasure felt by a man or group holding a trophy. Success in Kula is ascribed to special, personal power, due mainly to magic, and men are very proud of it. Again, the whole community glories in a specially fine Kula trophy, obtained by one of its members. All the rules so far enumerated, looking at them from the individual point of view, limit the social range and the direction of the transactions as well as the duration of ownership of the articles. Looking at them from the point of view of their integral effect, they shape the general outline of the Kula, give it the character of the double closed circuit. Now a few words must be said about the nature of each individual transaction, in so far as its commercial technicalities are concerned. Here very definite rules also obtain. v. The main principle underlying the regulations of actual exchange is that the Kula consists in the bestowing of a ceremonial gift, which has to be repaid by an equivalent counter-gift after a lapse of time, be it a few hours or even minutes. Though sometimes as much as a year or more may elapse between payments. But it can never be exchanged from hand to hand, with the equivalence between the two objects discussed, bargained about and computed. The decorum of the Kula transaction is strictly kept, and highly valued. The natives sharply distinguish it from barter, which they practice extensively, of which they have a clear idea, and for which they have a settled term, in Kirawinian, Gimwali. Often, when criticizing an incorrect, too hasty, or indecorous procedure of Kula, they will say, he conducts his Kula as if it were Gimwali. The second very important principle is that the equivalence of the counter-gift is left to the giver, and it cannot be enforced by any kind of coercion. A partner who has received a Kula gift is expected to give back fair and full value, that is, to give as good an arm shell as the necklace he receives, or vice versa. Again, a very fine article must be replaced by one of equivalent value, and not by several minor ones, though intermediate gifts may be given to mark time before the real repayment takes place. If the article given as counter-gift is not equivalent, the recipient will be disappointed and angry, but he has no direct means of redress, no means of coercing his partner, or of putting an end to the whole transaction. What then are the forces at work which keep the partners to the terms of the bargain? Here we come up against a very important feature of the natives' mental attitude towards wealth and value. The great misconception of attributing to the savage a pure economic nature, might lead us to reason incorrectly thus, the passion of acquiring, the loathing to lose or give away, is the fundamental and most primitive element in man's attitude to wealth. In primitive man, this primitive characteristic will appear in its simplest and purest form. Grab and never let go will be the guiding principle of his life. 
The fundamental error in this reasoning is that it assumes that, primitive man, as represented by the present-day savage, lives, at least in economic matters, untrammeled by conventions and social restrictions. Quite the reverse is the case. Although, like every human being, the Kula native loves to possess and therefore desires to acquire and dreads to lose, the social code of rules, with regard to give and take by far overrides his natural acquisitive tendency. This social code, such as we find it among the natives of the Kula is, however, far from weakening the natural desirability of possession. On the contrary, it lays down that to possess is to be great, and that wealth is the indispensable upunnage of social rank and attribute of personal virtue. But the important point is that with them to possess is to give, and here the natives differ from us notably. A man who owns a thing is naturally expected to share it, to distribute it, to be its trustee and dispenser. And the higher the rank the greater the obligation. A chief will naturally be expected to give food to any stranger, visitor, even loiterer from another end of the village. He will be expected to share any of the betel nut or tobacco he has about him. So that a man of rank will have to hide away any surplus of these articles which he wants to preserve for his further use. In the eastern end of New Guinea a type of large basket, with three layers, manufactured in the Trobriens, was specially popular among people of consequence, because one could hide away one's small treasures in the lower compartments. Thus the main symptom of being powerful is to be wealthy, and of wealth is to be generous. Meanness, indeed, is the most despised vice, and the only thing about which the natives have strong moral views, while generosity is the essence of goodness. This moral injunction and ensuing habit of generosity, superficially observed and misinterpreted, is responsible for another widespread misconception, that of the primitive communism of savages. This, quite as much as the diametrically opposed figment of the acquisitive and ruthlessly tenacious native, is definitely erroneous, and this will be seen with sufficient clearness in the following chapters. Thus the fundamental principle of the native's moral code in this matter makes a man do his fair share in Kula transaction and the more important he is, the more will he desire to shine by his generosity. Noblesse oblige is in reality the social norm regulating their conduct. This does not mean that people are always satisfied, and that there are no squabbles about the transactions, no resentments and even feuds. It is obvious that, however much a man may want to give a good equivalent for the object received, he may not be able to do so. And then, as there is always a keen competition to be the most generous giver, a man who has received less than he gave will not keep his grievance to himself, but will brag about his own generosity and compare it to his partner's meanness. The other resents it, and the quarrel is ready to break out. But it is very important to realize that there is no actual haggling, no tendency to do a man out of his share. The giver is quite as keen as the receiver that the gift should be generous, though for different reasons. Then, of course, there is the important consideration that a man who is fair and generous in the Kula will attract a larger stream to himself than a mean one. The two main principles, namely, first that the Kula is a gift repaid after an interval of time by a counter-gift, and not a bartering. And second, that the equivalent rests with the giver, and cannot be enforced, nor can there be any haggling or going back on the exchange, these underlie all the transactions. A concrete outline of how they are carried on, will give a sufficient preliminary idea. Let us suppose that I, a Sinekita man, am in possession of a pair of big arms hells. An overseas expedition from Dobu in the D'Entrecastos archipelago, arrives at my village. Blowing a conch shell, I take my arms hell pair and I offer it to my overseas partner, with some such words as, this is a vaga, opening gift, in due time, thou returnest to me a big soleva, necklace, for it. Next year, when I visit my partner's village, he either is in possession of an equivalent necklace, and this he gives to me as yodel, return gift, or he has not a necklace good enough to repay my last gift. In this case he will give me a small necklace, avowedly not equivalent to my gift, and he will give it to me as basi, intermediary gift. This means that the main gift has to be repaid on a future occasion, and the basi is given in token of good faith, but it, in turn, must be repaid by me in the meantime by a gift of small arm shells. The final gift, 
which will be given to me to clinch the whole transaction, would then be called kudu, clinching gift, in contrast to basi, lock sit, page 99. Plate. XX. A kula gathering on the beach of Sinekita. Along about half a mile's length of shore, over eighty canoes are beached or moored, and in the village, on the beach. And in the surrounding country there are assembled some two thousand natives from several districts, ranging from Kideva to Dobu. This illustrates the manner in which the Kula brings together large numbers of people belonging to different cultures, in this case, that of Kideva, Boyawa, the Amphlets and Dobu. C. And. Although haggling and bargaining are completely ruled out of the Kula, there are customary and regulated ways of bidding for a piece of vegue known to be in the possession of one's partner. This is done by the offer of what we shall call solicitary gifts, of which there are several types. If I, an inhabitant of Sinekita, happen to be in possession of a pair of arm shells more than usually good, the fame of it spreads. For it must be remembered that each one of the first-class arms shells and necklaces has a personal name and a history of its own, and as they circulate around the big ring of the Kula, they are all well known. And their appearance in a given district always creates a sensation. Now, all my partners, whether from overseas or from within the district, compete for the favor of receiving this particular article of mine. And those who are specially keen try to obtain it by giving me pokala, offerings, and karabudu, solicitary gifts. The former, pokala, consist as a rule of pigs, especially fine bananas, and yams or taro, the latter, karabudu, are of greater value, the valuable, large axe blades, called biku, or lime spoons of whale bone are given, lock sit, page 100. The further complication in the repayment of these solicitary gifts and a few more technicalities and technical expressions connected herewith will be given later on in. 6. I have enumerated the main rules of the Kula in a manner sufficient for a preliminary definition, and now a few words must be said about the associated activities and secondary aspects of the Kula. If we realize that at times the exchange has to take place between districts divided by dangerous seas, over which a great number of people have to travel by sail, and do so keeping to appointed dates. It becomes clear at once that considerable preparations are necessary to carry out the expedition. Many preliminary activities are intimately associated with the Kula. Such are, particularly, the building of canoes, preparation of the outfit, the provisioning of the expedition, the fixing of dates and social organization of the enterprise. All these are subsidiary to the Kula, and as they are carried on in pursuit of it, and form one connected series, a description of the Kula must embrace an account of these preliminary activities. The detailed account of canoe building, of the ceremonial attached to it, of the incidental magical rites, of the launching and trial run. Of the associated customs which aim at preparing the outfit, all this will be described in detail in the next few chapters. Another important pursuit inextricably bound up with the Kula, is that of the secondary trade. Voyaging to far-off countries, endowed with natural resources unknown in their own homes, the Kula sailors return each time richly laden with these, the spoils of their enterprise. Again, in order to be able to offer presents to his partner, every outward-bound canoe carries a cargo of such things as are known to be most desirable in the overseas district. Some of this is given away in presents to the partners, but a good deal is carried in order to pay for the objects desired at home. In certain cases, the visiting natives exploit on their own account during the journey some of the natural resources overseas. For example, the Sinekedans dive for the Spondylus in Sanaroa Lagoon, and the Dabuans fish in the Trobriens on a beach on the southern end of the island. The secondary trade is complicated still more by the fact that such big Kula centers as, for instance, Sinekita, are not efficient in any of the industries of special value to the Dabuans. Thus, Sinekitans have to procure the necessary store of goods from the inland villages of Kuboma, and this they do on minor trading expeditions preliminary to the Kula. Like the canoe building, the secondary trading will be described in detail later on, and has only to be mentioned here. Here, however, these subsidiary and associated activities must be put in proper relation with regard to one another and to the main transaction. 
Both the canoe building and the ordinary trade have been spoken of as secondary or subsidiary to the Kula proper. This requires a comment. I do not, by thus subordinating the two things in importance to the Kula, mean to express a philosophical reflection or a personal opinion as to the relative value of these pursuits from the point of view of some social teleology. Indeed, it is clear that if we look at the acts from the outside, as comparative sociologists, and gauge their real utility, trade and canoe building will appear to us as the really important achievements. Whereas we shall regard the Kula only as an indirect stimulus, impelling the natives to sail and to trade. Here, however, I am not dealing in sociological, but in pure ethnographical description, and any sociological analysis I have given is only what has been absolutely indispensable to clear away misconceptions and to define terms. By ranging the Kula as the primary and chief activity, and the rest as secondary ones, I mean that this precedence is implied in the institutions themselves. By studying the behavior of the natives and all the customs in question, we see that the Kula is in all respects the main aim, the dates are fixed, the preliminaries settled, the expeditions arranged, the social organization determined. Not with regard to trade, but with regard to Kula. On an expedition, the big ceremonial feast, held at the start, refers to the Kula, the final ceremony of reckoning and counting the spoil refers to Kula, not to the objects of trade obtained. Finally, the magic, which is one of the main factors of all the procedure, refers only to the Kula, and this applies even to a part of the magic carried out over the canoe. Some rites in the whole cycle are done for the sake of the canoe itself, and others for the sake of Kula. The construction of the canoes is always carried on directly in connection with a Kula expedition. All this, of course, will become really clear and convincing only after the detailed account is given. But it was necessary at this point to set the right perspective in the relation between the main Kula and the trade. Of course not only many of the surrounding tribes who know nothing of the Kula do build canoes and sail far and daringly on trading expeditions, but even within the Kula ring, in the Trobrians for instance. There are several villages who do not Kula, yet have canoes and carry on energetic overseas trade. But where the Kula is practiced, it governs all the other allied activities, and canoe building and trade are made subsidiary to it. And this is expressed both by the nature of the institutions and the working of all the arrangements on the one hand, and by the behavior and explicit statements of the natives on the other. The Kula, it becomes, I hope, more and more clear, is a big, complicated institution, insignificant though its nucleus might appear. To the natives, it represents one of the most vital interests in life, and as such it has a ceremonial character and is surrounded by magic. We can well imagine that articles of wealth might pass from hand to hand without ceremony or ritual, but in the Kula they never do. Even when at times only small parties in one or two canoes sail overseas and bring back vague certain taboos are observed, and a customary course is taken in departing, in sailing, and in arriving. Even the smallest expedition in one canoe is a tribal event of some importance, known and spoken of over the whole district. But the characteristic expedition is one in which a considerable number of canoes take part, organized in a certain manner, and forming one body. Feasts, distributions of food, and other public ceremonies are held, there is one leader and master of the expedition, and various rules are adhered to, in addition to the ordinary Kula taboos and observances. The ceremonial nature of the Kula is strictly bound up with another of its aspects, magic. The belief in the efficiency of magic dominates the Kula, as it does ever so many other tribal activities of the natives. Magical rites must be performed over the seagoing canoe when it is built, in order to make it swift, steady and safe, also magic is done over a canoe to make it lucky in the Kula. Another system of magical rites is done in order to avert the dangers of sailing. The third system of magic connected with overseas expeditions is the Mwazala or the Kula magic proper. This system consists in numerous rites and spells, all of which act directly on the mind, Nanola, of one's partner, and make him soft, unsteady in mind, and eager to give Kula gifts, Lock Sit, page 100. It is clear that an institution so closely associated with magical and ceremonial elements, as is the Kula, 
not only rests on a firm, traditional foundation, but also has its large store of legends. There is a rich mythology of the Kula, in which stories are told about far-off times when mythical ancestors sailed on distant and daring expeditions. Owing taught air magical knowledge they were able to escape dangers, to conquer their enemies, to surmount obstacles, and by their feats they established many a precedent which is now closely followed by tribal custom. But their importance for their descendants lies mainly in the fact that they handed on their magic, and this made the Kula possible for the following generations, Lok Sit, page 100. The Kula is also associated in certain districts, to which the Trobrians do not belong, with the mortuary feasts, called Soai. The association is interesting and important, and in an account of it will be given. The big Kula expeditions are carried on by a great number of natives, a whole district together. But the geographical limits, from which the members of an expedition are recruited, are well defined. Glancing at, we see a number of circles, each of which represents a certain sociological unit which we shall call a Kula community. A Kula community consists of a village or a number of villages, who go out together on big overseas expeditions, and who act as a body in the Kula transactions, perform their magic in common, have common leaders. And have the same outer and inner social sphere, within which they exchange their valuables. The Kula consists, therefore, first of the small, internal transactions within a Kula community or contiguous communities, and secondly, of the big overseas expeditions in which the exchange of articles takes place between two communities divided by sea. In the first, there is a chronic, permanent trickling of articles from one village to another, and even within the village. In the second, a whole lot of valuables, amounting to over a thousand articles at a time, are exchanged in one enormous transaction, or, more correctly, in ever so many transactions taking place simultaneously, Lock Sit, page 101. The Kula trade consists of a series of such periodical overseas expeditions, which link together the various island groups, and annually bring over big quantities of vague and of subsidiary trade from one district to another. The trade is used and used up, but the vague the arms hells and necklets, go round and round the ring, lock sit, page 105. In this chapter, a short, summary definition of the Kula has been given. I enumerated one after the other its most salient features, the most remarkable rules as they are laid down in native custom, belief and behavior. This was necessary in order to give a general idea of the institution before describing its working in detail. But no abridged definition can give to the reader the full understanding of a human social institution. It is necessary for this, to explain its working concretely, to bring the reader into contact with the people, show how they proceed at each successive stage, and to describe all the actual manifestations of the general rules laid down in abstract. As has been said above, the Kula exchange is carried on by enterprises of two sorts, first there are the big overseas expeditions, in which a more or less considerable amount of valuables are carried at one time. Then there is the inland trade in which the articles are passed from hand to hand, often changing several owners before they move a few miles. The big overseas expeditions are by far the more spectacular part of the Kula. They also contain much more public ceremonial, magical ritual, and customary usage. They require also, of course, more of preparation and preliminary activity. I shall therefore have a good deal more to say about the overseas Kula expeditions than about the internal exchange. As the Kula customs and beliefs have been mainly studied in Boyawa, that is, the Trobriand Islands, and from the Boyawan point of view, I shall describe, in the first place, the typical course of an overseas expedition, as it is prepared, organized, and carried out from the Trobriands. Beginning with the construction of the canoes, proceeding to the ceremonial launching and the visits of formal presentation of canoes, we shall choose then the community of Sinekita, and follow the natives on one of their overseas trips. Describing it in all details. This will serve us as a type of a Kula expedition to distant lands. It will then be indicated in what particular such expeditions may differ in other branches of the Kula, and for this purpose I shall describe an expedition from Dobu, and one between Kirawina and Kideva. 
An account of inland Kula in the Trobriands, of some associated forms of trading and of Kula in the remaining branches will complete the account. In the I pass, therefore, to the preliminary stages of the Kula, in the Trobriands, beginning with a description of the canoes. By, current view, I mean such as is to be found in textbooks and in passing remarks, scattered through economic and ethnological literature. As a matter of fact, economics is a subject very seldom touched upon either in theoretical works on ethnology, or in accounts of fieldwork. I have enlarged on this deficiency in the article on, Primitive Economics, published in the Economic Journal, March, 1921. The best analysis of the problem of savage economy is to be found, in spite of its many shortcomings, in K. Booker's Industrial Evolution, English Translation, 1901. On primitive trade, however, his views are inadequate. In accordance with his general view that savages have no national economy, he maintains that any spread of goods among natives is achieved by non-economic means, such as robbery, tributes and gifts. The information contained in the present volume is incompatible with Booker's views, nor could he have maintained them had he been acquainted with Barton's description of the Hiri, contained in Seligman's Melanesians. A summary of the research done on primitive economics, showing incidentally, how little real, sound work has been accomplished, will be found in Peter W. Copper's Die Ethnologische Wirtschaftsforschung, in Anthropos, X, 11, 1915-16, pp. 611 to 651 and 971 to 1079. The article is very useful, where the author summarizes the views of others. Professor C. G. Seligman, op. Sit. P. 93, states that armshells Toya, as they are called by the Motu, are traded from the Port Moresby district westward to the Gulf of Papua. Among the Motu and Koida, near Port Moresby, they are highly valued and nowadays attain very high prices, up to thirty pounds, much more than is paid for the same article among the Masim. This and the following quotations are from the author's preliminary article on the Kula in Man, July, 1920. Article number 51, page 100. In order not to be guilty of inconsistency in using loosely the word ceremonial, I shall define it briefly. I shall call an action ceremonial, if it is, one, public, 2. Carried on under observance of definite formalities, 3. If it has sociological, religious, or magical import, and carries with it obligations. This is not a fanciful construction of what an erroneous opinion might be, for I could give actual examples proving that such opinions have been set forth, but as I am not giving here a criticism of existing theories of primitive economics. I do not want to overload this chapter with quotations. It is hardly necessary perhaps to make it quite clear that all questions of origins, of development or history of the institutions have been rigorously ruled out of this work. The mixing up of speculative or hypothetical views with an account of facts is, in my opinion an unpardonable sin against ethnographic method. Chapter 4. Canoes and Sailing. I. A canoe is an item of material culture, and as such it can be described, photographed and even bodily transported into a museum. But, and this is a truth too often overlooked, the ethnographic reality of the canoe would not be brought much nearer to a student at home, even by placing a perfect specimen right before him. The canoe is made for a certain use, and with a definite purpose, it is a means to an end, and we, who study native life, must not reverse this relation, and make a fetish of the object itself. In the study of the economic purposes for which a canoe is made, of the various uses to which it is submitted, we find the first approach to a deeper ethnographic treatment. Further sociological data, referring to its ownership, accounts of who sails in it, and how it is done. Information regarding the ceremonies and customs of its construction, a sort of typical life history of a native craft, all that brings us nearer still to the understanding of what his canoe truly means to the native. Even this, however, does not touch the most vital reality of a native canoe. For a craft, whether of bark or wood, iron or steel, lives in the life of its sailors, and it is more to a sailor than a mere bit of shaped matter. 
To the native, not less than to the white seaman, a craft is surrounded by an atmosphere of romance, built up of tradition and of personal experience. It is an object of cult and admiration, a living thing, possessing its own individuality. We Europeans, whether we know native craft by experience or through descriptions, accustomed to our extraordinarily developed means of water transport, are apt to look down on a native canoe and see it in a false perspective, regarding it almost as a child's plaything, an abortive, imperfect attempt to tackle the problem of sailing, which we ourselves have satisfactorily solved. But to the native his cumbersome, sprawling canoe is a marvelous, almost miraculous achievement, and a thing of beauty, sea plates. He has spun a tradition around it, and he adorns it with his best carvings, he colors and decorates it. It is to him a powerful contrivance for the mastery of nature, which allows him to cross perilous seas to distant places. It is associated with journeys by sail, full of threatening dangers, of living hopes and desires to which he gives expression in song and story. In short, in the tradition of the natives, in their customs, in their behavior, and in their direct statements, there can be found the deep love, the admiration, the specific attachment as to something alive and personal. So characteristic of the sailor's attitude towards his craft. And it is in this emotional attitude of the natives towards their canoes that I see the deepest ethnographic reality, which must guide us right through the study of other aspects, the customs and technicalities of construction and of use. The economic conditions and the associated beliefs and traditions. Ethnology or anthropology, the science of man, must not shun him in his innermost self, in his instinctive and emotional life. Plate. XXI. A Misawa Canoe. Nagata Bue, the seagoing canoe of Omurakana, showing general form, ornamentation of prow boards, the leaf shaped paddles, and the form of the outrigger log. See and also next chap. Plate. XXI. Putting a canoe into its hangar. The canoes on the east shores of Boyawa are seldom used, and when idle are housed in shelters, built very much like ordinary huts, only much larger. Plate. XCI. Canoe under sail. This illustrates the rigging, the tilt of the canoe, the raised outrigger, and the carrying capacity of a canoe. This one is well in the water, with a crew of 18 men. C and, and. A look at the pictures, for instance plates, or, will give us some idea of the general structure of the native canoes, the body is a long, deep well, connected with an outrigger float. Which stretches parallel with the body for almost all its length, see plates end, and with a platform going across from one side to the other. The lightness of the material permits it to be much more deeply immersed than any seagoing European craft, and gives it greater buoyancy. It schemes the surface, gliding up and down the waves, now hidden by the crests, now riding on top of them. It is a precarious but delightful sensation to sit in the slender body, while the canoe darts on with the float raised, the platform steeply slanting, and water constantly breaking over. Or else, still better, to perch on the platform or on the float, the latter only feasible in the bigger canoes, and be carried across on the sea on a sort of suspended raft, gliding over the waves in a manner almost uncanny. Occasionally a wave leaps up and above the platform, and the canoe, unwieldy, square raft as it seems at first, heaves lengthways and crossways, mounting the furrows with graceful agility. When the sail is hoisted, its heavy, stiff folds of golden matting unroll with a characteristic swishing and crackling noise, and the canoe begins to make way. When the water rushes away below with a hiss, and the yellow sail glows against the intense blue of sea and sky, then indeed the romance of sailing seems to open through a new vista. The natural reflection on this description is that it presents the feelings of the ethnographer, not those of the native. Indeed there is a great difficulty in disentangling our own sensations from a correct reading of the innermost native mind. But if an investigator, speaking the native's language and living among them for some time, were to try to share and understand their feelings, he will find that he can gauge them correctly. Soon he will learn to distinguish when the native's behavior is in harmony with his own, and when, as it sometimes happens, the two are at variance. 
Thus, in this case, there is no mistaking the natives' great admiration of a good canoe. Of their quickness in appreciating differences in speed, buoyancy and stability, and of their emotional reaction to such difference. When, on a calm day, suddenly a fresh breeze rises, the sail is set, and fills, and the canoe lifts its lamina, outrigger float, out of the water, and races along. Flinging the spray to right and left, there is no mistaking the keen enjoyment of the natives. All rush to their posts and keenly watch the movements of the boat, some break out into song, and the younger men lean over and play with the water. They are never tired of discussing the good points of their canoes, and analyzing the various craft. In the coastal villages of the lagoon, boys and young men will often sail out in small canoes on mere pleasure cruises, when they race each other, explore less familiar nooks of the lagoon, and in general undoubtedly enjoy the outing. In just the same manner as we would do. Seen from outside, after you have grasped its construction and appreciated through personal experience its fitness for its purpose, the canoe is no less attractive and full of character than from within. When, on a trading expedition or as a visiting party, a fleet of native canoes appears in the offing, with their triangular sails like butterfly wings scattered over the water, sea plate, with the harmonious calls of conch shells blown in unison. The effect is unforgettable. When the canoes then approach, and you see them rocking in the blue water in all the splendor of their fresh white, red, and black paint, with their finely designed prowboards, and clanking array of large, white cowrie shells, sea plates. You understand well the admiring love which results in all this care bestowed by the native on the decoration of his canoe. Even when not in actual use, when lying idle beached on the sea front of a village, the canoe is a characteristic element in the scenery, not without its share in the village life. The very big canoes are in some cases housed in large sheds, sea plate, which are by far the largest buildings erected by the Trobrianders. In other villages, where sailing is always being done, a canoe is simply covered with palm leaves, sea plates, as protection from the sun, and the natives often sit on its platform, chatting, and chewing betel nut, and gazing at the sea. The smaller canoes, beached near the seafront in long parallel rows, are ready to be launched at any moment. With their curved outline and intricate framework of poles and sticks, they form one of the most characteristic settings of a native coastal village. 2. A few words must be said now about the technological essentials of the canoe. Here again, a simple enumeration of the various parts of the canoe, and a description of them, a pulling to pieces of a lifeless object will not satisfy us. I shall instead try to show how, given its purpose on the one hand, and the limitations in technical means and in material on the other, the native shipbuilders have coped with the difficulties before them. A sailing craft requires a watertight, immersible vessel of some considerable volume. This is supplied to our natives by a hollowed-out log. Such a log might carry fairly heavy loads, for wood is light, and the hollowed space adds to its buoyancy. Yet it possesses no lateral stability, as can easily be seen. A look at the diagrammatic section of a canoe, shows that a weight with its center of gravity in the middle, that is, distributed symmetrically, will not upset the equilibrium, but any load placed so as to produce a momentum of rotation, that is. A turning force, at the sides, as indicated by arrows at A or B, will cause the canoe to turn round and capsize. Figure I, diagram showing in transversal section some principles of canoe stability and construction. If, however, as shown in, another smaller, solid log, C, be attached to the dugout, a greater stability is achieved, though not a symmetrical one. If we press down the one side of the canoe, A, this will cause the canoe to turn round a longitudinal axis, so that its other side, B, is raised. The log, C, will be lifted out of the water, and its weight will produce a momentum, turning force, proportional to the displacement, and the rest of the canoe will come to equilibrium. This momentum is represented in the diagram by the arrow R. Thus a great stability relative to any stress exercised upon A, will be achieved. A stress on B causes the log to be immersed, to which its buoyancy opposes a slight resistance. 
but it can easily be seen that the stability on this side is much smaller than on the other. This asymmetrical stability plays a great part in the technique of sailing. Thus, as we shall see, the canoe is always so sailed that its outrigger float, C, remains in the wind side. The pressure of the sail then lifts the canoe, so that A is pressed into the water, and B and C are lifted, a position in which they are extremely stable, and can stand great force of wind. Whereas the slightest breeze would cause the canoe to turn turtle, if it fell on the other side, and thus pressed B, C into the water. Another look at and, 3, will help us to realize that the stability of the canoe will depend upon, I, the volume, and especially the depth of the dugout, 2, the distance B, C between the dugout and the log, 3, the size of the log C. The greater all these three magnitudes are, the greater the stability of the canoes. A shallow canoe, without much freeboard, will be easily forced into the water. Moreover, if sailed in rough weather, waves will break over it, and fill it with water. I, the volume of the dugout log naturally depends upon the length and thickness of the log. Fairly stable canoes are made of simply scooped out logs. There are limits, however, to the capacity of these, which are very soon reached. But by building out the side, by adding one or several planks to them, as shown in the volume and the depth can be greatly increased without much increase in weight. So that such a canoe has a good deal of freeboard to prevent water from breaking in. The longitudinal boards in Kirawinian canoes are closed in at each end by transversal prow boards, which are also carved with more or less perfection, C plates. 2. The greater the distance B, C between dugout and outrigger float, the greater the stability of the canoe. Since the momentum of rotation is the product of B, C, and the weight of the log C, it is clear, therefore, that the greater the distance, the greater will be the momentum. Too great a distance, however, would interfere with the wieldiness of the canoe. Any force acting on the log would easily tip the canoe, and as the natives, in order to manage the craft, have to walk upon the outrigger, the distance B, C must not be too great. In the Trobriens the distance B, C is about one quarter, or less, of the total length of the canoe. In the big, sea-going canoes, it is always covered with a platform. In certain other districts, the distance is much bigger, and the canoes have another type of rigging. Figure 2, Diagrammatic Sections of the Three Types of Trobriand Canoe 1. QOU, 2. Kalapulo, 3. Misawa 3. The size of the log, C, of which the float is formed. This, in seagoing canoes, is usually of considerable dimensions. But, as a solid piece of wood becomes heavy if soaked by water, too thick a log would not be good. These are all the essentials of construction in their functional aspect, which will make clear further descriptions of sailing, of building, and of using. For, indeed, though I have said that technicalities are of secondary importance, still without grasping them, we cannot understand references to the managing and rigging of the canoes. The Trobrianders use their craft for three main purposes, and these correspond to the three types of canoe. Coastal transport, especially in the lagoon, requires small, light, handy canoes called QOU, C, and plates, top foreground, and, to the right. For fishing, bigger and more seaworthy canoes called Kalapulo, C, and plates, and, to the left, also, are used. Finally, for deep sea sailing, the biggest type is needed, with a considerable carrying capacity, greater displacement, and stronger construction. These are called Masawa, C and plates, etc. The word waga is a general designation for all kinds of sailing craft. Only a few words need to be said about the first two types, so as to make, by means of comparison, the third type clearer. The construction of the smallest canoes is sufficiently illustrated by the diagram, 1, in. From this it is clear that it is a simple dugout log, connected with a float. It never has any built-up planking, and no carved boards, nor as a rule any platform. In its economic aspect, it is always owned by one individual, and serves his personal needs. No mythology or magic is attached to it. Type, 2, 
as can be seen in, differs in construction from, one, in so far that it has its well enclosed by built-out planking and carved proughboards. A framework of six ribs helps to keep the planks firmly attached to the dugout and to hold them together. It is used in fishing villages. These villages are organized into several fishing detachments, each with a headman. He is the owner of the canoe, he performs the fish magic, and among other privileges, obtains the main yield of fish. But all his crew de facto have the right to use the canoe and share in the yield. Here we come across the fact that native ownership is not a simple institution, since it implies definite rights of a number of men, combined with the paramount right and title of one. There is a good deal of fishing magic, taboos and customs connected with the construction of these canoes, and also with their use, and they form the subject of a number of minor myths. Plate 14. Fishing Canoe, Calipolo Above the profile of a canoe, shows the outline of the dugout, the relative width of the gunnel planks and the hull, and the general shape of the canoe. The bottom picture shows the attachment of the outrigger to the hull, the prow, the prow boards, and the platform. C. By far the most elaborate technically, the most seaworthy and carefully built, are the seagoing canoes of the third type, C. These are undoubtedly the greatest achievement of craftsmanship of these natives. Technically, they differ from the previously described kinds, in the amount of time spent over their construction and the care given to details, rather than in essentials. The well is formed by a planking built over a hollowed log and closed up at both ends by carved, transversal proughboards, kept in position by others, longitudinal and of oval form. The whole planking remains in place by means of ribs, as in the second type of canoes, the calipulo, the fishing canoes, but all the parts are finished and fitted much more perfectly, lashed with a better creeper, and more thoroughly caulked. The carving, which in the fishing canoes is often quite indifferent, here is perfect. Ownership of these canoes is even more complex, and its construction is permeated with tribal customs, ceremonial, and magic, the last based on mythology. The magic is always performed in direct association with Kula expeditions. 3. After having thus spoken about, first, the general impression made by a canoe and its psychological import, and then about the fundamental features of its technology. We have to turn to the social implications of a Masawa, seagoing canoe. The canoe is constructed by a group of people, it is owned, used and enjoyed communally, and this is done according to definite rules. There is therefore a social organization underlying the building, the owning, and the sailing of a canoe. Under these three headings, we shall give an outline of the canoe's sociology, always bearing in mind that these outlines have to be filled in in the subsequent account. a. Social organization of labor in constructing a canoe. In studying the construction of a canoe, we see the natives engaged in an economic enterprise on a big scale. Technical difficulties face them, which require knowledge, and can only be overcome by a continuous, systematic effort, and at certain stages must be met by means of communal labor. All this obviously implies some social organization. All the stages of work, at which various people have to cooperate, must be coordinated, there must be someone in authority who takes the initiative and gives decisions. And there must be also someone with a technical capacity, who directs the construction. Finally, in Kirawina, communal labor, and the services of experts have to be paid for, and there must be someone who has the means and is prepared to do it. This economic organization rests on two fundamental facts, one, the sociological differentiation of functions, and, two, the magical regulation of work. One, the sociological differentiation of functions. First of all there is the owner of the canoe, that is, the chief, or the headman of a village or of a smaller subdivision, who takes the responsibility for the undertaking. He pays for the work, engages the expert, gives orders, and commands communal labor. Besides the owner, there is next another office of great sociological importance, namely, that of the expert. He is the man who knows how to construct the canoe, how to do the carvings, and, last, not least, how to perform the magic. All these functions of the expert may be, but not necessarily are, united in one person. 
The owner is always one individual, but there may be two or even three experts. Finally, the third sociological factor in canoe building consists of the workers. And here there is a further division. First there is a smaller group, consisting of the relations and close friends of the owner or of the expert, who help throughout the whole process of construction. And, secondly, there is, besides them, the main body of villagers, who take part in the work at those stages where communal labor is necessary. 2. The Magical Regulation of Work The belief in the efficiency of magic is supreme among the natives of Boyawa, and they associate it with all their vital concerns. In fact, we shall find magic interwoven into all the many industrial and communal activities to be described later on, as well as associated with every pursuit where either danger or chance conspicuously enter. We shall have to describe, besides the magic of canoe-making, that of propitious sailing, of shipwreck and salvage, of kula and of trade, of fishing, of obtaining spondylus and conus shell, and of protection against attack in foreign parts. It is imperative that we should thoroughly grasp what magic means to the natives and the role it plays in all their vital pursuits, and a special chapter will be devoted to magical ideas and magical practices in Kiriwina. Here, however, it is necessary to sketch the main outlines, at least as far as canoe magic is concerned. First of all, it must be realized that the natives firmly believe in the value of magic, and that this conviction, when put to the test of their actions, is quite unwavering. Even nowadays when so much of native belief and custom has been undermined. We may speak of the sociological weight of tradition, that is of the degree to which the behavior of a community is affected by the traditional commands of tribal law and customs. In the Trobriens, the general injunction for always building canoes under the guidance of magic is obeyed without the slightest deviation, for the tradition here weighs very heavily. Up to the present, not one single Masawa canoe has been constructed without magic, indeed without the full observance of all the rites and ceremonial. The forces that keep the natives to their traditional course of behavior are, in the first place, the specific social inertia which obtains in all human societies and is the basis of all conservative tendencies. And then the strong conviction that if the traditional course were not taken, evil results would ensue. In the case of canoes, the Trobrianders would be so firmly persuaded that a canoe built without magic would be unseaworthy, slow in sailing, and unlucky in the Kula, that no one would dream of omitting the magic rites. In the myths related elsewhere, we shall see plainly the power ascribed to magic in imparting speed and other qualities to a canoe. According to native mythology, which is literally accepted, and strongly believed, canoes could be even made to fly, had not the necessary magic fallen into oblivion. It is also important to understand rightly the natives' ideas about the relation between magical efficiency and the results of craftsmanship. Both are considered indispensable, but both are understood to act independently. That is, the natives will understand that magic, however efficient, will not make up for bad workmanship. Each of these two has its own province, the builder by his skill and knowledge makes the canoe stable and swift, and magic gives it an additional stability and swiftness. If a canoe is obviously badly built, the natives will know why it sails slowly and is unwieldy. But if one of two canoes, both apparently equally well constructed surpasses the other in some respect, this will be attributed to magic. Finally, speaking from a sociological point of view, what is the economic function of magic in the process of canoe making? Is it simply an extraneous action, having nothing to do with the real work or its organization? Is magic, from the economic point of view, a mere waste of time? By no means. In reading the account which follows, it will be seen clearly that magic puts order and sequence into the various activities, and that it and its associated ceremonial are instrumental in securing the cooperation of the community and the organization of communal labor. As has been said before, it inspires the builders with great confidence in the efficiency of their work, a mental state essential in any enterprise of complicated and difficult character. The belief that the magician is a man endowed with special powers, controlling the canoe, makes him a natural leader whose command is obeyed, who can fix dates, apportion work, and keep the worker up to the mark. Magic, far from being a useless appendage, 
or even a burden on the work, supplies the psychological influence, which keeps people confident about the success of their labor, and provides them with a sort of natural leader. Thus the organization of labor in canoe building rests on the one hand on the division of functions, those of the owner, the expert, and the helpers, and on the other on the cooperation between labor and magic. 4. b. Sociology of Canoe Ownership Ownership, giving this word its broadest sense, is the relation, often very complex, between an object and the social community in which it is found. In ethnology it is extremely important not to use this word in any narrower sense than that just defined, because the types of ownership found in various parts of the world differ widely. It is especially a grave error to use the word ownership with the very definite connotation given to it in our own society. For it is obvious that this connotation presupposes the existence of very highly developed economic and legal conditions, such as they are amongst ourselves, and therefore the term own as we use it is meaningless, when applied to a native society. Or indeed, what is worse, such an application smuggles a number of preconceived ideas into our description, and before we have begun to give an account of the native conditions, we have distorted the reader's outlook. Ownership has naturally in every type of native society, a different specific meaning, as in each type, custom and tradition attach a different set of functions, rights and privileges to the word. Moreover, the social range of those who enjoy these privileges varies. Between pure individual ownership and collectivism, there is a whole scale of intermediate blendings and combinations. In the Trobriens, there is a word which may be said approximately to denote ownership, the prefix toli, followed by the name of the object owned. Thus the compound word, pronounced without hiatus, toliwaga, means, owner, or, master, of a canoe, waga, tolibugala, the master of the garden, bugala, garden, tolibunukwa, owner of the pig, tolimegwa, owner, expert in magic, etc. This word has to be used as a clue to the understanding of native ideas, but here again such a clue must be used with caution. For, in the first place, like all abstract native words, it covers a wide range, and has different meanings in different contexts. And even with regard to one object, a number of people may lay claim to ownership, claim to be totally, with regard to it. In the second place, people having the full de facto right of using an object, might not be allowed to call themselves totally, of this object. This will be made clear in the concrete example of the canoe. The word toli, in this example is restricted to one man only, who calls himself Toliwaga. Sometimes his nearest maternal relatives, such as his brothers and maternal nephews, might call themselves collectively Toliwaga, but this would be an abuse of the term. Now, even the mere privilege of using exclusively this title is very highly valued by the natives. With this feature of the Trobrian social psychology, that is with their characteristic ambition, vanity and desire to be renowned and well spoken of, the reader of the following pages will become very familiar. The natives, to whom the Kula and the sailing expeditions are so important, will associate the name of the canoe with that of its toli, they will identify his magical powers and its good luck in sailing and in the Kula. They will often speak of so and so's sailing here and there, of his being very fast in sailing, etc., using in this the man's name for that of the canoe. Turning now to the detailed determination of this relationship, the most important point about it is that it always rests in the person of the chief or headman. As we have seen in our short account of the Trobriander sociology, the village community is always subject to the authority of one chief or headman. Each one of these, whether his authority extends over a small sectional village, or over a whole district, has the means of accumulating a certain amount of garden produce, considerable in the case of a chief, relatively small in that of a headman. But always sufficient to defray the extra expenses incidental to all communal enterprise. He also owns native wealth condensed into the form of the objects of value called vegue. Again, a headman will have little, a big chief a large amount. But everyone who is not a mere nobody, must possess at least a few stone blades, a few coloma belts, and some koa, small necklets. Thus in all types of tribal enterprises, the chief or headman is able to bear the burden of expense, and he also derives the main benefit from the affair. 
In the case of the canoe, the chief, as we saw, acts as main organizer in the construction, and he also enjoys the title of Toli. This strong economic position runs side by side with his direct power, due to high rank, or traditional authority. In the case of a small headman, it is due to the fact that he is at the head of a big kinship group, the totemic subclan. Both combined, allow him to command labor and to reward for it. This title of Talawaga, besides the general social distinction which it confers, implies further a definite series of social functions with regard to its individual bearer. 1. There are first the formal and ceremonial privileges. Thus, the Talawaga has the privilege of acting as spokesman of his community in all matters of sailing or construction. He assembles the council, informal or formal as the case may be, and opens the question of when the sailing will take place. This right of initiative is purely a nominal one, because both in construction and sailing, the date of enterprise is determined by outward causes, such as reciprocity to overseas tribes, seasons, customs, etc. Nevertheless, the formal privilege is strictly confined to the Talawaga, and highly valued. The position of master and leader of ceremonies, of general spokesman, lasts right through the successive stages of the building of the canoe, and its subsequent use, and we shall meet with it in all the ceremonial phases of the kula. 2. The economic uses and advantages derived from a canoe are not limited to the Talawaga. He, however, gets the lion's share. He has, of course, in all circumstances, the privilege of absolute priority in being included in the party. He also receives always by far the greatest proportion of Kula valuables and other articles on every occasion. This, however, is in virtue of his general position as chief or headman, and should perhaps not be included under this heading. But a very definite and strictly individual advantage is that of being able to dispose of the canoe for hire, and of receiving the payment for it. The canoe can be, and often is, hired out from a headman, who at a given season has no intention of sailing, by another one, as a rule from a different district, who embarks on an expedition. The reason of this is, that the chief or headman who borrows, may at that time not be able to have his own canoe repaired, or construct another new one. The payment for hire is called Taguna, and it consists of a vague Besides this, the best vague obtained on the expedition would be Kula to the man from whom the canoe was hired. 3. The Talawaga has definite social privileges, and exercises definite functions, in the running of a canoe. Thus, he selects his companions, who will sail in his canoe, and has the nominal right to choose or reject those who may go on the expedition with him. Here again the privilege is much shorn of its value by many restrictions imposed on the chief by the nature of things. Thus, on the one hand, his veola, maternal kinsmen, have, according to all native ideas of right and law, a strong claim on the canoe. Again, a man of rank in a community could be excluded from an expedition only with difficulty, if he wished to go and there were no special grievance against him. But if there were such a cause, if the man had offended the chief, and were on bad terms with him, he himself would not even try to embark. There are actual examples of this on record. Another class of people having a de facto right to sail are the sailing experts. In the coastal villages like Sinakita there are many of these, in inland ones, like Omerkana, there are few. So in one of these inland places, there are men who always go in a canoe, whenever it is used. Who have even a good deal to say in all matters connected with sailing, yet who would never dare to use the title of Talawaga, and would even definitely disclaim it if it were given to them. To sum up, the chief's privilege of choice is limited by two conditions, the rank and the seamanship of those he may select. As we have seen, he fulfills definite functions in the construction of the canoe. We shall see later on that he has also definite functions in sailing. 4. A special feature, implied in the title of Talawaga, is the performance of magical duties. It will be made clear that magic during the process of construction is done by the expert, but magic done in connection with sailing and kula is done by the Talawaga. The latter must, by definition, know canoe magic. The role of magic in this, and the taboos, ceremonial activities, and special customs associated with it, 
will come out clearly in the consecutive account of a Kula expedition. V. C. The social division of functions in the manning and sailing of the canoe. Very little is to be said under this heading here, since to understand this we must know more about the technicalities of sailing. We shall deal with this subject later on, and there the social organization within the canoe, such as it is, will be indicated. Here it may be said that a number of men have definite tasks assigned to them, and they keep to these. As a rule a man will specialize, let us say, as steersman, and will always have the rudder given to his care. Captainship, carrying with it definite duties, powers and responsibilities, as a position distinct from that of the Talawaga, does not exist. The owner of the canoe will always take the lead and give orders, provided that he is a good sailor. Otherwise the best sailor from the crew will say what is to be done when difficulties or dangers arise. As a rule, however, everyone knows his task, and everyone performs it in the normal course of events. A short outline of the concrete details referring to the distribution of canoes in the Trobriens must be given here. A glance at the map of Boyawa shows that various districts have not the same opportunities for sailing, and not all of them direct access to the sea. Moreover, the fishing villages on the lagoon, where fishing and sailing have constantly to be done, will naturally have more opportunities for cultivating the arts of sailing and shipbuilding. And indeed we find that the villages of the two inland districts, Tilatala and Kuboma, know nothing about shipbuilding and sailing, and possess no canoes. The villages in Kiriwina and Luba, on the east coast, with indirect access to the sea, have only one canoe each, and few building experts, while some villagers on the lagoon are good sailors and excellent builders. The best centers for canoe building are found in the islands of Vakuta and Kelola, and to a lesser degree this craft flourishes in the village of Sinekita. The island of Kideva is the traditional building center, and at present the finest canoes as well as the best canoe carvings come from there. In this description of canoes, this island, which really belongs to the eastern rather than to the western branch of the N. Masim, must be included in the account, since all Boyawan canoe mythology and canoe industry is associated with Kideva. There are at present some 64 Misawa canoes in the Trobriens and Kideva. Out of these, some four belong to the northern district, where Kula is not practiced, all the rest are built and used for the Kula. In the foregoing chapters one have spoken about Kula communities, that is, such groups of villages as carry on the Kula as a whole, sail together on overseas expeditions, and do their internal Kula with one another. We shall group the canoes according to the Kula community to which they belong. Kiriwina Canoes Luba Canoes, comma. Sinekita Canoes, comma. Vakuta Canoes, comma. Kelola. About. Canoes, comma. Kideva. About. Canoes, comma. Total for all Kula. Communities. Canoes. To this number, the canoes of the northern district must be added, but they are never used in the Kula. In olden days, this figure was, on a rough estimate, more than double of what it is now, because, first of all, there are some villages which had canoes in the old days and now have none. And then the number of villages which became extinct a few generations ago is considerable. About half a century ago, there were in Vakuta alone about 60 canoes, in Sinekita at least 20, in Kideva 30, in Kiriwina 20, and in Luba 10. When all the canoes from Sinekita and Vakuta sailed south, and some twenty to thirty more joined them from the Amphlets and Tawara, quite a stately fleet would approach Dobu. Turning now to the list of ownership in Kiriwina, the most important canoe is, of course, that owned by the chief of Omurakana. This canoe always leads the fleet. That is to say, on big ceremonial Kula sailings, called Avalaku, it has the privileged position. It lives in a big shed on the beach of Kalakuba, sea plates, distant about one mile from the village, the beach on which also each new canoe is made. The present canoe, sea plates end, is called Nagata Bue, begging for an Arakanut. Every canoe has a personal name of its own, sometimes just an appropriate expression, like the one quoted, 
sometimes derived from some special incident. When a new canoe is built, it often inherits the name of its predecessor, but sometimes it gets a new name. The present Omurakana canoe was constructed by a master builder from Kideva, who also carved the ornamental prow board. There is no one now in Omurakana who can build or carve properly. The magic over the latter stages ought to have been recited by the present chief, Tuolua, but as he has very little capacity for remembering spells, the magic was performed by one of his kinsmen. All the other canoes of Kiriwina are also housed in hangars, each on a beach of clean, white sand on the eastern coast. The chief or headman of each village is the Taluaga. In Kasanaai, the sub-village of Omurakana, the canoe, called in feigned modesty Takwabu, something like, landlubber, was built by Ibina, a chief of equal rank, but smaller power than Tuolua, and he is also the Taluaga. Some other characteristic names of the canoes are, Kwayamatame, take care of yourself, that is, because I shall get ahead of you. The canoe of Liliuta, called Cii, which is the name of a government station, where some people from Liliuta were once imprisoned, Tepusa, a flying fish, Yaguyu, a scarecrow. Akam to you, I shall eat men, because the canoe was a gift from the cannibals of Dobu. In the district of Luba there are at present only three canoes, one belongs to the chief of highest rank in the village of Olivalivi. This is the biggest canoe in all the Trobrians. Two are in the village of Wawela, and belong to two headmen, each ruling over a section of the village, one of them is seen being relashed on. The big settlement of Sinekita, consisting of sectional villages, has also canoes. There are about four expert builders and carvers, and almost every man there knows a good deal about construction. In Vakuta the experts are even more numerous, and this is also the case in Kelola and Kideva. Comparing the frail yet clumsy native canoe with a fine European yacht, we feel inclined to regard the former almost in the light of a joke. This is the pervading note in many amateur ethnographic accounts of sailing, where cheap fun is made by speaking of roughly hewn dugouts in terms of dreadnoughts or royal yachts, just as simple. Savage chiefs are referred to as kings in a jocular vein. Such humor is doubtless natural and refreshing, but when we approach these matters scientifically, on the one hand we must refrain from any distortion of facts, and on the other. Enter into the finer shades of the native's thought and feeling with regard to his own creations. The crab claw sails, used on the south coast, from Mailu where I used to see them, to westwards where they are used with the double masted Lakatoi of Port Moresby, are still more picturesque. In fact, I can hardly imagine anything more strangely impressive than a fleet of crab claw sailed canoes. They have been depicted in the British New Guinea stamp, as issued by Captain Francis Barton, the late governor of the colony. See also plate 12 of Seligman's Melanesians. A constructive expedient to achieve a symmetrical stability is exemplified by the Mailu system of canoe building, where a platform bridges two parallel, hollowed out logs. CF. Author's article in the Transactions of the Royal Society of S. Australia, Volume 39, 1915, pages 494 to 706. Chapter 4, 612 to 599. Plates 35 to 37. The whole tribal life is based on a continuous material give and take, cf. The above mentioned article in the Economic Journal, March, 1921, and the digression on this subject in. This view has been more fully elaborated in the article on Primitive Economics in the Economic Journal, March, 1921. Compare also the remarks on systematic magic in The way of hiring a Masawa, seagoing, canoe is different from the usual transaction, when hiring a fishing canoe. In the latter case, the payment consists of giving part of the yield of fish, and this is called yuaga. The same term applies to all payments for objects hired. Thus, if fishing nets or hunting implements, or a small canoe for trading along the coast are hired out, part of the proceeds are given as Uwaga. Chapter 5. The Ceremonial Building of Uwaga. I. The building of the seagoing canoe, Misawa, is inextricably bound up with the general proceedings of the Kula. As we have said before, 
in all villages where Kula is practiced the Misawa canoes are built and repaired only in direct connection with it. That is, as soon as a Kula expedition is decided upon, and its date fixed, all the canoes of the village must be overhauled, and those too old for repair must be replaced by new ones. As the overhauling differs only slightly from building in the later, ceremonial stages of the procedure, the account in this chapter covers both. To the native, the construction of the canoe is the first link in the chain of the Kula performances. From the moment that the tree is felled till the return of the overseas party, there is one continuous flow of events, following in regular succession. Not only that, as we shall see, the technicalities of construction are interrupted and punctuated by magical rites. Some of these refer to the canoe, others belong to the Kula. Thus, Canoe building and the first stage of Kula dovetail into one another. Again, the launching of the canoe, and especially the Kabajadoya, the formal presentation visit, are in one respect the final acts of canoe building, and in another they belong to the Kula. In giving the account of canoe building, therefore, we start on the long sequence of events which form a Kula expedition. No account of the Kula could be considered complete in which canoe building had been omitted. Plate XXV. The dugout in the village. A canoe hull in the process of being hollowed out, in the baku of one of the villages of Sinekita. The parts not being worked are covered with coconut leaves. C. Plate. XXVI. Carving a tabuyo. Malalakwa, a tokabitam, master carver, giving the final touches to an oval proudboard, tabuyo, made for a new canoe in Olivalivi. The carving is done with a long iron nail, formerly a wallaby bone was used, which is driven by means of a wooden hammer. C. In this chapter, the incidents will be related one after the other as they happen in the normal routine of tribal life, obeying the commands of custom, and the indications of belief, the latter acting more rigidly and strongly even than the former. It will be necessary, in following this consecutive account, to keep in mind the definite, sociological mechanism underlying the activities, and the system of ideas at work in regulating labor and magic. The social organization has been described in the previous chapter. We shall remember that the owner, the expert or experts, a small group of helpers, and the whole community are the social factors, each of which fulfills a different function in the organization and performance of work. As to the magical ideas which govern the various rites, they will be analyzed later on in the course of this and some of the following chapters, and also in. Here it must suffice to say that they belong to several different systems of ideas. The one based on the myth of the flying canoe refers directly to the canoe, it aims at imparting a general excellence, and more especially the quality of speed to the canoe. The rites of the other type are really exorcisms directed against evil bewitchment, Bulabwalada, of which the natives are much afraid. The third system of magic, performed during canoe construction, is the Kula magic, based on its own mythological cycle, and although performed on the canoe, yet aiming at the imparting of success to the Talawaga in his Kula transactions. Finally, at the beginnings of the proceedings there is some magic addressed to the Takwe, the malignant wood sprite. The construction of the canoe is done in two main stages, differing from one another in the character of the work, in the accompanying magic and in the general sociological setting. In the first stage, the component parts of the canoe are prepared. A big tree is cut, trimmed into a log, then hollowed out and made into the basic dugout, the planks, boards, poles, and sticks are prepared. This is achieved by slow, leisurely work, and it is done by the canoe builder with the assistance of a few helpers, usually his relatives or friends or else those of the Talawaga. This stage generally takes a long time, some two to six months, and is done in fits and starts, as other occupations allow, or the mood comes. The spells and rites which accompany it belong to the Takwe magic, and to that of the flying canoe cycle. To this first stage also belongs the carving of the decorative proudboards. This is done sometimes by the builder, sometimes by another expert, if the builder cannot carve. The second stage is done by means of intense communal labor. As a rule this stage is spread over a short time, only perhaps a week or two, including the pauses between work. 
The actual labor, in which the whole community is energetically engaged, takes up only some three to five days. The work consists of the piecing together of the planks and prow boards, and, in case these do not fit well, of trimming them appropriately, and then of the lashing them together. Next comes the piecing and lashing of the outrigger, caulking and painting of the canoe. Sail making is also done at this time, and belongs to this stage. As a rule, the main body of the canoe is constructed at one sitting, lasting about a day. That is, the prow boards are put in, the ribs and planks fitted together, trimmed and lashed. Another day is devoted to the attaching of the float and binding of the outrigger frame and the platform. Caulking and painting are done at another sitting, or perhaps at two more, while the sail is made on yet another day. These times are only approximate, since the size of the canoe, as well as the number of people participating in communal labor, greatly varies. The second stage of canoe building is accompanied by Kula magic, and by a series of exorcisms on the canoe, and the magic is performed by the owner of the canoe, and not by the builder or expert. This latter, however, directs the technicalities of the proceedings, in which he is assisted and advised by builders from other villages, by sailing experts, and by the Talawaga and other notables. The lashing of the canoe with a specially strong creeper, called Wayugo, is accompanied by perhaps the most important of the rites and spells belonging to the flying canoe magic. 2. After the decision to build a waga has been taken, a tree suitable for the main log has to be chosen. This, in the Trobriens, is not a very easy task. As the whole plain is taken up by garden land, only the small patches of fertile soil in the coral ridge which runs all round the island, remain covered with jungle. There the tree must be found, there felled, and thence transported to the village. Once the tree is chosen, the Talawaga, the builder and a few helpers repair to the spot, and a preliminary rite must be performed, before they begin to cut it down. A small incision is made into the trunk, so that a particle of food, or a bit of arica nut can be put into it. Giving this as an offering to the Takwe, wood sprite, the magician utters an incantation. Vabusi Takwe spell. Come down, O wood sprites, O Takwe, dwellers in branches, come down. Come down, dwellers in branch forks, in branch shoots. Come down, come, eat. Go to your coral outcrop over there, crowd there, swarm there, be noisy there, scream there. Step down from our tree, old men. This is a canoe ill spoken of, this is a canoe out of which you have been shamed, this is a canoe out of which you have been expelled. At sunrise and morning, you help us in felling the canoe. This our tree, old men, let it go and fall down. This spell, given in free translation, which, however, follows the original very closely, word for word, is far clearer than the average sample of Trobrian magic. In the first part, the Takwe is invoked under various names, and invited to leave his abode, and to move to some other place, and there to be at his ease. In the second part, the canoe is mentioned with several epithets, all of which denote an act of discourtesy or ill omen. This is obviously done to compel the Takwe to leave the tree. In Boyawa, the Yoba, the chasing away, is under circumstances a great insult, and at times it commands immediate compliance. This is always the case when the chaser belongs to the local sub-clan of a village, and the person expelled does not. But the yoba is always an act of considerable consequence, never used lightly, and in this spell, it carries these sociological associations with it. In the usual anticipatory way, characteristic of native speech, the tree is called in the spell, canoe, waga. The object of this spell is written very plainly in every word of it, and the natives also confirm it by saying that it is absolutely necessary to get rid of the takwe. What would happen, however, if the takwe were not expelled, is not so unequivocally laid down by tradition, and it cannot be read out of the spell or the rite. Some informants say that the canoe would be heavy. Others that the wood would be full of knots, and that there would be holes in the canoe, or that it would quickly rot. But though the rationale of the expulsion is not so well defined, the belief in the Takwe's evil influence, and in the dangers associated with his presence is positive.
and this is in keeping with the general nature of the Takwe, as we find him delineated by native belief. The Takwe is on the whole a harmful being, though the harm he does is seldom more than an unpleasant trick, perhaps a sudden fright, an attack of shooting pains, or a theft. The Takwe live in trees or in coral rocks and boulders, usually in the Rabwag, the primeval jungle, growing on the coastal ridge, full of outcrops and rocks. Some people have seen a Takwe, although he is invisible at will. His skin is brown, like that of any Boyawan, but he has long, sleek hair, and a long beard. He comes often at night, and frightens people. But, though seldom seen, the Takwe's wailing is often heard from the branches of a big tree, and some trees evidently harbor more Takwe's than others, since you can hear them very easily there. Sometimes, over such trees, where people often hear the Takwe and get a fright, the above quoted incantation and rite are performed. In their contact with men, the Takwe show their unpleasant side, often they come at night and steal food. Many cases can be quoted when a man, as it seemed, was surprised in the act of stealing yams out of a storehouse, but lo! When approached he disappeared, it was a Takwe. Then, sickness in some of its lighter forms is caused by the Takwe. Shooting pains, pricking and stabbing in one's inside, are often due to him, for he is in possession of magic by which he can insert small, sharp-edged and sharp-pointed objects into the body. Fortunately some men know magic by which to extract such objects. These men, of course, according to the general rule of sorcery, can also inflict the same ailments. In olden days, the Takwe gave both the harmful and beneficent magic to some men, and ever since, this form of sorcery and of concomitant healing have been handed on from one generation to another. Let us return to our canoe, however. After the rite has been performed, the tree is felled. In olden days, when stone implements were used, this must have been a laborious process, in which a number of men were engaged in wielding the axe, and others in resharpening the blunted or broken blades. The old technique was more like nibbling away the wood in small chips, and it must have taken a long time to cut out a sufficiently deep incision to fell the tree. After the tree is on the ground, the preliminary trimming is done on the spot. The branches are lopped off, and the log of appropriate length is made out of the tree. This log is cut into the rough shape of a canoe, so as to make it as light as possible, for now it has to be pulled to the village or to the beach. The transporting of the log is not an easy task, as it has to be taken out of the uneven, rocky rabwag, and then pulled along very bad roads. Pieces of wood are put on the ground every few meters, to serve as slips on which the log can more easily glide than on the rocks and uneven soil. In spite of that, and in spite of the fact that many men are summoned to assist, the work of pulling the log is very heavy. The men receive food in payment for it. Pig flesh is cooked and distributed with baked yams. At intervals during the work they refresh themselves with green coconut drinks and with sucking sugar cane. Gifts of such food, given during work in payment of communal labor, are called puea. To describe how heavy the work sometimes is, the native will say, in a characteristically figurative manner. The pig, the cocoa drinks, the yams are finished, and yet we pull, very heavy. In such cases the natives resort to a magical rite which makes the canoe lighter. A piece of dry banana leaf is put on top of the log. The owner or builder beats the log with a bunch of dry lawang grass and utters the following spell. Kamamwayu spell. Come down, come down, defilement by contact with excrement. Come down, defilement by contact with refuse. Come down, heaviness. Come down, rot. Come down, fungus. And soon, invoking a number of deteriorations to leave the log, and then a number of defilements and broken taboos. In other words, the heaviness and slowness, due to all these magical causes, are thrown out of the log. This bunch of grass is then ritually thrown away. It is called mamwayu, or the heavy bunch. Another handful of the long lawang grass, seared and dry, is taken, and this is the gagable, the light bunch, and with this the canoe is again beaten. The meaning of the rite is quite plain, 
the first bunch takes into it the heaviness of the log, and the second imparts lightness to it. Both spells also express this meaning in plain terms. The second spell, recited with the gagable bunch, runs thus. Kagagabble spell. He fails to outrun me, repeated many times. The canoe trembles with speed, many times. A few untranslatable words are uttered. Then a long chain of ancestral names is invoked. I lash you, O oh tree, the tree flies, the tree becomes like a breath of wind, the tree becomes like a butterfly, the tree becomes like a cotton seed fluff. One sun, i.e. Time, for my companions, midday sun, setting sun, another sun for me, here the reciter's name is uttered, the rising sun, the rays of the, rising, sun, the time of, opening the huts, the time of the, rising of the morning star. The last part means, my companions arrive at sunset, while I arrive with the rising sun, indicating how far my canoe exceeds them in speed. These formulae are used both to make the log lighter for the present purpose of pulling it into the village, and in order to give it greater speed in general, when it is made up into a waga. After the log has been finally brought into the village, and left on the baku, the main central place, the creeper by means of which it has been pulled and which is called in this connection duku, is not cut away at once. This is done ceremonially on the morning of the following day, sometimes after even two or three days have passed. The men of the community assemble, and the one who will scoop out the canoe, the builder, Toda Ila Waga, the cutter of the canoe, performs a magical rite. He takes his adze, ligogu, and wraps some very light and thin herbs round the blade with a piece of dried banana leaf, itself associated with the idea of lightness. This he wraps only half round, so that a broad opening is left, and the breath and voice have free access to the herbs and blade of the adze. Into this opening, the magician chants the following long spell. Capitunana Duku spell. I shall wave them back, i.e., prevent all other canoes from overtaking me, repeated many times. On the top of C.A. Hill, women of Tokuna, my mother a sorceress, myself a sorcerer. It dashes forward, it flies ahead. The canoe body is light. The Pandana streamers are a flutter, the prow schemes the waves, the ornamental boards leap, like dolphins, the tabuyo, small prow board, breaks the waves, the lagum, transversal prow board, breaks the waves. Thou sleepest in the mountain, thou sleepest in Kuyua Island. We shall kindle a small fire of lalong grass, we shall burn aromatic herbs, i.e., at our destination in the mountains. Whether new or old, thou goest ahead. This is the exordium of the formula. Then comes a very long middle part, in a form very characteristic of Trobriand magic. This form resembles a litany, in so far as a key word or expression is repeated many times with a series of complementary words and expressions. Then the first key word is replaced by another, which in its turn, is repeated with the same series of expressions, then comes another key word, and so on. We have thus two series of words. Each term of the first is repeated over and over again, with all terms of the second, and in this manner, with a limited number of words, a spell is very much lengthened out, since its length is the product of the length of both series. In shorter spells, there may be only one key word, and in fact, this is the more usual type. In this spell, the first series consists of nouns denoting different parts of the canoe. The second are verbs, such as, to cut, to fly, to speed, to cleave a fleet of other canoes, to disappear, to skim over the waves. Thus the litany runs in such a fashion, the tip of my canoe starts, the tip of my canoe flies, the tip of my canoe speeds, etc., etc. After the long litany has been chanted, the magician repeats the exordium, and finishes it off with the conventional onomatopoetic word sadidity, which is meant to imitate the flying of the witches. After the recital of this long spell over the herbs and blade of his adze, the magician wraps up the dry banana leaf, thus imprisoning the magical virtue of the spell round the blade, and with this. He strikes and cuts through the duku, the creeper used for the pulling of the canoes. With this, the magic is not over yet, for on the same evening, when the canoe is put on transversal logs, nigakulu, another rite has to be carried out. 
Some herbs are placed on the transversals between them and the body of the big canoe log. Over these herbs, again, another spell has to be uttered. In order not to overload this account with magical texts, I shall not adduce this spell in detail. Its wording also plainly indicates that it is speed magic, and it is a short formula running on directly, without cross repetitions. After that, for some days, the outside of the canoe body is worked. Its two ends must be cut into tapering shape, and the bottom evened and smoothed. After that is done, the canoe has to be turned over, this time into its natural position, bottom down, and what is to be the opening, upwards. Before the scooping out begins, another formula has to be recited over the Kavilali, a special ligogu, adds, used for scooping out, which is inserted into a handle with a movable part. Which then allows the cutting to be done at varying angles to the plane of striking. The rite stands in close connection to the myth of the flying canoe, localized in Kudayuri, a place in the island of Kideva, and many allusions are made to this myth. After a short exordium, containing untranslatable magical words, and geographical references, the spell runs. Ligogu spell. I shall take hold of an adze, I shall strike. I shall enter my canoe, I shall make thee fly, O canoe, I shall make thee jump. We shall fly like butterflies, like wind, we shall disappear in mist, we shall vanish. You will pierce the straits of Kadamwadu, between the islands of Tawara and Uwama, you will break the promontory of Saramwa, near Dobu, pierce the passage of Loma, in Dawson Straits, die away in the distance, die away with the wind. Fade away with the mist, vanish away. Break through your seaweeds, i.e., on coming against the shore. Put on your wreath, probably an allusion to the seaweeds, make your bed in the sand. I turn round, I see the Vakuta men, the Kideva men behind me, my sea, the sea of Pololu, i.e. The sea between the Trobrians and the Amphlets, today the Kudayuri men will burn their fires, i.e., on the shores of Dobu. Bind your grass skirt together, O canoe, here the personal name of the canoe is mentioned, fly. The last phrase contains an implicit hint that the canoe partakes of the nature of a flying witch, as it should, according to the Kadayuri myth. After this, the canoe builder proceeds to scoop out the log. This is a long task, and a heavy one, and one which requires a good deal of skill, especially towards the end, when the walls of the dugout have to be made sufficiently thin, and when the wood has to be taken off evenly over the whole surface. Thus, although at the beginning the canoe carpenter is usually helped by a few men, his sons or brothers or nephews who in assisting him also learn the trade, towards the end he has to do the work single-handed. It, therefore, always happens that this stage takes a very long time. Often the canoe will lie for weeks, untouched, covered with palm leaves against the sun, and filled with some water to prevent drying and cracking, see. Then the carpenter will set to work for a few days, and pause again. In almost all villages, the canoe is put up in the central place, or before the builder's hut. In some of the eastern villages, the scooping out is done on the sea beach, to avoid pulling the heavy log to and from the village. Parallel with the process of hollowing out, the other parts of the canoe are made ready to be pieced together. For broad and long planks form the gunwale, L-shaped pieces of wood are cut into ribs, long poles are prepared for longitudinal support of the ribs, and for platform rafters. Short poles are made ready as transversals of the platform and main supports of the outrigging, small sticks to connect the float with the transversals, finally, the float itself, a long, bulky log. These are the main, constituent parts of a canoe, to be made by the builder. The four carved boards are also made by him if he knows how to carve, otherwise another expert has to do this part of the work, see. When all the parts are ready, another magical rite has to be performed. It is called, Capitunula Nanola Waga, the cutting off of the canoe's mind, an expression which denotes a change of mind, a final determination. In this case, the canoe makes up its mind to run quickly. The formula is short, contains at the beginning a few obscure words, and then a few geographical references to some places in the D'Entrecastos archipelago. It is recited over a few drops of coconut oil, which is then wrapped up in a small bundle. 
The same spell is then again spoken over the ligoga blade, round which a piece of dry banana has been wrapped in the manner described above. The canoe is turned bottom up, the bundle with coconut oil placed on it and struck with the adze. With this the canoe is ready to be pieced together, and the first stage of its construction is over. 3. As has been said above, the two stages differ from one another in the nature of work done and in their sociological and ceremonial setting. So far, we have seen only a few men engaged in cutting the tree and scooping it out and then preparing the various parts of the canoe. Industriously, but slowly and deliberately, with many pauses, they toil over their work, sitting on the brown, trodden soil of the village in front of the huts, or scooping the canoe in the central place. The first part of the task, the felling of the tree, took us to the tall jungle and intricate undergrowth, climbing and festooned around the fantastic shapes of coral rocks. Now, with the second stage, the scene shifts to the clean, snow-white sand of a coral beach, where hundreds of natives in festive array crowd around the freshly scraped body of the canoe. The carved boards, painted in black, white and red, the green fringe of palms and jungle trees, the blue of the sea, all lend color to the vivid and lively scene. Thus I saw the building of a canoe done on the east shore of the Trobriands, and in this setting I remember it. In Sinekita, instead of the blue, open sea, breaking in a belt of white foam outside on the fringing reef and coming in limpid waves to the beach, there are the dull, muddy browns and greens of the lagoon. Playing into pure emerald tints where the clean sandy bottom begins. Into one of these two scenes, we must now imagine the dugout transported from the village, after all is ready, and after the summons of the chief or headman has gone round the neighboring villages. In the case of a big chief, several hundreds of natives will assemble to help, or to gaze on the performance. When a small community with a second-rate headman construct their canoe, only a few dozen people will come, the relatives-in-law of the headman and of other notables, and their close friends. After the body of the canoe and all the accessories have been placed in readiness, the proceedings are opened by a magical rite, called Kachalaliva Tabuyo. This rite belongs to the Kula magic, for which the natives have a special expression. They call it Mwazala. It is connected with the inserting of the ornamental prowboards into their grooves at both ends of the canoe. These ornamental parts of the canoe are put in first of all, and this is done ceremonially. A few sprigs of the mint plant are inserted under the boards, as they are put in, and the Talawaga, owner of the canoe, hammers the boards in by means of a special stone imported from Dobu, and ritually repeats a formula of the Mwazala magic. The mint plant, Sulamwoya, plays an important part in the Mwazala, Kula magic, as well as in love spells, and in the magic of beauty. Whenever a substance is to be medicated for the purpose of charming, seducing, or persuading, as a rule Solomoya is used. This plant figures also in several myths, where it plays a similar part, the mythical hero always conquering the foe or winning a woman by the use of the Solomoya. I shall not adduce the magical formulae in this account, with the exception of the most important one. Even a short summary of each of them would obstruct the narrative, and it would blur completely the outline of the consecutive account of the various activities. The various complexities of the magical ritual and of the formulae will be set forth in. It may be mentioned here, however, that not only are there several types of magic performed during canoe building, such as the Mwazala, Kula magic, the canoe speed magic, exorcisms against evil magic, and exorcism of the Takwe. But within each of these types, there are different systems of magic, each with its own mythological basis, each localized in a different district, and each having of course different formulae and slightly different rites. After the prow boards are put in, and before the next bit of technical work is done, another magical rite has to be performed. The body of the canoe, now bright with the three colored boards, is pushed into the water. A handful of leaves, of a shrub called babiyu, is charmed by the owner or by the builder, and the body of the canoe is washed in sea water with the leaves. All the men participate in the washing, and this rite is intended to make the canoe fast, by removing the traces of any evil influence, which might still have remained, in spite of the previous magic, performed on the waga. After the waga has been rubbed and washed, 
it is pulled ashore again and placed on the skid logs. Now the natives proceed to the main and most important constructive part of their work. This consists of the erection of the gunnel planks at the sides of the dugout log, so as to form the deep and wide well of the built-up canoe. They are kept in position by an internal framework of some 12 to 20 pairs of ribs, and all of this is lashed together with a special creeper called wayugo, and the holes and interstices are caulked with a resinous substance. I cannot enter here into details of building, though from the technological point of view, this is the most interesting phase, showing us the native at grips with real problems of construction. He has a whole array of component parts, and he must make them fit together with a considerable degree of precision, and that without having any exact means of measurement. By a rough appreciation based on long experience and great skill, he estimates the relative shapes and sizes of the planks, the angles and dimensions of the ribs, and the lengths of the various poles. Then, in shaping them out, the builder tests and fits them in a preliminary manner as work goes on, and as a rule the result is good. But now, when all these component parts have to be pieced finally together, it nearly always happens that some bit or other fails to fit properly with the rest. These details have to be adjusted, a bit taken off the body of the canoe, a plank or pole shortened, or even a piece added. The natives have a very efficient way of lashing on a whole bit of a plank, if this proves too short, or if, by some accident, it breaks at the end. After all has been finally fitted, and made to tally, the framework of ribs is put into the canoe, C, and the natives proceed to lash them to the body of the dugout, and to the two longitudinal poles to which the ribs are threaded. And now a few words must be said about the wayugo, the lashing creeper. Only one species of creeper is used for the lashing of boats, and it is of the utmost importance that this creeper should be sound and strong. It is this alone that maintains the cohesion of the various parts, and in rough weather, very much depends on how the lashings will stand the strain. The other parts of the canoe, the outrigger poles, can be more easily tested, and as they are made of strong, elastic wood, they usually stand any weather quite well. Thus the element of danger and uncertainty in a canoe is due mainly to the creeper. No wonder, therefore, that the magic of the creeper is considered as one of the most important ritual items in canoe building. In fact, Wayugo, the name of that creeper species, is also used as a general term for canoe magic. When a man has the reputation of building or owning a good and fast canoe, the usual way of explaining it is to say that he has, or knows, a good Wayugo. For, as in all other magic, there are several types of Wayugo spells. The ritual is always practically the same, five coils of the creeper are, on the previous day, placed on a large wooden dish and chanted over in the owner's hut by himself. Only exceptionally can this magic be done by the builder. Next day they are brought to the beach ceremonially on the wooden plate. In one of the Wayugo systems, there is an additional rite, in which the Talawaga, canoe owner, takes a piece of the creeper, inserts it into one of the holes pierced in the rim of the dugout for the lashing, and pulling it to and fro. Recites once more the spell. In consideration of the importance of this magic, the formula will be here adduced in full. It consists of an exordium, Yula, a double main part, Tapwana, and a concluding period, Dogaina. Wayugo Spell in the Yula he first repeats, sacred, or ritual, eating of fish, sacred inside, thus alluding to a belief that the Talawaga has in connection with this magic to partake ritually of baked fish. Then come the words, flutter, beetle plant, leaving behind, all associated with leading ideas of canoe magic, the flutter of pandanus streamers, the beetle nut, which the ancestral spirits in other rites are invited to partake of. The speed by which all comrades will be left behind. A list of ancestral names follows. Two of them, probably mythical personages, have significative names, Stormy Sea, and Foaming. Then the Baloma, spirits, of these ancestors are asked to sit on the canoe slips and to chew beetle, and they are invoked to take the Pandana streamer of the Kadayuri, a place in Kideva. Where the flying canoe magic originated, and planted on top of Tula or Tawara, the small island off the east coast of Ferguson. The magician after that chance, I shall turn, I shall turn towards you, 
O men of Kideva, you remain behind on the Tuaru beach, in the lagoon of Akuta. Before you lies the sea arm of Pololu. Today, they kindle the festive fire of the Kadayuri, thou, O my boat, here the personal name of the boat is uttered, bind thy skirts together and fly. In this passage, which is almost identical with one in the previously quoted Ligogo spell, there is a direct allusion to the Kadayuri myth, and to the custom of festive fires. Again the canoe is addressed as a woman who has to bind her grass petticoat together during her flight. A reference to the belief that a flying witch binds her skirts when starting into the air and to the tradition that this myth originates from Nal Kawakula, one of the flying Kadayuri sisters. The following main part continues with this mythical allusion, Nal Kawakula flew from Kideva through Sinakita and Kelola to Simsim, where she settled down and transmitted the magic to her progeny. In this spell the three places, Kuyawa, a creek and hillock near Sinakita, Dikutua, a rock near Kelola, and Layu, a cleft rock in the sea near Simsim, in the Lausanke Islands, are the leading words of the Tapuana. The last sentence of the first part, forming a transition into the Tapuana, runs as follows, I shall grasp the handle of the adze. I shall grip all the component parts of the canoe, perhaps another allusion to the mythical construction of the Kadayuri canoe, comp. I shall fly on the top of Kuyua, I shall disappear, dissolve in mist, in smoke, become like a wind eddy, become alone, on top of Kuyua. The same words are then repeated, substituting for Kuyua the two other above-mentioned spots, one after the other, and thus retracing the flight of Nao Kawakula. Then the magician returns to the beginning and recites the spell over again up to the phrase, Bind thy skirt together and fly, which is followed this time by a second tapwana, I shall outdistance all my comrades with the bottom of my canoe. I shall outdistance all my comrades with the prow board of my canoe, etc., etc., repeating the prophetic boast with all the parts of the canoe, as is usual in the middle part of magical spells. In the Dogaina, the last part, the magician addresses the Waga in mythological terms, with allusions to the Kadayuri myth, and adds, Canoe thou art a ghost, thou art like a wind eddy, vanish, O my canoe, fly. Break through your sea passage of Kadamwadu, cleave through the promontory of Saramwa, pass through Loma, die away, disappear, vanish with an eddy, vanish with the mist. Make your imprint in the sand, cut through the seaweed, go, put on your wreath of aromatic herbs. Plate. XXVI. Construction of a Waga. This canoe has been partly dismembered, in the process of being relashed. It shows the construction of the tibs and the fixtures on the outrigger log. The men were just in the act of fitting in a new gunnel plank, to be seen in the background, which has to fit into the carved prow boards and into the groove at the top of the hull. CDIVV. Plate. 18 EI. Sail making. Within a couple of hours a number of men performed this enormous task of sewing together small bands of pandanus leaf, sea and, till they form a sail. Among the workers there is an albino. Plate. Zix. Rolls of dried pandanus leaf. This is the material of which the sail is made. The bisola, pandanus streamer, is made of a softer variety of pandanus leaf, bleached at a fire. After the wayugo has been ritually brought in, the lashing of the canoe begins. First of all the ribs are lashed into position then the planks, and with this the body of the canoe is ready. This takes a varying time, according to the number of people at work, and to the amount of tallying and adjusting to be done at the final fitting. Sometimes one whole day's work is spent on this stage, and the next piece of work, the construction of the outrigger, has to be postponed to another day. This is the next stage, and there is no magic to punctuate the course of technical activities. The big, solid log is put alongside the canoe, and a number of short, pointed sticks are driven into it. The sticks are put in crossways on the top of the float, lamina. Then the tops of these sticks are again attached to a number of horizontal poles, which have to be thrust through one side of the canoe body, and attached to the other. All this naturally requires again adjusting and fitting. When these sticks and poles are bound together, there results a strong yet elastic frame, in which the canoe and the float are held together in parallel positions. 
and across them transversely there run the several horizontal poles which keep them together. Next, these poles are bridged over by many longitudinal sticks lashed together, and thus a platform is made between the edge of the canoe and the tops of the float sticks. When that is done, the whole frame of the canoe is ready, and there remains only to caulk the holes and interstices. The caulking substance is prepared in the hut of the Talawaga, and a spell is recited over it on the evening before the work is begun. Then again, the whole community turn out and do the work in one day's sitting. The canoe is now ready for the sea, except for the painting, which is only for ornamentation. Three more magical rites have to be performed, however, before it is painted and then launched. All three refer directly to the canoe, and aim at giving it speed. At the same time all three are exorcisms against evil influences, resulting from various defilements or broken taboos, which possibly might have desecrated the waga. The first is called Vakasalu, which means something like, ritual cooking, of the canoe. The Talawaga has to prepare a real witch's cauldron of all sorts of things, which afterwards are burnt under the bottom of the canoe, and the smoke is supposed to exercise a speed-giving and cleansing influence. The ingredients are, the wings of a bat, the nest of a very small bird called Pasiziku, sun-dried bracken leaves, a bit of cotton fluff, and some lalong grass. All the substances are associated with flying and lightness. The wood used for kindling the fire is that of the light-timbered mimosa tree, Liga. The twigs have to be obtained by throwing at the tree a piece of wood, never a stone, and when the broken-off twig falls, it must be caught in the hand, and not allowed to touch the ground. The second rite, called Viguri, is an exorcism only, and it consists of charming a stick, and then knocking the body of the canoe all over with it. This expels the evil witchery, Bulabwalada, which it is only wise to suspect has been cast by some envious rivals, or persons jealous of the Talawaga. Finally, the third of these rites, the Katapina Waga, consists in medicating a torch of coca leaf with the appropriate spell, and fumigating with it the inside of the canoe. This gives speed and once more cleanses the canoe. After another sitting of a few days, the whole outside of the canoe is painted in three colors. Over each of them a special spell is chanted again, the most important one over the black color. This is never omitted, while the red and white spells are optional. In the right of the black color, again, a whole mixture of substances is used, a dry bracken leaf, grass, and a pasiziku nest, all this is charred with some coconut husk, and the first strokes of the black paint are made with the mixture. The rest is painted with a watery mixture of charred coconut. For red color, a sort of ochre, imported from the D'Entrecastos Islands, is used, the white one is made of a chalky earth, found in certain parts of the seashore. Sailmaking is done on another day, usually in the village, by communal labor, and, with a number of people helping, the tedious and complicated work is performed in a relatively short time. The triangular outline of the sail is first pegged out on the ground, as a rule the old sail being used as a pattern. After this is done, tapes of dried pandanus leaf, sea plates, are stretched on the ground and first fixed along the borders of the sail. Then, starting at the apex of the triangle, the sailmakers put tapes radiating towards the base, sewing them together with awls of flying fox bone, and using as thread narrow strips of specially toughened pandanus leaf. Two layers of tapes are sewn one on top of the other to make a solid fabric. 4. The canoe is now quite ready to be launched. But before we go on to an account of the ceremonial launching and the associated festivities, one or two general remarks must be made retrospectively about the proceedings just described. The whole of the first stage of canoe building, that is, the cutting of the tree, the scooping out of the log, and the preparation of the other component parts, with all their associated magic, is done only when a new canoe is built. But the second stage has to be performed over all the canoes before every great overseas Kula expedition. On such an occasion, all the canoes have to be relashed, recocked, and repainted. This obviously requires that they should all be taken to pieces and then lashed, cocked, and painted exactly as is done with a new canoe. All the magic incidental to these three processes is then performed, in its due order, over the renovated canoe. 
so that we can say about the second stage of canoe building that not only is it always performed in association with the Kula, but that no big expedition ever takes place without it. We have had a description of the magical rites, and the ideas which are implied in every one of them have been specified. But there are one or two more general characteristics which must be mentioned here. First, there is what could be called the ceremonial dimension of magical rites. That is, how far is the performance of the rite attended by the members of the community, if at all? And if so, do they actively take part in it, or do they simply pay keen attention and behave as an interested audience, or, though being present, do they pay little heed and show only small interest? In the first stage of canoe building, the rites are performed by the magician himself, with only a few helpers in attendance. The general village public do not feel sufficiently interested and attracted to assist, nor are they bound by custom to do so. The general character of these rites is more like the performance of a technicality of work than of a ceremony. The preparing of herbs for the ligogo magic, for instance, and the charming it over, is carried out in a matter-of-fact, business-like manner. And nothing in the behavior of the magician and those casually grouped around him would indicate that anything specially interesting in the routine work is happening. The rites of the second stage are ipso facto attended by all those who help in piecing together and lashing, but on the whole those present have no special task assigned to them in the performance of these rites. As to the attention and behavior during the performance of the magic, much depends of course on whether the magician officiating is a chief of great importance or someone of low rank. A certain decorum and even silence would be observed in any case. But many of those present would turn aside and go away, if they wanted to do so. The magician does not produce the impression of an officiating high priest performing a solemn ceremony, but rather of a specialized workman doing a particularly important piece of work. It must be remembered that all the rites are simple, and the chanting of the spells in public is done in a low voice, and quickly, without any specially effective vocal production. Again, the caulking and the wayugo rites are, in some types of magic at least, performed in the magician's hut, without any attendance whatever, and so is that of the black paint. Another point of general importance is what could be called the stringency of magic rites. In canoe magic, for instance, the expulsion of the takwe, the ritual cutting of the pulling rope, the magic of the ads, ligogo, that of the lashing creeper, Wayugo, of the caulking, and of the black paint can never be omitted. Whereas the other rites are optional, though as a rule some of them are performed. But even those which are considered indispensable do not all occupy the same place of importance in native mythology and in native ideas, which is clearly expressed in the behavior of the natives and their manner of speaking of them. Thus, the general term for canoe magic is either Wayugo or Ligogo, from which we can see that these two spells are considered the most important. A man will speak about his Wayugo being better than that of the other, or of having learnt his Ligogo from his father. Again, as we shall see in the canoe myth, both these rites are explicitly mentioned there. Although the expulsion of the Takwe is always done, it is definitely recognized by the natives as being of lesser importance. So are also the magic of caulking and of the black paint. A less general point, of great interest, however, is that of evil magic, Bulabwalada, and of broken taboos. I had to mention several exorcisms against those influences, and something must be said about them here. The term Bulabwalada covers all forms of evil magic or witchery. There is that which, directed against pigs, makes them run away from their owners into the bush, there is Bulabwalada for alienating the affections of a wife or sweetheart. There is evil magic against gardens, and, perhaps the most dreaded one, evil magic against rain, producing drought and famine. The evil magic against canoes, making them slow, heavy, and unseaworthy, is also much feared. Many men profess to know it, but it is very difficult for the ethnographer to obtain a formula, and I succeeded only in taking down one. It is always supposed to be practiced by canoe owners upon the craft which they regard as dangerous rivals of their own. There are many taboos referring to an already constructed canoe, and we shall meet with them later when speaking about sailing and handling the canoe. But before that stage is reached, any defilement with any unclean substance of the log out of which the canoe is scooped, 
would make it slow and bad, or if anybody were to walk over a canoe log or stand on it there would be the same evil result. One more point must be mentioned here. As we have seen, the first magical rite, of the second stage of construction, is performed over the prow boards. The question obtrudes itself as to whether the designs on these boards have any magical meaning. It must be clearly understood that any guesswork or speculations about origins must be rigidly excluded from ethnographic field work like this. For a sociologically empirical answer, the ethnographer must look to two classes of facts. First of all, he may directly question the natives as to whether the prow boards themselves or any of the motives upon them are done for magical purposes. Whether he questions the average man, or even the specialist in canoe magic and carving, to this he will always receive in Kiriwina a negative answer. He can then inquire whether in the magical ritual for formulae there are no references to the prow boards, or to any of the decorative motives on them. Here also, the evidence on the whole is negative. In one spell perhaps, and that belonging not to canoe but to the Kula magic, comp. Below, the Kayakuna Tabuyo spell, there can be found an allusion to the prow boards, but only to the term describing them in general, and not to any special decorative motive. Thus the only association between canoe decoration and canoe magic consists in the fact that two magical rites are performed over them, one mentioned already, and the other to be mentioned at the beginning of the next chapter. The description of canoe building, in fact, all the data given in this chapter, refer only to one of the two types of seagoing canoe to be found in the Kula district. For the natives of the eastern half of the ring use craft bigger, and in certain respects better, than the Misawa. The main difference between the eastern and western type consists in the fact that the bigger canoes have a higher gunwale or side, and consequently a greater carrying capacity, and they can be immersed deeper. The larger waterboard offers more resistance against making leeway, and this allows the canoes to be sailed closer to the wind. Consequently, the eastern canoes can beat, and these natives are therefore much more independent of the direction of the wind in their sailings. With this is connected the position of the mast, which in this type is stepped in the middle, and it is also permanently fixed, and is not taken down every time after sailing. It obviously, therefore, need not be changed in its position every time the canoe goes on another tack. I have not seen the construction of a najega, as these canoes are called, but I think that it is technically a much more difficult task than the building of a masawa. I was told that both magic and ceremonial of construction are very much the same in the building of both canoes. The najega, that is the larger and more seaworthy type, is used on the section of the Kula ring beginning in Gawa and ending in Tube Tube. It is also used in certain parts of the Ma Sim district, which lie outside the Kula ring, such as the island of Sudest, and surrounding smaller islands, and it is used among the southern Ma Sim of the mainland. But though its use is very widely spread, its manufacture is confined to only a few places. The most important centers of Najega building are Gawa, a few villages on Woodlark Islands, the island of Panayati, and perhaps one or two places on Misima. From there, the canoes are traded all over the district, and indeed this is one of the most important forms of trade in this part of the world. The Misawa canoes are used and manufactured in the district of Dobu, in the Amphlets, in the Trobriens, in Kideva and Iwa. One point of great importance in the relation of these two forms of canoe is that one of them has, within the last two generations, been expanding at the expense of the other. According to reliable information, gathered at several points in the Trobriands and the Amphlets, the Najega type, that is the heavier, more seaworthy and better sailing canoe, was driven out some time ago from the Amphlets and Trobriands. The Misawa, in many respects inferior, but less difficult to build, and swifter, has supplanted the bigger type. In olden days, that is, about two or three generations ago, the Najega was used exclusively in Iwa, Kideva, Kiriwina, Bakuta, and Sinekita, while the Amphletans and the natives of Kelola would usually use the Najega. Though sometimes they would sail in Misawa canoes. Dobu was the real home and headquarters of the Misawa. When the shifting began, and when it was completed, I could not ascertain. But the fact is that nowadays even the villages of Kideva and Iwa manufacture the smaller Misawa canoe. 
Thus, one of the most important cultural items is spreading from south to north. There is, however, one point on which I could not obtain definite information, that is, whether in the Trobriens the Najega in olden days was imported from Kideva. Or whether it was manufactured locally by imported craftsmen, as is done even nowadays in Kiriwina at times, or whether the Trobrianders themselves knew how to make the big canoes. There is no doubt, however, that in olden days, the natives of Kideva and Iwa used themselves to make the Najega canoes. The Kudayuri myth, C, and the connected magic, refer to this type of canoe. Thus in this district at any rate, and probably in the Trobriands and Amphlets as well, not only the use, but also the manufacture of the bigger canoe has been superseded by that of the smaller one, the Masawa, now found in all these parts. The words within brackets in this and in some of the following spells are free additions, necessary to make the meaning clear in the English version. They are implied by the context in the native original, though not explicitly contained. Compare therefore. All this is discussed at length in. It is necessary to be acquainted with the mythology of canoe building and of the Kula, in order to understand thoroughly the meaning of this spell. Compare the linguistic analysis of this spell in. Chapter 6. Launching of a Canoe and Ceremonial Visiting, Tribal Economics in the Trobriands. I. The canoe, painted and decorated, stands now ready to be launched, a source of pride to the owners and to the makers. And an object of admiration to the other beholders. A new sailing craft is not only another utility created, it is more, it is a new entity sprung into being, something with which the future destinies of the sailors will be bound up, and on which they will depend. There can be no doubt that this sentiment is also felt by the natives and expressed in their customs and behavior. The canoe receives a personal name, it becomes an object of intense interest to the whole district. Its qualities, points of beauty, and of probable perfection or faultiness are canvassed round the fires at night. The owner and his kinsmen and fellow villagers will speak of it with the usual boasting and exaggerations, and the others will all be very keen to see it, and to watch its performances. Thus the institution of ceremonial launching is not a mere formality prescribed by custom. It corresponds to the psychological needs of the community, it rouses a great interest, and is very well attended even when the canoe belongs to a small community. When a big chief's canoe is launched, whether that of Kasanai or Omurakana, Olivalivi or Sinakita, up to a thousand natives will assemble on the beach. This festive and public display of a finished canoe, with its full paint and ornament, is not only in harmony with the native sentiments towards a new sailing craft. It also agrees with the way they treat in general the results of their economic activities. Whether in gardening or in fishing, in the building of houses or in industrial achievements, there is a tendency to display the products, to arrange them, and even adorn at least certain classes of them, so as to produce a big, aesthetic effect. In fishing, there are only traces of this tendency, but in gardening, it assumes very great proportions, and the handling, arranging and display of garden produce is one of the most characteristic features of their tribal life. And it takes up much time and work. Soon after the painting and adorning of the canoe, a date is fixed for the ceremonial launching and trial run, the Tassasoria festivities, as they are called. Word is passed to the chiefs and headmen of the neighboring villages. Those of them who own canoes and who belong to the same Kula community have always to come with their canoes and take part in a sort of regatta held on the occasion. As the new canoe is always constructed in connection with a Kula expedition, and as the other canoes of the same Kula community have to be either done up or replaced. It is the rule that on the Tassasoria day a whole fleet of brand new or renovated canoes assemble on the beach, all resplendent in fresh colors and decoration of cowrie shells and bleached pandana streamers. The launching itself is inaugurated with a rite of the Mwazala, Kula magic, called Ketalula Wadola Waga, staining red of the mouth of the canoe. After the natives have taken off the plated coconut leaves with which the canoe is protected against the sun, the Talawaga chants a spell over some red ochre, and stains both bow and stern of the canoe. A special cowrie shell, attached to the prow board, tabuyo, is stained at each end. 
After that the canoe is launched, the villagers pushing it into the water over pieces of wood transversely placed which act as slips, see. This is done amidst shouts and ululations, such as are made on all occasions when some piece of work has to be done in a festive and ceremonial manner, when, for instance, the harvest is brought in and given ceremonially by a man to his brother-in-law, or when a gift of yams or taro is laid down before a fisherman's house by an inland gardener, or the return gift of fish is made. Thus the canoe is finally launched after the long series of mingled work and ceremony, technical effort and magical rite. After the launching is done, there takes place a feast, or, more correctly, a distribution of food, sagali, under observation of all sorts of formalities and ritual. Such a distribution is always made when the Talawaga has not built the canoe himself, and when he therefore has to repay the cutter of the canoe and his helpers. It also takes place whenever the canoe of a big chief is launched, in order to celebrate the occasion, to show off his wealth and generosity, and to give food to the many people who have been summoned to assist in the construction. After the Sagali, ceremonial distribution of food, is over, as a rule, in the afternoon, the new canoe is rigged, the mast is put up, the sail attached, and this and all the other boats make a trial run. It is not a competitive race in the strict sense of the word. The chief's canoe, which indeed would as a rule be best and fastest, in any case always wins the race. If it did not sail fastest, the others would probably keep back. The trial run is rather a display of the new canoe, side by side with the others. In order to give one concrete illustration of the ceremonial connected with canoe building and launching, it may be well to relate an actual event. I shall therefore describe the Tassasoria, seen on the beach of Kalakuba, in February, 1916, when the new canoe of Kasanai was launched. Eight canoes took part in the trial run, that is, all the canoes of Kirawina, which forms what I have called the Kula community, the social group who make their Kula expeditions in a body. And who have the same limits within which they carry on their exchange of valuables. Plate. Triple X. Launching of a canoe. Nagata Bue, after its renovation, being pushed into the water. C. Plate. XXXI. The Tassasoria on the beach of Kalakuba. Stepping the masts and getting the sails ready for the run. In the foreground, Tuolua, the chief of Kirawina, standing at the mast, supervises the rigging of Nagata Bue. C. Plate. XXXI. A chief's yam house in Kasanai. This illustrates the display of yams in the interstices between the logs of the well and the decorations of coconuts, running round the gable, along the supports and the walls. This yam house was quite recently put up and its barge boards had not yet been erected. C. Plate. 33. Filling a yam house in Yayumugwa. The yams are taken from the conical heaps and put into the buema, storehouses, by the brother-in-law, wife's brother, of the owner. Note the decorations on the Gableth owner being a Gungyu, chief of lower rank. C. The great event which was the cause of the building and renovating of the canoes, was a Kula expedition planned by Tulawa and his Kula community. They were to go to the east, to Kideva, to Iwa or Gawa, perhaps even to Morowa, Woodlark Island, though with this island the natives do not carry on the Kula directly. As is usual in such cases, months before the approximate date of sailing, plans and forecasts were made, stories of previous voyages were recounted. Old men dwelt on their own reminiscences and reported what they had been told by their elders of the days when iron was unknown and everyone had to sail to the east in order to get the green stone quarried in Suloga on Woodlark Island. And so, as it always happens when future events are talked over round village fires, imagination outran all bounds of probability, and the hopes and anticipations grew bigger and bigger. In the end, everyone really believed his party would go at least to the easternmost Marshall Bennett's, Gawa, whereas, as events turned out, they did not sail beyond Kideva. For this occasion a new canoe had to be constructed in Kasanaai, and this was done by Ibina himself, the chief of that village, a man of rank equal to the highest chief, his kinsman, in fact, but of smaller power. 
Ibina is a skilled builder as well as a fair carver, and there is no class of magic in which he does not profess to be versed. The canoe was built, under his guidance. He carved the boards himself, he also performed the magic, and he was, of course, the Talawaga. In Omurakana, the canoe had to be slightly altered in construction, it had to be relashed and repainted. To do this to Oyua, the chief, had summoned a master builder and carver from the island of Kideva, the same one who a couple of years before, had built this canoe. Also a new sail had to be made for the Omurakana boat, as the old one was too small. The ceremony of Tassasoria, launching and regatta, ought by rights to have been held on the beach of Kasanai, but as its sister village, Omurakana, is so much more important, it took place on Kalakuba, the seashore of the latter. As the date approached, the whole district was alive with preparations, since the coastal villages had to put their canoes in order, while in the inland communities, new festive dresses and food had to be made ready. The food was not to be eaten, but to be offered to the chief for his sagali, ceremonial distribution. Only in Omurakana, the women had to cook for a big festive repast to be eaten on return from the Tassasoria. In the Trobriens it is always a sign that a festive event is pending when all the women go in the evening to the bush to collect plenty of firewood. Next morning, this will be used for the kumkumuli, the baking of food in the ground, which is one of the forms of cooking used on festive occasions. On the evening of the Tassasoria ceremony, people in Omurakana and Kasanaai were also busy with the numerous other preparations, running to the shore and back, filling baskets with yams for the sagali. Getting ready their festive dress and decorations for the morrow. Festive dress means, for a woman, a new grass skirt, resplendent in fresh red, white and purple, and for the man a newly bleached, snow-white pubic leaf, made of the stalk of erica palm leaf. Early in the morning of the appointed day, the food was packed into baskets of plated leaf, the personal apparel on top of it, all covered as usual with folded mats and conveyed to the beach. The women carried on their heads the large baskets, shaped like big inverted bells, the men shouldered a stick with two bag-shaped baskets at each end. Other men had to carry the oars, paddles, rigging and sail, as these paraphernalia are always kept in the village. From one of the villages, one of the large, prismatic receptacles for food made of sticks was carried by several men right over the Rabwag, Coral Ridge, to be offered to the chief of Omurakana as a share in the Sagali. The whole village was astir, and on its outskirts, through the surrounding groves, parties from inland could be seen making their way rapidly to the shore. I left the village with a party of notables at about eight o'clock in the morning. After leaving the grove of fruit and palm trees which grows especially densely around the village of Omurkana, we entered between the two walls of green, the usual monotonous Trobriand road, which passes through the low scrub. Soon, emerging on a garden space, we could see, beyond a gentle declivity, the rising slope of the Rabwag, a mixture of rank vegetation with monumental boulders of grey coral standing out here and there. Through this, the path led on, following in an intricate course between small precipices and towering outcrops, passing huge, ancient ficus trees, spreading around them their many trunks and aerial roots. At the top of the ridge, all of a sudden the blue sea shone through the foliage, and the roar of waves breaking on the reef struck our ears. Soon we found ourselves among the crowd assembled on the beach, near to the big boat shed of Omurakana. By about nine o'clock, everybody was ready on the beach. It was fully exposed to the eastern sun, but this was not yet sufficiently high to drop its light right from above, and thus to produce that deadly effect of tropical midday, where the shadows instead of modeling out the details. Blur every vertical surface and make everything dull and formless. The beach appeared bright and gaudy, and the lively brown bodies looked well against the background of green foliage and white sand. The natives were anointed with coconut oil, and decorated with flowers and facial paint. Large red hibiscus blossoms were stuck into their hair, and wreaths of the white, wonderfully scented buchsia flowers crowned the dense black mops. There was a good display of ebony carvings, sticks, and lime spoons. There were decorated lime pots, and such objects of personal adornment as belts of red shell discs or of small cowrie shells, nose sticks, very rarely used nowadays. 
and other articles so well known to everybody from ethnological collections in museums, and usually called ceremonial, though. As said above, the description, objects of parade, would be much more in agreement with the correct meaning of the words. Such popular festivities as the one just being described are the occasions on which these objects of parade, some of which astonish us by their artistic perfection, appear in native life. Before I had opportunities to see savage art in actual display, in its proper, living, setting, there seemed to me always to exist some incongruity between the artistic finish of such objects and the general crudity of savage life. A crudity marked precisely on the aesthetic side. One imagines greasy, dirty, naked bodies, moppy hair full of vermin, and other realistic features which make up one's idea of the savage, and in some respects reality bears out imagination. As a matter of fact though, the incongruity does not exist when once one has seen native art actually displayed in its own setting. A festive mob of natives, with the wonderful golden brown color of their skins brought out by washing and anointing and set off by the gaudy white, red and black of facial paint, feathers and ornaments. With their exquisitely carved and polished ebony objects, with their finely worked lime pots, has a distinct elegance of its own, without striking one as grotesque or incongruous in any aesthetic detail. There is an evident harmony between their festive mood, the display of colors and forms, and the manner in which they put on and bear their ornaments. Those who have come from a distance, and who would spoil their decorations by the long march, wash with water and anoint themselves with coconut grease immediately before arriving at the scene of festivities. As a rule the best paint is put on later on, when the climax of the proceedings approaches. On this occasion, after the preliminaries, distribution of food, arrival of other canoes, were over, and when the races were just going to be started, the aristocracy of Omurakana, the wives and children of Tuoyua. His relatives and himself, withdrew behind the shelters, near the boat shed, and proceeded to put on the red, white and black of full facial paint. They crushed young betel nut, mixed it with lime, and put it on with the pestles of beetle mortars, then some of the aromatic black resin, sayaku, and white lime were applied. As the habit of mirrors is not quite well established yet in the Trobriens, the painting was done by one person on the face of another, and great care and patience were displayed on both sides. The numerous crowd spent the day without taking much refreshment, a feature strongly differentiating Kirawinian festivities from our ideal of an entertainment or picnic. No cooking was done, and only a few bananas were eaten here and there, and green coconuts were drunk and eaten. But even these refreshments were consumed with great frugality. As always on such occasions, the people collected together in sets, the visitors from each village forming a group apart. The local natives kept to their own boat houses, those of Omurakana and Kurakaiwa having their natural centers on the beach of Kalakuba. The other visitors similarly kept together in their position on the beach, according to their local distribution. Thus, men from the northern villages would keep to the northern section of the beach, those from the south would stick to that point of the compass, so that villages which were neighbors in reality would also be side by side on the shore. There was no mingling in the crowd, and individuals would not walk about from one group to another. The aristocrats, out of personal dignity, humble folk because of a modesty imposed by custom, would keep in their places. Tuolua sat practically still during the whole performance, on the platform erected for this purpose, except when he went over to his boat, to trim it for the race. The boat shed of Omurakana, round which the chief, his family and the other villagers were grouped, was the center of all the proceedings. Under one of the palms, a fairly high platform was put up to accommodate Tuolua. In a row in front of the sheds and shelters, there stood the prismatic food receptacles, Pwadaai. They had been erected by the inhabitants of Omurkana and Kasanai, on the previous day, and partially filled with yams. The rest had to be supplied by people from the other villages, on the day of the boat races. As the natives came to the beach on that day, village after village, they brought their contribution, and before settling down on their particular spot on the shore, they paid a visit to the chief and offered him their tributes. These would be put into one of the Pwadaai. All the villages did not contribute their share, but the majority did, though some of them brought only a few baskets. 
one of the villages brought one complete poirai, filled with yams, and offered the whole to the chief. In the meantime, the eight canoes arrived, including that of Kasanaai, which had been ceremonially launched that morning with the accompanying magical rite, on its own beach about half a mile away. The canoe of Omar Khanna had also been launched on this morning, and the same rite performed over it. It ought to have been done by Tuolua, the chief. As he, however, is quite incapable of remembering magical spells, in fact, he never does any of the magic which his rank and office impose on him, the rite was performed on this occasion by one of his kinsmen. This is a typical case of a rule very stringently formulated by all informants when you ask about it, yet in reality often observed with laxity. If you inquire directly, everyone will tell you that this rite, as all others of the Mwazala, Kula magic, has to be done by the Talawaga. But every time when he ought to perform it, Tuolua will find some excuse, and delegate it to another. When all the canoes were present, as well as all the important villages, at about eleven o'clock a.m., there took place the Sagali, ceremonial distribution. The food was given to people from various villages, especially such as took part in the races, or had assisted in the building of the new canoe. So we see that food contributed by all the villages before the Sagali was simply redistributed among them, a considerable quantity having been added first by the chief, and this indeed is the usual procedure at a Sagali. In this case, of course, the lion's share was taken by the Kitavans who helped at the building. After the Sagali was over, the canoes were all brought up to one spot, and the natives began to prepare them for the race. The masts were stepped, the fastenings trimmed, the sails made ready, see. After that the canoes all put off and gathered about half a mile off the shore, beyond the fringing reef, and at a sign given by someone on one of them, they all started. As said before, such a run is not a race properly speaking, in which the canoes would start scrupulously at the same minute, have the same distance to cover, and which would clearly show which is the fastest. In this case, it was merely, as always, review of the boats sailing along as well as they were able, a review in which they all began to move, more or less at the same time, went in the same direction, and covered practically the same distance. As to the timetable of the events, the Sagali was over before midday. There was a pause, and then, at about 1 p.m., the natives began rigging the canoes. Then all hands had a spell, and not before 3 p.m. were the races started. The whole affair was over by about four o'clock and half an hour later, the boats from the other villages started to sail home, the people on the shore dispersed, so that by sunset, that is, about six o'clock, the beach was almost deserted. Such was the Tassasoria ceremony which I saw in February, 1916. It was a fine sight from the spectacular point of view. A superficial onlooker could have hardly perceived any sign of white man's influence or interference. I was the only white man present, and besides myself only some two or three native missionary teachers were dressed in white cotton. Amongst the rest of us there could be seen sparsely a colored rag, tied round as a neckerchief or headdress. But otherwise there was only a swarm of naked brown bodies, shining with coconut oil, adorned in new festive dress, with here and there the three-colored grass skirt of a woman, sea plates end. But alas, for one who could look below the surface and read the various symptoms of decay, deep changes would be discernible from what must have been the original conditions of such a native gathering. In fact, some three generations ago, even its appearances would have been different. The natives then would have been armed with shields and spears. Some would have borne decorative weapons, such as the big sword clubs of hard wood, or massive ebony cudgels, or small throwing sticks. A closer inspection would have shown many more decorations and ornaments, such as no sticks, finely carved lime spatulae, gourds with burnt-in designs, some of which are now out of use, or those used of inferior workmanship or without decoration. But other and much deeper changes have taken place in the social conditions. Three generations ago both the canoes in the water and the people on the shore would have been more numerous. As mentioned above, in the olden days there would have been some twenty canoes in Kiriwina, as against eight at the present time. Again, the far stronger influence of the chief, 
and the much greater relative importance of the event would have attracted a larger proportion out of the then more numerous population. Nowadays, other interests, such as diving for pearls, working on white man's plantations, divert the native attention, while many events connected with missions, government and trading, eclipse the importance of old customs. Again, the people on the shore would have had to adhere in olden days even more closely to the local distribution, men of the same village community keeping together still more strictly, and looking with mistrust and perhaps even hostility. At other groups, especially those with whom they had hereditary feuds. The general tension would often be broken by squabbles or even miniature fights, especially at the moment of dispersing, and on the way home. One of the important features of the performance, and the one of which the natives think perhaps most, the display of food, would also have been quite different. The chief whom I saw sitting on a platform surrounded by a few wives only, and with small attendants would, under the old conditions, have been the owner of thrice as many wives and consequently relatives-in-law. And as it is these from whom he derives most of his income, he would have provided a much bigger sagali than he is able to do nowadays. Three generations ago the whole event would have been much more solemn and dramatic to the natives. The very distance to the neighboring island of Kideva is nowadays dwarfed. In the past, it would not, as now, be quickly obliterated by a white man's steam launch. Then, the canoes on the beach were the only means of arriving there, and their value in the eyes of the natives must have, therefore, been even higher, although they think so much of them now. The outlines of the distant island and the small fleet of canoes on the beach formed for the natives the first act of a big overseas expedition, an event of far deeper significance to them then than now. A rich haul of armed shells, the arrival of many much-coveted utilities, the bringing back of news from the far-off land, all this meant much more in older days than it can mean at present. War, dancing, and the Kula supplied tribal life with its romantic and heroic elements. Nowadays, with war prohibited by the government, with dancing discredited by missionary influence, the Kula alone remains, and even that is stripped of some of its glamour. 2. Before we proceed to the next stage, we must pause in following the events of a Kula expedition, and consider one or two points of more general importance. I have touched in the narrative, but not dwelt upon, certain problems of the sociology of work. At the outset of the preceding chapter it was mentioned that canoe building requires a definite organization of work, and in fact we saw that in the course of construction, various kinds of labor were employed, and more especially towards the end. Much use was made of communal labor. Again, we saw that during the launching ceremony payment was given by the owner to the expert and his helpers. These two points therefore, the organization of labor and communal labor in particular, and the system of payment for experts' work must be here developed. Organization of Labor First of all, it is important to realize that a Kirawinian is capable of working well, efficiently, and in a continuous manner. But he must work under an effective incentive, he must be prompted by some duty imposed by tribal standards, or he must be lured by ambitions and values also dictated by custom and tradition. Gain such as is often the stimulus for work in more civilized communities, never acts as an impulse to work under the original native conditions. It succeeds very badly, therefore, when a white man tries to use this incentive to make a native work. This is the reason why the traditional view of the lazy and indolent native is not only a constant refrain of the average white settler, but finds its way into good books of travel, and even serious ethnographic records. With us, labor is, or was till fairly recently, a commodity sold as any other, in the open market. A man accustomed to think in terms of current economic theory will naturally apply the conceptions of supply and demand to labor, and he applies them therefore to native labor. The untrained person does the same, though in less sophisticated terms, and as they see that the native will not work well for the white man, even if tempted by considerable payment and treated fairly well. They conclude that his capacity for labor is very small. This error is due to the same cause which lies at the bottom of all our misconceptions about people of different cultures. If you remove a man from his social milieu, you eo ipso deprive him of almost all his stimuli to moral steadfastness and economic efficiency and even of interest in life. 
If then you measure him by moral, legal or economic standards, also essentially foreign to him, you cannot but obtain a caricature in your estimate. But the natives are not only capable of energetic, continuous and skillful work. Their social conditions also make it possible for them to employ organized labor. At the beginning of, the sociology of canoe building was given in outline, and now, after the details of its successive stages have been filled in, it is possible to confirm what has been said there. And draw some conclusions as to this organization of labor. And first, as we are using this expression so often, I must insist again on the fact that the natives are capable of it, and that this contention is not a truism, as the following considerations should show. The just-mentioned view of the lazy, individualistic and selfish savage, who lives on the bounties of nature as they fall ripe and ready for him, implicitly precludes the possibility of his doing effective work. Integrated into an organized effort by social forces. Again, the view, almost universally accepted by specialists, is that the lowest savages are in the pre-economic stage of individualistic search for food, whereas the more developed ones, such as the Trobrianders, for instance, live at the stage of isolated household economy. This view also ignores, when it does not deny explicitly, the possibility of socially organized labor. The view generally held is that, in native communities each individual works for himself, or members of a household work so as to provide each family with the necessities of life. Of course, a canoe, even a masawa, could obviously be made by the members of a household, though with less efficiency and in a longer time. So that there is a priori nothing to foretell whether organized labor, or the unaided efforts of an individual or a small group of people should be used in the work. As a matter of fact, we have seen in canoe building a number of men engaged in performing each a definite and difficult task, though united to one purpose. The tasks were differentiated in their sociological setting. Some of the workers were actually to own the canoe, others belonged to a different community, and did it only as an act of service to the chief. Some worked in order to derive direct benefit from the use of the canoe, others were to be paid. We saw also that the work of felling, of scooping, of decorating, would in some cases be performed by various men, or it might be performed by one only. Certainly the minute tasks of lashing, caulking and painting, as well as sailmaking, were done by communal labor as opposed to individual. And all these different tasks were directed towards one aim, the providing the chief or headman with the title of ownership of a canoe, and his whole community with its use. It is clear that this differentiation of tasks, coordinated to a general purpose, requires a well-developed social apparatus to back it up, and that on the other hand, this social mechanism must be associated and permeated with economic elements. There must be a chief, regarded as representative of a group, he must have certain formal rights and privileges, and a certain amount of authority, and also he must dispose of part of the wealth of the community. There must also be a man or men with knowledge sufficient to direct and coordinate the technical operations. All this is obvious. But it must be clearly set forth that the real force which binds all the people and ties them down in their tasks is obedience to custom, to tradition. Every man knows what is expected from him, in virtue of his position, and he does it, whether it means the obtaining of a privilege, the performance of a task, or the acquiescence in a status quo. He knows that it always has been thus, and thus it is all around him, and thus it always must remain. The chief's authority, his privileges, the customary give and take which exist between him and the community, all that is merely, so to speak, the mechanism through which the force of tradition acts. For there is no organized physical means by which those in authority could enforce their will in a case like this. Order is kept by direct force of everybody's adhesion to custom, rules and laws, by the same psychological influences which in our society prevent a man of the world doing something which is not the right thing. The expression, might is right, would certainly not apply to Trobrian society. Tradition is right, and what is right has might, this rather is the rule governing the social forces in Boyawa, and I dare say in almost all native communities at this stage of culture. All the details of custom, all the magical formulae, the whole fringe of ceremonial and rite which accompany canoe building, all these things add weight to the social scheme of duties. 
The importance of magical ideas and rites as integrating forces has been indicated at the outset of this description. It is easy to see how all the appurtenances of ceremony, that is, magic, decoration, and public attendance welded together into one whole with labor, serve to put order and organization into it. Another point must be enlarged upon somewhat more. I have spoken of organized labor, and of communal labor. These two conceptions are not synonymous, and it is well to keep them apart. As already defined, organized labor implies the cooperation of several socially and economically different elements. It is quite another thing, however, when a number of people are engaged side by side, performing the same work, without any technical division of labor, or social differentiation of function. Thus, the whole enterprise of canoe building is, in Kirawina, the result of organized labor. But the work of some twenty to thirty men, who side by side do the lashing or caulking of the canoe, is communal labor. This latter form of work has a great psychological advantage. It is much more stimulating and more interesting, and it allows of emulation, and therefore of a better quality of work. For one or two men, it would require about a month to do the work which twenty to thirty men can do in a day. In certain cases, as in the pulling of the heavy log from the jungle to the village, the joining of forces is almost indispensable. True, the canoe could be scooped out in the ravewag, and then a few men might be able to pull it along, applying some skill. But it would entail great hardships. Thus, in some cases, communal labor is of extreme importance, and in all cases it furthers the course of work considerably. Sociologically, it is important, because it implies mutual help, exchange of services, and solidarity in work within a wide range. Communal labor is an important factor in the tribal economy of the Trobriand natives. They resort to it in the building of living huts and storehouses, in certain forms of industrial work, and in the transport of things, especially at harvest time, when great quantities of produce have to be shifted from one village to another. Often over a great distance. In fishing, when several canoes go out together and fish each for itself, then we cannot speak of communal labor. When on the other hand, they fish in one band, each canoe having an appointed task, as is sometimes done, then we have to do with organized labor. Communal labor is also based upon the duties of Urigubu, or relatives-in-law. That is, a man's relatives-in-law have to assist him, whenever he needs their cooperation. In the case of a chief, there is an assistance on a grand scale, and whole villages will turn out. In the case of a commoner, only a few people will help. There is always a distribution of food after the work has been done, but this can hardly be considered as payment, for it is not proportional to the work each individual does. By far the most important part communal labor has to play, is in gardening. There are as many as five different forms of communal labor in the gardens, each called by a different name, and each distinct in its sociological nature. When a chief or headman summons the members of a village community, and they agree to do their gardens communally, it is called tamgagula. When this is decided upon, and the time grows near for cutting the scrub for new gardens, a festive eating is held on the central place, and there all men go, and to Keva, cut down, the scrub on the chief's plot. After that, they cut in turn the garden plots of everyone, all men working on the one plot during a day, and getting on that day food from the owner. This procedure is reproduced at each successive stage of gardening. At the fencing, planting of yams, bringing in supports, and finally, at the weeding, which is done by women. At certain stages, the gardening is often done by each one working for himself, namely at the clearing of the gardens after they are burnt, at the cleaning of the roots of yams when they begin to produce tubers, and at harvesting. There are, as a rule, several communal feasts during the progress, and one at the end of a Tamgagula period. Gardens are generally worked in this fashion, in years when big ceremonial dancing or some other tribal festivity is held. This usually makes the work very late, and it has then to be done quickly and energetically, and communal labor has evidently been found suitable for this purpose. When several villages agree to work their gardens by communal labor, this is called lobolobiza. 
the two forms do not differ very much except by name, and also by the fact that, in the latter form, more than one chief or headman has to direct the process. The Lubula Biza would only be held when there are several small villages, clustered together, as is the case in the village compounds of Sinekita, Cavateria, Kabwaku, or Yalaka. When a chief or headman, or man of wealth and influence summons his dependents or his relatives-in-law to work for him, the name Kabutu is given to the proceedings. The owner has to give food to all those cooperating. A Kabutu may be instituted for one bit of gardening, for example, a headman may invite his villagers to do his cutting for him, or his planting or his fencing. It is clear that whenever communal labor is required by one man in the construction of his house or yam store, the labor is of the kabuta type, and it is thus called by the natives. The fourth form of communal labor is called taula, and takes place whenever a number of villagers agree to do one stage of gardening in common, on the basis of reciprocity. No great or special payments take place. The same sort of communal labor extending over all stages of gardening, is called cariula, and it may be counted as the fifth form of communal labor in the gardens. Finally, a special word, tavali, is used when they wish to say that the gardens are done by individual labor, and that everyone works on his own plot. It is a rule, however, that the chief's plots, especially those of an influential chief of high rank, are always gardened by communal labor, and this latter is also used with regard to certain privileged plots, on which, in a given year, the garden magic is performed first, and with the greatest display. Thus there is a number of distinct forms of communal labor, and they show many more interesting features which cannot be mentioned in this short outline. The communal labor used in canoe building is obviously of the kabuta type. In having a canoe made, the chief is able to summon big numbers of the inhabitants of a whole district, the headman of an important village receives the assistance of his whole community, whereas a man of small importance, such as one of the smaller headmen of Sinekita or Vakuta, would have to rely on his fellow villagers and relations-in-law. In all these cases, it would be the call of duty, laid down by custom, which would make them work. The payment would be of secondary importance, though in certain circumstances, it would be a considerable one. The distribution of food during launching forms such a payment, as we have seen in Division 1 of this chapter. In olden days, a meal of pigs, an abundance of betel nut and coconut and sugar cane would have made a veritable feast for the natives. Another point of importance from the economic aspect is the payment given by the chief to the builder of the canoe. The canoe of Omurakana was made, as we saw, for Tuolua by a specialist from Kideva, who was well paid with a quantity of food, pigs and vagwa, native valuables. Nowadays, when the power of the chiefs is broken, when they have much less wealth than formerly to back up their position, and cannot use even the little force they ever did and when the general breaking up of custom has undermined the traditional deference and loyalty of their subjects. The production of canoes and other forms of wealth by the specialist for the chief is only a vestige of what it once was. In olden days it was, economically, one of the most important features of the Trobrian tribal life. In the construction of the canoe, which a chief in olden days would never build himself, we meet with an example of this. Here it will be enough to say that whenever a canoe is built for a chief or headman by a builder, this has to be paid for by an initial gift of food. Then, as long as the man is at work, provisional gifts of food are given him. If he lives away from home, like the Katavan builder on the beach of Omurkana, he is fed by the Talawaga and supplied with dainties such as coconut, betel nut, pig's flesh, fish and fruits. When he works in his own home, the Talawaga will bring him choice food at frequent intervals, inspecting, as he does so, the progress of the work. This feeding of the worker or bringing him extra choice food is called the capula. After the canoe is finished, a substantial gift is given to the master builder during the ceremonial distribution of food. The proper amount would be a few hundred basketfuls of yams, a pig or two, bunches of betel nut, and a great number of coconuts, also, a large stone blade or a pig, or a belt of red shell discs, and some smaller vagua of the non-kula type. In Vakuta, where chieftainship is not very distinct, and the difference in wealth less great, 
Atalawaga also has to feed the workers during the time of hollowing out, preparing, and building a canoe. Then, after the caulking, some fifty basketfuls are given to the builder. After the launching and trial run, this builder gives a rope, symbol of the canoe, to his wife, who, blowing the conch shell, presents the rope to the Talawaga. He, on the spot, gives her a bunch of beetle or bananas. Next day, a considerable present of food, known as Yamalu, is given by the chief, and then at the next harvest, another fifty or sixty basketfuls of yams as karabudaboda or closing up gift. I have chosen the data from two concrete cases, one noted in Kiriwina, the other in Vakuta, that is, in the district where the chief's power is greatest. And in that where there never has been more than a rudimentary distance in rank and wealth between chief and commoner. In both cases there is a payment, but in Kiriwina the payment is greater. In Vakuta, it is obviously rather an exchange of services, whereas in Kiriwina the chief maintains, as well as rewards his builder. In both cases we have the exchange of skilled services against maintenance by supply of food. 3. We shall pass now to the next ceremonial and customary performance in the succession of Kula events, to the display of a new canoe to the friends and relatives of the Talawaga. This custom is called Kabajidoya. The Tassasoria, launching and trial run, is obviously at the same time the last act of shipbuilding, and by its associated magical rite, by the foretaste of sailing, it is also one of the beginning stages of the Kula. The Kabajidoya being a presentation of the new canoe, belongs to the series of building ceremonials, but in so far as it is a provisioning trip, it belongs to the Kula. The canoe is manned with the usual crew, it is rigged and fitted out with all its paraphernalia, such as paddles, baler, and conch shell, and it sets out on a short trip to the beaches of the neighboring villages. When the canoe belongs to a compound settlement like Sinekita, then it will stop at every beach of the sister villages. The conch shell is blown, and people in the village will know, the Kabajidoya men have arrived. The crew remains in the canoe, the Talawaga goes ashore, taking one paddle with him. He goes to the house of his fellow headman, and thrusts the paddle into the frame of the house, with the words, I offer thee thy bisala, panned in a streamer. Take a vagua, valuable, catch a pig and break the head of my new canoe. To which the local headman will answer, giving a present, this is the katavisala dabala, the breaking of the head, of thy new canoe. This is an example of the quaint, customary wording used in the exchange of gifts, and in other ceremonial transactions. The bisala, Pandana streamer, is often used as a symbol for the canoe, in magical spells, in customary expressions, and in idiomatic terms of speech. Bleached Pandana streamers are tied to the mast, rigging, and sail. A specially medicated strip is often attached to the prow of the canoe to give it speed, and there is also other Bissala magic to make a district partner inclined for Kula. The gifts given are not always up to the standard of those mentioned in the above customary phrase. The cabbage adoya, especially from the neighboring villages, often brings only a few mats, a few dozen coconuts, some betel nut, a couple of paddles, and such articles of minor value. And even in these trifles there is not much gain from the short cabbage adoya. For as we know, at the beginning of the Kula all the canoes of, say, Sinekita or Kiriwina are either rebuilt or renewed. What therefore one canoe receives on its cabbage adoya round, from all the others, will have to be more or less returned to them, when they in their turn cabajadoya one after the other. Soon afterwards, however, on an appointed day, all the canoes sail together on a visit to the other districts, and on this cabajadoya, they receive as a rule much more substantial presents, and these they will only have to return much later. After a year or two, when the visited district will come back to them on their own cabajadoya. Thus, when the canoes of Kirwina are built and renovated for a big Kula expedition, they will sail south along the coast, and stop first in Alavalivi, receiving presents from the chief there, and walking on a round of the inland villages of Luba. Then they will proceed to the next sea village, that of Wawela, leaving their canoes there, and going from there across to Sinekita. Thence they proceed still further south, to Vakuta. The villages on the lagoon, such as Sinekita and Vakuta, will return these visits, 
sailing north along the western shore on the lagoon side. Then they stop at Tequaqua or Cavateria, and from there walk inland to Kiriwina, where they receive presents, see, page 50. The Cabajadoya trips of the Vakutans and Sinakitans are more important than those of the northern or eastern districts, because they are combined with a preliminary trade, in which the visitors replenish their stock of goods. Which they will need presently on their trip south to Dobu. The reader will remember that Kuboma is the industrial district of the Trobrians, where are manufactured most of the useful articles, for which these islands are renowned in the whole of eastern New Guinea. It lies in the northern half of the island, and from Kiriwina it is only a few miles walk, but to reach it from Sinakita or Vakuta it is necessary to sail north. The southern villages therefore go to Cavateria, and from there walk inland to Boitalu, Luya, Yalaka and Katakwekala, where they make their purchases. The inhabitants of these villages also when they hear that the Sinakitans are anchored in Cavateria, bring their wares to the canoes. A brisk trade is carried on during the day or two that the Sinakitans remain in Cavateria. The natives of Kuboma are always eager to buy yams, as they live in an unfertile district, and devote themselves more to industrial productions than to gardening. And they are still more eager to acquire coconuts and betel nut, of which they have a great scarcity. They desire besides to receive in exchange for their produce the red shell discs manufactured in Sinakita and Bakuta, and the turtle shell rings. For objects of great value, the Sinakitans would give the big clay pots which they receive directly from the amphlets. For that they obtain different articles according to the villages with which they are exchanging. From Boitalu, they get the wonderfully fashioned and decorated wooden dishes of various sizes, depths and finish, made out of either hard or soft wood, from Boitalu, Wabutuma and Buduelaka, armlets of plated fern fiber, and wooden combs. From Buduelaka, Yalaka, and Katakwekala, lime pots of different qualities and sizes. From the villages of Tilatala, the district northeast of Kuboma, the polished axe blades used to be acquired in olden days. I shall not enter into the technicalities of this exchange, nor shall I give here the approximate list of prices which obtain. We shall have to follow the traded goods further on to Dobu, and there we shall see how they change hands again, and under what conditions. This will allow us to compare the prices and thus to gauge the nature of the transaction as a whole. It will be better therefore to defer all details till then. 4. Here, however, it seems necessary to make another digression from the straight narrative of the Kula, and give an outline of the various forms of trade and exchange as we find them in the Trobrians. Indeed, the main theme of this volume is the Kula, a form of exchange, and I would be untrue to my chief principle of method, were I to give the description of one form of exchange torn out of its most intimate context. That is, were I to give an account of the Kula without giving at least a general outline of the forms of Kirawinian payments and gifts and barter. In, speaking of some features of Trobrian tribal life, I was led to criticize the current views of primitive economic man. They depict him as a being indolent, independent, happy-go-lucky, yet at the same time governed exclusively by strictly rational and utilitarian motives, and logical and consistent in his behavior. In this chapter again, in, I pointed out another fallacy implied in this conception, a fallacy which declares that a savage is capable only of very simple, unorganized and unsystematic forms of labor. Another error more or less explicitly expressed in all writings on primitive economics, is that the natives possess only rudimentary forms of trade and exchange. That these forms play no essential part in the tribal life, are carried on only spasmodically and at rare intervals, and as necessity dictates. Whether we have to deal with the widespread fallacy of the primitive golden age, characterized mainly by the absence of any distinction between mine and thine. Or whether we take the more sophisticated view, which postulates stages of individual search for food, and of isolated household catering. Or if we consider for the moment the numerous theories which see nothing in primitive economics but simple pursuits for the maintenance of existence, in none of these can we find reflected even a hint of the real state of affairs as found in the Trobrians. Namely, that the whole tribal life is permeated by a constant give and take, that every ceremony, every legal and customary act is done to the accompaniment of material gift and counter-gift. 
That wealth, given and taken, is one of the main instruments of social organization, of the power of the chief, of the bonds of kinship, and of relationship in law. These views on primitive trade, prevalent though erroneous, appear no doubt quite consistent, that is, if we grant certain premises. Now these premises seem plausible, and yet they are false, and it will be good to have a careful look at them so that we can discard them once and for all. They are based on some sort of reasoning, such as the following one, if, in tropical conditions, there is a plenty of all utilities, why trouble about exchanging them? Then, why attach any value to them? Is there any reason for striving after wealth, where everyone can have as much as he wants without much effort? Is there indeed any room for value, if this latter is the result of scarcity as well as utility, in a community, in which all the useful things are plentiful? On the other hand, in those savage communities where the necessities of life are scarce, there is obviously no possibility of accumulating them, and thus creating wealth. Plate. Exiv. Display of pigs and yams at a distribution, Sagali. All food to be given away is several times displayed before, during, and after the ceremony. Exhibiting of food in large, prismatic receptacles, Pwadaai, is one of the typical features of Trobrian custom. C. Plate. XXXV. Communal cooking of Mona, taro dumplings. Large clay pots, imported from the amphlets, are used for the purpose. In these, coconut oil is brought to a boil, pieces of pounded taro being thrown in afterwards, while a man stirs the contents with a long, decorated, wooden ladle. Plate. XXXVI. Seen in the Wasi, ceremonial exchange of vegetables for fish. The inland party have brought their yams by boat to the village of Aburaku, which is practically inaccessible by land. They are putting up the vegetables into square, wooden crates in order to carry them ceremonially and to place each before the partner's house. Plate. XVI. Vava, direct barter of vegetables for fish. In the picture, the inland natives exchange bundles of taro directly for fish, without observing the rites and ceremonies obligatory in Awasi. C. Again, since, in savage communities, whether bountifully or badly provided for by nature, everyone has the same free access to all the necessities, is there any need to exchange them? Why give a basket full of fruit or vegetables, if everybody has practically the same quantity and the same means of procuring it? Why make a present of it, if it cannot be returned except in the same form? There are two main sources of error at the bottom of this faulty reasoning. The first is that the relation of the savage to material goods is a purely rational one, and that consequently, in his conditions, there is no room for wealth or value. The second erroneous assumption is that there can be no need for exchange if anyone and everyone can, by industry and skill, produce all that represents value through its quantity or its quality. As regards the first proposition, it is not true either with regard to what may be called primary wealth, that is, foodstuffs, nor with regard to articles of luxury, which are by no means absent in Trobrian society. First as to foodstuffs, they are not merely regarded by the natives as nourishment, not merely valued because of their utility. They accumulate them not so much because they know that yams can be stored and used for a future date, but also because they like to display their possessions in food. Their yam houses are built so that the quantity of the food can be gauged, and its quality ascertained through the wide interstices between the beams, sea plates end. The yams are so arranged that the best specimens come to the outside and are well visible. Special varieties of yams, which grow up to two meters length, and weigh as much as several kilograms each, are framed in wood and decorated with paint, and hung on the outside of the yam houses. That the right to display food is highly valued can be seen from the fact that in villages where a chief of high rank resides, the commoner's storehouses have to be closed up with coconut leaves so as not to compete with his. All this shows that the accumulation of food is not only the result of economic foresight, but also prompted by the desire of display and enhancement of social prestige through possession of wealth. When I speak about ideas underlying accumulation of foodstuffs in the Trobrians, I refer to the present, actual psychology of the natives. 
and I must emphatically declare that I am not offering here any conjectures about the origins or about the history of the customs and their psychology, leaving this to theoretical and comparative research. Another institution which illuminates the native ideas about food storage is the magic called Villamalia, performed over the crops after harvest, and at one or two other stages. This magic is intended to make the food last long. Before the storehouse is filled with yams, the magician places a special kind of heavy stone on the floor, and recites a long magical spell. On the evening of the same day, after the food houses have been filled, he spits over them with medicated ginger root, and he also performs a rite over all the roads entering into the village, and over the central place. All this will make food plentiful in that village, and will make the supplies last long. But, and this is the important point for us, this magic is conceived to act, not on the food, but on the inhabitants of the village. It makes their appetites poor, it makes them, as the natives put it, inclined to eat wild fruit of the bush, the mango and bread fruit of the village grove, and refuse to eat yams, or at least be satisfied with very little. They will boast that when this magic is performed well, half of the yams will rot away in the storehouses, and be thrown on the wawa, the rubbish heap at the back of the houses, to make room for the new harvest. Here again we meet the typical idea that the main aim of accumulating food is to keep it exhibited in the yam houses till it rots, and then can be replaced by a new eatilage. The filling of the storehouses involves a double display of food, and a good deal of ceremonial handling. When the tubers are taken out of the ground they are first displayed in the gardens. A shed of poles is erected, and covered with tight a vine, which is thrown thickly over it. In such arbors, a circle is pegged out on the ground, and within this the taitu, the ordinary small yams of the trobriens which form the staple harvest, are carefully piled up into a conical heap. A great deal of care is lavished on this task, the biggest are selected, scrupulously cleaned, and put on the outside of the heap. After a fortnight or more of keeping the yams in the garden, where they are much admired by visiting parties, the owner of the garden plot summons a party of friends or relatives-in-law, and these transport them into a village. As we know already, from, such yams will be offered to the owner's sister's husband. It is to his village that they are brought, where again they are displayed in conical heaps, placed before his yam house. Only after they have thus remained for several days, sometimes up to a fortnight, are they put into the storehouse, see. Indeed, it would be enough for anyone to see how the natives handle the yams, how they admire big tubers, how they pick out freaks and sports and exhibit them, to realize that there is a deep, socially standardized sentiment centering round this staple product of their gardens. In many phases of their ceremonial life, big displays of food form the central feature. Extensive mortuary distributions called sagali, are, in one of their aspects, enormous exhibitions of food, connected with their reapportionment, c. At harvest of the early yams, kuvi, there is an offering of first fruits to the memory of the recently dead. At the later, main harvest of taitu, small yams, the first tubers are dug out ceremonially brought into the village and admired by the whole community. Food contests between two villages at harvest, in olden days often followed by actual fighting, are also one of the characteristic features which throw light on the natives' attitude towards edible wealth. In fact, one could almost speak of a cult of food among these natives, in so far as food is the central object of most of their public ceremonies. In the preparation of food, it must be noted that many taboos are associated with cooking, and especially with the cooking pots. The wooden dishes on which the natives serve their food are called kaboma, which means tabooed wood. The act of eating is as a rule strictly individual. People eat within their family circles, and even when there is public ceremonial cooking of the taro pudding, mona, in the big clay pots, especially tabooed for this purpose, see, they do not eat in one body, but in small groups. A clay pot is carried into the different parts of the village, and men from that part squat round it and eat, followed afterwards by the women. Sometimes again the pudding is taken out, placed on wooden dishes, and eaten within the family. I cannot enter here into the many details of what could be called the social psychology of eating, but it is important to note that the center of gravity of the feast lies, not in the eating. 
but in the display and ceremonial preparation of the food, c. When a pig is to be killed, which is a great culinary and festive event, it will be first carried about, and shown perhaps in one or two villages. Then roasted alive, the whole village and neighbors enjoying the spectacle and the squeals of the animal. It is then ceremonially, and with a definite ritual, cut into pieces and distributed. But the eating of it is a casual affair. It will take place either within a hut, or else people will just cook a piece of flesh and eat it on the road, or walking about in the village. The relics of a feast such as pig's jaws and fish tails, however, are often collected and displayed in houses or yam stores. The quantity of food eaten, whether in prospect or retrospect, is what matters most. We shall eat, and eat till we vomit, is a stock phrase, often heard at feasts, intended to express enjoyment of the occasion, a close parallel to the pleasure felt at the idea of stores rotting away in the yam house. All this shows that the social act of eating and the associated conviviality are not present in the minds or customs of the Trobrianders, and what is socially enjoyed is the common admiration of fine and plentiful food. And the knowledge of its abundance. Naturally, like all animals, human or otherwise, civilized or savage, the Trobrianders enjoy their eating as one of the chief pleasures of life, but this remains an individual act. And neither its performance nor the sentiments attached to it have been socialized. It is this indirect sentiment, rooted of course in reality in the pleasures of eating, which makes for the value of food in the eyes of the natives. This value again makes accumulated food a symbol, and a vehicle of power. Hence the need for storing and displaying it. Value is not the result of utility and rarity, intellectually compounded, but is the result of a sentiment grown round things, which, through satisfying human needs, are capable of evoking emotions. The value of manufactured objects of use must also be explained through man's emotional nature, and not by reference to his logical construction of utilitarian views. Here, however, I think that the explanation must take into account, not so much the user of these objects, as the workman who produces them. These natives are industrious, and keen workers. They do not work under the spur of necessity, or to gain their living, but on the impulse of talent and fancy, with a high sense and enjoyment of their art, which they often conceive as the result of magical inspiration. This refers especially to those who produce objects of high value, and who are always good craftsmen and are fond of their workmanship. Now these native artists have a keen appreciation of good material, and of perfection in craft. When they find a specially good piece of material it lures them on to lavish on it an excess of labor, and to produce things too good to be used, but only so much the more desirable for possession. The careful manner of working, the perfection of craftsmanship, the discrimination in material, the inexhaustible patience in giving the final touches, have been often noted by those who have seen natives at work. These observations have also come under the notice of some theoretical economists, but it is necessary to see these facts in their bearing upon the theory of value. That is, namely, that this loving attitude towards material and work must produce a sentiment of attachment to rare materials and well-worked objects, and that this must result in their being valued. Value will be attached to rare forms of such materials as the craftsman generally uses, classes of shell which are scarce, lending themselves especially to fashioning and polishing, kinds of wood which are also rare, like ebony. And more particularly, special varieties of that stone out of which implements are made. We can now compare our results with the fallacious views on primitive economic man, sketched out at the beginning of this division. We see that value and wealth exist, in spite of abundance of things, that indeed this abundance is valued for its own sake. Great quantities are produced beyond any possible utility they could possess, out of mere love of accumulation for its own sake. Food is allowed to rot, and though they have all they could desire in necessities, yet the natives want always more, to serve in its character of wealth. Again, in manufactured objects, and more especially in objects of the Vegue type, comp. It is not rarity within utility which creates value, but a rarity sought out by human skill within the workable materials. In other words, not those things are valued, which being useful or even indispensable are hard to get, 
since all the necessities of life are within easy reach of the Trobriand Islander. But such an article is valued where the workman, having found specially fine or sportive material, has been induced to spend a disproportionate amount of labor on it. By doing so, he creates an object which is a kind of economic monstrosity, too good, too big, too frail, or too overcharged with ornament to be used, yet just because of that, highly valued. V. Thus the first assumption is exploded, that there is no room for wealth or value in native societies. What about the other assumption, namely, that there is no need to exchange if anyone can by industry and skill, produce all that represents value through its quantity or its quality? This assumption is confuted by realizing a fundamental fact of native usage and psychology, the love of give and take for its own sake, the active enjoyment in possession of wealth, through handing it over. In studying any sociological questions in the Trobriands, in describing the ceremonial side of tribal life, or religion and magic, we constantly meet with this give and take, with exchange of gifts and payments. I had occasion several times to mention this general feature, and in the short outline of the Trobriand sociology in, I gave some examples of it. Even a walk across the island, such as we imagined in that chapter, would reveal to an open-eyed ethnographer this economic truth. He would see visiting parties, women carrying big food baskets on their head, men with loads on their shoulders, and on inquiring he would learn that these were gifts to be presented under one of the many names they bear. In fulfillment of some social obligation. Offerings of first fruits are given to the chief or to relatives-in-law, when the mango or breadfruit or sugar cane are ripe. Big quantities of sugar cane being borne to a chief, carried by some twenty to thirty men running along the road, produced the impressions of a tropical burnham wood moving through the jungle. At harvest time all the roads are full of big parties of men carrying food, or returning with empty baskets. From the far north of Kiriwina a party will have to run for some twelve miles to the creek of Tukwakwa, get into canoes, punt for miles along the shallow lagoon, and have another good walk inland from Sinekita. And all this is in order to fill the yam house of a man who could do it quite well for himself, if it were not that he is under obligation to give all the harvest to his sister's husband. Displays of gifts associated with marriage, with sagali, food distributions, with payments for magic, all these are some of the most picturesque characteristics of the Trobriand garden, road and village. And must impress themselves upon even a superficial observer. The second fallacy, that man keeps all he needs and never spontaneously gives it away, must therefore be completely discarded. Not that the natives do not possess a strongly retentive tendency. To imagine that they differ from other human beings in this, would be to fall out of one fallacy into the opposite one also already mentioned, namely that there is a sort of primitive communism among the natives. On the contrary, just because they think so much of giving, the distinction between mine and thine is not obliterated but enhanced. For the presents are by no means given haphazardly, but practically always in fulfillment of definite obligations, and with a great deal of formal punctilio. The very fundamental motive of giving, the vanity of a display of possession and power, eliminate rules out any assumption of communistic tendencies or institutions. Not in all cases, but in many of them, the handing over of wealth is the expression of the superiority of the giver over the recipient. In others, it represents subordination to a chief, or a kinship relation or relationship in law. And it is important to realize that in almost all forms of exchange in the Trobriands, there is not even a trace of gain, nor is there any reason for looking at it from the purely utilitarian and economic standpoint. Since there is no enhancement of mutual utility through the exchange. Thus, it is quite a usual thing in the Trobriands for a type of transaction to take place in which A gives twenty baskets of yams to B, receiving for it a small polished blade, only to have the whole transaction reversed in a few weeks' time. Again, at a certain stage of mortuary ritual, a present of valuables is given, and on the same day later on, the identical articles are returned to the giver. Cases like that described in the Kabajadoya custom, where each owner of a new canoe made a round of all the others, each thus giving away again what he receives, are typical. In the Wasi, exchange of fish for yams, to be described presently, 
through a practically useless gift, a burdensome obligation is imposed, and one might speak of an increase of burdens rather than an increase of utilities. The view that the native can live in a state of individual search for food, or catering for his own household only, in isolation from any interchange of goods, implies a calculating, cold egotism. The possibility of enjoyment by man of utilities for their sake. This view, and all the previously criticized assumptions, ignore the fundamental human impulse to display, to share, to bestow. They ignore the deep tendency to create social ties through exchange of gifts. Apart from any consideration as to whether the gifts are necessary or even useful, giving for the sake of giving is one of the most important features of Trobrian sociology, and, from its very general and fundamental nature. I submit that it is a universal feature of all primitive societies. I have dwelt at length on economic facts which on the surface are not directly connected with the Kula. But if we realize that in these facts we may be able to read the natives' attitude towards wealth and value, their importance for the main theme becomes obvious. The Kula is the highest and the most dramatic expression of the natives' conception of value, and if we want to understand all the customs and actions of the Kula in their real bearings we must, first and foremost, grasp the psychology that lies at its basis. 6. I have on purpose spoken of forms of exchange, of gifts and counter-gifts, rather than of barter or trade, because, although there exist forms of barter pure and simple, there are so many transitions and gradations between that and simple gift, that it is impossible to draw any fixed line between trade on the one hand, and exchange of gifts on the other. Indeed, the drawing of any lines to suit our own terminology and our own distinctions is contrary to sound method. In order to deal with these facts correctly it is necessary to give a complete survey of all forms of payment or present. In this survey there will be at one end the extreme case of pure gift, that is an offering for which nothing is given in return. Then, through many customary forms of gift or payment, partially or conditionally returned, which shade into each other, there come forms of exchange, where more or less strict equivalence is observed, arriving finally at real barter. In the following survey I shall roughly classify each transaction according to the principle of its equivalence. Such tabularized accounts cannot give the same clear vision of facts as a concrete description might do, and they even produce the impression of artificiality, but, and this must be emphatically stated. I shall not introduce here artificial categories, foreign to the native mind. Nothing is so misleading in ethnographic accounts as the description of facts of native civilizations in terms of our own. This, however, shall not be done here. The principles of arrangement, although quite beyond the comprehension of the natives, are nevertheless contained in their social organization, customs, and even in their linguistic terminology. This latter always affords the simplest and surest means of approach towards the understanding of native distinctions and classifications. But it also must be remembered that, though important as a clue to native ideas, the knowledge of terminology is not a miraculous shortcut into the native's mind. As a matter of fact, there exist many salient and extremely important features of Trobrian sociology in social psychology, which are not covered by any term. Whereas their language distinguishes subdivisions and subtleties which are quite irrelevant with regard to actual conditions. Thus, a survey of terminology must always be supplemented by a direct analysis of ethnographic fact and inquiry into the natives' ideas, that is, by collecting a body of opinions, typical expressions and customary phrases by direct cross-questioning. The most conclusive and deepest insight, however, must always be obtained by a study of behavior, by analysis of ethnographic custom and concrete cases of traditional rules. List of gifts, payments, and commercial. Transactions. 1. Pure gifts. By this, as just mentioned, we understand an act, in which an individual gives an object or renders a service without expecting or getting any return. This is not a type of transaction very frequently met in Trobrian tribal life. It must be remembered that accidental or spontaneous gifts, such as alms or charities, do not exist, since everybody in need would be maintained by his or her family. Again, there are so many well-defined economic obligations, connected with kinship and relationship in law, 
that anyone wanting a thing or a service would know where to go and ask for it. And then, of course, it would not be a free gift, but one imposed by some social obligation. Moreover, since gifts in the Trobrians are conceived as definite acts with a social meaning, rather than transmissions of objects, it results that where social duties do not directly impose them, gifts are very rare. The most important type of free gift are the presence characteristic of relations between husband and wife, and parents and children. Among the Trobrianders, husband and wife own their things separately. There are man's and woman's possessions, and each of the two partners has a special part of the household goods under control. When one of them dies, his or her relations inherit the things. But though the possessions are not joint, they very often give presents to one another, more especially a husband to his wife. As to the parents' gifts to the children, it is clear that in a matrilineal society, where the mother is the nearest of kin to her children in a sense quite different to that in our society, they share in and inherit from her all her possessions. It is more remarkable that the father, who, according to native belief and law, is only the mother's husband, and not the kinsman of the children, is the only relation from whom free gifts are expected. The father will give freely of his valuables to a son, and he will transmit to him his relationships in the kula, according to the definite rules by which it is done, c. Also, one of the most valuable and valued possessions, the knowledge of magic, is handed over willingly, and free of any countergift, from father to son. The ownership of trees in the village grove and ownership in garden plots is ceded by the father to his son during the lifetime of the former. At his death, it often has to be returned to the man's rightful heirs, that is, his sister's children. All the objects of use embraced by the term gugwa will be shared with him as a matter of course by a man's children. Also, any special luxuries in food, or such things as betel nut or tobacco, he will share with his children as well as with his wife. In all such small articles of indulgence, free distribution will also obtain between the chief or the headman and his vassals, though not in such a generous spirit, as within the family. In fact, everyone who possesses betel nut or tobacco in excess of what he can actually consume on the spot, would be expected to give it away. This very special rule, which also happens to apply to such articles as are generally used by white men for trade, has largely contributed to the tenacity of the idea of the communistic native. In fact, many a man will carefully conceal any surplus so as to avoid the obligation of sharing it and yet escape the opprobrium attaching to meanness. There is no comprehensive name for this class of free gifts in native terminology. The verb, to give, seiki, would simply be used, and on inquiry as to whether there was repayment for such a gift, the natives would directly answer that this was a gift without repayment. Mapula being the general term for return gifts, and retributions, economic as well as otherwise. The natives undoubtedly would not think of free gifts as forming one class, as being all of the same nature. The acts of liberality on the part of the chief, the sharing of tobacco and betel nut by anybody who has some to spare, would be taken as a matter of course. Gifts by a husband to a wife are considered also as rooted in the nature of this relationship. They have as a matter of fact a very coarse and direct way of formulating that such gifts are the mapula, payment, for matrimonial relations, a conception in harmony with the ideas underlying another type of gift, of which I shall speak presently. That given in return for sexual intercourse. Economically the two are entirely different, since those of husband to wife are casual gifts within a permanent relationship, whereas the others are definite payment for favors given on special occasions. The most remarkable fact, however, is that the same explanation is given for the free gifts given by the father to his children. That is to say, a gift given by a father to his son is said to be a repayment for the man's relationship to the son's mother. According to the matrilineal set of ideas about kinship, mother and son are one, but the father is a stranger, tamakava, to his son, an expression often used when these matters are discussed. There is no doubt, however, that the state of affairs is much more complex, for there is a very strong direct emotional attitude between father and child. The father wants always to give things to his child, as I have said, compare, and this is very well realized by the natives themselves. As a matter of fact, 
the psychology underlying these conditions is this, normally a man is emotionally attached to his wife, and has a very strong personal affection towards his children, and expresses these feelings by gifts. And more especially by trying to endow his children with as much of his wealth and position as he can. This, however, runs counter to the matrilineal principle as well as to the general rule that all gifts require repayment, and so these gifts are explained away by the natives in a manner that agrees with these rules. The above crude explanation of the natives by reference to sex payment is a document, which in a very illuminating manner shows up the conflict between the matrilineal theory and the actual sentiments of the natives. And also how necessary it is to check the explicit statements of natives, and the views contained in their terms and phraseology by direct observation of full-blooded life, in which we see man not only laying down rules and theories, but behaving under the impulse of instinct and emotion. 2. Customary payments, repaid irregularly, and without strict equivalence. The most important of these are the annual payments received at harvest time by a man from his wife's brothers, cf. and. These regular and unfailing gifts are so substantial, that they form the bulk of a man's income in food. Sociologically, they are perhaps the strongest strand in the fabric of the Trobrian's tribal constitution. They entail a lifelong obligation of every man to work for his kinswomen and their families. When a boy begins to garden, he does it for his mother. When his sisters grow up and marry, he works for them. If he has neither mother nor sisters, his nearest female blood relation will claim the proceeds of his labor. The reciprocity in these gifts never amounts to their full value, but the recipient is supposed to give a valuable, vague or a pig to his wife's brother from time to time. Again if he summons his wife's kinsmen to do communal work for him, according to the Kabuta system, he pays them in food. In this case also the payments are not the full equivalent of the services rendered. Thus we see that the relationship between a man and his wife's kinsmen is full of mutual gifts and services, in which repayment, however, by the husband, is not equivalent and regular, but spasmodic and smaller in value than his own share. And even if for some reason or other it ever fails, this does not relieve the others from their obligations. In the case of a chief, the duties of his numerous relatives-in-law have to be much more stringently observed. That is, they have to give him much bigger harvest gifts, and they also have to keep pigs, and grow beetle and coconut palms for him. For all this, they are rewarded by correspondingly large presents of valuables, which again, however, do not fully repay them for their contributions. The tributes given by vassal village communities to a chief and usually repaid by small countergifts, also belong to this class. Besides these, there are the contributions given by one kinsman to another, when this latter has to carry out a mortuary distribution, sagali. Such contributions are sometimes, but irregularly and spasmodically, repaid by objects of small value. The natives do not embrace this class under one term, but the word urigibu, which designates harvest gifts from the wife's brothers, stands for one of the most important conceptions of native sociology and economics. They have quite a clear idea about the many characteristics of the Urigibu duties, which have been described here, and about their far-reaching importance. The occasional counter-gifts given by the husband to his wife's kinsmen are called Yulo. The chief's tributes which we have put in this category are called Pokala. The placing of these two types of payment in one category is justified both by the similar mechanism, and by the close resemblance between the Urigiba gifts, when given to a chief, and the pokala received by him. There are even resemblances in the actual ceremonial, which however, would require too much of a detailed description to be more than mentioned here. The word pokala is a general term for the chief's tributes, and there are several other expressions which cover gifts of first fruit, gifts at the main harvest, and some other subdivisions. There are also terms describing the various counter-gifts given by a chief to those who pay him tribute, according to whether they consist of pig's flesh or yams or fruit. I am not mentioning all these native words, in order not to overload the account with details, which would be irrelevant here. 3. Payment for services rendered. This class differs from the foregoing one in that here the payment is within limits defined by custom. It has to be given each time the service is performed, 
but we cannot speak here of direct economic equivalence, since one of the terms of the equation consists of a service, the value of which cannot be assessed, except by conventional estimates. All services done by specialists for individuals or for the community, belong here. The most important of these are undoubtedly the services of the magician. The garden magician, for instance, receives definite gifts from the community and from certain individuals. The sorcerer is paid by the man who asks him to kill or who desires to be healed. The presents given for magic of rain and fair weather are very considerable. I have already described the payments given to a canoe builder. I shall have to speak later on of those received by the specialists who make the various types of vegue. Here also belong the payments, always associated with love intrigues. Disinterested love is quite unknown among these people of great sexual laxity. Every time a girl favors her lover, some small gift has to be given immediately. This is the case in the normal intrigues, going on every night in the village between unmarried girls and boys, and also in more ceremonial cases of indulgence, like the Katayasi custom, or the mortuary consolations, mentioned in. A few areca nuts, some beetle pepper, a bit of tobacco, some turtle shell rings, or spondylus discs, such are the small tokens of gratitude and appreciation never omitted by the youth. An attractive girl need never go unprovided with the small luxuries of life. The big mortuary distributions of food, sagali, have already been mentioned several times. On their economic side, these distributions are payments for funerary services. The deceased man's nearest maternal kinsman has to give food gifts to all the villagers for their assuming mourning, that is to say, for blackening their faces and cutting their hair. He pays some other special people for wailing and grave digging. A still smaller group for cutting out the dead man's ulna and using it as a lime spoon, and the widow or widower for the prolonged and scrupulously to be observed period of strict mourning. All these details show how universal and strict is the idea that every social obligation or duty, though it may not on any account be evaded, has yet to be repaid by a ceremonial gift. The function of these ceremonial repayments is, on the surface of it, to thicken the social ties from which arise the obligations. The similarity of the gifts and payments which we have put into this category is expressed by the native use of the word mapula, repayment, equivalent, in connection with all these gifts. Thus in giving the reason why a certain present is made to a magician, or why a share is allotted to a man at the sagali, distribution, or why some valuable object is given to a specialist, they would say, this is the mapula for what he has done. Another interesting identification contained in linguistic usage is the calling of both magical payments and payments to specialists, restorative, or, literally, poultice. Certain extra fees given to a magician are described as cachoarina kekila or poultice for his leg, as the magician, especially he of the garden or the sorcerer, has to take long walks in connection with his magic. The expression, poultice of my back, will be used by a canoe builder who has been bending over his work, or poultice of my hand, by a carver or stone polisher. But the identity of these gifts is not in any way expressed in the detailed terminology. In fact, there is a list of words describing the various payments for magic, the gifts given to specialists, love payments, and the numerous types of gifts distinguished at the Sagali. Thus a magical payment, of which a small part would be offered to ancestral spirits, is called Ulula, a substantial magical gift is called Susala, a gift to a sorcerer is described by the verb Ibudipida, and there are many more special names. The gifts to the specialists are called Vulo, the initial gift, Yamalu, a gift of food given after the object has been ceremonially handed over to the owner. Karabuda Boda, a substantial gift of yams given at the next harvest. The gifts of food, made while the work is in progress are called vocapula, but this latter term has much wider application, as it covers all the presence of cooked or raw food given to workers by the man, for whom they work. The sexual gifts are called bawana or sebuana. I shall not enumerate the various terminological distinctions of Sagali gifts, as this would be impossible to do, without entering upon the enormous subject of mortuary duties and distributions. 
the classification of love gifts and sagali gifts in the same category with gifts to magicians and specialists, is a generalization in which the natives would not be able to follow us. For them, the gifts given at sagali form a class in themselves and so do the love gifts. We may say that, from the economic point of view, we were correct in classing all these gifts together, because they all represent a definite type of equivalence. Also they correspond to the native idea that every service has to be paid for, an idea documented by the linguistic use of the word mapula. But within this class, the subdivisions corresponding to native terminology represent important distinctions made by the natives between the three subclasses, love gifts, sagali gifts, and gifts for magical and professional services. 4. Gifts returned in economically equivalent form. We are enumerating the various types of exchange, as they gradually assume the appearance of trade. In this fourth class have been put such gifts as must be repaid with almost strict equivalence. But it must be stressed that strict equivalence of two gifts does not assimilate them to trade altogether. There can be no more perfect equivalence between gift and countergift, than when A gives to B an object, and B on the same day returns the very same object to A. At a certain stage of the mortuary proceedings, such a gift is given and received back again by a deceased man's kinsman and his widow's brothers. Yet it is obvious at once that no transaction could be further removed from trade. The above described gifts at the presentation of new canoes, cabajadoya, belong to this class. So do also numerous presents given to one community by another, on visits which are going to be returned soon. Payments for the lease of a garden plot are at least in certain districts of the Trobriens returned by a gift of equivalent value. Sociologically, this class of gifts is characteristic of the relationship between friends, Lubai. Thus the Kabajadoya takes place between friends, the Kula takes place between overseas partners and inland friends, but of course relations in law also belong par excellence to this category. Other types of equivalent gifts which have to be mentioned here shortly, are the presents given by one household to another, at the Milamala, the festive period associated with the return of the ancestral spirits to their villages. Offerings of cooked food are ceremonially exposed in houses for the use of the spirits, and after these have consumed the spiritual substance, the material one is given to a neighboring household. These gifts are always reciprocal. Again, a series of mutual gifts exchanged immediately after marriage between a man and his wife's father, not matrilineal kinsmen in this case, have to be put into this category. The economic similarity of these gifts is not expressed in terminology or even in linguistic use. All the gifts I have enumerated have their own special names, which I shall not adduce here, so as not to multiply irrelevant details of information. The natives have no comprehensive idea that such a class as I have spoken of exists. My generalization is based upon the very interesting fact, that all through the tribal life we find scattered cases of direct exchange of equivalent gifts. Nothing perhaps could show up so clearly, how much the natives value the give and take of presents for its own sake. 5. Exchange of material goods against privileges, titles and non-material possessions. Under this heading, I class transactions which approach trade, in so far as two owners, each possessing something they value highly, exchange it for something they value still more. The equivalence here is not so strict, at any rate not so measurable, as in the previous class, because in this one, one of the terms is usually a non-material possession, such as the knowledge of magic, the privilege to execute a dance. Or the title to a garden plot, which latter very often is a mere title only. But in spite of this smaller measure of equivalence, their character of trade is more marked, just because of the element of mutual desire to carry out the transaction and of the mutual advantage. Two important types of transaction belong to this class. One of them is the acquisition by a man of the goods or privileges which are due to him by inheritance from his maternal uncle or elder brother, but which he wishes to acquire before the elder's death. If a maternal uncle is to give up in his lifetime a garden, or to teach and hand over a system of magic, he has to be paid for that. As a rule several payments, and very substantial ones, have to be given to him, and he gradually relinquishes his rights, giving the garden land, bit by bit, teaching the magic in installments. 
After the final payment, the title of ownership is definitely handed over to the younger man. I have drawn attention already in the general description of the Trobriand sociology, to the remarkable contrast between matrilineal inheritance and that between father and son. It is noteworthy that what is considered by the natives rightful inheritance has yet to be paid for, and that a man who knows that in any case he would obtain a privilege sooner or later, if he wants it at once, must pay for it, and that heavily. Nonetheless, this transaction takes place only when it appears desirable to both parties. There is no customary obligation on either of the two to enter on the exchange, and it has to be considered advantageous to both before it can be completed. The acquisition of magic is of course different, because that must naturally always be taught by the elder man to the younger in his lifetime. The other type of transaction belonging to this class, is the payment for dances. Dances are owned. That is, the original inventor has the right of producing his dance and song in his village community. If another village takes a fancy to this song and dance, it has to purchase the right to perform it. This is done by handing ceremonially to the original village a substantial payment of food and valuables, after which the dance is taught to the new possessors. In some rare cases, the title to garden lands would pass from one community to another. For this again, the members and headmen of the acquiring community would have to pay substantially to those who hand over their rights. Another transaction which has to be mentioned here is the hire of a canoe, where a temporary transference of ownership takes place in return for a payment. The generalization by which this class has been formed, although it does not run counter to native terminology and ideas, is beyond their own grasp, and contains several of their subdivisions, differentiated by distinct native terms. The name for the ceremonial purchase of a task or for the transfer of a garden plot is laga. This term denotes a very big and important transaction. For example, when a small pig is purchased by food or minor objects of value, they call this barter, gimwali, but when a more valuable pig is exchanged for vegue, they call it laga. The important conception of gradual acquisition in advance of matrilineal inheritance, is designated by the term pokala, a word which we have already met as signifying the tributes to the chief. It is a homonym, because its two meanings are distinct, and are clearly distinguished by the natives. There can be no doubt that these two meanings have developed out of a common one by gradual differentiation, but I have no data even to indicate this linguistic process. At present, it would be incorrect to strain after any connection between them, and indeed this is an example how necessary it is to be careful not to rely too much on native terminology for purposes of classification. The term for the hire of a canoe is to gunawaga. 6. Ceremonial barter with deferred payment. In this class we have to describe payments which are ceremonially offered, and must be received and repaid later on. The exchange is based on a permanent partnership, and the articles have to be roughly equivalent in value. Remembering the definition of the Kula in, it is easy to see that this big, ceremonial, circulating exchange belongs to this class. It is ceremonial barter based on permanent partnership, where a gift offered is always accepted, and after a time has to be repaid by an equivalent countergift. There is also a ceremonial form of exchange of vegetable food for fish, based on a standing partnership, and on the obligation to accept and return an initial gift. This is called wasi. The members of an inland village, where yams and taro are plentiful have partners in a lagoon village, where much fishing is done but garden produce is scarce. Each man has his partner, and at times, when new food is harvested and also during the main harvest, he and his fellow villagers will bring a big quantity of vegetable food into the lagoon village C each man putting his share before his partner's house. This is an invitation, which never can be rejected, to return the gift by its fixed equivalent in fish. As soon as weather and previous engagements allow, the fishermen go out to sea and notice is given to the inland village of the fact. The inlanders arrive on the beach, awaiting the fishermen, who come back in a body, and their haul of fish is taken directly from the canoes and carried to the inland village. Such large quantities of fish are always acquired only in connection with big distributions of food, sagali. It is remarkable that in the inland villages these distributions must be carried out in fish, 
whereas in the lagoon villages, fish never can be used for ceremonial purposes, vegetables being the only article considered proper. Thus the motive for exchange here is not to get food in order to satisfy the primary want of eating, but in order to satisfy the social need of displaying large quantities of conventionally sanctioned eatables. Often when such a big fishing takes place, great quantities of fish perish by becoming rotten before they reach the man for whom they are finally destined. But being rotten in no way detracts from the value of fish in a sagali. The equivalence of fish, given in return for vegetable food, is measured only roughly. A standard-sized bunch of taro, or one of the ordinary baskets of tedu, small yams, will be repaid by a bundle of fish, some 3 to 5 kilograms in weight. The equivalence of the two payments, as well as the advantage obtained by one party at least, make this exchange approach barter. But the element of trust enters into it largely, in the fact that the equivalence is left to the repayer. And again, the initial gift which as a rule is always given by the inlanders, cannot be refused. And all these features distinguish this exchange from barter. Similar to this ceremonial exchange are certain arrangements in which food is brought by individuals to the industrial villages of Cuboma, and the natives of that place return it by manufactured objects when these are made. In certain cases of production of vegue, valuables, it is difficult to judge whether we have to do with the payment for services rendered, class 3, or with the type of ceremonial barter belonging to this class. There is hardly any need to add that the two types of exchange contained in this class, the kula and the wasi, fish barter, are kept very distinct in the minds of the natives. Indeed, the ceremonial exchange of valuables, the kula, stands out as such a remarkable form of trade that in all respects, not only by the natives, but also by ourselves, it must be put into a class by itself. There is no doubt, however, that the technique of the wasi must have been influenced by the ideas and usages of the kula, which is by far the more important and widespread of the two. The natives, when explaining one of these trades, often draw parallels to the other. And the existence of social partnership, of ceremonial sequence of gift, of the free yet unavadable equivalence, all these features appear in both forms. This shows that the natives have a definite mental attitude towards what they consider an honorable, ceremonial type of barter. The rigid exclusion of haggling, the formalities observed in handing over the gift, the obligation of accepting the initial gift and of returning it later on, all these express this attitude. 7. Trade, pure and simple. The main characteristic of this form of exchange is found in the element of mutual advantage, each side acquires what is needed, and gives away a less useful article. Also we find here the equivalence between the articles adjusted during the transaction by haggling or bargaining. This bartering, pure and simple, takes place mainly between the industrial communities of the interior, which manufacture on a large scale the wooden dishes, combs, lime pots, armlets and baskets and the agricultural districts of Kiruina. The fishing communities of the west, and the sailing and trading communities of the south. The industrials, who are regarded as pariahs and treated with contumely, are nevertheless allowed to hawk their goods throughout the other districts. When they have plenty of articles on hand, they go to the other places, and ask for yams, coconuts, fish, and betel nut, and for some ornaments, such as turtle shell, earrings and spondylus beads. They sit in groups and display their wares, saying, you have plenty of coconuts, and we have none. We have made fine wooden dishes. This one is worth forty nuts, and some betel nut, and some betel pepper. The others then may answer, Oh, no, I do not want it. You ask too much. What will you give us? An offer may be made, and rejected by the peddlers, and so on, till a bargain is struck. Again, at certain times, people from other villages may need some of the objects made in Kuboma, and will go there, and try to purchase some manufactured goods. People of rank as a rule will do it in the manner described in the previous paragraph, by giving an initial gift, and expecting a repayment. Others simply go and barter. As we saw in the description of the Kabajadoya, the Sinekitans and Vakutans go there and purchase goods before each Kula expedition to serve for the subsidiary trade. Thus the conception of pure barter, Gimwali, stands out very clearly, 
and the natives make a definite distinction between this and other forms of exchange. Embodied in a word, this distinction is made more poignant still by the manner in which the word is used. When scornfully criticizing bad conduct in Kula, or an improper manner of giving gifts, a native will say that it was done like a gimwali. When asked about a transaction, whether it belongs to one class or another, they will reply with an accent of depreciation that was only a gimwali, gimwali wala. In the course of ethnographic investigation, they give clear descriptions, almost definitions of gimwali, its lack of ceremony, the permissibility of haggling, the free manner in which it can be done between any two strangers. They state correctly and clearly its general conditions, and they tell readily which articles may be exchanged by gimwali. Of course certain characteristics of pure barter, which we can perceive clearly as inherent in the facts, are quite beyond their theoretical grasp. Thus for instance, that the element of mutual advantage is prominent in gimwali. That it refers exclusively to newly manufactured goods, because secondhand things are never gimwali, etc., etc. Such generalizations the ethnographer has to make for himself. Other properties of the gimwali embodied in custom are, absence of ceremonial, absence of magic, absence of special partnership, all these already mentioned above. In carrying out the transaction, the natives also behave quite differently here than in the other transactions. In all ceremonial forms of give and take, it is considered very undignified and against all etiquette, for the receiver to show any interest in the gift or any eagerness to take it. In ceremonial distributions as well as in the kula, the present is thrown down by the giver, sometimes actually, sometimes only given in an abrupt manner, and often it is not even picked up by the receiver. But by some insignificant person in his following. In the gimwali, on the contrary, there is a pronounced interest shown in the exchange. There is one instance of gimwali which deserves special attention. It is a barter of fish for vegetables, and stands out in sharp contrast therefore to the wasi, the ceremonial fish and yam exchange. It is called vava, and takes place between villages which have no standing wasi partnership and therefore simply gimwali their produce when necessary, c. This ends the short survey of the different types of exchange. It was necessary to give it, even though in a condensed form, in order to provide a background for the kula. It gives us an idea of the great range and variety of the material give and take associated with the Trobrian tribal life. We see also that the rules of equivalence, as well as the formalities accompanying each transaction, are very well defined. 7. It is easy to see that almost all the categories of gifts, which I have classified according to economic principles, are also based on some sociological relationship. Thus the first type of gifts, that is, the free gifts, take place in the relationship between husband and wife, and in that between parents and children. Again, the second class of gifts, that is, the obligatory ones, given without systematic repayment, are associated with relationship in law, mainly, though the chief's tributes also belong to this class. If we drew up a scheme of sociological relations, each type of them would be defined by a special class of economic duties. There would be some parallelism between such a sociological classification of payments and presents, and the one given above. But such parallelism is only approximate. It will be therefore interesting to draw up a scheme of exchanges, classified according to the social relationship, to which they correspond. This will give us good insight into the economics of Trobrian sociology, as well as another view of the subject of payments and presents. Going over the sociological outline in and, we see that the family, the clan and sub-clan, the village community, the district and the tribe are the main social divisions of the Trobrians. To these groupings correspond definite bonds of social relationship. Thus, to the family, there correspond no less than three distinct types of relationship, according to native ideas. First of all there is the matrilineal kinship, Veola, which embraces people, who can trace common descent through their mothers. This is, to the natives, the blood relationship, the identity of flesh, and the real kinship. The marriage relation comprises that between husband and wife, and father and children. 
Finally, the relationship between the husband and the wife's matrilineal kinsman forms the third class of personal ties corresponding to family. These three types of personal bonds are clearly distinguished in terminology, in the current linguistic usage, in custom, and in explicitly formulated ideas. To the grouping into clans and subclans, there pertain the ties existing between clansmen and more especially between members of the same subclan, and on the other hand, the relationship between a man and members of different clans. Membership in the same subclan is a kind of extended kinship. The relationship to other clans is most important, where it assumes the form of special friendship called lubai. The grouping into village communities results in the very important feature of fellow membership in the same village community. The distinction of rank associated with clanship, the division into village communities and districts, result, in the manner sketched out in, in the subordination of commoners to chiefs. Finally, the general fact of membership in the tribe creates the bonds which unite every tribesman with another and which in olden days allowed of a free though not unlimited intercourse, and therefore of commercial relations. We have, therefore, eight types of personal relationship to distinguish. In the following table we see them enumerated with a short survey of their economic characteristics. 1. Matrilineal Kinship the underlying idea that this means identity of blood and of substance is by no means forcibly expressed on its economic side. The right of inheritance, the common participation in certain titles of ownership, and a limited right to use one another's implements and objects of daily use are often restricted in practice by private jealousies and animosities. In economic gifts more especially, we find here the remarkable custom of purchasing during lifetime, by installments, the titles to garden plots and trees and the knowledge of magic. Which by right ought to pass at death from the older to the younger generation of matrilineal kinsmen. The economic identity of matrilineal kinsmen comes into prominence at the tribal distributions, Sagali, where all of them have to share in the responsibilities of providing food. 2. Marriage ties. Husband and wife. And derived from that, father and children. It is enough to tabulate this type of relationship here, and to remind the reader that it is characterized by free gifts, as has been minutely described in the foregoing classification of gifts, under, 1. 3. Relationship in law. These ties are in their economic aspect not reciprocal or symmetrical. That is, one side in it, the husband of the woman, is the economically favored recipient, while the wife's brothers receive from him gifts of smaller value in the aggregate. As we know, this relationship is economically defined by the regular and substantial harvest gifts, by which the husband's storehouse is filled every year by his wife's brothers. They also have to perform certain services for him. For all this, they receive a gift of vague valuables, from time to time, and some food in payment for services rendered. 4. Clanship The main economic identification of this group takes place during the Sagali, although the responsibility for the food rests only with those actually related by blood with the deceased man. All the members of the subclan, and to a smaller extent members of the same clan within a village community, have to contribute by small presents given to the organizers of the Sagali. 5. The Relationship of Personal Friendship Two men thus bound as a rule will carry on Kula between themselves, and, if they belong to an inland and lagoon village respectively, they will be partners in the exchange of fish and vegetables, wasi. 6. Fellow Citizenship in a Village Community There are many types of presents given by one community to another. And, economically, the bonds of fellow citizenship mean the obligation to contribute one's share to such a present. Again, at the mortuary divisions, Sagali, the fellow villagers of clans, differing from the deceased man's, receive a series of presents for the performance of mortuary duties. 7. Relationship between chiefs and commoners. The tributes and services given to a chief by his vassals on the one hand, and the small but frequent gifts which he gives them, and the big and important contribution which he makes to all tribal enterprises are characteristic of this relationship. 8. Relationship between any two tribesmen. This is characterized by payments and presents, by occasional trade between two individuals, 
and by the sporadic free gifts of tobacco or betel nut which no man would refuse to another unless they were on terms of hostility. With this, the survey of gifts and presents is finished. The general importance of give and take to the social fabric of Boyawan society. The great amount of distinctions and subdivisions of the various gifts can leave no doubt as to the paramount role which economic acts and motives play in the life of these natives. CF and 4, and some of the following divisions of this chapter. I am adducing these views not for any controversial purposes, but to justify and make clear why I stress certain general features of Trobriand economic sociology. My contentions might run the danger of appearing as gratuitous truisms if not thus justified. The opinion that primitive humanity and savages have no individual property is an old prejudice shared by many modern writers, especially in support of communistic theories, and the so-called materialistic view of history. The, communism of savages, is a phrase very often read, and needs no special quotation. The views of individual search for food and household economy are those of Karl Bucher, and they have directly influenced all the best modern writings on primitive economics. Finally, the view that we have done with primitive economics if we have described the way in which the natives procure their food, is obviously a fundamental premise of all the naive. Evolutionary theories which construct the successive stages of economic development. This view is summarized in the following sentence. In many simple communities, the actual food quest, and operations immediately arising from it, occupy by far the greater part of the people's time and energy. Leaving little opportunity for the satisfaction of any lesser needs. This sentence, quoted out of, Notes and Queries on Anthropology, p. 160, article on the, Economics of the Social Group, represents what may be called the official view of contemporary ethnology on the subject and in perusing the rest of the article, it can be easily seen that all the manifold economic problems with which we are dealing in this book, have been so far more or less neglected. These views had to be adduced at length, although touched upon already in, because they imply a serious error with regard to human nature in one of its most fundamental aspects. We can show up their fallacy on one example only, that of the Trobrian society, but even this is enough to shatter their universal validity and show that the problem must be restated. The criticized views contain very general propositions, which, however, can be answered only empirically. And it is the duty of the field ethnographer to answer and correct them. Because a statement is very general, it can nonetheless be a statement of empirical fact. General views must not be mixed up with hypothetical ones. The latter must be banished from field work, the former cannot receive too much attention. As a matter of fact, this custom is not so prominent in the Trobriens as in other Ma Sim districts and all over the Papua Melanesian world, cf. for instance Seligman, op. sit, page 56 and plate 6, figure 6. Again, in explaining value, I do not wish to trace its possible origins, but I try simply to show what are the actual and observable elements into which the natives' attitude towards the object valued can be analyzed. These natives have no idea of physiological fatherhood. C. Compare, where the yam houses of a headman are filled by his wife's brothers. This advantage was probably in olden days a mutual one. Nowadays, when the fishermen can earn about 10 or 20 times more by diving for pearls than by performing their share of the wasi, the exchange is as a rule a great burden on them. It is one of the most conspicuous examples of the tenacity of native custom that in spite of all the temptation which pearling offers them and in spite of the great pressure exercised upon them by the white traders. The fishermen never try to evade a wasi and when they have received the inaugurating gift, the first calm day is always given to fishing, and not to pearling. Chapter 7 The Departure of an Overseas Expedition We have brought the Kula narrative to the point where all the preparations have been made, the canoe is ready, its ceremonial launching and presentation have taken place. And the goods for the subsidiary trade have been collected. It remains only to load the canoes and to set sail. So far, in describing the construction, the Tassasoria and Cabajadoya, we spoke of the Trobrianders in general. Now we shall have to confine ourselves to one district, the southern part of the island, 
and we shall follow a Kula expedition from Sinekita to Dobu. For there are some differences between the various districts and each one must be treated separately. What is said of Sinekita, however, will hold good so far as the other southern community, that of Vakuta, is concerned. The scene, therefore, of all that is described in the following two chapters will be set in one spot, that is, the group of some eight component villages lying on the flat, muddy shore of the Trobriand Lagoon. Within about a stone's throw of one another. There is a short, sandy beach under a fringe of palm trees, and from there we can take a comprehensive view of the lagoon, the wide semicircle of its shore edged with the bright green of mangroves. Backed by the high jungle on the raised coral ridge of the Raybwag. A few small, flat islands on the horizon just faintly thicken its line, and on a clear day the mountains of the D'Entrecastos are visible as blue shadows in the far distance. From the beach, we step directly into one of the villages, a row of houses faced by another of yam stores. Through this, leaving on our right a circular village, and passing through some empty spaces with groves of beetle and coconut palms, we come to the main component village of Sinekita, to Kasiatana. There, overtopping the elegant native huts, stands an enormous corrugated iron shed, built on piles, but with the space between the floor and the ground filled up carefully with white coral stones. This monument testifies both to native vanity and to the strength of their superstitions, vanity in aping the white man's habit of raising the house, and native belief in the fear of the Bwagayu, sorcerer, whose most powerful sorcery is applied by burning magical herbs, and could not be warded off, were he able to creep under the house. It may be added that even the missionary teachers, natives of the Trobriands, always put a solid mass of stones to fill the space beneath their houses. To Yudawada, the chief of Kasiatana, is, by the way, the only man in Boyawa who has a corrugated iron house. And in fact in the whole of the island there are not more than a dozen houses which are not built exactly according to the traditional pattern. To Yudawada is also the only native whom I ever saw wearing a sun helmet, Otherwise he is a decent fellow, physically quite pleasant-looking, tall, with a broad, intelligent face. Opposite his iron shanty are the fine native huts of his four wives. Plate. XXXVI. Kudawaya, one of the chiefs of Sinekita. He is seen standing in front of one of his decorated yam houses, his Lisaga, own dwelling, in the background. Plate. XX. A loaded canoe. A Masawa canoe on the beach of New Agassi, in the amphlets, showing the main load at the Jabobo, middle partition. Walking towards the north, over the black soil here and there pierced by coral, among tall trees and bits of jungle, fields and gardens, we come to Kanyabane, the village of Kudawaya, the second most important chief in Sinekita. Very likely we shall see him sitting on the platform of his hut or yam house, a shriveled up, toothless old man, wearing a big native wig. He, as well as Tiyutawada, belongs to the highest ranks of chieftainship, and they both consider themselves the equals of the chiefs of Kiruina. But the power of each one is limited to his small, component village, and neither in ceremonial nor in wealth did they, at least in olden days, approach their kinsmen in the north. There is still another chief of the same rank in Sinekita, who governs the small village of Orewoda. This is Sinekati, a puffed-up, unhealthy-looking, bald and toothless old man, and a really contemptible and crooked character, despised by black and white alike. He has a well-established reputation of boarding white men's boats as soon as they arrive, with one or two of his young wives in the canoe, and of returning soon after, alone, but with plenty of tobacco and good merchandise. Lax as is the Trobriander sense of honor and morality in such matters, this is too much even for them, and Sinekati is accordingly not respected in his village. The rest of the villages are ruled by headmen of inferior rank, but of not much less importance and power than the main chiefs. One of them, a queer old man, spare and lame but with an extremely dignified and deliberate manner, called Laisita, is renowned for his extensive knowledge of all sorts of magic, and for his long sojourns in foreign countries. Such as the Amphlets and Dobu. We shall meet some of these chiefs later on in our wanderings. Having described the villages and headmen of Sinekita let us return to our narrative. 
A few days before the appointed date of the departure of the Kula expedition there is a great stir in the villages. Visiting parties arrive from the neighborhood, bringing gifts mostly of food, to serve as provisions for the journey. They sit in front of the huts, talking and commenting, while the local people go about their business. In the evenings, long conferences are held over the fires, and late hours are kept. The preparation of food is mainly woman's work, whereas the men put the finishing touches to the canoes, and perform their magic. Sociologically the group of the departing differentiates itself of course from those who remain. But even within that group a further differentiation takes place, brought about by their respective functions in the Kula. First of all there are the masters of the canoe, the Talawaga, who will play quite a definite part for the next few weeks. On each of them fall with greater stringency the taboos, whether those that have to be kept in Sinekita or in Dobu. Each has to perform the magic and act in ceremonies. Each will also enjoy the main honors and privileges of the Kula. The members of the crew, the Usagilu, some four to six men in each canoe, form another group. They sail the craft, perform certain magical rites, and as a rule do the Kula each on his own account. A couple of younger men in each canoe, who do not yet Kula, but who help in the work of sailing, form another class, and are called Salasala. Here and there a small boy will go with his father on a Kula expedition, such are called Dodo Yu, and makes himself useful by blowing the conch shell. Thus the whole fleet consists of four classes, that of the Talawaga, the Usagilu, the helpers, and the children. From Sinekita, women, whether married or unmarried, never go on overseas expeditions, though a different custom prevails in the eastern part of the Trobriands. Each Talawaga has to give a payment in food to his Usagilu, and this is done in the form of a small ceremony of distribution of food called Mwalalo, and held after the return from the expedition, in the central place of the village. A few days before the sailing, the Talawaga starts his series of magical rites and begins to keep his taboos, the women busy themselves with the final preparation of the food, and the men trim the waga, canoe, for the imminent, long journey. The taboo of the Talawaga refers to his sexual life. During the last two nights, he has in any case to be up late in connection with his magical performances, and with the visits of his friends and relatives from other villages, who bring provisions for the voyage, presents in trade goods and who chat about the forthcoming expedition. But he has also to keep vigil far into the night as a customary injunction, and he has to sleep alone, though his wife may sleep in the same house. The preparations of the canoe are begun by covering it with plated mats called yawarapu. They are put on the platform, thus making it convenient for walking, sitting and spreading about of small objects. This, the first act of canoe trimming, is associated with a magical rite. The plated leaves are chanted over by the Talawaga on the shore as they are put on the canoe. Or, in a different system of Kula magic the Talawaga medicates some ginger root and spits it on the mats in his hut. This is a specimen of the magical formula which would be used in such a rite. Yawarapu spell. Betel nut, betel nut, female betel nut, betel nut, betel nut, male betel nut, betel nut of the ceremonial spitting. The chief's comrades. The chiefs and their followers, their son, the afternoon sun, their pig, a small pig. One only is my day, here the reciter utters his own name, their dawn, their morning. This is the exordium of the spell. Then follows the main body. The two words Boratupa and Badadaruma, coupled together, are repeated with a string of other words. The first word of the couple means, freely translated, quick sailing, and the second one, abundant hull. The string of words which are in succession tacked on to this couple describe various forms of Kula necklaces. The necklaces of different length and of different finish have each their own class names, of which there are about a dozen. After that, a list of words, referring to the human head, are recited. My head, my nose, my occiput, my tongue, my throat, my larynx, etc., etc. Finally, the various objects carried on a Kula expedition are mentioned. The goods to be given, peri. A ritually wrapped up bundle, lil eva, the personal basket, the sleeping mat, big baskets, 
the lime stick, the lime pot and comb are uttered one after the other. Finally the magician recites the end part of the spell. I shall kick the mountain, the mountain moves, the mountain tumbles down, the mountain starts on its ceremonial activities, the mountain acclaims, the mountain falls down, the mountain lies prostrate. My spell shall go to the top of Doba Mountain, my spell will penetrate the inside of my canoe. The body of my canoe will sink, the float of my canoe will get under water. My fame is like thunder, my treading is like the roar of the flying witches. The first part of this spell contains a reference to the betel nut, this being one of the things which the natives expect to receive in the kula. On the other hand, it is one of the substances which the natives charm over and give to the partner to induce him to kula with them. To which of these two acts the spell refers, it is impossible to decide, nor can the natives tell it. The part in which he extols his speed and success are typical of the magic formulae, and can be found in many others. The main part of the spell is as usual much easier to interpret. It implies, broadly speaking, the declaration, I shall speed and be successful with regard to the various forms of vague I shall speed and be successful with my head, with my speech, with my appearance. In all my trade goods and personal belongings. The final part of the spell describes the impression which is to be made by the man's magic upon the mountain, which stands here for the district of Dobu and its inhabitants. In fact, the districts in the Dientracastos to which they are sailing are always called Koya, mountain. The exaggerations, the metaphors, and the implicit insistence on the power of the spell are very characteristic of all magical spells. The next day, or the day after, as there is often a delay in starting, a pig or two are given by the master of the expedition to all the participants. In the evening of that day, the owner of each canoe goes into the garden, and finds an aromatic mint plant, solomoya. Taking a sprig of it into his hand, he moves it to and fro, uttering a spell, and then he plucks it. This is the spell. Solomoya spell. Who cuts the solomoya of Labai? I, Kwairegu, with my father, we cut the solomoya of Labai. The roaring solomoya, it roars, the quaking solomoya, it quakes, the suffing solomoya, it suffs. The boiling solomoya, it boils. My solomoya, it boils, my lime spoon, it boils, my lime pot, it boils, my comb, my basket, my small basket, my mat, my lilava bundle, my presentation goods, parry. And with each of these terms, the word boils or foams up is repeated often several times. After that, the same verb it boils is repeated with all parts of the head, as in the previously quoted formula. The last part runs thus, Recently deceased spirit of my maternal uncle Moyalova, breathe thy spell over the head of Monikaniki. Breathe the spell upon the head of my light canoe. I shall kick the mountain, the mountain tilts over, the mountain subsides, the mountain opens up, the mountain jubilates, it topples over. I shall kula so as to make my canoe sink. I shall kula so as to make my outrigger go under. My fame is like thunder, my treading is like the roar of the flying witches. The exordium of this spell contains some mythical references, of which, however, my informants could give me only confused explanations. But it is clear in so far as it refers directly to the magical mint, and describes its magical efficiency. In the second part, there is again a list of words referring to objects used in the kula, and to the personal appearance and persuasiveness of the magician. The verb with which they are repeated refers to the boiling of the mint and coconut oil which I shall presently have to mention, and it indicates that the magical properties of the mint are imparted to the Talawaga and his goods. In the last part, the magician invokes the spirit of his real maternal kinsman, from whom he obtained this spell, and asks him to impart magical virtue to his canoe. The mythological name, Monikaniki, with which there is no myth connected, except the tradition that he was the original owner of all these spells, stands here as synonym of the canoe. At the very end in the Dogaina, which contains several expressions identical with those in the end part of the Yawarapu spell, we have another example of the strongly exaggerated language so often used in magic. After having thus ritually plucked the mint plant, the magician brings it home. 
There he finds one of his Usagilu, members of crew, who helps him by boiling some coconut oil, balami, in a small native clay pot. Into the boiling oil the mint plant is put, and, while it boils, a magical formula is uttered over it. Kemoloyo spell. No betel nut, no doga, ornament of circular boar's tusk, no betel pod. My power to change his mind. My mwazala magic, my mwaz, mwazer, mwazerwe. This last sentence contains a play on words very characteristic of Kirawinian magic. It is difficult to interpret the opening sentence. Probably it means something like this, no betel nut or pod, no gift of a doga, can be as strong as my mwazala and its power of changing my partner's mind in my favor. Now comes the main part of the spell, there is one solomoya, mint, of mine, a solomoya of labai which I shall place on top of gumasila. Thus shall I make a quick kula on top of gumasila, thus shall I hide away my kula on top of gumasila. Thus shall I rob my kula on top of gumasila, thus shall I forage my kula on top of gumasila, thus shall I steal my kula on top of gumasila. These last paragraphs are repeated several times, inserting instead of the name of the island of Gumasila the following ones, Kuyawewo, Dom Dom, Tawara, Siawawa, Sanaroa, Tuyutana, Kamsarita, Gorobobu. All these are the successive names of places in which Kula is made. In this long spell, the magician follows the course of a Kula expedition, enumerating its most conspicuous landmarks. The last part in this formula is identical with the last part of the Yawarapu spell, previously quoted, I shall kick the mountain, etc. After the recital of this spell over the oil and mint, the magician takes these substances, and places them in a receptacle made of banana leaf toughened by grilling. Nowadays a glass bottle is sometimes used instead. The receptacle is then attached to a stick thrust through the prow boards of the canoe and protruding slantwise over the nose. As we shall see later on, the aromatic oil will be used in anointing some objects on arrival at Dobu. With this, however, the series of magical rites is not finished. The next day, early in the morning, the ritual bundle of representative trade goods, called Lil Ava, is made up with the recital of a magical spell. A few objects of trade, a plated armlet, a comb, a lime pot, a bundle of betel nut are placed on a clean, new mat, and into the folded mat the spell is recited. Then the mat is rolled up, and over it another mat is placed, and one or two may be wrapped round, thus it contains, hermetically sealed, the magical virtue of the spell. This bundle is placed afterwards in a special spot in the center of the canoe, and is not open till the expedition arrives in Dobu. There is a belief that a magical portent, Kariyala, is associated with it. A gentle rain, accompanied by thunder and lightning, sets in whenever the Lileva is opened. A skeptical European might add, that in the monsoon season it almost invariably rains on any afternoon, with the accompaniment of thunder, at the foot or on the slopes of such high hills as are found in the D'Entrecastos group. Of course when, in spite of that, a Kariyala does not make its appearance, we all know something has been amiss in the performance of the magical rite over the Lileva. This is the spell recited over the tabooed Lileva bundle. Lileva spell. I skirt the shore of the beach of Korakoma, the beach of Kali, the Kali of Muywa. I cannot add any explanation which would make this phrase clearer. It obviously contains some mythological references to which I have no key. The spell runs on. I shall act magically on my mountain. Where shall I lie? I shall lie in Legumatabu, I shall dream, I shall have dream visions, rain will come as my magical portent, his mind is on the alert. He lies not, he sits not, he stands up and trembles, he stands up and is agitated. The renown of Kawara is small, my own renown flares up. This whole period is repeated over and over again, each time the name of another place being inserted instead of that of Legumatabu. Legumatabu is a small coral island some 200 yards long and a 100 yards wide, with a few pandanus trees growing on it, wild fowl and turtle laying their eggs in its sand. 
In this island, halfway between Sinekita and the Amphlets, the Sinekitan sailors often spend a night or two, if overtaken by bad weather or contrary winds. This period contains first a direct allusion to the magical portent of the Lileva. In its second half it describes the state of agitation of the Dabuan partner under the influence of this magic, a state of agitation which will prompt him to be generous in the Kula. I do not know whether the word Kawara is a proper name or what else it may mean, but the phrase contains a boast of the magician's own renown, very typical of magical formulae. The localities mentioned instead of Legumatabu in the successive repetitions of the period are, Yakum, another small coral island, Uresai, the Dabuan name for Gumasila, Tawara, Seneroe, and Tuyutana. All localities known to us already from our description of Dobu. This is a very long spell. After the recital, and a very lengthy one, of the last period with its variants, yet another change is introduced into it. Instead of the first phrase, where shall I lie? etc. The new form runs, where does the rainbow stand up? It stands up on the top of Koyatabu, and after this the rest of the period is repeated, I shall dream, I shall have dream visions, etc. This new form is again varied by uttering instead of Koyatabu, Kamsarita, Koyavayu, and Gorobubu. This again carries us through the landscape. But here, instead of the sleeping places we follow the beacons of the sailing expedition by mentioning the tops of the high mountains. The end part of this spell is again identical with that of the Yawarapu spell. This magical rite takes place on the morning of the last day. Immediately after the recital of the spell, and the rolling up of the Lileva, it is carried to the canoe, and put into its place of honor. By that time the Usagilu, members of the crew, have already made the canoe ready for sailing. Each Misawa canoe is divided into ten, eleven, or twelve compartments by the stout, horizontal poles called Ryu, which join the body of the canoe with the outrigger. Such a compartment is called Liku, and each Liku has its name and its function. Starting from the end of the canoe, the first Liku, which, as is easily seen, is both narrow and shallow, is called Ogugwao, in the mist, and this is the proper place for the conch shell. Small boys will sit there and blow the conch shell on ceremonial occasions. The next compartment is called Laikumakava, and there some of the food is stowed away. The third division is called Kailaku and water bottles made of coconut shells have their traditional place in it. The fourth liku, called Likugwiyu, is, as its name indicates, the place for the Gaiyu or chief, which, it may be added, is unofficially used as a courtesy title for any headman, or man of importance. The bailer, Yalumala, always remains in this compartment. Then follow the central compartments, called Jabobo, one, two or three, according to the size of the canoe. This is the place where the Lileva is put on the platform, and where are placed the best food, not to be eaten till the arrival in Dobu, and all valuable trade articles. After that central division, the same divisions, as in the first part are met in inverse order, c. When the canoe is going to carry much cargo, as is always the case on an expedition to Dobu, a square space is fenced round corresponding to the Jabobo part of the canoe. A big sort of square hen coop, or cage, is thus erected in the middle of the canoe, and this is full of bundles wrapped up in mats, and at times when the canoe is not traveling, it is usually covered over with a sail. In the bottom of the canoe a floor is made by a framework of sticks. On this, people can walk and things can rest, while the bilge water flows underneath, and is bailed out from time to time. On this framework, in the jabobo, for coconuts are placed, each in the corner of the square, while a spell is recited over them. It is after that, that the lileva and the choice food, and the rest of the trade are stowed away. The following spell belongs to the class which is recited over the four coconuts. Jabobo spell. My father, my mother. Kula, Wazala. This short exordium, running in the compressed style proper to magical beginnings, is rather enigmatic, except for the mention of the Kula and Mwazala, which explain themselves. The second part is less obscure. I shall fill my canoe with Bajido Yu, I shall fill my canoe with Bagariku, I shall fill my canoe with Bajidudu, etc. 
All the specific names of the necklaces are enumerated. The last part runs as follows, I shall anchor in the open sea, and my renown will go to the lagoon, I shall anchor in the lagoon, and my renown will go to the open sea. My companions will be on the open sea and on the lagoon. My renown is like thunder, my treading is like earthquake. This last part is similar to several of the other formulae. This rite is obviously a Kula rite, judging from the spell, but the natives maintain that its special virtue is to make the foodstuffs, loaded into the canoe, last longer. After this rite is over, the loading is done quickly, the lileva is put into its place of honor, and with it the best food to be eaten in Dobu. Some other choice food to serve as pokala, offerings, is also put in the jabobo, to be offered to overseas partners. On it, the rest of the trade, called peri, is piled, and right on top of all are the personal belongings of the Usajalu and the Talawaga in their respective baskets, shaped like traveling bags. The people from the inland villages, Kalila Adala, as they are called, are assembled on the beach. With them stand the women, the children, the old men, and the few people left to guard the village. The master of the fleet gets up and addresses the crowd on the shore, more or less in these words. Women, we others sail, you remain in the village and look after the gardens and the houses, you must keep chaste. When you get into the bush to get wood, may not one of you lag behind. When you go to the gardens to do work keep together. Return together with your younger sisters. He also admonishes the people from the other villages to keep away, never to visit Sinekita at night or in the evening, and never to come singly into the village. On hearing that, the headman of an inland village will get up and speak in this fashion. Not thus, O, oh, our chief, you go away, and your village will remain here as it is. Look, when you are here we come to see you. You sail away, we shall keep to our villages. When you return, we come again. Perhaps you will give us some betel nut, some sago, some coconuts. Perhaps you will kula to us some necklace of shell beads. After these harangues are over, the canoes sail away in a body. Some of the women on the beach may weep at the actual departure, but it is taboo to weep afterwards. The women are also supposed to keep the taboo, that is, not to walk alone out of the village, not to receive male visitors, in fact, to remain chaste and true to their husbands during their absence. Should a woman commit misconduct, her husband's canoe would be slow. As a rule there are recriminations between husbands and wives and consequent bad feeling on the return of the party. Whether the canoe should be blamed or the wife it is difficult to say. The women now look out for the rain and thunder, for the sign that the men have opened the Lileva, special magical bundle. Then they know that the party has arrived on the beach of Sarabuena, and performs now its final magic, and prepares for its entrance into the villages of Tuyutana, and Buewa. The women are very anxious that the men should succeed in arriving at Dobu, and that they should not be compelled by bad weather to return from the amphlets. They have been preparing special grass skirts to put on, when they meet the returning canoes on the beach, they also hope to receive the sago, which is considered a dainty, and some of the ornaments, which their men bring them back from Dobu. If for any reason the fleet returns prematurely, there is great disappointment throughout the village, because this means the expedition has been a failure, nothing has been brought back to those left at home. And they have no opportunity of wearing their ceremonial dress. Compare the linguistic analysis of the original text of this spell, given in Koyatabu, the mountain on the north shore of Ferguson, Kamsarita, the highest hill on Dom Dom, in the Amphlets. Koyavayu, the mountain opposite Dobu Island, on the north shore of Dawson Straits, Gorobubu, the volcano on Dobu Island. Chapter 8 The First Halt of the Fleet on Moa I. After so many preparations and preliminaries, we might expect that, once embarked, the natives would make straight for the high mountains. Which beckon them alluringly from the distant south. Quite on the contrary, they are satisfied with a very short stage the first day, and after sailing a few miles, they stop on a big sand bank called Moa, lying to the southwest of the village of Sinekita. Here, near the sandy shore, edged with old, gnarled trees, the canoes are moored by sticks, 
while the crews prepare for a ceremonial distribution of food, and arrange their camp for the night on the beach. This somewhat puzzling delay is less incomprehensible, if we reflect that the natives, after having prepared for a distant expedition, now at last for the first time find themselves together, separated from the rest of the villagers. A sort of mustering and reviewing of forces, as a rule associated with a preliminary feast held by the party, is characteristic of all the expeditions or visits in the Trobriands. I have spoken already about big and small expeditions, but I have not perhaps made quite clear that the natives themselves make a definite distinction between big, competitive Kula expeditions, called Avalaku, and sailings on a smaller scale. Described as, just Kula, Kulawala. The Uvalaku are held every two or three years from each district, though nowadays, as in everything else, the natives are getting slack. One would be held, whenever there is a great agglomeration of Vegue, due to reasons which I shall describe later on. Sometimes, a special event, such as the possession by one of the head men of an exceptionally fine pig, or of an object of high value, might give rise to an Uvalaku. Thus, in 1918, a big competitive expedition, Uvalaku, from Dobu was held ostensibly for the reason that Kayaporu, one of the head men of Tuyutana, owned a very large boar with tusks almost curling over into a circle. Again, plenty of food, or in olden days the completion of a successful war expedition, would form the raison d'etre of an Uvalaku. Of course these reasons, explicitly given by the natives, are, so to speak, accessory causes, for in reality an avalaku would be held whenever its turn came, that is, barring great scarcity of food or the death of an important personage. The avalaku is a Kula expedition on an exceptionally big scale, carried on with a definite social organization under scrupulous observance of all ceremonial and magical rites and distinguished from the smaller expeditions by its size. By a competitive element, and by one or two additional features. On an Avalaku, all the canoes in the district will sail, and they will sail fully manned. Everybody will be very eager to take part in it. Side by side with this natural desire, however, there exists the idea that all the members of the crews are under an obligation to go on the expedition. This duty they owe to the chief, or master of the Avalaku. The Toli Avalaku, as he is called, is always one of the sectional chiefs or headmen. He plays the part of a master of ceremonies, on leaving the beach of Sinekita, at the distributions of food, on arrival in the overseas villages, and on the ceremonial return home. A streamer of dried and bleached pandanus leaf, attached to the prows of his canoe on a stick, is the ostensible sign of the dignity. Such a streamer is called Tarababayu in Kirawinian, and Doya in the Dabuan language. The headman, who is totally Avalaku on an expedition, will as a rule receive more Kula gifts than the others. On him also will devolve the glory of this particular expedition. Thus the title of Toli, in this case, is one of honorary and nominal ownership, resulting mainly in renown, Butura, for its bearer, and as such highly valued by the natives. From the economic and legal point of view, however, the obligation binding the members of the expedition to him is the most important sociological feature. He gives the distribution of food, in which the others participate, and this imposes on them the duty of carrying out the expedition, however hard this might be, however often they would have to stop or even return owing to bad weather. Contrary winds, or, in olden days, interference by hostile natives. As the natives say, We cannot return on Avalaku, for we have eaten of the pig, and we have chewed of the betel nut given by the Toli Avalaku. Only after the most distant community with whom the Sinekedon's Kula has been reached, and after due time has been allowed for the collection of any vague within reach, will the party start on the return journey. Concrete cases are quoted in which expeditions had to start several times from Sinekita, always returning within a few days after all the provisions had been eaten on Moa, from where a contrary wind would not allow the canoes to move south. Or again, a memorable expedition, some few decades ago, started once or twice, was becalmed in Vakuta, had to give a heavy payment to a wind magician in the village of Okinai, to provide them with a propitious northerly wind, and then, sailing south at last, met with a vinilida, one of the dreadful perils of the sea, a live stone which jumps from the bottom of the sea at a canoe. 
But in spite of all this, they persevered, reached Dobu in safety, and made a successful return. Thus we see that, from a sociological point of view, the Uvalaku is an enterprise partially financed by the Toli Uvalaku, and therefore redounding to his credit, and bringing him honor. While the obligation imposed on others by the food distributed to them, is to carry on the expedition to a successful end. It is rather puzzling to find that, although everyone is eager for the expedition, although they all enjoy it equally and satisfy their ambition and increase their wealth by it, yet the element of compulsion and obligation is introduced into it. For we are not accustomed to the idea of pleasure having to be forced on people. Nonetheless, the Uvalaku is not an isolated feature, for in almost all tribal enjoyments and festive entertainments on a big scale, the same principle obtains. The master of the festivities, by an initial distribution of food, imposes an obligation on the others, to carry through dancing, sports, or games of the season. And indeed, considering the ease with which native enthusiasms flag, with which jealousies, envies and quarrels creep in, and destroy the unanimity of social amusements. The need for compulsion from without to amuse oneself appears not so preposterous as at first sight. I have said that an Avalaku expedition is distinguished from an ordinary one, in so far also as the full ceremonial of the Kula has to be observed. Thus all the canoes must be either new or relashed, and without exception they must be also repainted and redecorated. The full ceremonial launching, Tassasoria, and the presentation, Kabigadoya, are carried out with every detail only when the Kula takes the form of an Avalaku. The pig or pigs killed in the village before departure are also a special feature of the competitive Kula. So is the Kegiyu ceremonial distribution held on Moa, just at the point of the proceedings at which we have now arrived. The Tanarare, a big display of Vegue in comparison of the individual acquisitions at the end of an expedition, is another ceremonial feature of the Uvalaku and supplies some of the competitive element. There is also competition as to the speed, qualities and beauties of the canoes at the beginning of such an expedition. Some of the communities who present their Vegue to an Uvalaku expedition vie with one another, as to who will give most, and in fact the element of emulation or competition runs right through the proceedings. In the following chapters, I shall have, in several more points, occasion to distinguish an Avalaku from an ordinary Kula sailing. It must be added at once that, although all these ceremonial features are compulsory only on an Avalaku sailing, and although only then are they one and all of them unfailingly observed. Some and even all may also be kept during an ordinary Kula expedition, especially if it happens to be a somewhat bigger one. The same refers to the various magical rites, that is to say the most important ones, which although performed on every Kula expedition, are carried out with more punctilio on an Avalaku. Finally, a very important distinctive feature is the rule, that no vegue can be carried on the outbound sailing of an Avalaku. It must not be forgotten that a Kula overseas expedition sails, in order mainly to receive gifts and not to give them, and on an Avalaku this rule is carried to its extreme, so that no Kula valuables whatever may be given by the visiting party. The natives sailing from Sinekita to Dobu on ordinary Kula may carry a few arms hells with them, but when they sail on a ceremonial competitive Avalaku, no arms hell is ever taken. For it must be remembered that Kula exchanges, as has been explained in, never take place simultaneously. It is always a gift followed after a lapse of time by a counter-gift. Now on a Avalaku the natives would receive in Dobu a certain amount of gifts, which, within a year or so, would be returned to the Dobuans, when these pay a visit to Sinekita. But there is always a considerable amount of valuables which the Dobuans owe to the Sinekitans, so that when now the Sinekitans go to Dobu, they will claim also these gifts due to them from previous occasions. All these technicalities of Kula exchange will become clearer in one of the subsequent chapters. To sum up, the Uvalaku is a ceremonial and competitive expedition. Ceremonial it is, in so far as it is connected with the special initial distribution of food, given by the master of the Uvalaku. It is also ceremonial in that all the formalities of the Kula are kept rigorously and without exception, for in a sense every Kula sailing expedition is ceremonial. 
competitive it is mainly in that at the end of it all the acquired articles are compared and counted. With this also the prohibition to carry vague is connected, so as to give everyone an even start. 2. Returning now to the Sinekitan fleet assembled at Moa, as soon as they have arrived there, that is, some time about noon, they proceed to the ceremonial distribution. Although the Toli of Alaku is master of ceremonies, in this case he as a rule sits and watches the initial proceedings from a distance. A group of his relatives or friends of lesser rank busy themselves with the work. It might be better perhaps here to give a more concrete account, since it is always difficult to visualize exactly how such things will proceed. This was brought home to me when in March, 1918, I assisted at these initial stages of the Kula in the Amphlet Islands. The natives had been preparing for days for departure, and on the final date, I spent the whole morning observing and photographing the loading and trimming of the canoes, the farewells, and the setting out of the fleet. In the evening, after a busy day, as it was a full moon night, I went for a long pull in a dinghy. Although in the Trobriands I had had accounts of the custom of the first halt, yet it gave me a surprise when on rounding a rocky point I came upon the whole crowd of Gumasila natives, who had departed on the Kula that morning. Sitting in full moonlight on a beach, only a few miles from the village which they had left with so much to do some ten hours before. With the fairly strong wind that day, I was thinking of them as camping at least halfway to the Trobriands, on one of the small sand banks some twenty miles north. I went and sat for a moment among the morose and unfriendly Amphlet islanders, who, unlike the Trobrianders, distinctly resented the inquisitive and blighting presence of an ethnographer. To return to our Sinekitan party, we can imagine the chief sitting high up on the shore under the gnarled, broad-leafed branches of the shady trees. They might perhaps be resting in one group, each with a few attendants, or else every headman and chief near his own canoe, to Utawada silently chewing betel nut, with a heavy and bovine dignity. The excitable Katoya chattering in a high-pitched voice with some of his grown-up sons, among whom there are two or three of the finest men in Sinekita. Further on, with a smaller group of attendants, sits the infamous Sinekati, in conference with his successor to chieftainship, his sister's son, Gomaya, also a notorious scoundrel. On such occasions it is good form for chiefs not to busy themselves among the groups, nor to survey the proceedings, but to keep an aloof and detached attitude. In company with other notables, they discuss in the short, jerky sentences which make native languages so difficult to follow, the arrangements and prospects of the Kula, making now and then a mythological reference, forecasting the weather. And discussing the merits of the canoes. In the meantime, the henchmen of the Toli of Alaku, his sons, his younger brothers, his relatives-in-law, prepare the distribution. As a rule either Tuyutawada or Kutoya would be the Toli of Alaku. The one who at the given time has more wealth on hand and prospects of receiving more vague would take over the dignity and the burdens. Sinekati is much less wealthy, and probably it would be an exception for him and his predecessors and successors to play the part. The minor headmen of the other compound villages of Sinekita would never fill the role. Whoever is the master of the expedition for the time being will have brought over a couple of pigs, which will now be laid on the beach and admired by the members of the expedition. Soon some fires are lit, and the pigs, with a long pole thrust through their tied feet, are hung upside down over the fires. A dreadful squealing fills the air and delights the hearers. After the pig has been singed to death, or rather, into insensibility, it is taken off and cut open. Specialists cut it into appropriate parts, ready for the distribution. Yams, taro, coconuts and sugar cane have already been put into big heaps, as many as there are canoes, that is, nowadays, eight. On these heaps, some hands of ripe bananas and some betel nut bunches are placed. On the ground, Beside them, on trays of plated coconut leaves, the lumps of meat are displayed. All this food has been provided by the Toli of Alaku, who previously has received as contributions towards its special presence, both from his own and from his wife's kinsmen. In fact, if we try to draw out all the strands of gifts and contributions connected with such a distribution we would find that it is spun round into such an intricate web that even the lengthy account of the foregoing chapter does not quite do it justice.
After the chief's helpers have arranged the heaps, they go over them, seeing that the apportionment is correct, shifting some of the food here and there, and memorizing to whom each heap will be given. Often in the final round, the Toli of Alaku inspects the heaps himself, and then returns to his former seat. Then comes the culminating act of the distribution. One of the chief's henchmen, always a man of inferior rank, accompanied by the chief's helpers, walks down the row of heaps, and at each of them screams out in a very loud voice. O, oh, Sayagana, thy heap, there, O oh, Sayagana, O. Oh. At the next one he calls the name of another canoe, O oh, Gumawara, thy heap, there. O oh, Gumawara, O. Oh. He goes thus over all the heaps, allotting each one to a canoe. After that is finished, some of the younger boys of each canoe go and fetch their heap. This is brought to their fire, the meat is roasted, and the yams, the sugar cane and betel nut distributed among the crew, who presently sit down and eat, each group by itself. We see that, although the Toli of Alaku is responsible for the feast, and receives from the natives all the credit for it, his active part in the proceedings is a small one, and it is more nominal than real. On such occasions it would perhaps be incorrect to call him master of ceremonies, although he assumes this role, as we shall see, on other occasions. Nevertheless, for the natives, he is the center of the proceedings. His people do all the work there is to be done, and in certain cases he would be referred to for a decision, on some question of etiquette. After the meal is over, the natives rest, chew betel nut and smoke, looking across the water towards the setting sun, it is now probably late in the afternoon, towards where, above the moored canoes, which rock and splash in the shallows. There float the faint silhouettes of the mountains. These are the distant Koya, the high hills in the D'Entrecastos and Amphlets, to which the elder natives have often already sailed, and of which the younger have heard so many times in myth, tales and magical spells. Kula conversations will predominate on such occasions, and names of distant partners. And personal names of specially valuable vegue will punctuate the conversation and make it very obscure to those not initiated into the technicalities and historical traditions of the Kula. Recollections how a certain big spondylus necklace passed a couple of years ago through Sinekita, how so-and-so handed it to so-and-so in Kiriwina. Who again gave it to one of his partners in Kideva, all the personal names of course being mentioned, and how it went from there to Woodlark Island. Where its traces become lost, such reminiscences lead to conjectures as to where the necklace might now be, and whether there is a chance of meeting it in Dobu. Famous exchanges are cited, quarrels over Kula grievances, cases in which a man was killed by magic for his two successful dealings in the Kula, are told one after the other, and listened to with never-failing interest. The younger men amuse themselves perhaps with less serious discussions about the dangers awaiting them on the sea, about the fierceness of the witches and dreadful beings in the Koya. While many a young Trobriander would be warned at this stage of the unaccommodating attitude of the women in Dobu, and of the fierceness of their men folk. After nightfall a number of small fires are lit on the beach. The stiff pandanus mats, folded in the middle, are put over each sleeper so as to form a small roof, and the whole crowd settle down for the night. 3. Next morning, if there is a fair wind, or a hope of it, the natives are up very early, and all are feverishly active. Some fix up the masts and rigging of the canoes, doing it much more thoroughly and carefully than it was done on the previous morning, since there may be a whole day's sailing ahead of them perhaps with a strong wind, and under dangerous conditions. After all is done, the sails ready to be hoisted, the various ropes put into good trim, all the members of the crew sit at their posts, and each canoe waits some few yards from the beach for its Talawaga, master of the canoe. He remains on shore, in order to perform one of the several magical rites which, at this stage of sailing, break through the purely matter-of-fact events. All these rites of magic are directed towards the canoes, making them speedy, seaworthy and safe. In the first rite, some leaves are medicated by the Talawaga as he squats over them on the beach and recites a formula. The wording of this indicates that it is a speed magic, and this is also the explicit statement of the natives. Katamiyala Spell In this spell, the flying fish and the jumping gar fish are invoked at the beginning. 
Then the Talawaga urges his canoe to fly at its bows and at its stern. Then, in a long tapwana, he repeats a word signifying the magical imparting of speed, and with the names of the various parts of the canoe. The last part runs, the canoe flies, the canoe flies in the morning, the canoe flies at sunrise, the canoe flies like a flying witch, ending up with the onomatopoetic words, satiti, tatata, numsa, which represent the flapping of pandana streamers in the wind, or as others say, the noises made by the flying witches, as they move through the air on a stormy night. After having uttered this spell into the leaves, the Talawaga gives them to one of the Usajalu, members of the crew, who, waiting round the waga, rubs with them first the dabwana, head, of the canoe, then the middle of its body. And finally its yula, basis. Proceeding round on the side of the outrigger, he rubs the, head, again. It may be remembered here that, with the native canoes, fore and aft in the sailing sense are interchangeable, since the canoe must sail having always the wind on its outrigger side, and it often has to change stern to bows. But standing on a canoe so that the outrigger is on the left hand, and the body of the canoe on the right, a native will call the end of the canoe in front of him its head, Dabwana, and that behind, its basis, Eula. After this is over, the Talawaga enters the canoe, the sail is hoisted, and the canoe rushes ahead. Now two or three pandana streamers which had previously been medicated in the village by the Talawaga are tied to the rigging, and to the mast. The following is the spell which had been said over them. Bissala spell. Borai, Borai, a mythical name. Borai flies, it will fly, Borai Bora, Borai stands up, it will stand up. In company with Bora, Sidididai. Break through your passage in Kadamwadu, pierce through thy promontory of Salamwa. Go and attach your pandana streamer in Salamwa, go and ascend the slope of Loma. Lift up the body of my canoe. Its body is like floating gossamer, its body is like dry banana leaf, its body is like fluff. There is a definite association in the minds of the natives between the pandana streamers, with which they usually decorate mast, rigging and sail, and the speed of the canoe. The decorative effect of the floating strips of pale, glittering yellow is indeed wonderful, when the speed of the canoe makes them flutter in the wind. Like small banners of some stiff, golden fabric they envelope the sail and rigging with light, color, and movement. The pandanus streamers, and especially their trembling, are a definite characteristic of Trobrian culture, c. In some of their dances, the natives use long, bleached ribbons of pandanus, which the men hold in both hands, and set a flutter while they dance. To do this well is one of the main achievements of a brilliant artist. On many festive occasions the bisala, pandana streamers, are tied to houses on poles for decoration. They are thrust into armlets and belts as personal ornaments. The vegue, valuables, when prepared for the kula, are decorated with strips of bisala. In the kula a chief will send to some distant partner a bisala streamer over which a special spell has been recited, and this will make the partner eager to bestow valuables on the sender. As we saw, a broad Bissala streamer is attached to the canoe of a Toliavalaku as his badge of honor. The flying witches, Molokwazi, are supposed to use pandana streamers in order to acquire speed and levitation in their nightly flights through the air. After the magical pandana strips have been tied to the rigging, beside the non-magical, purely ornamental ones, the Talawaga sits at the viva rope, the sheet by which the sail is extended to the wind, and moving it to and fro he recites a spell. Kaikuna Viva Spell. Two verbs signifying magical influence are repeated with the prefix bo, which implies the conception of ritual or sacred or being tabooed. Then the Talawaga says, I shall treat my canoe magically in its middle part, I shall treat it in its body. I shall take my bucha, flower wreath, of the sweet scented flowers. I shall put it on the head of my canoe. Then a lengthy middle strophe is recited in which all the parts of a canoe are named with two verbs one after the other. The verbs are, to wreath the canoe in a ritual manner, and, to paint it red in a ritual manner. The prefix bo dash, added to the verbs, has been here translated, in a ritual manner. The spell ends by a conclusion similar to that of many other canoe formulae, 
my canoe, thou art like a whirlwind, like a vanishing shadow. Disappear in the distance, become like mist, avaunt. These are the three usual rites for the sake of speed at the beginning of the journey. If the canoe remains slow, however, an auxiliary rite is performed. A piece of dried banana leaf is put between the gunwale and one of the inner frame sticks of the canoe, and a spell is recited over it. After that, they beat both ends of the canoe with this banana leaf. If the canoe is still heavy, and lags behind the others, a piece of kalea, cooked and stale yam, is put on a mat, and the talawaga medicates it with a spell which transfers the heaviness to the yam. The spell here recited is the same one which we met when the heavy log was being pulled into the village. The log was then beaten with a bunch of grass, accompanied by the recital of the spell, and then this bunch was thrown away. In this case the piece of yam which has taken on the heaviness of the canoe is thrown overboard. Sometimes, however, even this is of no avail. The Talawaga then seats himself on the platform next to the steersman, and utters a spell over a piece of coconut husk, which is thrown into the water. This rite, called Bisaboda paddle is a piece of evil magic, Bulabwalada, intended to keep all the other canoes back. If that does not help, the natives conclude that some taboos pertaining to the canoe might have been broken, and perhaps the Talawaga may feel some misgivings regarding the conduct of his wife or wives. The prefix bo has three different etymological derivations, each carrying its own shade of meaning. First, it may be the first part of the word bomala, in which case, its meaning will be ritual or sacred. Secondly, it may be derived from the word bua, barakanat, a substance very often used and mentioned in magic, both because it is a narcotic, and a beautiful, vermilion dye. Thirdly, the prefix may be a derivation from bucha, the sweet-scented flower made into wreaths, in which case it would usually be bue, but sometimes might become bo dash, and would carry the meaning of festive, decorated. To a native, who does not look upon a spell as an ethnological document, but as an instrument of magical power, the prefix probably conveys all three meanings at once, and the word ritual covers best all these three meanings. C. Chapter 9. Sailing on the Sea Arm of Palolu. I. Now at last the Kula expedition is properly set going. The canoes are started on a long stage, before them the Sea Arm of Palolu, stretching between the Trobrians and the D'Entrecastos. On the north, this portion of the sea is bounded by the archipelago of the Trobrians, that is, by the islands of Wakuta, Boyawa, and Kelola, joining in the west onto the scattered belt of the Lausanke Islands. On the east, a long submerged reef runs from the southern end of Wakuta to the Amphlets, forming an extended barrier to sailing, but affording little protection from the eastern winds and seas. In the south, this barrier links on to the Amphlets, which together with the northern coast of Ferguson and Goodenough, form the southern shore of Palolu. To the west, Palolu opens up into the seas between the mainland of New Guinea and the Bismarck archipelago. In fact, what the natives designate by the name of Palolu is nothing else but the enormous basin of the Lausanke Lagoon, the largest coral atoll in the world. To the natives, the name of Palolu is full of emotional associations, drawn from magic and myth, it is connected with the experiences of past generations, told by the old men round the village fires and with adventure personally lived through. As the Kula adventurers speed along with filled sails, the shallow lagoon of the Trobriens soon falls away behind. The dull green waters, sprinkled with patches of brown where seaweed grows high in rank, and lit up here and there with spots of bright emerald where a shallow bottom of clean sand shines through, give place to a deeper sea of strong green hue. The low strip of land, which surrounds the Trobriand lagoon in a wide sweep, thins away and dissolves in the haze, and before them the southern mountains rise higher and higher. On a clear day, these are visible even from the Trobriands. The neat outlines of the amphlet stand diminutive, yet firmer and more material, against the blue silhouettes of the higher mountains behind. These, like a faraway cloud are draped in wreaths of cumuli, almost always clinging to their summits. The nearest of them, Koyatabu, the mountain of the Tabu, on the north end of Ferguson Island, a slim, somewhat tilted pyramid, forms a most alluring beacon, guiding the mariners due south. 
To the right of it, as we look towards the southwest, a broad, bulky mountain, the Koyabwagayu, Mountain of the Sorcerers, marks the northwestern corner of Ferguson Island. The mountains on Good Enough Island are visible only in very clear weather, and then very faintly. Within a day or two, these disembodied, misty forms are to assume what for the Trobrianders seems marvelous shape and enormous bulk. They are to surround the Kula traders with their solid walls of precipitous rock and green jungle, furrowed with deep ravines and streaked with racing watercourses. The Trobrianders will sail deep, shaded bays, resounding with the, to them unknown, voice of waterfalls. With the weird cries of strange birds which never visit the Trobrians, such as the laughing of the kookaburra, laughing jackass, and the melancholy call of the South Sea Crow. The sea will change its color once more, become pure blue, and beneath its transparent waters, a marvelous world of multicolored coral, fish and seaweed will unfold itself, a world which, through a strange geographical irony. The inhabitants of a coral island hardly ever can see at home, and must come to this volcanic region to discover. In these surroundings, they will find also wonderful, heavy, compact stones of various colors and shapes, whereas at home the only stone is the insipid, white, dead coral. Here they can see, besides many types of granite and basalt and volcanic tuff, specimens of black obsidian, with its sharp edges and metallic ring, and sites full of red and yellow ochre. Besides big hills of volcanic ash, they will behold hot springs boiling up periodically. Of all these marvels the young Trobriander hears tales, and sees samples brought back to his country, and there is no doubt that it is for him a wonderful experience to find himself amongst them for the first time. And that afterwards he eagerly seizes every opportunity that offers to sail again to the Koya. Thus the landscape now before them is a sort of promised land, a country spoken of in almost legendary tone. And indeed the scenery here, on the borderland of the two different worlds, is singularly impressive. Sailing away from the Trobrians on my last expedition, I had to spend two days, weather-bound, on a small sandbank covered with a few pandanus trees, about midway between the Trobrians and the Amphleps. A darkened sea lay to the north, big thunderclouds hanging over where I knew there was the large flat island of Boyawa, the Trobrians. To the south, against a clearer sky, were the abrupt forms of the mountains, scattered over half of the horizon. The scenery seemed saturated with myth and legendary tales, with the strange adventures, hopes and fears of generations of native sailors. On this sandbank they had often camped, when becalmed or threatened with bad weather. On such an island, the great mythical hero, Casabuebuerita stopped, and was marooned by his companions, only to escape through the sky. Here again a mythical canoe once halted, in order to be recocked. As I sat there, looking towards the southern mountains, so clearly visible, yet so inaccessible, I realized what must be the feelings of the Trobrianders, desirous to reach the Koya, to meet the strange people, and to Kula with them. A desire made perhaps even more acute by a mixture of fear. For there, to the west of the Amphleps, they see the big bay of Gabu, where once the crews of a whole fleet of Trobrian canoes were killed and eaten by the inhabitants of unknown villages, in attempting to Kula with them. And stories are also told of single canoes, drifted apart from the fleet and cast against the northern shore of Ferguson Island, of which all the crew perished at the hands of the cannibals. There are also legends of some inexperienced natives, who, visiting the neighborhood of Daydai and arriving at the crystal water in the big stone basins there, plunged in, to meet a dreadful death in the almost boiling pool. But though the legendary dangers on the distant shores may appall the native imagination, the perils of actual sailing are even more real. The sea over which they travel is seamed with reefs, studded with sandbanks and coral rocks awash. And though in fair weather these are not so dangerous to a canoe as to a European boat, yet they are bad enough. The main dangers of native sailing, however, lie in the helplessness of a canoe. As we have said before, it cannot sail close to the wind, and therefore cannot beat. If the wind comes round, the canoe has to turn and retrace its course. This is very unpleasant, but not necessarily dangerous. If, however, the wind drops, and the canoe just happens to be in one of the strong tides, which run anything between three and five knots, 
or if it becomes disabled, and makes leeway at right angles to its course, the situation becomes dangerous. To the west, there lies the open sea, and once far out there, the canoe would have slender chances of ever returning. To the east, there runs the reef, on which in heavy weather a native canoe would surely be smashed. In May, 1918, a Dabuan canoe, returning home a few days after the rest of the fleet, was caught by a strong southeasterly wind, so strong that it had to give up its course, and make northwest to one of the Lausanne Islands. It had been given up as lost, when in August it came back with a chance blow of the northwesterly wind. It had had, however, a narrow escape in making the small island. Had it been blown further west, it would never have reached land at all. There exist other tales of lost canoes, and it is a wonder that accidents are not more frequent, considering the conditions under which they have to sail. Sailing has to be done, so to speak, on straight lines across the sea. Once they deviate from this course, all sorts of dangers crop up. Not only that, but they must sail between fixed points on the land. For, and this of course refers to the olden days, if they had to go ashore, anywhere but in the district of a friendly tribe, the perils which met them were almost as bad as those of reefs and sharks. If the sailors missed the friendly villages of the Amphlets and of Dobu, everywhere else they would meet with extermination. Even nowadays, though the danger of being killed would be smaller, perhaps not absolutely non-existent, yet the natives would feel very uncomfortable at the idea of landing in a strange district, fearing not only death by violence but even more by evil magic. Thus, as the natives sail across Pololu, only very small sectors of their horizon present a safe goal for their journey. On the east, indeed, beyond the dangerous barrier reef, there is a friendly horizon, marked for them by the Marshall Bennett Islands, and Woodlark, the country known under the term Omuyua. To the south, there is the Koya, also known as the land of the Kinana, by which name the natives of the D'Entrecastos and the Amphlets are known generically. But to the southwest and west there is the deep open sea, Bibega, and beyond that, lands inhabited by tailed people, and by people with wings, of whom very little more is known. To the north, beyond the reef of small coral islands, lying off the Trobriands, there are two countries, Kokapua and Ketaluji. Kokapua is peopled with ordinary men and women, who walk about naked, and are great gardeners. Whether this country corresponds to the south coast of New Britain, where people really are without any clothing, it would be difficult to say. The other country, Ketaluji, is a land of women only, in which no man can survive. The women who live there are beautiful, big and strong, and they walk about naked, and with their bodily hair unshaven, which is contrary to the Trobriand custom. They are extremely dangerous to any man through the unbounded violence of their passion. The natives never tire of describing graphically how such women would satisfy their sensuous lust, if they got hold of some luckless, shipwrecked man. No one could survive, even for a short time, the amorous yet brutal attacks of these women. The natives compare this treatment to that customary at the Yusa, the orgiastic mishandling of any man, caught at certain stages of female communal labor in Boyawa, cf. Not even the boys born on this island of Ketaluji can survive a tender age. It must be remembered the natives see no need for male cooperation in continuing the race. Thus the women propagate the race, although every male needs must come to an untimely end before he can become a man. Nonetheless, there is a legend that some men from the village of Kalagu, in eastern Boyawa, were blown in their canoe far north from the easterly course of a Kula expedition, and were stranded on the coast of Ketaluji. There, having survived the first reception, they were apportioned individually and married. Having repaired their canoe, ostensibly for the sake of bringing some fish to their wives, one night they put food and water into it, and secretly sailed away. On their return to their own village, they found their women married to other men. However, such things never end tragically in the Trobriands. As soon as their rightful lords reappeared their women came back to them. Among other things these men brought to Boyawa a variety of banana called Yusikala, not known before. 2. Returning again to our Kula party, we see that, in journeying across Pololu, 
they move within the narrow confines of familiar sailing ground, surrounded on all sides both by real dangers and by lands of imaginary horrors. On their track, however, the natives never go out of sight of land, and in the event of mist or rain, they can always take sufficient bearings to enable them to make for the nearest sandbank or island. This is never more than some six miles off, a distance which, should the wind have dropped, may even be reached by paddling. Plate XL Awaga sailing on a Kula expedition A canoe fully loaded with a crew of twelve men, just about to furl sail arriving in the amphlets. Note the cargo at the jabobo and each man's personal bundle of folded mat on top of it. C. Plate. XLI. The rigging of a canoe. Each time before a canoe starts, its mast has to put up and fixed by means of stays and a special arrangement of crescent-shaped cross pieces and a rope, to be seen in the picture. C. Note the small kawukano to the left. Another thing that also makes their sailing not so dangerous as one would imagine, is the regularity of the winds in this part of the world. As a rule, in each of the two main seasons, there is one prevailing direction of wind, which does not shift more than within some 90 degrees. Thus, in the dry season, from May to October, the trade wind blows almost incessantly from the southeast or south, moving sometimes to the northeast, but never beyond that. As a matter of fact, however, this season, just because of the constancy of the wind, does not lend itself very well to native sailing. For although with this wind it is easy to sail from south to north, or east to west, it is impossible to retrace the course, and as the wind often blows for months without veering, the natives prefer to do their sailings between the seasons. Or in the time when the monsoon blows. Between the seasons, November, December or March and April, the winds are not so constant, in fact they shift from one position on the compass to another. On the other hand, there is very seldom a strong blow at this time, and so this is the ideal season for sailing. In the hot summer months, December till March, the monsoon blows from the northwest or southwest, less regularly than a trade wind, but often culminating in violent storms which almost always come from the northwest. Thus the two strong winds to be met in these seas come from definite directions, and this minimizes the danger. The natives also as a rule are able to foretell a day or two beforehand the approach of a squall. Rightly or wrongly, they associate the strength of the northwesterly gales with the phases of the moon. There is, of course, a good deal of magic to make wind blow or to put it down. Like many other forms of magic, Wind magic is localized in villages. The inhabitants of Sim Sim, the biggest village in the Lausanne Islands, and the furthest northwesterly settlement of this district, are credited with the ability of controlling the northwesterly wind. Perhaps through association with their geographical position. Again, the control over the southeasterly wind is granted to the inhabitants of Kideva, lying to the east of Boyawa. The Sim Sim people control all the winds which blow habitually during the rainy season, that is the winds on the western side of the compass, from north to south. The other half can be worked by the Kitavan spells. Many men in Boyawa have learnt both spells and they practice the magic. The spells are chanted broadcast into the wind, without any other ritual. It is an impressive spectacle to walk through a village, during one of the devastating gales, which always arise at night and during which people leave their huts and assemble in cleared spaces. They are afraid the wind may lift their dwellings off the ground, or uproot a tree which might injure them in falling, an accident which actually did happen a year or two ago in Wawela, killing the chief's wife. Through the darkness from the doors of some of the huts, and from among the huddled groups, there resound loud voices, chanting, in a penetrating sing-song, the spells for abating the force of the wind. On such occasions, feeling myself somewhat nervous, I was deeply impressed by this persistent effort of frail, human voice, fraught with deep belief, pitting itself so feebly against the monotonous, overpowering force of the wind. Taking the bearing by sight, and helped by the uniformity of winds, the natives have no need of even the most elementary knowledge of navigation. Barring accidents they never have to direct their course by the stars. Of these, they know certain outstanding constellations, sufficient to indicate for them the direction, 
should they need it. They have names for the Pleiades, for Orion, for the Southern Cross, and they also recognize a few constellations of their own construction. Their knowledge of the stars, as we have mentioned already in, is localized in the village of Wawela, where it is handed over in the maternal line of the chiefs of the village. In order to understand better the customs and problems of sailing, a few words must be said about the technique of managing a canoe. As we have said before, the wind must always strike the craft, on the outrigger side, so the sailing canoe is always tilted with its float raised, and the platform slanting towards the body of the canoe. This makes it necessary for it to be able to change bows and stern at will. For imagine that a canoe going due south, has to sail with a northeasterly wind, then the lamina, outrigger, must be on the left hand, and the canoe sails with what the natives call its head forward. Now imagine that the wind turns to the northwest. Should this happen in a violent squall, without warning, the canoe would be at once submerged. But, as such a change would be gradual, barring accidents, the natives could easily cope with it. The mast, which is tied at the fourth cross pole, Ryu, from the temporary bows of the canoe, would be unbound, the canoe would be turned 180 degrees around, so that its head would now form the stern, its Yula, foundation, would face south. And become its bows, and the platform would be to our right, facing west. The mast would be attached again to the fourth cross pole, Ryu, from the Yula end, the sail hoisted, and the canoe would glide along with the wind striking it again on its outrigger side, but having changed bows to stern, see. The natives have a set of nautical expressions to describe the various operations of changing mast, of trimming the sail, of paying out the sheet rope, of shifting the sail, so that it stands up with its bottom end high. And its tip touching the canoe, or else letting it lie with both boom and gaff almost horizontal. And they have definite rules as to how the various maneuvers should be carried out, according to the strength of the wind, and to the quarter on which it strikes the canoe. They have four expressions denoting a following wind, wind striking the outrigger beam, wind striking the canoe from the catala, built-out body, and wind striking the canoe on the outrigger side close to the direction of sailing. There is no point, however, in adducing this native terminology here, as we shall not any further refer to it it is enough to know that they have got definite rules, and means of expressing them, with regard to the handling of a canoe. It has been often remarked here, that the Trobriand canoes cannot sail close to the wind. They are very light and shallow, and have very little waterboard, giving a small resistance against making leeway. I think that this is also the reason, why they need two men to do the steering for the steering oars act as leeboards. One of the men wields a big, elongated steering oar, called Kuriga. He sits at the stern, of course, in the body of the canoe. The other man handles a smaller steering paddle, leaf-shaped, yet with a bigger blade than the paddling oars, it is called Vioyu. He sits at the stern end of the platform, and does the steering through the sticks of the patapital, platform. The other working members of the crew are the man at the sheet, the Takwabila Viva, as he is called who has to let out the viva or pull it in, according as the wind shifts and varies in strength. Another man, as a rule, stands in the bows of the ship on the lookout, and if necessary, has to climb the mast in order to trim the rigging. Or again, he would have to bail the water from time to time, as this always leaks through, or splashes into the canoe. Thus four men are enough to man a canoe, though usually the functions of the bailer and the man on the lookout and at the mast are divided. When the wind drops, the men have to take to the small, leaf-shaped paddles, while one, as a rule, wields a pulling oar. But in order to give speed to a heavy Misawa canoe, at least ten men would have to paddle and pull. As we shall see, on certain ceremonial occasions, the canoes have to be propelled by paddling, for instance when they approach their final destination, after having performed the great Mwazala magic. When they arrive at a halting place, the canoes, if necessary, are beached. As a rule, however, the heavily loaded canoes on a Kula expedition, would be secured by both mooring and anchoring, according to the bottom. On muddy bottoms, such as that of the Trobriand Lagoon, a long stick would be thrust into the slime, and one end of the canoe lashed to it. From the other, a heavy stone, tied with a rope, 
would be thrown down as an anchor. Over a hard, rocky bottom, the anchor stone alone is used. It can be easily understood that with such craft, and with such limitations in sailing, there are many real dangers which threaten the natives. If the wind is too strong, and the sea becomes too rough, a canoe may not be able to follow its course, and making leeway, or even directly running before the wind, it may be driven into a quarter where there is no landfall to be made. Or from where at best there is no returning at that season. This is what happened to the Dabuan boat mentioned before. Or else, a canoe becalmed and seized by the tide may not be able to make its way by means of paddling. Or in stormy weather, it may be smashed on rocks and sandbanks, or even unable to withstand the impact of waves. An open craft like a native canoe easily fills with sea water, and, in a heavy rainstorm, with rain water. In a calm sea this is not very dangerous, for the wooden canoe does not sink, even if swamped, the water can be bailed out and the canoe floats up. But in rough weather, a waterlogged canoe loses its buoyancy and gets broken up. Last and not least, there is the danger of the canoe being pressed into the water, outrigger first, should the wind strike it on the opposite side. With so many real dangers around it, it is a marvelous thing, and to the credit of native seamanship, that accidents are comparatively rare. We now know about the crew of the canoe and the different functions which every man has to fulfill. Remembering what has been said in, about the sociological division of functions in sailing, we can visualize concretely the craft with all its inmates, as it sails on the pololu. The Talawaga usually sits near the mast in the compartment called Kegiyu. With him perhaps is one of his sons or young relatives, while another boy remains in the bows, near the conch shell ready to sound it, whenever the occasion arises. Thus are employed the Talawaga and the Dodoyu, small boys. The Usajalu or members of the crew, some four or five strong, are each at his post, with perhaps one supernumerary to assist at any emergency, where the task would require it. On the platform are lounging some of the Salasala, the youths not yet employed in any work, and not participating in the Kula, but there for their pleasure, and to learn how to manage a boat, c. 3. All these people have not only special posts and modes of occupation assigned to them, but they have also to keep certain rules. The canoe on a Kula expedition, is surrounded by taboos, and many observances have to be strictly kept, else this or that might go wrong. Thus it is not allowed to point to objects with the hand, Yosala Yamada, or those who do it will become sick. A new canoe has many prohibitions connected with it, which are called Bomala Wayugo, the taboos of the lashing creeper. Eating and drinking are not allowed in a new canoe except after sunset. The breaking of this taboo would make the canoe very slow. On a very quick waga this rule might perhaps be disregarded, especially if one of the young boys were hungry or thirsty. The talawaga would then bail in some sea water, pour it over one of the lashings of the creeper with the words. I sprinkle thy eye, O Kadayuri creeper, so that our crew might eat. After that, he would give the boys something to eat and drink. Besides this eating and drinking taboo, on a new waga the other physiological needs must not be satisfied. In case of urgent necessity, a man jumps into the water, holding to one of the cross sticks of the outrigger, or if it were a small boy, he is lowered into the water by one of the elders. This taboo, if broken, would also make the canoe slow. These two taboos, however, as was said, are kept only on a new waga, that is on such a one which either sails for the first time, or else has been relashed and repainted before this trip. The taboos are in all cases not operative on the return journey. Women are not allowed to enter a new waga before it sails. Certain types of yams may not be carried on a canoe, which has been lashed with the rites of one of the Wayugo magical systems. There are several systems of this magic, compare, and each has got its specific taboos. These last taboos are to be kept right through the sailing. On account of a magic to be described in the next chapter, the magic of safety as it might be called, a canoe has to be kept free from contact with earth, sand and stones. Hence the natives of Sinekita do not beach their canoes if they can possibly avoid it. Among the specific taboos of the Kula, called Bomala Lileva, taboos of the magical bundle, 
there is a strict rule referring to the entering of a canoe. This must not be entered from any other point but on the vitovaria, that is, the front side of the platform, facing the mast. A native has to scale the platform at this place, then, crouching low, pass to the back or front, and there descend into the body of the canoe, or sit down where he is. The compartment facing the lileva, magical bundle, is filled out with other trade goods. In front of it sits the chief, behind it the man who handles the sheets. The natives have special expressions which denote the various manners of illicitly entering a canoe, and, in some of the canoe exorcisms, these expressions are used to undo the evil effects of the breaking of these taboos. Other prohibitions, which the natives call the taboo of the Mwazala, though not associated with the Lileva, are those which do not allow of using flower wreaths, red ornaments or red flowers in decorating the canoe or the bodies of the crew. The red color of such ornaments is, according to native belief, magically incompatible with the aim of the expedition, the acquisition of the red spondylus necklaces. Also, yams may not be roasted on the outward journey, while later on, in Dobu, no local food may be eaten, and the natives have to subsist on their own provisions, until the first Kula gifts have been received. There are, besides, definite rules, referring to the behavior of one canoe towards another, but these vary considerably with the different villages. In Sinakita, such rules are very few. No fixed sequence is observed in the sailing order of the canoes, any one of them can start first, and if one of them is swifter it may pass any of the others, even that of a chief. This, however, has to be done so that the slower canoe is not passed on the outrigger side. Should this happen, the transgressing canoe has to give the other one a peace offering, Lula, because it has broken a Bomala Lileva, it has offended the magical bundle. There is one interesting point with regard to priorities in Sinakita, and to describe this we must hark back to the subject of canoe building and launching. One of the sub-clans of the Lukwa clan, the Talabwaga sub-clan, have the right of priority in all the successive operations of piecing together, lashing, caulking, and painting of their canoes. All these stages of building and all the magic must first be done on the Talabwaga canoe, and this canoe is also the first to be launched. Only afterwards, the chiefs and the commoners canoes may follow. A correct observance of this rule, keeps the sea clean, Imalakatal Borita. If it were broken, and the chiefs had their canoes built or launched before the Talabwaga, the Kula would not be successful. We go to Dobu, no pig, no Soleva necklace is given. We would tell the chiefs, why have you first made your canoes? The ancestor spirits have turned against us, for we have broken the old custom. Once at sea, however, the chiefs are first again, in theory at least, for in practice the swiftest canoe may sail first. In the sailing custom of Vakuta, the other South Boyawan community, who make the Kula with the Dobu, a sub-clan of the Lukwasizaga clan, called Talawaga, have the privilege of priority in all the canoe-building operations. While at sea, they also retain one prerogative, denied to all the others, the man who steers with the smaller oar, the Tokabina Viyoyu, is allowed permanently to stand up on the platform. As the natives put it, this is the sign of the Talawaga, sub-clan, of Vakuta, wherever we see a man standing up at the Viyoyu, we say, there sails the canoe of the Talawaga. The greatest privileges, however, granted to a sub-clan in sailing are those which are to be found in Cavateria. This fishing and sailing community from the north shore of the lagoon makes distant and dangerous sailings to the northwestern end of Ferguson Island. These expeditions for sago, betelnut, and pigs will be described in. Their sea customs, however, have to be mentioned here. The Kaluchula subclan of the Lukwasizaga clan enjoy all the same privileges of priority in building as the Talabwaga and Talawaga clans in the southern villages, only in a still higher degree. For their canoe has to pass each stage of construction on the first day, and only the day after can the others follow. This refers even to launching, the Kaluchula canoe being launched one day, and on the next those of the chiefs and commoners. When the moment of starting arrives, the Kaluchula canoe leaves the beach first, and during the sailing no one is allowed to pass ahead of it. When they arrive at the sandbanks or at an intermediate place in the amphlets, the Kaluchula have to anchor first, 
and first go ashore and make their camp ready. Only after that can the others follow. This priority expires at the final point of destination. When they arrive at the furthest Koya the Kaluchula go ashore first, and they are the first to be presented with the welcoming gift of the foreigner, Tokanana. He receives them with a bunch of betel nut, which he beats against the head of the canoe, till the nuts scatter. On the return journey, the Kaluchula clan sink again into their naturally inferior position. It may be noted that all the three privileged subclans in the three villages belong to the Lukwasizaga clan, and that the names of two of them, Talawaga, Talabwaga have a striking resemblance to the word Talawaga. Although these resemblances would have to be tested by some stricter methods of etymological comparison, than I have now at my disposal. The fact that these clans, under special circumstances of sailing, resume what may be a lost superiority points to an interesting historical survival. The name Kaluchula is undoubtedly identical with Kalutalu, which is an independent totemic clan in the eastern Marshall Bennets and in Woodlark. 4. Let us return now to our Sinekedon fleet, moving southwards along the barrier reef and sighting one small island after the other. If they did not start very early from Moa, and delay is one of the characteristics of native life, and if they were not favored with a very good wind, they would probably have to put in at one of the small sand islands, Legumatabu, Gabawana or Yakum. Here, on the western side, sheltered from the prevalent trade winds, there is a diminutive lagoon, bounded by two natural breakwaters of coral reef running from the northern and southern ends of the island. Fires are lit on the clean, white sand, under the scraggy pandanus trees, and the natives boil their yam food and the eggs of the wild sea fowl, collected on the spot. When darkness closes in and the fires draw them all into a circle, the Kula talk begins again. Let us listen to some such conversations, and try to steep ourselves in the atmosphere surrounding this handful of natives, cast for a while onto the narrow sandbank, far away from their homes. Having to trust only to their frail canoes on the long journey which faces them. Darkness, the roar of surf breaking on the reef, the dry rattle of the pandanus leaves in the wind, all produce a frame of mind in which it is easy to believe in the dangers of witches and all the beings usually hidden away. But ready to creep out at some special moment of horror. The change of tone is unmistakable, when you get the natives to talk about these things on such an occasion, from the calm, often rationalistic way of treating them in broad daylight in an ethnographer's tent. Some of the most striking revelations I have received of this side of native belief and psychology were made to me on similar occasions. Sitting on a lonely beach in Santa Roa, surrounded by a crew of Trobrianders, Dobuans, and a few local natives, I first heard the story of the jumping stones. On a previous night, trying to anchor off Gumasila in the Amphlets, we had been caught by a violent squall, which tore one of our sails, and forced us to run before the wind, on a dark night, in the pouring rain. Except for myself, all the members of the crew saw clearly the flying witches in the form of a flame at the masthead. Whether this was St. Elmo's fire I could not judge, as I was in the cabin, seasick and indifferent to dangers, witches, and even ethnographic revelations. Inspired by this incident, my crew told me how this is, as a rule, a sign of disaster, how such a light appeared a few years ago in a boat, which was sunk almost on the same spot where the squall had caught us, but fortunately all were saved. Starting from this, all sorts of dangers were spoken about, in a tone of deep conviction, rendered perfectly sincere by the experiences of the previous night, the surrounding darkness. And the difficulties of the situation, for we had to repair our sail and again attempt the difficult landing in the amphlets. I have always found that whenever natives are found under similar circumstances, surrounded by the darkness and the imminent possibility of danger, they naturally drift into a conversation about the various things and beings into which the fears and apprehensions of generations have traditionally crystallized. Thus if we imagine that we listen to an account of the perils and horrors of the seas, sitting round the fire at Yakum or Legumatabu, we do not stray from reality. One of those who are specially versed in tradition, and who love to tell a story, might refer to one of his own experiences, or to a well-known case from the past, while others would chime in, and comment, telling their own stories. General statements of belief would be given, 
while the younger men would listen to the tales so familiar, but always heard with renewed interest. They would hear about an enormous octopus, Quida, which lies in wait for canoes, sailing over the open seas. It is not an ordinary Quida of exceptional size, but a special one, so gigantic that it would cover a whole village with its body. Its arms are thick as coconut palms, stretching right across the sea. With typical exaggeration, the natives will say, Ikanabwadi Pololu. He covers up all the Pololu, the sea arm between the Trobriens and the Amphlets. Its proper home is in the east, O Muyua, as the natives describe that region of sea and islands, where also it is believed some magic is known against the dreadful creature. Only seldom does it come to the waters between the Trobriens and Amphlets, but there are people who have seen it there. One of the old men of Sinekita tells how, coming from Dobu, when he was quite young, he sailed in a canoe ahead of the fleet, some canoes being to the right and some to the left behind him. Suddenly from his canoe, they saw the giant Quida right in front of them. Paralyzed with fear, they fell silent, and the man himself, getting up on the platform, by signs warned the other canoes of the danger. At once they turned round, and the fleet divided into two, took big bends in their course, and thus gave the octopus a wide berth. For woe to the canoe caught by the giant Quida. It would be held fast, unable to move for days, till the crew, dying of hunger and thirst, would decide to sacrifice one of the small boys of their number. Adorned with valuables, he would be thrown overboard, and then the Quida, satisfied, would let go its hold of the canoe, and set it free. Once a native, asked why a grown-up would not be sacrificed on such an occasion, gave me the answer. A grown-up man would not like it, a boy has got no mind. We take him by force and throw him to the Quida. Another danger threatening a canoe on the high seas, is a big, special rain, or water falling from above, called Cinematanaginoji. When in rain and bad weather a canoe, in spite of all the efforts to bail it out, fills with water, Cinematanaginoji strikes it from above and breaks it up. Whether at the basis of this are the accidents with water spouts, or cloud bursts or simply extremely big waves breaking up the canoe, it is difficult to judge. On the whole, this belief is more easily accounted for than the previous one. The most remarkable of these beliefs is that there are big, live stones, which lie in wait for sailing canoes, run after them, jump up and smash them to pieces. Whenever the natives have reasons to be afraid of them, all the members of the crew will keep silence, as laughter and loud talk attracts them. Sometimes they can be seen, at a distance, jumping out of the sea or moving on the water. In fact I have had them pointed to me, sailing off Koyotabu, and although I could see nothing, the natives, obviously, genuinely believed they saw them. Of one thing I am certain, however, that there was no reef awash there for miles around. The natives also know quite well that they are different from any reefs or shallows, for the live stones move, and when they perceive a canoe will pursue it, break it up on purpose and smash the men. Nor would these expert fishermen ever confuse a jumping fish with anything else, though in speaking of the stones they may compare them to a leaping dolphin or stingery. There are two names given to such stones. One of them, Nuwakipaki, applies to the stones met in the Dabuan seas. The other, Vinilida, to those who live O Muyua. Thus, in the open seas, the two spheres of culture meet, for the stones not only differ in name but also in nature. The Nuwakipaki are probably nothing but malevolent stones. The Vinilida are inhabited by witches, or according to others, by evil male beings. Sometimes a Vinilida will spring to the surface, and hold fast the canoe, very much in the same manner as the giant octopus would do. And here again offerings would have to be given. A folded mat would first be thrown, in an attempt to deceive it. If this were of no avail, a little boy would be anointed with coconut oil, adorned with arm shells and baggy necklaces, and thrown over to the evil stones. It is difficult to realize what natural phenomena or actual occurrences might be at the bottom of this belief, and the one of the giant octopus. We shall presently meet with a cycle of beliefs presenting the same striking features. We shall find a story told about human behavior mixed up with supernatural elements, laying down the rules of what would happen, 
and how human beings would behave, in the same matter-of-fact way, as if ordinary events of tribal life were described. I shall have to comment on the psychology of these beliefs in the next chapter, where also the story is told. Of all the dangerous and frightful beings met with on a sailing expedition, the most unpleasant, the best known and most dreaded are the flying witches, the Yoyova or Molokwazi. The former name means a woman endowed with such powers, whereas Molokwazi describes the second self of the woman, as it flies disembodied through the air. Thus, for instance, they would say that such and such a woman in Wawela is a Yoyova. But sailing at night, one would have to be on the lookout for Molokwazi, among whom might possibly be the double of that woman in Wawela. Very often, especially at moments when the speaker would be under the influence of fear of these beings, the deprecating euphemism, vivila, women, would be used. And probably our Boyawan mariners would speak of them thus in their talk round the campfire, for fear of attracting them by sounding their real name. Dangerous as they always are, at sea they become infinitely more dreaded. For the belief is deep that in case of shipwreck or mishap at sea, no real evil can befall the crows except by the agency of the dreaded women. As through their connection with shipwreck, they enter inevitably into our narrative, it will be better to leave our Kula expedition on the beach of Yakum in the midst of Palolu. And to turn in the next chapter to Kirawinian ethnography and give there an account of the natives' belief in the flying witches and their legend of shipwreck. The word taboo, in the meaning of taboo, prohibition, is used in its verbal form in the language of the Trobrians, but not very often. The noun, prohibition, sacred thing, is always bomala, used with suffix personal pronouns. At a later date, I hope to work out certain historical hypotheses with regard to migrations and cultural strata in eastern New Guinea. A considerable number of independent indices seem to corroborate certain simple hypotheses as to the stratification of the various cultural elements. The word vinilida suggests the former belief, as vine, female, lida, coral stone. Chapter 10 The Story of Shipwreck I. In this chapter an account will be given of the ideas and beliefs associated with shipwreck, and of the various precautions which the natives take to ensure their own safety. We shall find here a strange mixture of definite, matter-of-fact information, and of fantastic superstitions. Taking a critical, ethnographic side view, it may be said directly that the fanciful elements are intertwined with the realities in such a manner. That it is difficult to make a distinction between what is mere mythopoetic fiction and what is a customary rule of behavior, drawn from actual experience. The best way of presenting this material will be to give a consecutive account of a shipwreck, as it is told in Kirawinian villages by the traveled old men to the younger generation. I shall adduce in it the several magical formulae, the rules of behavior, the part played by the miraculous fish, and the complex ritual of the saved party as they flee from the pursuing Molokwazi. These, the flying witches, will play such an important part in the account, that I must begin with a detailed description of the various beliefs referring to them, though the subject has been touched upon once or twice before, and other places. The sea and sailing upon it are intimately associated in the mind of a Boyawan with these women. They had to be mentioned in the description of canoe magic, and we shall see what an important part they play in the legends of canoe building. In his sailing, whether he goes to Kidava or further east, or whether he travels south to the Amphlets and Dobu, they form one of the main preoccupations of a Boyawan sailor. For they are not only dangerous to him, but to a certain extent, foreign. Boyawa, with the exception of Wawela and one or two other villages on the eastern coast, and in the south of the island, is an ethnographic district, where the flying witches do not exist, although they visit it from time to time. Whereas all the surrounding tribes are full of women who practice this form of sorcery. Thus sailing south, the Boyawan is traveling straight into the heart of their domain. These women have the power of making themselves invisible, and flying at night through the air. The orthodox belief is that a woman who is a yoyova can send forth a double which is invisible at will, but may appear in the form of a flying fox or of a night bird or a firefly. There is also a belief that a yoyova develops within her a something, shaped like an egg, or like a young, unripe coconut. This something is called as a matter-of-fact kapuana, 
which is the word for a small coconut. This idea remains in the native's mind in a vague, indefinite, undifferentiated form, and any attempt to elicit a more detailed definition by asking him such questions, as to whether the Kapuana is a material object or not, would be to smuggle our own categories into his belief, where they do not exist. The Kapuana is anyhow believed to be the something which in the nightly flights leaves the body of the Yoyova and assumes the various forms in which the Molokwazi appears. Another variant of the belief about the Yoyova is, that those who know their magic especially well, can fly themselves, bodily transporting themselves through the air. But it can never be sufficiently emphasized that all these beliefs cannot be treated as consistent pieces of knowledge, they flow into one another, and even the same native probably holds several views rationally inconsistent with one another. Even their terminology, compare the last division of the foregoing chapter, cannot be taken as implying a strict distinction or definition. Thus, the word Yoyova is applied to the woman as we meet her in the village, and the word Molokwazi will be used when we see something suspicious flying through the air. But it would be incorrect to systematize this use into a sort of doctrine and to say, an individual woman is conceived as consisting of an actual living personality called Yoyova, and of an immaterial, spiritual principle called Molokwazi, which in its potential form is the Kapuana. In doing this we would do much what the medieval scholastics did to the living faith of the early ages. The native feels and fears his belief rather than formulates it clearly to himself. He uses terms and expressions, and thus, as used by him, we must collect them as documents of belief, but abstain from working them out into a consistent theory, for this represents neither the native's mind nor any other form of reality. As we remember from, the flying witches are a nefarious agency, second in importance to the Boagayu, male sorcerer, but in efficiency far more deadly even than he himself. In contrast to the Boagayu, who is simply a man in possession of a special form of magic, the Yoyova have to be gradually initiated into their status. Only a small child, whose mother is a witch, can become a witch herself. When a witch gives birth to a female child, she medicates a piece of obsidian, and cuts off the navel string. The navel string is then buried, with the recital of a magical formula, in the house, and not, as is done in all ordinary cases, in the garden. Soon after, the witch will carry her daughter to the sea beach, utter a spell over some brine in a coconut cup, and give the child to drink. After that, the child is submerged in water and washed, a kind of witch's baptism. Then she brings back the baby into the house, utters a spell over a mat, and folds her up in it. At night, she carries the baby through the air, and goes to a trysting place of other Yoyova, where she presents her child ritually to them. In contrast to the usual custom of young mothers of sleeping over a small fire, a sorceress lies with her baby in the cold. As the child grows up, the mother will take it into her arms and carry it through the air on her nightly rounds. Entering girlhood at the age when the first grass skirt is put on a maiden, the little perspective which will begin to fly herself. Another system of training, running side by side with flying, consists in accustoming the child to participation in human flesh. Even before the growing witch will begin to fly on her own account, the mother will take her to the ghoulish repasts, where she and other witches sit over a corpse, eating its eyes, tongue, lungs, and entrails. There the little girl receives her first share of corpse flesh, and trains her taste to like this diet. There are other forms of training ascribed to mothers solicitous that their daughters should grow up into efficient Yoyova and Molokwazi. At night the mother will stand on one side of the hut, with the child in her hands, and throw the little one over the roof. Then quickly, with the speed only possible to a Yoyova, she will move round, and catch the child on the other side. This happens before the child begins to fly, and is meant to accustom it to passing rapidly through the air. Or again, the child will be held by her feet, head down, and remain in this position while the mother utters a spell. Thus gradually, by all these means, the child acquires the powers and tastes of a yoyova. It is easy to pick out such girls from other children. They will be recognizable by their crude tastes, and more especially by their habit of eating raw flesh of pigs or uncooked fish. And here we come to a point, 
where mythical superstition plays over into something more real, for I have been assured by reliable informants, and those not only natives, that there are cases of girls who will show a craving for raw meat. And when a pig is being quartered in the village will drink its blood and tear up its flesh. These statements I never could verify by direct observations, and they may be only the result of very strong belief projecting its own realities, as we see on every side in our own society in miraculous cures, spiritistic phenomena, etc., etc. If, however, the eating of raw flesh by girl children really occurs, this simply means that they play up to what they know is said and believed about them. This again is a phenomenon of social psychology met with in many phases of Trobrian society and in our own. This does not mean that the character of a Yoyova is publicly donned. Indeed, though a man often owns up to the fact that he is a Bwagayu, and treats his speciality quite openly in conversation, a woman will never directly confess to being a Yoyova, not even to her own husband. But she will certainly be marked by everyone as such a one, and she will often play up to the role, for it is always an advantage to be supposed to be endowed with supernatural powers. And moreover, being a sorceress is also a good source of income. A woman will often receive presents with the understanding that such and such a person has to be injured. She will openly take gifts, avowedly in payment for healing someone who has been hurt by another witch. Thus the character of a Yoyova is, in a way, a public one, and the most important and powerful witches will be enumerated by name. But no woman will ever openly speak about being one. Of course to have such a character would in no way spoil matrimonial chances, or do anything but enhance the social status of a woman. So deep is the belief in the efficacy of magic, and in magic being the only means of acquiring extraordinary faculties, that all powers of a yoyova are attributed to magic. As we saw in the training of a young yoyova, magic has to be spoken at every stage in order to impart to her the character of a witch. A full-blown yoyova has to utter special magic each time she wishes to be invisible, or when she wants to fly, or acquire higher speed, or penetrate darkness and distance in order to find out whether an accident is happening there. But like everything referring to this form of witchcraft, these formulae never come to light. Although I was able to acquire a whole body of spells of the Boisvieu sorcery, I could not even lift the fringe of the impenetrable veil, surrounding the magic of the Yoyova. As a matter of fact, there is not the slightest doubt for me that not one single rite, not one single word of this magic, have ever existed. Once a Molokwazi is fully trained in her craft, she will often go at night to feed on corpses or to destroy shipwrecked mariners, for these are her two main pursuits. By a special sense, acquired through magic, she can hear, as the natives say, that a man has died at such and such a place, or that a canoe is in danger. Even a young apprentice Yoyova will have her hearing so sharpened that she will tell her mother, Mother, I hear, they cry. Which means that a man is dead or dying at some place. Or she will say, Mother, a waga is sinking. And then they both will fly to the spot. When she goes out on such an errand, the yoyova leaves her body behind. Then she climbs a tree, and reciting some magic, she ties a creeper to it. Then, she flies off, along this creeper, which snaps behind her. This is the moment when we see the fire flying through the sky. Whenever the natives see a falling star, they know it is a Molokwazi on her flight. Another version is that, when a Molokwazi recites a certain spell, a tree which stands somewhere near her destination bends down towards the other tree on which she is perched. She jumps from one top to the other, and it is then that we see the fire. According to some versions, the Molokwazi, that is, the witch in her flying state, moves about naked, leaving her skirt round the body, which remains asleep in the hut. Other versions depict her as tying her skirt tightly round her when flying, and beating her buttocks with a magical pandanus streamer. These latter versions are embodied in the magic quoted above in. Arrived at the place where lies the corpse, the Molokwazi, with others who have also flown to the spot, perches on some high object, the top of a tree or the gable of a hut. There they all wait till they can feast on the corpse, and such is their greed and appetite that they are also very dangerous to living men. 
People who collect round the dead body to mourn and wake over it often have a special spell against the Mulaquazi recited over them, by the one who knows it. They are careful not to stray away from the others, and, during burial of the dead and afterwards, they believe the air to be infested with these dangerous witches, who spread the smell of carrion around them. The Mulaquazi will eat out the eyes, the tongue, and the insides lopla, of the corpse, when they attack a living man they may simply hit him or kick him, and then he becomes more or less sick. But sometimes they get hold of an individual and treat him like a corpse and eat some of his organs, and then the man dies. It is possible to diagnose this, for such a person would quickly fail, losing his speech, his vision, sometimes suddenly being bereft of all power of movement. It is a less dangerous method to the living man when the Mulaquazi instead of eating his insides on the spot, simply remove them. They hide them in a place only known to themselves, in order to have provision for a future feast. In that case there is some hope for the victim. Another Yoyova, summoned quickly by the relations of the dying and well paid by them, will, in the form of a Mulaquazi, go forth, search for the missing organs, and, if she is fortunate enough to find and restore them, save the life of the victim. Kenaria, the favorite daughter of Tulawa, the chief of Omarakana, while on a visit to another village, was deprived of her internal organs by the Molokwazi. When brought home, she could neither move nor speak, and lay down as if dead. Her mother and other relatives already began their mortuary wailing over her, the chief himself broke out into loud lamentations. But nevertheless, as a forlorn hope, they sent for a woman from Wawela, a well-known Yoyova, who after receiving valuables and food, flew out as a Molokwazi, and the very next night found Kenaria's inside somewhere in the Rabwag. Near the beach of Kalakuba, and restored her to health. Another authentic story is that of the daughter of a Greek trader and a Kirawinian woman from Aburaku. This story was told me by the lady herself, in perfectly correct English, learnt in one of the white settlements of New Guinea, where she had been brought up in the house of a leading missionary. But the story was not spoilt by any skepticism. It was told with perfect simplicity and conviction. When she was a little girl, a woman called Suawela, from the island of Kideva, but married to a man of Wawela, came to her parents' house and wanted to sell a mat. They did not buy it, and gave her only a little food, which, as she was a renowned Yoyova and accustomed therefore to deferential treatment, made her angry. When night came, the little one was playing on the beach in front of the house, when the parents saw a big firefly hovering about the child. The insect then flew round the parents and went into the room. Seeing that there was something strange about the firefly, they called the girl and put her to bed at once. But she fell ill immediately, could not sleep all night, and the parents, with many native attendants, had to keep watch over her. Next morning, added the Kirawinian mother, who was listening to her daughter telling me the tale, the girl, Boje Karij, Cucula Walla Epipisai, she was dead already, but her heart was still beating. All the women present broke out into the ceremonial lamentations. The father of the girl's mother, however, went to Wawela, and got hold of another Yoyova, called Bamramwari. She took some herbs and smeared her own body all over. Then she went out in the form of a Molokwazi in search of the girl's Lopolo, inside. She searched about and found it in the hut of Suawela, where it lay on the shelf on which are kept the big clay pots, in which the mona, taro pudding, is cooked ceremonially. There it lay, red as calico. Suawela had left it there, while she went into the garden with her husband, meaning to eat it on her return. Had this happened, the girl could not have been saved. As soon as Bamramwari found it, she made some magic over it then and there. Then she came back to the trader's compound, made some more magic over ginger root and water, and caused the lopolo to return to its place. After that, the little girl soon got better. A substantial payment was given by the parents to the Yoyova for saving their child. Living in Abiraku, a village on the southern half of Boyowa, I was on the boundary between the district where the Yoyova do not exist, and the other one, to the east, where they are plentiful. On the other side of the island, which is very narrow at this part, is the village of Wawela, where almost every woman is reputed to be a witch, and some are quite notorious. Going over the Rabwag at night, 
the natives of Aburaku would point out certain fireflies which would suddenly disappear, not to relight again. These were the Molokwazi. Again, at night, swarms of flying foxes used to flap over the tall trees, making for the big, swampy island of Boimapoyu which closes in the lagoon opposite the village. These two were Molokwazi, traveling from the east, their real home. They also used to perch on the tops of the trees growing on the water's edge, and this was therefore an especially dangerous spot after sunset. I was often warned not to sit there on the platforms of the beached canoes, as I liked to do, watching the play of colors on the smooth, muddy waters, and on the bright mangroves. When I fell ill soon after, everybody decided that I had been kicked by the Molokwazi, and some magic was performed over me by my friend Malalakwa, the same who gave me some formulae of Kegayu, the magic spoken at sea against witches. In this case his efforts were entirely successful, and my quick recovery was attributed by the natives solely to the spells. 2. What interests us most about Molokwazi, is their association with the sea and shipwreck. Very often they will roam over the sea, and meet at a trysting place on a reef. There they will partake of a special kind of coral, broken off from a reef, a kind called by the natives nada. This whets their appetite for human flesh, exactly as the drinking of salt water does with the Bwagayu. They have also some indirect power over the elements in the sea. Although the natives do not quite agree on the point, there is no doubt that a definite connection exists between the Molokwazi and all the other dangers which may be met in the sea, such as sharks, the gaping depth, Ikapwajega Wiwatu. Many of the small sea animals, crabs, some of the shells and the other things to be mentioned presently, all of which are considered to be the cause of death of drowning men. Thus the belief is quite definite that, in being cast into the water by the shipwreck, men do not meet any real danger except by being eaten by the Molokwazi, the sharks, and the other animals. If by the proper magic these influences can be obviated, the drowning men will escape unscathed. The belief in the omnipotence of man, or rather, woman in this case, and of the equal power in antidoting by magic, governs all the ideas of these natives about shipwreck. The supreme remedy and insurance against any dangers lies in the magic of mist, called kegayu, which, side by side with kula magic, and the magic of the canoes, is the third of the indispensable magical equipments of a sailor. A man who knows well the Kegayu is considered to be able to travel safely through the most dangerous seas. A renowned chief, Maniyua, who was reputed as one of the greatest masters in Kegayu as well as in other magic, died in Dobu on an expedition about two generations ago. His son, Maradayana, had learned his father's Kegayu. Although the Molokwazi are extremely dangerous in the presence of a corpse, and though the natives would never dream of putting a dead body on a canoe, and thus multiplying the probabilities of an attack by the witches, still, Maradayana. Trusting to his Kegayu, brought the corpse back to Boyawa without mishap. This act, a testimony to the daring sailor's great prowess, and to the efficiency of the Kegayu magic, is kept alive in the memory and tradition of the natives. One of my informants, boasting of his Kegayu, told me how once, on a return from Dobu, he performed his rites. Such a mist arose as a consequence of it that the rest of the canoes lost their way, and arrived in the island of Kelola. Indeed, if we can speak of a belief being alive, that is, of having a strong hold over human imagination, the belief in the danger from Molokwazi at sea is emphatically such a one. In times of mental stress, in times of the slightest danger at sea, or when a dying or dead person is near, the natives at once respond emotionally in terms of this belief. No one could live among these natives, speaking their language, and following their tribal life, without constantly coming up against the belief in Molokwazi, and in the efficiency of the Kegayu. As in all other magic, also here, there are various systems of Kegayu, that is, there are various formulae, slightly differing in their expressions, though usually similar in their fundamental wordings and in certain key expressions. In each system, there are two main types of spells, the Jayatanawa, or the Kegayu of the underneath, and the Jairokewa, or the Kegayu of the above. The first one usually consists of a short formula or formulae spoken over some stones and some lime in a lime pot and over some ginger root. 
This Jayatanawa, as its name indicates, is magic directed against the evil agencies, awaiting the drowning men from below. It spells close up the gaping depth and they screen off the shipwrecked men from the eyes of the sharks. They also protect them from the other evil things, which cause the death of a man in drowning. The several little sea worms found on the beach, the crabs, the poisonous fish, Saka, and the spiky fish, Baibaai, as well as the jumping stones, whether Vinilida or Nuwakakapaki, are all warded off and blinded by the Jayatanawa. Perhaps the most extraordinary belief in this connection is that the Tequalu, the carved human figures on the prow boards, the Gawaya, the semi-human effigy on the mast top, as well as the canoe ribs would eat the drowning men if not magically treated. The Kagyu of the above, the Gyro Kewa, consists of long spells, recited over some ginger root, on several occasions before sailing, and during bad weather or shipwreck. They are directed exclusively against the Molokwazi, and form therefore the more important class of the two. These spells must never be recited at night, as then the Molokwazi could see and hear the man, and make his magic inefficient. Again, the spell of the above, when recited at sea, must be spoken so that the magician is not covered with spray, for if his mouth were wet with sea water, the smell would attract rather than disperse, the flying witches. The man who knows the kegayu must also be very careful at meal times. Children may not speak, play about, or make any noise while he eats, nor should anyone go round him behind his back while he is thus engaged. Nor may they point out anything with the finger. Should the man be thus disturbed during his food, he would have to stop eating at once, and not resume it till the next meal time. Now the leading idea of Kegayu is that it produces some sort of mist. The Molokwazi who follow the canoe, the sharks and live stones which lie in wait for it, the depth with all its horror, and the debris of the canoe ready to harm the owner, all these are blinded by the mist that arises in obedience to these spells. Thus the paralyzing effect of these two main forms of magic and the specialized sphere of influence of each of them, are definite and clear dogmas of native belief. But here again we must not try to press the interpretation of these dogmas too far. Some sort of mist covers the eyes of all the evil agencies or blinds them, it makes the natives invisible from them. But to ask whether the Kegayu produces a real mist, visible also to man, or only a supernatural one, visible only to the Molokwazi, or whether it simply blinds their eyes so that they see nothing, would be asking too much. The same native who will boast of having produced a real mist, so great that it led astray his companions, will next day perform the Kegayu in the village during a burial, and affirm that the Molokwazi are in a mist. Though obviously a perfectly clear atmosphere surrounds the whole proceedings. The natives will tell how, sailing on a windy but clear day, after a kegayu has been recited into the eye of the wind, they hear the shrieks of the Molokwazi, who, losing their companions in the scent of the trail, hail one another in the dark. Again, some expressions seem to represent the view that it is mainly an action on the eyes of the witches. Ida dubula matala Molokwazi, it darkens the eyes of the Molokwazi, or Igwiyagweu, it blinds, the natives will say. And when asked, What do the Molokwazi see, then, they will answer, they will see mist only. They do not see the places, they do not see the men, only mist. Thus here, as in all cases of belief, there is a certain latitude, within which the opinions and views may vary, and only the broad outline, which surrounds them, is definitely fixed by tradition, embodied in ritual. And expressed by the phraseology of magical formulae or by the statements of a myth. I have thus defined the manner in which the natives face the dangers of the sea. We have found, that the fundamental conceptions underlying this attitude are, that in shipwreck, men are entirely in the hands of the witches, and that from this, only their own magical defense can save them. This defense consists in the rites and formulae of the Kegayu, of which we have also learnt the leading principles. Now, a consecutive description must be given of how this magic is performed when a Talawaga sets out on an expedition. And following up this expedition, it must be told how the natives imagine a shipwreck, and what they believe the behavior of the shipwrecked party would be. 3. I shall give this narrative in a consecutive manner, 
as it was told to me by some of the most experienced and renowned Trobriand sailors in Sinekita, Abiraku, and Omerkana. We can imagine that exactly such a narrative would be told by a veteran Talawaga to his Usagilu on the beach of Yakum, as our Kula party sit round the camp fires at night. One of the old men, well known for the excellence of his Kegayu, and boastful of it, would tell his story, entering minutely into all the details, however often the others might have heard about them before. Or even assisted at the performance of his magic. He would then proceed to describe, with extreme realism, and dwelling graphically on every point, the story of a shipwreck, very much as if he had gone through one himself. As a matter of fact, no one alive at present has had any personal experience of such a catastrophe, though many have lived through frequent narrow escapes in stormy weather. Based on this, and on what they have heard themselves of the tradition of shipwrecks, natives will tell the story with characteristic vividness. Thus, the account given below is not only a summary of native belief, it is an ethnographic document in itself, representing the manner in which such type of narrative would be told over camp fires. The same subject being over and over again repeated by the same man, and listened to by the same audience, exactly as we, when children, or the peasants of Eastern Europe, will hearken to familiar fairy tales and merkin. The only deviation here from what would actually take place in such a storytelling, is the insertion of magical formulae into the narrative. The speaker might indeed repeat his magic, were he speaking in broad daylight, in his village, to a group of close kinsmen and friends. But being on a small island in the middle of the ocean, and at night, the recital of spells would be a taboo of the kegayu. Nor would a man ever recite his magic before a numerous audience, except on certain occasions at mortuary vigils, where people are expected to chant their magic aloud before hundreds of listeners. Returning then again to our group of sailors, who sit under the stunted pandanus trees of Yakum, let us listen to one of the companions of the daring Maradiana, now dead, to one of the descendants of the great Maniua. He will tell us how, early in the morning, on the day of departure from Sinekita, or sometimes on the next morning, when they leave Moa, he performs the first rite of Kegayu. Wrapping up a piece of leia, wild ginger root, in a bit of dried banana leaf, he chants over it the long spell of the gyro kewa, the kegayu of the above. He chants this spell into the leaf, holding it cup-shaped, with the morsel of ginger root at the bottom, so that the spell might enter into the substance to be medicated. After that, the leaf is immediately wrapped round, so as to imprison the magical virtue, and the magician ties the parcel round his left arm, with a piece of bast or string. Sometimes he will medicate two bits of ginger and make two parcels, of which the other will be placed in a string necklet and carried on his breast. Our narrator, who is the master of one of the canoes, will probably not be the only one within the circle round the camp fire, who carries these bundles of medicated ginger. For though a Talawaga must always perform this rite as well as know all the other magic of shipwreck, as a rule several of the older members of his crew also know it, and have also prepared their magical bundles. This is one of the spells of the gyro kewa, such as the old man said over the ginger root. Gyro kewa number one, Leia Kegayu. I will befog Muyua. Repeat it. I will befog Misima. Repeat it. The mist springs up. The mist makes them tremble. I befog the front, I shut off the rear, I befog the rear, I shut off the front. I fill with mist, mist springs up, I fill with mist, the mist which makes them tremble. This is the opening part of the formula, very clear, and easy to be translated. The mist is magically invoked, the word for mist being repeated with several verbal combinations, in a rhythmic and alliterative manner. The expression tremble, misizi, refers to a peculiar belief, that when a sorcerer or sorceress approaches the victim, and this man paralyzes them with a counter spell, they lose their bearings, and stand there trembling. The main part of this spell opens up with the word agayu, I befog, which, like all such leading words of a spell is first of all intoned in a long, drawn-out chant, and then quickly repeated with a series of words. Then the word agayu is replaced by agayu sulu, I befog, lead astray, which in its turn makes way for agayu boda, I befog, shut off. 
The list of words repeated in succession with each of these three expressions is a long one. It is headed by the words, the eyes of the witches. Then, the eyes of the sea crab. Then, always with the word eyes, the animals, worms and insects which threaten drowning men in the sea, are enumerated. After they are exhausted, the various parts of the body are repeated, then finally, a long list of villages is recited, preceded by the word agayu, forming phrases such as, I befog the eyes of the women of Wawela, etc. Let us reconstruct a piece of this middle part in a consecutive manner. I befog. I befog, I befog, the eyes of the witches. I befog the eyes of the little crabs. I befog the eyes of the hermit crab. I befog the eyes of the insects on the beach. Etc. I befog the hand, I befog the foot, I befog the head. I befog the shoulders, etc. I befog the eyes of the women of Wawela, I befog the eyes of the women of Colossi. I befog the eyes of the women of Kumalabwaga, I befog the eyes of the women of Vakuta, etc., etc. I befog, lead astray, the eyes of the witches, I befog, lead astray the eyes of the little crab, etc. I befog, shut off the eyes of the witches, I befog, shut off the eyes of the little crab, etc., etc. It can easily be seen how long drawn such a spell is, especially as in this middle part, the magician will often come back to where he has started, and repeat the leading word over and over again with the others. Indeed, this can be taken as a typical tapwana, or middle part, of a long spell, where the leading words are, so to speak, well rubbed into the various other expressions. One feature of this middle part is remarkable, namely, that the beings from below, the crabs, the sea insects and worms are invoked, although the spell is one of the gyro kewa type, the magic of the above. This is an inconsistency frequently met with, a contradiction between the ideas embodied in the spell, and the theory of the magic, as explicitly formulated by the informants. The parts of the body enumerated in the tapwana refer to the magician's own person, and to his companions in the canoe. By this part of the spell, he surrounds himself and all his companions with mist, which makes them invisible to all the evil influences. After the long tapwana has been recited, there follows the last part, which, however, is not chanted in this case, but spoken in a low, persuasive, tender voice. I hit thy flanks, I fold over thy mat, thy bleached mat of pandanus. I shall make it into thy mantle. I take thy sleeping doba, grass skirt, I cover thy loins, remain there, snore within thy house. I alone myself, here the reciter's name is uttered, I shall remain in the sea, I shall swim. This last part throws some interesting sidelights on native belief in Molokwazi. We see here the expression of the idea that the body of the witch remains in the house, whilst she herself goes out on her nefarious errand. Malalakwa, the magician of Abiraku who gave me this spell, said in commentary to this last part. The Yoyova casts off her body, Inini Waola, which really means, peels off her skin, she lies down and sleeps, we hear her snoring. Her covering, Kapolila that is, her outward body, her skin, remains in the house, and she herself flies, Titalila Biova. Her skirt remains in the house, she flies naked. When she meets men, she eats us. In the morning, she puts on her body, and lies down in her hut. When we cover her loins with the doba, she cannot fly any more. This last sentence refers to the magical act of covering, as expressed in the last part of the spell. Here we find another variant of belief as to the nature of the Molokwazi, to be added to those mentioned before. Previously we met the belief of the disassociation of the woman into the part that remains, and the part that flies. But here the real personality is located in the flying part, whereas what remains is the covering. To imagine the Molokwazi, the flying part, as a sending, in the light of this belief, would not be correct. In general, such categories as agent, and sending, or as real self and emanation, etc., etc., can be applied to native belief as rough approximations only, and the exact definition should be given in terms of native statement. The final sentence of this spell, 
containing the wish to remain alone in the sea, to be allowed to swim and drift, is a testimony to the belief that without Molokwazi, there is no danger to a man adrift on a piece of wreckage among the foaming waves of a stormy sea. After reciting this lengthy spell, the Talawaga, as he tells us in his narrative, has had to perform another rite, this time, over his lime pot. Taking out the stopper of rolled palm leaf and plated fiber from the baked and decorated gourd in which he keeps his lime, he utters another spell of the Jairokewa cycle. Jairokewa number 2, Pwaka Kegiyu. There on Muroa, I arise, I stand up. Iwa, Sawadapa, at the head, I rumble, I disperse. Kasabwebwerida, name Dili, Taburitalu, Tabwebwiso, Tauvayu, Boabwayu, Razaresa. They are lost, they disappear. This beginning, full of archaic expressions, implicit meanings and allusions and personal names, is very obscure. The first words refer probably to the headquarters of sorcery, Muroa, or Murua, Woodlark Island, IWA, Sawadapa. The long list of personal names following afterwards contains some mythical ones, like Kasabwe Warida, and some others, which I cannot explain, though the words Tabwebwiso, Tauviu, and Boabwiu suggest that this is a list in which some sorcerers' names figure. As a rule, in such spells, a list of names signifies that all those who have used and handed down this formula, are enumerated. In some cases the people mentioned are frankly mythical heroes. Sometimes a few mythical names are chanted, and then comes a string of actual people, forming a sort of pedigree of the spell. If these in this spell are ancestor names they all refer to mythical personalities, and not to real ancestors. The last words contained an expression typical of the Kegiyu. Then comes the middle part. I arise, I escape from Barayu, I arise, I escape from Yoyova. I arise, I escape from Molokwazi. I arise, I escape from Baoyu, etc. Repeating the leading words, I arise, I escape from, with the words used to describe the flying witches in the various surrounding districts. Thus the word Barayu comes from Muyawa, Woodlark Island, where it describes the sorceress, and not, as in other Ma Sim districts, a male sorcerer. The words Yoyova, Molokwazi need no explanation. Baoyu is an emphleton word. Words from Dobu, Tube Tube, etc., follow. Then the whole period is repeated, adding eyes of in the middle of each phrase, so that it runs. I arise, I escape from the eyes of the Barayu. I arise, I escape from the eyes of the Yoyova, etc. The leading words, I arise, I escape from, are then replaced by, they wander astray, which, again, make way to, the sea is cleared off. This whole middle part of the spell is clear, and needs no commentary. Then comes the concluding period, Dogaina. I am a Manuturi, small bird, I am a Kitakiti, small sea bird, I am a floating log, I am a piece of seaweed, I shall produce mist till it encloses all, I shall befog, I shall shut off with fog. Mist, enveloped in mist, dissolving in mist am I, clear is the sea, the Molokwazi are, straying in mist. This part also needs no special commentary. This is again a long spell of the Jairokewa type, that is, directed against the Molokwazi, and in this the spell is consistent, for the Molokwazi alone are invoked in the middle period. After the spell has been chanted into the lime pot, this is well stoppered, and not open till the end of the journey. It must be noted that these two Jairokewa spells have been spoken by our Talawaga in the village or on Moa beach, and in daytime. For, as said above, it is a taboo to utter them in the night or at sea. From the moment he has spoken these two spells, both medicated substances, the ginger root and the lime in the lime pot, remain near him. He has also in the canoe some stones of those brought from the koya, and called by Nabana, in distinction to the dead coral, which is called dakuna. Over these stones, at the moment of the occurrence of danger, a spell of the underneath, a jayatanawa will be recited. The following is a formula of this type, short as they always are. Jayatanawa number 1, Dakuna Kegiyu. Man, bachelor, woman, young girl, woman, young girl, man, 
bachelor. Traces, traces obliterated by cobwebs, traces, obliterated by turning up, the material in which they were left, I press, I close down. Sharks of Dukatabuya, I press, I close down, sharks of Kadoaga, I press, I close down, etc., the sharks of Moa, Galia, Banari, and Kalakoki being invoked in turn. All these words are names of marked parts of the sea, in and around the Trobriand Lagoon. The formula ends up with the following peroration, I press down thy neck, I open up thy passage of Kiowa, I kick thee down, O shark. Duck down under water, shark. Die, shark, die away. The commentary to the opening sentences given by my informant, Malalakwa of Aburaku, was. This magic is taught to people when they are quite young. Hence the mention of young people. The obliterating of traces will be made clearer by the account which follows, in which we shall see that to obliterate traces, to put off the scent the shark and Molokwazi are the main concerns of the shipwrecked party. The middle part refers to sharks only, and so does the peroration. The passage of Kiowa near Tuma is mentioned in several types of magical exorcisms, when the evil influence is being banished. This passage lies between the main island and the island of Tuma, and leads into the unknown regions of the northwestern seas. It will be best to quote here another formula of the Jayatanawa type, and a very dramatic one. For this is the formula spoken at the critical moment of shipwreck. At the moment when the sailors decide to abandon the craft and to plunge into the sea, the Talawaga stands up in the canoe, and slowly turning round so as to throw his words towards all four winds. Intones in a loud voice this spell. Jayatanawa no. 2. Foam, foam, breaking wave, wave. I shall enter into the breaking wave, I shall come out from behind it. I shall enter from behind into the wave, and I shall come out in its breaking foam. Mist, gathering mist, encircling mist, surround, surround me. Mist, gathering mist, encircling mist, surround, surround me, my mast. Mist, gathering mist, etc., surround me, the nose of my canoe. Mist, etc., surround me, my sail. Mist, etc. Surround me, my steering oar. Mist, etc., surround me, my rigging. Mist, etc., surround me, my platform. And so on, enumerating one after the other all the parts of the canoe and its accessories. Then comes the final part of the spell. I shut off the skies with mist, I make the sea tremble with mist, I close up your mouth, sharks, banubanu, small worms, jinnaquadu, other worms. Go underneath and we shall swim on top. Little is needed as a commentary to this magic. Its beginning is very clear, and singularly well depicts the situation in which it is uttered. The end refers directly to the primary aim of the magic, to the warding off of the underneath, of the dangerous animals in the sea. The only ambiguity refers to the middle part, where the magical leading words of enveloping by mist are associated with a list of names of the parts of the canoe. I am not certain whether this is to be interpreted, in the sense that the Talawaga wants to surround his whole canoe with mist so that it may not be seen by the sharks, etc. Or whether, on the contrary, just on the verge of abandoning his canoe, and anxious to cut himself off from its various parts which may turn on him and eat him, he therefore wants to surround each of them with mist so that it may be blinded. The latter interpretation fits the above-quoted belief that certain parts of the canoe, especially the carved human figures on the prow board and the mast, the ribs of the canoe, and certain other parts of its construction. Eat the shipwrecked men. But again, in this spell, there are enumerated not certain parts, but every part, and that undoubtedly is not consistent with this belief, so the question must remain open. 4. I have anticipated some of the events of the consecutive narrative of shipwreck, in order to give the two last mentioned magical formulae first, and not to have to interrupt the tale of our Talawaga, to which we now return. We left it at the point where, having said his first two Kegayu formulae over the ginger and into the lime pot, he embarks, keeping these two things handy, and putting some binabana stones within his reach. From here, his narrative becomes more dramatic. 
he describes the approaching storm. Narrative of Shipwreck and Salvage The canoe sails fast, the wind rises, big waves come, the wind booms, do 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 do. The sails flutter. The lamina, outrigger, rises high. All the usagula crouch on the lamina. I speak magic to calm the wind. The big spell of the simsim. They know all about Yavada, northwesterly monsoon wind. They live in the eye of the Yavada. The wind abates not, not a little bit. It booms, it gains strength, it booms loud do 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 all the Usagilu are afraid. The Mulaquazi scream, you you, you you, you you, you, their voices are heard in the wind. With the wind they scream and come flying. The viva, sheet rope, is torn from the hands of the Tokaban Aviva. The sail flutters freely in the wind, it is torn away. It flies far into the sea, it falls on the waters. The waves break over the canoe. I stand up. I take the Binabana stones. I recite the Kegiyu over them, the Jayatanawa, the spell of the underneath. The short spell, the very strong spell. I throw the stones into the deep. They weigh down the sharks, the vinilida, they close the gaping depth. The fish cannot see us. I stand up, I take my lime pot, I break it. The lime I throw into the wind. It wraps us up in mist. Such a mist that no one can see us. The Mulaquazi lose sight of us. We hear them shout nearby. They shout you you, you you, you you, you. The sharks, the Banubanu, the Saka do not see us, the water is turbid. The canoe is swamped, the water is in it. It drifts heavily, the waves break over us. We break the Vatatua, the sticks joining the float to the platform. The lamina, outrigger float, is severed, we jump from the waga, we catch hold of the lamina. On the lamina we drift. I utter the great Kateria spell, the big fish Iraviyaka comes. It lifts us. It takes the lamina on its back, and carries us. We drift, we drift, we drift. We approach a shore, the Iraviyaka brings us there, the Iraviyaka puts us on the shallows. I take a stout pole, I lift it off, I speak a spell. The Iraviyaka turns back to the deep sea. We are all on the Dayaga, fringing reef. We stand in water. The water is cold, we all shiver with cold. We do not go ashore. We are afraid of the Molokwazi. They follow us ashore. They wait for us ashore. I take a dakuna, piece of coral stone, I say a spell over it. I throw the stone on the beach, it makes a big thud, good, the Molokwazi are not there. We go ashore. Another time, I throw a stone, we hear nothing, Molokwazi are on the beach. They catch it, we hear nothing. We remain on the Dayaga. I take some Leia, ginger. I spit it at the beach. I throw another stone. The Molokwazi do not see it. It falls down, we hear it. We go ashore, we sit on the sand in a row. We sit in one row, one man near another, as on the lamina, in the same order as they drifted on the lamina. I make a charm over the comb, all the Usagula comb their hair, they tease their hair a long time. They are very cold. We do not make the fire. First, I put order on the beach, I take the piece of Leia, I spit it over the beach. One time, when the Leia is finished, I take some casita leaves, the beach is always full of these. I put them on the shore, I put a stone on them, uttering a spell, afterwards, we make fire. All sit round and warm themselves at the fire. At daytime, we don't go to the village, the Molokwazi would follow us. After dark, we go. Like on the lamina, we march in the same order, one after the other. I go last, I chant a spell over a libu plant. I efface our traces. I put the libu on our track, I put the weeds together. I make the path confused. I say a charm to the spider, that he might make a cobweb. I say a charm to the bush hen, 
that she might turn up the soil. We go to the village. We enter the village, we pass the main place. No one sees us, we are in mist, we are invisible. We enter the house of my Viola, maternal kinsman, he medicates some Leia, he spits, magically, on all of us. The Mulaquazi smell us, they smell the salt water on our skins. They come to the house, the house trembles. A big wind shakes the house, we hear big thuds against the house. The owner of the house medicates the Leia and spits over us, they cannot see us. A big fire is made in the house, plenty of smoke fills the house. The Leia and the smoke blind their eyes. Five days we sit in smoke, our skin smells of smoke, our hair smells of smoke, the Molokwazi cannot smell us. Then I medicate some water and coconut, the Usagula wash and anoint themselves. They leave the house, they sit on the Kakweda, spot before the house. The owner of the house chases them away. Go, go to your wife, we all go, we return to our houses. I have given here a reconstruction of a native account, as I have often heard it told with characteristic vividness, spoken in short, jerky sentences, with onomatopoetic representations of sound, the narrative exaggerates certain features. And omits others. The excellency of the narrator's own magic, the violence of the elements at critical moments, he would always reiterate with monotonous insistence. He would diverge into some correlated subject, jump ahead, missing out several stages, come back, and so on, so that the whole is quite incoherent and unintelligible to a white listener, though the native audience follows its trend perfectly well. For it must be remembered that, when a native tells such a story, the events are already known to his listeners, who have grown up gradually becoming familiar with the narrow range of their tribal folklore. Our Talawaga, telling this story over again on the sandbank of Yakum, would dwell on such points as allowed him to boast of his kegayu, to describe the violence of the storm, to bear witness to the traditional effects of the magic. It is necessary for an ethnographer to listen several times to such a narrative, in order to have a fair chance of forming some coherent idea of its trend. Afterwards, by means of direct examination, he can succeed in placing the facts in their proper sequence. By questioning the informants about details of right and magic, it is possible then to obtain interpretations and commentaries. Thus the whole of a narrative can be constructed, the various fragments, with all their spontaneous freshness, can be put in their proper places, and this is what I have done in giving this account of shipwreck. A few words of comment must now be given on the text of the above narrative. In it, a number of magical rites were mentioned, besides those which were described first with their spells. Something must be said more in detail about the spells of the subsequent magical performances. There are some eleven of them. First comes the ritual invocation of the fish which helps the shipwrecked sailors. The spell corresponding to this, is called Kateria, and it is an important formula, which every Talawaga is supposed to know. The question arises, has this rite ever been practiced in reality? Some of the actions taken by the shipwrecked natives, such as the cutting of the the outrigger float when the boat is abandoned, are quite rational. It would be dangerous to float on the big, unwieldy canoe which might be constantly turned round and round by the waves, and if smashed to pieces, might injure the sailors with its wreckage. In this fact, perhaps there is also the empirical basis for the belief that some fragments of the canoe eat the shipwrecked men. The round, symmetrical log of the lamina, on the other hand, will serve as an excellent life buoy. Perhaps a Talawaga, arrived at such a pass, would really utter the Kateria spell. And if the party were saved, they would probably all declare, and, no doubt believe, that the fish had come to their summons, and somehow or other helped in the rescue. It is less easy to imagine what elements in such an experience might have given rise to the myth that the natives, landed on the shore, magically lift the fish from the shallow waters by means of a charmed pole. This indeed seems a purely imaginary incident, and my main informant, Malalakwa of Abiraku, from whom I obtained the Kateria spell, did not know the spell of the pole, and would have had to leave the Iravayaka to its own fate in the shallows. Nor could I hear of anyone else professing to know this spell. 
The formula uttered over the stone to be thrown on the beach was equally unknown to the circle of my informants. Of course, in all such cases, when a man carrying on a system of magic would come to a gap in his knowledge, he would perform the rite without the spell, or utter the most suitable spell of the system. Thus here, as the stone is thrown in order to reconnoiter whether the Molokwazi are waiting for them, a spell of the Jairokewa, the spell of the Molokwazi, might be uttered over the stone. Over the combs, as well as over the herbs on the beach, a Jairokewa spell would be uttered, according to my informants, but probably, a different spell from the one spoken originally over the ginger root. Malalakwa, for instance, knows two spells of the Jairokewa, both of which are suitable to be spoken over the ginger and over the beach respectively. Then there comes another spell, to be uttered over the libu plant, and in addressing the spider and the bush hen. Malalakwa told me that the same spell would be said in the three cases, but neither he, nor anyone else, among my informants could give me this spell. The magic done in the village, while the shipwrecked men remained in the smoky hut, would be all accompanied by the leia, ginger, spells. One incident in the above narrative might have struck the reader as contradictory of the general theory of the Molokwazi belief, that, namely, where the narrator declares that the party on the beach have to wait till nightfall before they enter the village. The general belief expressed in all the Molokwazi legends, as well as in the taboos of the Kagyu, is that the witches are really dangerous only at night, when they can see and hear better. Such contradictions, as I have said, are often met in native belief, and in this, by the way, the savages do not differ from ourselves. My informant, from whom I had this version, simply said that such was the rule and the custom, and that they had to wait till night. In another account, on the other hand, I was told that the party must proceed to the village immediately after having performed the several rites on the beach, whether night or day. There also arises the main question, regarding this narrative, to which allusion has been made already, namely, how far does it represent the normal behavior in shipwreck, and how far is it a sort of standardized myth? There is no doubt that shipwreck in these seas, surrounded in many parts by islands, is not unlikely to end by the parties being saved. This again would result in some such explanation as that contained in our narrative. Naturally, I tried to record all the actual cases of shipwreck within the natives' memory. Some two generations ago, one of the chiefs of Omurakana, named Namakala, perished at sea, and with him all his crew. A canoe of another eastern Trobrian village, Tilakewa, was blown far north, and stranded in Kokapua, from where it was sailed back by its crew, when the wind turned to the northwest. Although this canoe was not actually shipwrecked, its salvation is credited to Kegeyu magic, and to the kind fish, Iraviaka. A very intelligent informant of mine explained this point of view in answer to some of my cavillings, if this canoe had been wrecked, it would have been saved also. A party from Muyawa, Woodlark Island, were saved on the shore of Boyawa. In the south of the island, Several cases are on record where canoes were wrecked and saved in the D'Entrecastos Islands or in the Amphlets. Once the whole crew were eaten by cannibals, getting ashore in a hostile district of Ferguson Island, and one man only escaped, and ran along the shore, southeastwards towards Dobu. Thus there is a certain amount of historical evidence for the saving power of the magic, and the mixture of fanciful and real elements makes our story a good example of what could be called standardized or universalist myth that is. A myth referring not to one historical event but to a type of occurrence, happening universally. v. Let us now give the text of the remaining spells which belong to the above narrative, but have not been adduced there, so as not to spoil its flow. First of all there is the Kateria spell, that which the Talawaga, drifting alongside his crew on the detached canoe float, intones in a loud, slow voice, in order to attract the ear of Iaka. Kateria spell. I lie, I shall lie down in my house, a big house. I shall sharpen my ear, I shall hear the roaring of the sea, it foams up, it makes a noise. At the bottom of Kausabii, come, lift me, take me, bring me to the top of Nabanabwana beach. Then comes a sentence with mythological allusions which I could not succeed in translating. After that follows the main part of the spell. The suyasay of fish shall lift me up, my child, 
the Suyaseu shall lift me up. My child's things, the Suyaseu shall lift me up, my basket, etc., my lime pot, etc., my lime spoon, etc., my house, etc. Repeating the words, the Suyaseu fish shall lift me up, with various expressions describing the Talawaga's equipment as well as his child, presumably a member of the shipwrecked crew. There is no end part to this spell, as it was given to me. Only the beginning is repeated after the main part. It is not impossible that Malalakwa himself, my informant, did not know the spell to the end. Such magic, once learnt by a native, never used, and recited perhaps once a year during a mortuary ceremony, or occasionally, in order to show off, is easily forgotten. There is a marked difference between the vacillating and uncertain way in which such spells are produced by informants, and the wonderful precision and the easy flow with which, for example, the spells, year after year performed in public, will trip off the tongue of the garden magician. I cannot give a correct commentary to the mythological names Kausabii and Nabanabwana, in the first part of the spell. What this part means, whether the reclining individual who hears the noises of the sea is the magician, or whether it represents the sensations of the fish who hears the calling for help, I could not make out. The meaning of the middle part is plain, however. Suyaseu is another name for Iraviyaka, indeed, its magical name used only in spells, and not when speaking of it in ordinary conversations. The other formula to be given here is the other Jairokewa spell, which would be used in spitting the ginger on the beach after rescue, and also in medicating the herbs, which will be put on the beach and beaten with a stone. This spell is associated with the myth of the origin of Kegayu, which must be related here, to make the formula clear. Near the beginning of time, there lived in Kwaiwata, one of the Marshall Bennets, a family strange to our ideas of family life, but quite natural in the world of Kirawinian mythology. It consisted of a man, Kala Atedu, his sister, Isinadoga, and the youngest brother, a dog, Tokalabwe Doga. Like other mythological personages, their names suggest that originally they must have conveyed some sort of description. Doga means the curved, almost circular, boar's tusk used as ornament. The name of the canine member of the family might mean something like man with circular tusks in his head, and his sister's name, woman ornamented with doga. The eldest brother has in his name the word tedu, which signifies the staple food, small yams, of natives, and a verb, kalai, signifying, to put on ornaments. Not much profit, however, can be deduced from this etymology, as far as I can see, for the interpretation of this myth. I shall quote in a literal translation the short version of this myth, as I obtained it first, when the information was volunteered to me by Malalakwa in Aburaku. Myth of Tokalabwedoga. They live in Kwaiwata. One day Kalateta goes to fish, gets into a small canoe, Kyou. Behind him swims the dog. He comes to Degumanu. They fish with the older brother. They catch fish. The elder brother paddles, that one again goes behind, goes, returns to Kwaiwata. They died, came Madokiai, he learned the Kegayu, the inside of Tokalabwedoga. The name of their mother, the mother of Tokalabwedoga, is Tabunagu. This little fragment gives a good idea of what the first version is, even of so well fixed a piece of narrative as a myth. It has to be supplemented by inquiries as to the motives of the behavior of the various personages, as to the relations of one event to the other. Thus, further questions revealed that the elder brother refused to take the dog with him on this fishing expedition. Tokalabwe Doga then determined to go all the same, and swam to Degumanu, following the canoe of his brother. This latter was astonished to see him, but nonetheless they went to work together. In fishing, the dog was more successful than his brother, and thus aroused his jealousy. The man then refused to take him back. Tokalabwe Doga then jumped into the water, and again swam and arrived safely in Kwaiwata. The point of the story lies in the fact that the dog was able to do the swimming, because he knew the Kegayu, otherwise the sharks, Molokwazi, or other evil things would have eaten him. He got it from his mother, the Lady Tabunagu, who could teach him this magic because she was a Molokwazi herself. Another important point about this myth, 
also quite omitted from the first version volunteered to me, is its sociological aspect. First of all, there is the very interesting incident, unparalleled in Kirawinian tradition, the mother of the three belonged to the Luquasiziga clan. It was a most incongruous thing for a dog, who is the animal of the Lukuba clan, to be born into a Luquasiziga family. However, there he was, and so he said. Good, I shall be a Lukuba, this is my clan. Now the incident of the quarrel receives its significance in so far as the dog, the only one to whom the mother gave the kegayu, did not hand it over to his brother and sister who were of the Luquasiziga clan. And so the magic went down only the dog's own clan, the Lukuba. It must be assumed, though this was not known to my informant, that Madokiai, who learnt the magic from the dog, was also a Lukuba man. Like all mythological mother ancestresses, Tabunagu had no husband, nor does this circumstance call forth any surprise or comment on the part of the natives, since the physiological aspect of fatherhood is not known among them. As I have repeatedly observed. As can be seen, by comparing the original fragment, and the subsequent amplification by inquiries, the volunteered version misses out the most important points. The concatenation of events, the origin of the Kegayu, the important sociological details, have to be dragged out of the informant, or, to put it more correctly, he has to be made to enlarge on points. To roam over all the subjects covered by the myth, and from his statements then, one has to pick out and piece together the other bits of the puzzle. On the other hand, the names of the people, the unimportant statements of what they did and how they were occupied are unfailingly given. Let us adduce now the Kegayu, which is said to be derived from the dog, and ultimately from his mother. Kegayu of Tokalabwedoga. Tabunagu, repeated, Manamanegu, repeated, my mother a snake, myself a snake. Myself a snake, my mother a snake. Tokalabwedoga, Isanadoga, Madagagai, Kalaatetu, Bulamavayu Tabugu Madokiai. I shall befog the front, I shall shut off the rear, I shall befog the rear, I shall shut off the front. This exordium contains at first the invocation of the name of the Molokwazi, who was the source of the spell. Its pendant Manamanegu is, according to my informant, derived from an archaic word Nima, equivalent to the present-day Yama, hand. As the right hand is to the left one, so is Tabunagu to Manamanegu, which was expressed as a matter of fact in the less grammatically worded form, this right hand, this left, clapped together, so Tabunagu, Manamanegu. Whether this analysis of my informant is correct must remain an open question. It must be remembered that magic is not taken by the natives as an ethnographic document, allowing of interpretations and developments, but as an instrument of power. The words are there to act, and not to teach. Questions as to the meaning of magic, as a rule, puzzle the informants, and therefore it is not easy to explain a formula or obtain a correct commentary upon it. All the same there are some natives who obviously have tried to get to the bottom of what the various words in magic represent. To proceed with our commentary, the phrase, my mother a snake, etc. was thus explained to me by Malalakwa, supposing we strike a snake, already it vanishes, it does not remain, thus also we human beings, when Molokwazi catch us, we disappear. That is, we disappear after having spoken this magical formula, for in a formula the desired result is always expressed in anticipation. Malalakwa's description of a snake's behavior is, according to my experience, not sound natural history, but it probably expresses the underlying idea, namely the elusiveness of the snake. Which would naturally be one of the metaphorical figures used in the spell. The string of words following the invocation of the snake are all mythical names, four of which we found mentioned in the above myth, while the rest remain obscure. The last named, that of Madokiai, is preceded by the words Bulamavo Tabugu, which means, recent spirit of my ancestor, which words are as a rule used in spells with reference to real grandfathers of the reciters. The middle part of the spell proceeds. I shall cover the eyes of the witches of Kideva, I shall cover the eyes of the witches of Kumwajia, I shall cover the eyes of the witches of Iwa, I shall cover the eyes of the witches of Gawa, etc., etc. Enumerating all the villages and islands renowned for their witches. 
This list is again recited, substituting for the expression, I shall cover, in succession, I shall befog, and, do envelopes. This middle part needs no commentary. The end of this formula runs as follows. I shall kick thy body, I shall take thy spirit skirt, I shall cover thy buttocks, I shall take thy mat, a pandanus mat, I shall take thy mantle. I shall strike thee with my foot, go, fly over Tuma, fly away. I myself in the sea, here the reciter's name is mentioned, I shall drift away, well. This last part of the spell is so much alike to the end of the spell first quoted in this chapter, that no commentary is needed. The mythological and magical data presented in this chapter all bear upon the native belief in flying witches and dangers at sea, a belief in which elements of reality are strangely blended with traditionally fixed fancies, in a way, however, not uncommon to human belief in general. It is time now to return to our party on the beach at Yakum, who, after having spent the night there, next morning rig up their masts, and with a favorable wind, soon reach the waters of Gumasila and Domdom. Professor Seligman has described the belief in similar beings on the northeast coast of New Guinea. At Gelaria, inland of Bartle Bay, the flying witches can produce a double, or sending, which they call labuni. Labuni exists within women, and can be commanded by any woman who has had children. It was said that the labuni existed in, or was derived from, an organ called ipona, situated in the flank, and literally meaning egg or eggs, opposite page 640. The equivalence of beliefs here is evident. Not all the spells which I have obtained have been equally well translated and commented upon. This one, although very valuable, for it is one of the spells of the old chief Maniyua, and one which had been recited when his corpse was brought over from Dobu by his son Maradayana, was obtained early in my ethnographic career, and Gomaya. Maradayana's son, from whom I got it, is a bad commentator. Nor could I find any other competent informant later on, who could completely elucidate it for me. Such reconstructions are legitimate for an ethnographer, as well as for a historian. But it is a duty of the former as well as of the latter to show his sources as well as to explain how he has manipulated them. In one of the next chapters, a sample of this methodological aspect of the work will be given, although the full elaboration of sources and methods must be postponed to another publication. Chapter 11. In the Amphlets, Sociology of the Kula. I. Our party, sailing from the north, reach first the main island of Gumasila, a tall, steep mountain with arched lines and great cliffs, suggesting vaguely some huge Gothic monument. To the left, a heavy pyramid, the island of Dom Dom, recedes behind the nearer mountain as the travelers approach. The fleet now sails along the westerly shore of Gumasila, on which side the jungle, interspersed with bald patches, ascends a steep slope, ribbed with rocky ridges, and creased by valleys which run at their foot into wide bays. Only here and there can be seen triangular clearings, signs of cultivation made by the natives from the other side of the island, where the two villages are situated. At the southwest end of Gumasila, a narrow promontory runs into a flat, low point with a sandy beach on both sides. On the north side of the point, hidden from the villages, the fleet comes to a halt, on the beach of Jayawana, called by the Trobrianders Jayasala. This is the place where all the fleets, arriving from the north, stop before approaching the villages. Here also the inhabitants of the Amphlets rest for a day, after the first false start they have made from the villages, and before they actually set off for the Trobrians. This beach, in short, is the Amphleton counterpart of the Sandbank Moa. It was also here that I surprised the Gumasalan canoes on a full moon night, in March, 1918, after they had started to join the Uvalaku expedition to Sinekita. On this beach, the Sinekitans perform the final stage of Kula magic, before approaching their partners in Gumasila. The same magic will be repeated before arriving in Dobu, and as a matter of fact, when the objective of the big Uvalaku is Dobu, the full and ceremonial performance of the magic might usually be deferred till then. It will be better therefore to postpone the description of this magic till we have brought our fleet to the beach of Sarabuena. Here it will be enough to mention that on occasions when magic is performed, after an hour's or half-hour's pause on the beach of Jayawana, 
all the men get into their canoes, take the paddles and oars, and the fleet sails round the point where. In a small, very picturesque bay, there lies the smaller village of Gumasila, called New Agassi, c. This village in olden days was perched on a narrow ledge some 100 meters above the sea level, a fastness difficult of access, and overlooking all its approaches. Now, after the white man's influence has rendered unnecessary all precautions against raiding parties, the village has come down to the narrow strip of foreshore, a bridge between the sea and a small swamp formed at the foot of the hill. Some of the canoes will come to this beach, the others will sail further, under a precipitous black rock of some 150 meters high and 300 meters wide, c. Turning another corner, they arrive at the big village of Gumasila, built on artificial stone terraces, surrounded by dikes of small stones, forming square lagoons and diminutive harbors, compare the description given above in. This is the old village which, practically inaccessible by sea, formed a fastness of a different kind from the other, high-perched villages typical of this district. Exposed to the full onslaught of the southeasterly winds and seas, against which it was protected by its stone bulwarks and dikes, it was approachable only in all weathers by a small channel to the south, where a big rock and a reef shelter it from the rough waters. Plate XLI Scenery in the Amphlets C. Plate XLI Landing in the main village of Gumasila C. Without any preliminary welcoming ceremony or formal reception, the Sinekitan guests now leave their canoes and disperse among the villagers, settle down in groups near the houses of their friends, and engage in beetle chewing and conversations. They speak in Kirawinian, a language which is universally known in the amphlets. Almost as soon as they go ashore, they give to their partners presents of peri, opening gift, some small object, such as a comb, a lime pot, or a lime stick. After that, they await some kula gifts to be given them. The most important headman will offer such a gift first to Kutawaya, or to Yudawada, whichever of them is the Toliavalaku of the occasion. The soft, penetrating sound of a conch shell soon announces that the first gift has been given. Other blasts of conch shells follow, and the kula is in full swing. But here again, what happens in the amphlets, is only a minor interlude to the Sinekitan adventurers, bent on the bigger goal in Dobu. And in order for us to remain in harmony with the native perspective we shall also wait for the detailed and circumstantial description of the Kula proceedings till we arrive on the beach of Tuyutana, in Dobu. The concrete account of how such a visiting fleet is received and behaves on arrival will be given, when I describe a scene I saw with my own eyes in the village of Nabwajeta, another amphlet island. When sixty Dabuan canoes arrived there on their Avalaku, en route for Boyawa. To give a definite idea of the conversations which take place between the visitors and the Amphletans, I shall give a sample noted down, during a visit of some Trobrianders to New Agassi, the smaller village of Gomasila. A few canoes had arrived a day or two before, in the neighboring island, Nabwajeta, coming from the small western islands of the Trobrians on Akula. One of them paddled across to New Agassi with a crew of some six men, in order to offer Perry gifts to their partners and see what was to be done in the way of Kula. The canoe was sighted from a distance, and its purpose was guessed at once, as word had been brought before of the arrival in Nabwajeta of this small expedition. The headman of New Agassi, Tavasana, hurried back to his house from my tent, where I was taking great pains to obtain some ethnographic information from him. Tavasana is an outspoken character, and he is the most important headman in the amphlets. I am not using the word chief, for in the amphlets, as I have said, the natives do not observe either the court ceremonial with crouching and bending, nor do the headmen have any power or economic influence. At all comparable with those of the Trobrians. Yet, although I came from the Trobrians, I was struck by the authoritative tone used, and the amount of influence evidently wielded by Tavasana. This is partly due undoubtedly to the lack of white man's interference which has so undermined native authority and morality in the Trobrians. Whereas the amphlets have so far escaped to a large extent missionary teaching and government law and order. On the other hand, however, the very narrow sphere of his powers, the authority over a small village, 
consolidates the headman's influence. The oldest and the most aristocratic by descent of all the headmen, he is their acknowledged doyen. In order to receive his visitors he went to the beach in front of his house and sat there on a log, looking impassively over the sea. When the Trobrianders arrived each man took a gift and went to his partner's house. The chief did not rise to meet them, nor did they come in a body to greet him. The Talawaga came towards the place where Tavasana was sitting, he carried a bundle of taro and a piece of gugue, objects of small value, such as combs, lime pots, etc. These he laid down near the seated headman, who, however, took no notice of it. A small boy, a grandchild of Tavasana, I think, took up the gifts and put them into his house. Then, without having yet exchanged a word, the Talawaga sat down on the platform next to Tavasana. Under a shady tree, which spread its branches like a canopy above the bleached canoe, the men formed a picturesque group sitting cross-legged on the platform. Beside the slim, youthful figure of the Kadoaga man, the old Tavasana, with his big, roughly carved features, with his large aquiline nose sticking out from under an enormous turban-like wig, looked like an old gnome. At first exchanging merely a word or two, soon they dropped into more animated conversation, and when other villagers and the rest of the visitors joined them, the talk became general. As they spoke in Kirawinian, I was able to jot down the beginning of their conversation. Tavasana asked. Where have you anchored? In Nabwajeta. When did you come? Yesterday. From where did you start on the last day before arriving? From Gabawana. When? The day before yesterday. What wind? Started from home with Yavada, wind changed. Arrived on sandbank, Gabawana, we slept, so and so made wind magic, wind changed again, good wind. Then Tavasana asked the visitors about one of the chiefs from the island of Kelola, to the west of Kiruina, and when he was going to give him a big pair of mwali. The man answered they do not know. To their knowledge that chief has no big mwali at present. Tavasana became very angry, and in a long harangue, lapsing here and there into the Gumasila language, he declared that he would never kula again with that chief, who is a tapiki, mean man. Who has owed him for a long time a pair of mwali as yodel, return gift, and who always is slow in making kula. A string of other accusations about some clay pots given by Tavasana to the same chief, and some pigs promised and never given, were also made by the angry headman. The visitors listened to it with polite assent, uttering here and there some non-comital remark. They, in their turn, complained about some sago, which they had hoped to receive in Nabwajeta, but which was churlishly refused for some reason or other to all the men of Kadoaga, Kesiga, and Kuyua. Tavasana then asked them, How long are you going to stay? Till Dobu men come. They will come, said Tavasana, not in two days, not in three days, not in four days, they will come tomorrow, or at the very last, the day after tomorrow. You go with them to Boyawa. I sail first to Bakuta, then to Sinakita with the Dobu men. They sail to Susua Beach to fish, I go to your villages, to Kaduaga, to Kesiga, to Kiwa. Is there plenty of Mwali in your villages? Yes, there are. So and so has. Here followed a long string of personal names of big arms hells, the approximate number of smaller, nameless ones, and the names of the people in whose possession they were at the time. The interest of both hearers and speakers was very obvious, and Tavasana gave the approximate dates of his movements to his visitors. Full moon was approaching, and the natives have got names for every day during the week before and after full moon, and the following and preceding days can therefore be reckoned. Also, every seven-day period within a moon is named after the quarter which falls in it. This allows the natives to fix dates with a fair exactitude. The present example shows the way in which, in olden times, the movements of the various expeditions were known over enormous areas. Nowadays, when white men's boats with native crews often move from one island to the other, the news spreads even more easily. In former times, small preliminary expeditions such as the one we have just been describing, would fix the dates and make arrangements often for as much as a year ahead. 
The Kaduaga men next inquired as to whether any strangers from the Trobrians were then staying in Gumasila. The answer was that there was in the village one man from Bayou, and one from Sinakita. Then inquiries were made as to how many Kula necklaces there were in Gumasila, and the conversation drifted again into Kula technicalities. It is quite customary for men from the Trobrians to remain for a long time in the amphlets, that is, from one expedition to another. For some weeks or even months, they live in the house of their partner, friend, or relative, careful to keep to the customs of the country. They will sit about with the men of the village and talk. They will help in the work and go out on fishing expeditions. These latter will be specially attractive to a Trobriander, a keen fisherman himself, who here finds an entirely new type of this pursuit. Whether an expedition would be made on one of the sandbanks, where the fishermen remain for a few days, casting their big nets for dugong and turtle. Or whether they would go out in a small canoe, trying to catch the jumping gar fish with a fishing kite. Or throwing a fish trap into the deep sea, all these would be a novelty to the trobriander, accustomed only to the methods suitable to the shallow waters of the lagoon, swarming with fish. In one point the trobriander would probably find his sojourn in the amphlets uncongenial, he would be entirely debarred from any intercourse with women. Accustomed in his country to easy intrigues, here he has completely to abstain, not only from sexual relations with women married or unmarried, but even from moving with them socially, in the free and happy manner characteristic of Boyawa. One of my main informants, Laysida, a Sinakita man, who spent several years in the amphlets, confessed to me, not without shame and regret, that he never succeeded in having any intrigues with the women there. To save his face, he claimed that he had had several amphlet bells declaring their love to him, and offering their favors, but he always refused them. I feared, I feared the Baoyu of Gumasila, they are very bad. The Baoyu are the local sorcerers of the amphlets. Whatever we might think about Lacita's temptations, and his personal appearance and charm do not make his boastings very credible, and whether he was afraid of sorcery or of a sound thrashing. The fact remains that a Trobriander would have to change his usual mode of behavior when in the amphlets, and keep away from the women entirely. When big parties arrive in Gumasila, or Nabwajeta, the women run away, and camp in the bush till the beach is clear. The Amphletans, on the contrary, were used to receive favors from unmarried women in Sinakita. Nowadays, the male inhabitants of that village, always disapproving of the custom, though not to the extent of taking any action. Tell the Amphletans that the white man's government has prohibited the men from Gumasila and Nabwajeta to have sexual relations in Sinakita. One of the very few occasions, when the men from the Amphlets showed any interest in talking to me was when they asked me whether this was true. The Sinakita men tell us that we will go to jail if we sleep with girls in Sinakita. Would the government put us into jail, in truth? As usually, I simply disclaimed all knowledge of the white man's arcana in such matters. The small party of Kaduaga men, whose visit to Tavasana I have just been describing, sat there for about two hours, smoked and chewed betel nut, the conversation flagging now and then. And the men looking into the distance with the habitual self-important expression worn on such occasions. After the final words about mutual plans were exchanged, and a few pots had been brought by small boys to the canoe as Taioi, farewell gift to the visitors, they embarked, and paddled back three or four miles across to Nabwajeta. We must imagine the big Kula party from Sinakita, whom we just watched landing in the two villages of Gumasila, behaving more or less in the same manner, conducting similar conversations, offering the same type of parry gifts to their partners. Only everything happens of course on a much bigger scale. There is a big group seated before each house, parties walk up and down the village, the sea in front of it is covered with the gaudy, heavily laden canoes. In the little village, of which Tavasana is headman, the two chiefs, Teutawada and Kutawaya, will be seated on the same platform, on which we saw the old man receiving his other guests. The other headmen of the Sinakitans will have gone to the bigger village round the corner, and will encamp there under the tall palms, looking across the straits towards the pyramidal forms of Dom Dom, and further south. To the main island fronting them with the majestic form of Koyatabu. Here, 
Among the small houses on piles, scattered picturesquely through the maze of little harbors, lagoons, and dikes, large groups of people will be seated on mats of plated coconut, each man as a rule under the dwelling of his partner. Chewing betel nut stolidly, and watching stealthily the pots being brought out to be presented to them, and still more eagerly awaiting the giving of Kula gifts, although he remains to a superficial glance quite impassive. 2. In I spoke about the sociology of Kula, and gave a concise definition of partnership with its functions and obligations. 